present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. Excuse me, Major. Ah, Saunders, you have news. Just come down from the hill. We got through to intelligence. I uh, gave our coordinates, and they say proceed due west to Rajak Pass and await guides. Rajak Pass? I've never heard of it. Well, I checked up about 90 miles from here. It's rough going right into the Montenegro Mountains. We can't cross mountains. Did you tell them that we had a large number of women and children with us? The figures you gave me, Major. 122 men of various nationalities, 53 women and 18 children under 10. And they want me to march through the mountains? The Germans have moved in three divisions of Waffen SS to deal with the Yugoslav partisan groups. If we went north, we'd risk walking into one of them. Yeah, I don't relish that thought, Saunders. Very well, Montenegro it is. They call it the land of the Black Mountain. Yes, Saunders. Very ominous. Ah, Lieutenant Sayo. Come in, take a seat. Uh, thank you, sir. Been having a bit of a holiday, haven't you? Well, I'm afraid it's at an end. Uh, well, I was getting bored, sir. This afternoon, you're off to Yugoslavia with two guides. There's a large group struggling to make it uh, their way to the coast. And, well, to be frank, our intelligence boys have made a botch of it. I see. Told them to make for Rajik Pass. Damn stupid idea. There's no way through from the pass. It's a dead end. Well, can't the order be countermanded, sir? Problem is, Sale, we seem to have lost contact. They could have run into trouble. Mm. A lot of military activity around there at the moment. The Russians are over the border already, and the German high command is getting a bit panicky. What was being squeezed between them and the partisan groups? Anyway, yeah, back to business. This group you ought to meet is being led by one of our people, Major Clifford Ramsden, a Royal Artillery man. Is he? He escaped from the Linovich camp with 50-odd other prisoners of war, Russians, Poles, Americans, French, a bit of everything. Since heading west, they have picked up more ex-prisoners, plus a large batch of women from an internment camp. Are they armed? Yes, they picked up weapons on the way. I think they can generally look after themselves, unless, of course, they run into one of these SS groups. Ramsden did report a spot of bother with some of the partisan groups he's met. Not a very helpful lot. And the civilians are reluctant to give assistance for fear of German reprisals. Hmm. The whole picture there is most confusing, as you'll find out for yourself, my boy. Your file says you were a student of the Slavic and Cried languages. Uh, yes, sir. I, uh, I spent a lot of time there before the war. Hmm, good. Good. Now then, this is what I've done. Have a look at this map. <coughs> In the early hours of tomorrow morning, you and your guys will be landed here, just south of this small fishing village. Mm -hmm. You'll find few Germans in this area, and from there you'll head inland to here. An old chap called Ubak will take care of you and put you on the right road to join up with Major Ramsden. It's all quite simple, and you'll have plenty of time to study it before you leave. Oh, Sanders, it's not the damage that bothers me. It's the fact that they know we're here. I think the Germans have known about us all along, sir. We just didn't constitute a threat to them. So why the hell are their planes strafing us now? Oh, search me, Major. Maybe they know now that we're well-armed and growing in strength. Again, they could have taken us for a partisan group. Yes, there's that. Has Harrison managed to make that infernal radio work yet? No, not a peep out of it. He reckons one of the valves is gone. I guess we'll just have to keep on marching to Rajak Pass and hope for the best. Yes, at ten miles a day. Lieutenant Weser. Yeah, I'm I have received orders. 
They're about to become sheep herders, Razor. Uh, there's a bitter war going on, and I'm to herd sheep. Sheep? Do you mean real sheep? A large group of escaped prisoners. How large? Uh, reports estimated at about 200 strong. What would be the point of recapturing them? The way things are, they would be sent to a camp and escape again. Discipline is so lax among their men that their camp commanders are releasing prisoners by the score. Yes, we know it. And now Berlin knows it. The camps are being restaffed by Waffen SS. There are to be no more escapes. <laughs> well, at least until the Russians come and release them. And put us inside. If we're lucky. Too often it's the nearest lamppost for SS officers. Anyhow, uh, this group of escapees is heading due west. Why, I don't know. There's only the Rajek Pass there. Forest, high mountains. And we have to round them up and hand them over? Yes, there's a... That is exactly what we have to do. Ah, hello. You must be my guide. I am Joseph, and <clears throat> this is Maria. Hello, Lieutenant. <laughs> my, my. What's a pretty girl like you doing in a nasty army base like this, hmm? I have been in many worse places. <sighs> I'm sorry, that uh, was intended to be a joke. Uh, Marie escaped from a concentration camp during an Allied air raid. Why were you in the camp? I was with a partisan group. The Germans surprised us and I was captured. You were lucky to get out. Well, I want you to tell me the kind of country we have to cross. Why well, we have been told is to take you to the eastern entrance of Rajek Pass. That'll do for a start. What can we expect? There is dense forest before reaching the pass. Mm -hmm. It changes to scrub and bare rock where the pass narrows at its western point. And there's no way to cross westwards and come down onto the coastal plain? Which is possible, yes, for a mountaineer. Very few people live in the area. I doubt if even the Germans have been in Tirayet Pass. Are we likely to encounter any partisan groups? Several. The two main ones will be those led by Popchek and Karescu. Hmm. And now for the inevitable question. What are their politics? <laughs> Pavchek and Karescu are rivals. Deadly rivals. Karescu is a monarchist and Pavchek is red. They spend much more time fighting each other than the Germans. <laughs> yes, that seems to be the fashion. You say we'll be likely to meet up with them? If we are lucky, no. I see. They won't be inclined to help us on our way. With the bullet at the base of our skulls, Pavchek is an ex-police officer. His intelligence, his cunning, is ruthless. He's a die-hard communist with a pathological hatred of anyone who does not share his views. Mm. And the other fellow, um, Karescu? <laughs> Even before the war, he was an enemy of Pavchek. Karescu was a bandit, an outlaw who lived in the mountains, a man who stole and cut throats for a living. Now he commands 300 partisans and rules like an ancient despot. Not a pretty prospect either way. Well, after meeting my group at the entrance of Rajek Pass, we'll turn northeast and make for the coast just north of Dubrovnik. It is a long way around. But the nearest route to the coast is through forest on all the hills. What will happen when we reach this, uh, this place? We'll be met by a small flotilla of boats that will bring us across to Italy. To this camp, here? Possibly. Why? Does it matter? Uh, no. No, not really. She has been seeing a man, a, a soldier. Ah, yes, I see. Well, I should think we'll all be brought back here for debriefing. Well, that seems to be it. We'll be leaving in a couple of hours. We'll see you then. <sighs> well, what do you think of him, Joseph? Reliable, speaks our language well, looks looks like a strong man in a fight. He is also very handsome. Yes, I was expecting to hear you say that. I say, Saunders, what are you doing with that Russian chap in tow? Dimitri's in command of our rear guard, sir. Tell the major what you told me, Dimitri. We are being followed by whom? Germans? I see. Keeping an eye on us, are they? I was rather expecting it. Not just ordinary German soldiers. They wear the uniforms of the Waffen-SS. Yeah. How many? About 
fifty men all on foot. They are either the advance guard or been sent to shadow us. Well, either way, it spells trouble, sir. They don't send out their crack troops just to go pussyfooting around the countryside. Well, to keep tabs on escaped prisoners. My guess is they've got all their pals right behind them. All right. Let's have a little fun and ambush the blighters. We need more arms and ammunition anyway. Sanders, you get the Gregson to head the column while we stay here and arrange the party, sir. Dimitri, I want you to collect your Russian chaps and come with me. Oh, yes. I think the Polish fellows would also like to have a crack at them. <laughs> a party, he calls it. You'd think the guy was going off to play cricket. That will be a good crossing. The water is like glass. Well, I'll be sick. I usually am. <laughs> but far rather go by air and drop in by parachute. What's the beach like uh, where we land, you know? It is a narrow inlet with a small wooden jetty. I guided another Englishman there three weeks ago. He was carrying information to the partisan groups. Did he make it? He was taken by the Germans soon after he left me. A pity. He was so young. How long have you been doing this kind of work, Maria? Six months. And you, Joseph? Two years. I started as a liaison between British agents who were sent in from North Africa by air. And a number of partisan groups. By now, the Germans must know you. Oh, they know me, but they haven't caught me yet. <laughs> well, just for reference, uh, what are your politics, Joseph? I worked with the communist groups, but their politics didn't interest me. I just want to see Yugoslavia at peace. And that is why British intelligence can trust me. What about you, Maria? My family always supported the royal family. So that must make me a monarchist. Mm -hmm. Tell me, uh, where do you come from? I mean, where were you born and brought up? <laughs> you ask so many questions about me. It is my turn to question you. <laughs> at this stage of our assignment, all you'll get from me is name, rank, and number. your men in position? Yes, Major. Can you see them? No, not one. Good. That is the way it should be. It should start to get dark in half an hour. I want this party concluded by then. Uh, the path through the valley winds up from around that hill. Galovich signaled that the leading Germans are less than 200 meters from the bend. Ah, uh, yes, Major. They are carrying Schmeisser machine guns. The standard equipment, Arthur. Excellent. Just what we need. If they walk into our ambush, if not, they can cause many casualties. War's a gamble, old boy. You Russians are the best chess players, so you should know that. You can't play the game without losses, you know. Oh, Saunders, how did it go? Well, all the women and children have been escorted onto high ground over there. They'll be well clear of the action. How far away are the SS troopers, sir? According to our Russian friend, they should be in sight within a few ticks. Ah, that is our signal, Major. You will see the patrol in less than a minute. I have just received this radio signal from Gorin. His men have made contact with the escapees, and they are staying well to the rear. Good. What is their position? Here, on the map. There's a valley leading to a small village called Komasek. Mm, that's 60 kilometers, huh? Well, Vesa, I think we shall move out and join them in the morning. Tell Gorn to report into operations every hour. Uh, oh, there's a social gathering in the officer's mess this evening, and I'm tired already. Still, I think we had best make the most of it before we get on the road. <laughs> I think I was going to have an early night instead, Herr Mayor. <laughs> Just as well, I suppose. One of us should have his wits about him tomorrow. <laughs> Herding sheep can be a grueling occupation, yeah? <laughs> Every man Jack is carrying a machine gun. Yes, I was telling Dimitri earlier we can make great use of those schmeisses. Mm. They'll treble our firepower. Yeah, and make great holes in our force if this little operation goes wrong. Oh, stop. Fussing, Saunders. Why do you Americans always get so pessimistic when you don't have an ice cream lorry to follow you around? <sighs> I haven't seen ice cream since October 1943. Yes, that's what I mean. You're lost without it. 
Well, Dimitri, get that weird bird signal of yours ready. Ah, funny, Sanders, I always thought it was your Red Indians who did things like that. Personally, I find it rather melodramatic. All right, Dimitri, do it now. A shouted order or a shot would have done the job just as well. It'll be dark soon. Yes. You can see the moon. I was hoping not to see a moon. The Met people said it wouldn't be an overcast sky when we land. To me, a moon means romance, not danger. <laughs> I think you're in the wrong job, Maria. <laughs> oh, wait and see. You will take that back when the time comes to prove it. Where are you eating? A little later, Joseph. Make the most of it. Perhaps it will be the last meal in comfort for a long time. Oh, these fishing boats, they are so slow. Dropping this from a plane would have been the best. I asked. Colonel Egan didn't want to risk it. There's quite a lot of Luftwaffe activity in the area. To make up for a lack of ground troops. My friends tell me that almost every available man is being sent to the east to hold back the Russians. Except for the Waffen SS, it seems. One SS trooper is worth ten ordinary soldiers, and so it is said. They will be put on garrison duty and used later to blunt the Russian truss. It is all for nothing. The Germans have lost but cannot bring themselves to face the truth. Now, they've been brought up to believe in their own invincibility. Even now, two months after D-Day, they still believe they can push the British and American troops out of France. They still call it a bridgehead. Oh, enough talk of war. It seems as though my whole life has been dominated by it. I'm getting tired, Paul. I want to be just a woman again. I want to forget about politics and begin to think of a home, a family. I don't care who rules, just as long as I can be a real woman again. I think that we all want an end to it, Maria. It won't be long now. It could be over by Christmas. Well, I think the Germans will fight on well into next year. I hope you are wrong, Paul. Well, about 15 got away. He took off down the valley. I don't reckon it's worth chasing them. It went well, Saunders. Dimitri, you can tell your men I'm proud of them. Thank you, Major. Do you want to interrogate the prisoners before we shoot them? Uh, shoot prisoners? They're not animals, Dimitri. They didn't shoot you when you were taken prisoner. Only one in five to teach us total submission. But I was captured by regular soldiers. These are SS the same men who manned the concentration camps. I don't care if we've captured Adolf Hitler, Hermann Goering, and that nasty little fellow with the glasses, Heinrich Himmler. We do not shoot prisoners. Well, what do we do then, Major? Put them on their butts, tell them to walk home and, and behave themselves in future? I can do without your sarcasm, son. Okay, Major, but the question needs answering. How many are there, Dimitri? Nine. And four wounded. Well, let them go. I think it's crazy. Perhaps you do. But supplies are short enough without having to feed extra mouths. Besides, if the Germans decide to take reprisals against us, at least they can't accuse us of murder if we get we taken. You can bet your life they'll take reprisals. After what we've just done, they'll send a whole division to wipe us out. Let's wait and see, shall we? So, we let the prisoners go, huh? Dimitri, is there an officer among them? Two. Hmm. I'll bring them here for interrogation. Then we'll camp for the night farther down the valley... And let the prisoners go in the morning. <laughs> then, 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 then I said to these two Frenchmen, if you don't know where your army is, why ask me? <laughs> ah, Lieutenant Fraser, I, I thought you were having an early night. I was spoken of by Oberleutnant Walder. He brought me important news. Can I see you alone here, Mayor? Uh, yes. Oh, excuse me, gentlemen. I'll be back shortly. <laughs> what is it, Razor? You've turned as pale as a ghost. A survivor of Lieutenant Gorin's company is called in. A survivor? Oh, what are you talking about? They were ambushed and most of them killed. Partisans? No, Herr Mayor. The sheep turned on the shepherd. And Gorin? It's believed he was taken prisoner. Well, I wouldn't give a fennec for his life in their hands. Who called in? Corporal Schmalt. 
He has another eight men with him. Out of sixty. Oh, Fraser, this is scandalous. I can only conclude that Corin was careless. So, our sheep have big teeth, eh? Let me see. It's 11 o'clock now. I want you to call out the men. I want to call them on the road by midnight at the latest. While you do that, I shall inform General Gressa of the position. An interview I am not looking forward to. The captain tells me we're off the inlet now. We're expected at midnight. Another five minutes. And so much for the weather report. It's a brilliant full moon. An observer on shore could see us for kilometers. There's nothing to fear at this place. The nearest German is 50 kilometers north of Look, here. Look, a light. Yes. One long. Three shorts. Two longs. Yes. That's the correct sequence. So all's well. And this is the part of the operation I hate most. It's a sort of feeling of helplessness. Almost as bad as swinging from a descending parachute. The captain is taking us in. On the jetty, you will meet the man who flashed this signal. A fisherman called Morosco. He's been doing it for years. They are turning into the inlet. How clearly you can see the land on either side. There. There's the jetty. A hundred meters on the right. Here's your back, Paul. Thanks. And yours, Maria. Now you'll just go and thank the captain for the ride. Excuse me. Hey, Captain. Maratha. It's amazing. It is so peaceful. And such a beautiful night. Yes. And that's the way I wanted to stay. Right. Let's go. Right. Come on, Maria. Take my hand. No. No, I'm all right. Joseph. Hurry up, Joseph. All right, I'm coming. So, Maria, where's this ancient smuggler you told me about? I don't know. It's very odd. It's strange. But please, he should be here. He could be waiting over there. Yeah. First rule of survival. Beware of anything unusual. Uh, start walking down the jetty. And when I say so, run to the nearest cover. But Paul, Do what? as I say. Uh, come on and just keep it casual. Are you not being a little... Please, we've landed in a trap. What? I get ready to run. As soon as we do, they'll start shooting. Are you ready? Yes. Yes, I am. Now, go! Run! waiting for us, Joseph. I can't. I can't understand it. And what happened to Maria? She didn't run when you said. I don't know. Perhaps she was hit. Well, so much for the nearest German being 50 kilometers away. These are not Germans. I will bet my life on it, Paul. You mean uh, the partisans? I am sure they are. It's difficult to see clearly, but I, I'll go closer. I can see their figures silhouetted as they search for us around the jetty. Be careful. Something I don't understand. Why would they fire on us? I don't know, but that is what I want to find out. Now stay here. I shall not be long. Joseph? Uh, Joseph! Maria! Oh. Maria, we're here. Uh, Joseph, wait. I was worried about you. And then I heard Joseph's voice. Yeah, we thought they'd got you on the jetty. Joseph thinks they might be partisans. He's going in no, to find... No, they're not partisans. What? They're Germans. I clearly heard them talking. I see. How many? No more than ten. They were waiting for us. Yes, they were. Betrayed already. What a lovely start to our mission. The 
The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Diffenthal. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting on Springbok Radio. Excitement, romance, and suspense. From the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. escaped from the ambush by the skins of our teeth. Instead of meeting a guide as we landed from the Italian fishing boat on the coast of Yugoslavia, we were met by a hail of gunfire from a waiting ambush. My mission was to find a group of escaped prisoners of war and internees that was making its way across Yugoslavia to the coast, where it would be picked up by a flotilla of allied vessels. The leader of this group was a British Royal Artillery officer, Major Clifford Ramsden, and he was acting under order relayed to him by military intelligence to make for the sea by a Rajik Pass in the Montenegrin mountains. This had been a mistake. Since it was found, there was no way through, and the group of SKPs could find themselves helplessly bottled in the grim confines of the pass. Behind them, a group of Waffen SS under the command of Major Gunther Scheer was under orders to eliminate or recapture them. I'd been sent with two Yugoslav guides, Joseph and Maria, to turn the SKPs away from Rajik Pass to a road farther north which would bring them to the sea. But now we lay in some grass, looking towards the narrow wooden jetty where we'd been ambushed a few minutes earlier. German, Maria? I told you, I heard them talking. Uh, they're all gathered on the jetty. I can see they're wearing civilian clothing. Posing as partisans. <laughs> An old trick. But they are as German as Hitler himself. We must move into the woods before they begin searching for us. No. But what else can we do? They think we've made a run for the woods already. Which is why they're off guard and standing together in a group. They make a lovely target. There are ten of them, Paul. Look, for the sake of our own security, they mustn't get a chance to report our escape. Then more Germans will be drafted in to hunt us down. But if they're found dead, it'll be blamed on one of the local partisan groups, and the heat will be off us. Yes, that is true, but if I can crawl into close range, we can get them. The biter bit, so to speak. But we must move now before they separate. enough. Maria, you aim for those who run to the right. Joseph, you fire for the ones who scatter left. I'll concentrate on the center. Are you ready? When you say the word. All right, ready. Right. Perfect. The killing was done with cold efficiency. When silence fell, we were sure the ten Germans were dead. 
Maria ran forward, her stem gun held at the ready. We followed behind, using more caution. We saw the silhouette of the figure rise from the ground ahead of Maria, his hands raised. The body fell back, and Maria walked over it as though it had never existed. We joined her as she checked over the other bodies. They are all dead. Where is Joseph? He's taking a look over there. He says there's a road. Yes, the one that leads to Vercozzi. Vercozzi will be our first stop. Where you meet your contact? Yeah, that's right. Uh, here's Joseph coming back. They came in two cars which are parked at the roadside. Good. We can take one of them into Vercozzi, then dump it somewhere. The cars were of the type used by the civil administration... I looked inside them both and found nothing of interest, except that the keys had been left in the ignitions. I glanced at my watch. It was only a few minutes after midnight. We could be in Vercozzi in less than 30 minutes. Then I saw a huddled body lying behind the second car. As I rolled it over, I saw Maria and Joseph approaching. Joseph stooped and looked at the face. It's the old fisherman who signaled us in. The spine has got his throat. Well, we'd best leave him here. But first, let's destroy this car. This incendiary grenade will do it. I'll open this window here and throw it in as we pass. Yeah, that'll do fine. Now, come on. Okay, Joseph. Yes, all there is once is a car. It's a great pity. Meanwhile, far to the northwest, Major Ramsden was unable to sleep. He'd interrogated the two German officers his group had captured during a rearguard skirmish. He got out of bed and ordered one of his men to bring before him Lieutenant Gorin, the senior of the two men. In a few minutes, the German was seated before him in the light of the crackling fire. Two burly Russian ex-infantrymen standing close behind him. I brought you here because I'm not satisfied with the story you told me earlier. There is no more to tell. Your unit is part of a Waffen-SS battalion. Why are you separated from the rest? And why were you so closely following us but avoiding contact? We were making for Komasek. Your group lay between us and the village. No, Herr Leutnant. I believe you were under orders to observe my group, to report our progress until the rest of your battalion catches us up. Am I correct? I will say no more. Then I will assume that I am right. Somewhere behind, an SS battalion is coming for us. How far away are they? You know I am only obliged to give my name, rank, and number, Herr Major. Since when did the SS observe the rules of the Geneva Convention? Really, Lieutenant Gorin, let's be realistic. If our positions were reversed, I would be tortured into giving you the information and then hanged. Am I right? You believe your own propaganda. Do I? You forget I was a prisoner myself. I know it for the truth at first hand. When I was taken at Crete, I was hanged for an hour by my wrists, which were tied behind my back. It was a horrifyingly painful experience. I talked in the end, but I had the presence of mind to only tell of things that could do no great damage. So please, don't tell me about the rules of war. Well, Lieutenant Gorin... You commanded the company which followed us, therefore you must know the reason why, and I want it. You said you would believe your assumption about a battalion following you up. Please continue to believe it. I see. I think that's as close to admitting it as you ever will. The knowledge will not help you, Herr Major. Your tiny force will be overrun in minutes. You're wrong, Maria. He's been working for Allied Intelligence for years. Back, your contact. Mm -hmm. I would never have believed it possible. If what Maria says is true, this could be another trap. If you're both so damned worried, I'll wait here while you circle the farmhouse. It would be better, Paul. I'll go this way. Go on, Joseph. Hurry up. But whoever's inside will have heard the car. Uh, I thought so. Who is there? 
A friend from the mountains, old man. Come inside. Come on, Joseph. Maria can follow us when she's happy that Ubak doesn't have a division of SS waiting in one of the barns. Have some more peach brandy, my friends. I make it myself. <laughs> it is quite illegal, of course. <laughs> Everything you do is illegal, you old rascal. A man must live. <laughs> well, it's as well for us that you do. What do you want of me? Hmm? Well, shelter for the three of us until tomorrow night. And then we move on towards Rajik Pass. Rajik Pass? Mm -hmm. Strange place to go. Nothing ever happens there. It is desolate. Not even the partisans go there. Well, it's a long story, Ubak, but that's our destination. We want to avoid all the partisan groups between, and you can help us in that respect. Mm, it can be done, but with difficulty, and the road will be long, almost twice as far. Can you uh, work us out a route on a map? I can, yes. But uh, between here and Rajak Pass lie two major partisan groups. Can we avoid meeting both of them? Possibly, yes, with great care and stealth. Mm -hmm. You will have to pass through both territories using goat tracks and a compass. As for the main roads, do not go close to them. There has been a great deal of German military activity on them of late. They send out small, heavily armed motorized patrols which shoot at everything that moves. The car we came in will have to be hidden. No, oh, I will worry about that. Some of my farm hands will bury it in the morning. Uh, where will we stay? In uh, one of the barns? No, no. I get many overnight visitors, and I made provision for them long time ago. There is a cellar with a sliding panel leading into a second cellar below the yard outside. So you will find all you need down there. A search party will never find you. Not even if they burn down the house. <laughs> but first, we must drink some more. All day tomorrow you can sleep the sleep of the innocent. You knew we were coming here? Oh, yes. I was told by the British intelligence. Are you in radio contact? Of course. Hidden in the woods is my own little radio station. Tomorrow I will signal them that you arrived safely. Somebody betrayed us. The Germans were waiting for us at the landing place. One never knows who to trust. The Germans have many informants. And you, Uba? <sighs> Do you suggest that I betray you? Oh, Maria, please. I have passed harmless information onto the Germans from time to time, yes. This has been done by arrangement with the Allies. It puts me above suspicion and safeguards my position here. And that makes sense. If you are betrayed, you must look elsewhere for the culprit. Now drink. Let us forget about this war for a little while. After Ubak had finally emptied his bottle of peach brandy, he took us below to the cellar. We climbed down a flight of wooden steps from a squeaky trapdoor. The cellar was empty, apart from some racks of wine and more peach brandy. A shelf against one wall was pulled out to reveal what appeared to be bare brick with a nail protruding from it. Ubak twisted the nail for a moment and then pulled. A section of the wall slid silently outward. The other side was more like a small apartment with four beds each in their own small cubicle, and a central furnished lounge. It was getting close to dawn when we finally went inside, so we looked forward to a few hours' deep sleep. I half undressed and lay on the bed for a while. A shadow passed me several times, and I realized it was Maria pacing the floor. I got up again. I thought you would be asleep by now. Uh, how can I, with you walking up and down like a caged lioness? I'm all right. Something's bothering you. Is it Ubach? How do we know he hasn't gone straight to the Germans? I know. I just relax. I've worked with Ubach several times in the past, and he's always come up aces. Now get yourself some sleep. From what he's been telling us, it could be the last for some time to come. I don't sleep a lot. Well, then just lie back and think nice thoughts. I'll try. Good, because uh, I get ratty when I can't sleep. Good night, Maria. Good night, Paul. Oh. What is it now? Talk to me for a few minutes. What about? Let me sit here, beside you. Really, Maria, this is no time I for... find you a very beautiful man, Paul. Hmm? Are you really so cold as they say the Englishmen are? <sighs> Your hands are cold on my chest. My heart is warm. Kiss me, Paul. Please. 
Oh, must I show you how? It is done like this. <laughs> ah, you do have a spark of feeling in you. I'm not a machine. If you were, I'd fill you full of oil and make you go faster. What about Joseph? Oh, he sleeps the sleep of the dead. He will not waken for many hours. Paul, Paul, just the nearness of you takes away my breath. Saunders, you want me, Chief? Chief? Really, Saunders, I'm a major, not one of your Red Indian leaders. Who have you detailed to cover our rear? The Poles and the six Frenchmen. And the Russians? Well, some of them were on guard duty last night. The rest are due to relieve the British and Americans to head the column. That that Russian officer, what's his name? Uh, Dmitry Arkhanov. Yes, well, he seems a rather reliable fellow. One of the best, if you ask me. Hmm. Uh, what about the prisoners? Did you see them off? Uh, sure. They went off down the trail like scalded cats, much to the disgust of the Ruskies. Is the major in there? Oh, no, not her. What's wrong with you, Captain? That woman... I'd rather face a panzer division than do battle with her. Who is she? She's an English battle axe who joined the column two days ago. I demand that you tell this guard to let go of my arm. All right, Corporal Huskins. You, I take it, are Major Ramsden in the flesh. Correct, madam. And who might you be? Lady Agnes Collier, late of the Chinaki internment camp. May I sit here? Thank you. Yes, yes. Please sit down. Yes, I am seated, Major. All yesterday I tried to see you, and those brutes you call guards wouldn't let me pass. I'm sorry, ma'am, but you will appreciate that yesterday was extremely busy. Yes, I hear you knocked hell out of the hun, please, to hear Now, that's what we need if we're to reach safety. Excuse me a moment. Uh, Captain Saunders, will you see that my orders are carried out? Uh, and tell Lieutenant Holford that we shall be moving off in 15 minutes. With pleasure, Chief. Lost the man and his chief. Mm, Americans, you know. One can expect anything from them. Uh, was there something you wanted to see me about, Lady Collier? Well, of course. Why else would I force myself in here? It's about the women and children. I've taken charge of their welfare. We need fresh milk, blankets, and if you could commandeer some vehicles on the way, it would be a great help. I'm doing everything possible. Vehicles are out of the question. We're moving into the mountains, and there are no roads, only rutted tracks. As for milk and blankets, I hope to obtain these at Komasek, which is a village 12 miles from here. I hope to reach there before nightfall. Mm, I expect you to do your best, Major. Twice a day at 9 in the morning and 5 in the evening, I will report personally to you and convey my needs. Kindly see that your bully boys allow me to pass. I can assure you that I am not an assassin. Yes, Lady Collier. I've taken enough of your time until five this evening. Oh, yes, Major. You must obtain some warmer clothes for us from these peasants. The rags we are wearing at the moment are totally inadequate. Good day to you. Oh, we got what is it? It is time you were up. Hmm? What's the time? After 12 o'clock. Ubak brought some food and more of his peach brandy. Oh, just the thought of that stuff. <laughs> there is some wine as well. Mm -hmm. Where is Joseph? He went out. Ah. Come over to the table. There are things we must talk over. Uh, I'm coming. <clears throat> What's to eat? A sort of goulash. Mm -hmm. It tastes all right. <laughs> All right. What's there to talk about? About Joseph. Hmm. He cannot be trusted. Uh, what's the matter with you, Maria? Are you suffering from some kind of persecution mania? What is that? Oh, never mind. What's wrong with Joseph? If Ubak did not betray us to the Germans, he did. Well, how do you work that out? Only us, Ubak, and the old fisherman knew we were coming. The fisherman was killed by them, so I doubt if he was the informer. That leaves only Joseph. And you? Me? How can you say that to me, Paul? I hate the Germans more than anything else in this world. I, I thought, Doctor, what, what happened between us and... Oh, calm you... down, Maria. I was only making a point. Now, look, you say Joseph is a traitor. Well, what if he comes to me and says you are the traitor? What am I to believe then? You will believe me, Paul. We are lovers, my darling. There must be implicit trust between us. 
you say Ubek can be trusted, therefore Joseph is the traitor. Is that not so, Paul? I don't know. If he is a traitor, he'll make a mistake and I'll catch him. What then? What else? A bullet through the back of his head, of course. Very well. We shall wait and see. But pray he does not lead us into another German trap beforehand. I'll be on my guard. Let me pour your wine. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not too much, sir. The wine makes me sleepy. Now you have eaten, you can sleep some more. Both of us. Like last night. Major, Dimitri and his men are back. Uh, Good. What do they report? They watched the village for two hours before going in. It's deserted. Deserted? Everything is gone. Food, bedding, livestock. We've evacuated. Hmm. Could be. They could have heard of our approach. And... Or the approach of the SS behind us. It's possible, I suppose. Did the Russians circle the place, check the country around? Yeah, two miles deep. The villagers must have gone into the mountains, and there must be a clear reason. What? Partisan activity, do you think? Could be, yes. The partisans could have ordered the village to be evacuated. Hmm. Well, Sanders, we must continue to move ahead. I hope to reach Comasek by five, so we'll have to be on our guard. I could send patrols on ahead to occupy the village and make it ready for our arrival. Yes, do that. Right. I'm expecting something else at five. What? That woman. Uh, Anyway, she'll have to damn well wait until we're settled in for the night. Yeah, you mean that woman. Uh, Is she real? I mean, is is she what she claims to be? (laughs) You could bet your life on it. The Lady Colliers of this world built and organized the British Empire in their day. Meeting her here in this column was a nasty shock, believe me, Saunders. What did she want? It would appear that she's taken charge of the women and children. Her present and future demands on our resources don't bear thinking about. spent most of the day drawing this map for you. If you look here, and here, and and over here, near these areas you must avoid. Mm-hmm. The patch marked in yellow is Koresko's territory. The one in red is Pavchek's. The darker in your areas are the most dangerous. You will have to cross both the outer areas, I know, but do so at night. We intend to do most of our traveling by night. Good. Now, these lines here denote the German strong points. Uh, You can easily avoid them. Now, once you have passed through the Royalist area, you should have a clear and safe run to Rajak Pass. That'll be a relief. It's getting late, Paul. The lady is right. Take the map. I wish you Godspeed and a safe journey. Well, thanks for everything, Ubak. The war will not last much longer. Perhaps if we meet again, it will be in happier times. Yes. I certainly hope so. Goodbye. Thank you, Ubak. May God go with you. Well, it's a nice clear night. Moonlight can be dangerous. (laughs) You will have to excuse Maria. She's always looking on the black side. It has saved my life on more than one occasion. Oh. Hmm? What's the matter? I'm sorry. I've uh, I've left something back at the house. Oh, well, just forget it. No, I can't do that. It uh, it's important. Important? What, what is it? Well, it's um, something personal. Uh, please, I will not be long. Uh, wait a minute, Maria. You... Wait here for me. I won't be long. Oh boy, women. You know, she's probably left behind a makeup or eyebrow tweezers. Maria is not like other women in that respect. She's gone back for some other purpose. How do you mean? She's become very close to you, Paul. I can see it in your eyes. But be careful. Oh, no. Do not trust her too far. She's scumming and she's very ruthless. She doesn't trust you and you don't trust her. What is all this? Look, you were sent with me to advise and to assist and... We're shooting here down at Ubak's house. Come on, let's go and have a run. Be careful, it could be the Germans. (laughs) 
I ran the 300 yards back to Ubach's house. Joseph was close behind me. The door was closed. I cocked my Sten gun and gently pushed open the door. I found myself staring at Maria. She was still holding her machine pistol poised. Sprawled out on the floor at her feet lay Ubak. Blood spattered over his shirt front from three gaping wounds. He was quite dead. I'm sorry. It had to be done, Paul. Maria, you're, you're mad. You, you have to be mad. Why, why did you do it? It's quite simple, Paul. I'm surprised you didn't think he would have betrayed us to the Germans. Betr- oh, that's ridiculous. How do you know? I don't know for sure. I just had that feeling. You can kill just because of a feeling? Is that the real reason why you came back here? Yes. After we left the house, it was almost as though I knew. Can we afford to take chances just because you liked the man? Liked him? Ubak was the linchpin for allied intelligence in this area. Good grief, woman. I could have trusted him more than my own mother. Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Diffenthal. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. Joseph and I stood staring in horror at Maria, who stood over Ubak's body, a machine pistol poised in her hand. She was completely without remorse at killing the kindly man. The man who had been the linchpin for Allied intelligence in southern Yugoslavia. The man admitted having passed information onto the Germans. With agreement from intelligence and only to put himself above suspicion. (sighs) Maria, you killed him because you wanted to. He was no threat to us. Why would I want to kill an innocent man? You have a bad reputation for such things, Maria. Be quiet. This is none of your business, Joseph. Everything that happens on this mission is my business, as much as it is Paul's. You'll have to explain this when we return to Italy. Time will prove my action was the right one. Dare we jeopardize the lives of all those heading for Rajek Pass for the sake of one man's life? I'm tired of arguing with you, Maria. Come on, let's be on our way. First, this house must be burned. Why? There may be imported evidence lying around which might be of use to the enemy. The Germans will closely investigate Dubak's death, especially if he was the informer. I believe he was. I agree with Maria on this point. All right. Let it be Dubak's funeral pyre. But let's be quick. We have a long way to go before daylight. Meanwhile, far to the northwest, Major Ramsden had led his column of escaped prisoners of war and internees into the deserted village of Komasek. Before occupying it, the advance guard had carefully searched for booby traps. 
none was found. It was as though the villagers had disappeared from the face of the earth. Ramsden set up his headquarters in the building that had once served as a village hall. Ah, Captain Sanders, uh, the men settled in? And the women and the kids. Oh, yes, yes, of course, I was including that. But... Lady, whatever her name is, is fluttering around and finding out what they need. Mainly the things we don't have, I suppose. You know, with all due respect, Major, I think she could cause us a lot of headaches. She's treating this march as though it's a... Well, it's a vacation in the country. Yes. I think I shall have to put my foot down firmly when next she visits me. She's already asking to see you. Do I, do I hear an aircraft, Sonny? Yeah, it's over there, flying over the valley. Can you see what it is? Uh, yeah, a German reconnaissance plane. Those prisoners you let go must have made it back by now. The crowds will be wanting to know how far we've gotten. Yeah, not very far, they'll find... Fifteen miles in a day isn't much. No. At this speed, we won't reach Rajik Pass for another five days. This Waffen SS battalion that I suspect is following us up, well, we must keep a close watch for it. Mm. How many Poles are there? Twenty-three under Lieutenant Brzezinski. Yeah, look, send the lieutenant back with his men after they've eaten. Ten miles will do. Tell them to keep a close watch for the Germans, but not to make contact with them. Okay. They must estimate the size of the force and immediately report back to me. Oh, excuse me, sir. Is that lady demanding to see you again? Quite all right. I can announce myself. Major Ramsden, those brutes of yours are still trying to block my way. Good evening, Lady Collier. I wanted to see you at five o'clock, but you were too busy. We were occupying this village at the time. Now, if you can tell this, uh, this American officer to take his foot off this chair, I can sit down. Oops. Beg your pardon, I'll lady. I'll tolerate your, none of your sarcasm, young man. You may address me as Lady Agnes. Are your charges settled in? I asked you for milk and blankets. I can spare you some tinned milk, Lady Agnes. As far as we can ascertain, the village has been stripped of all foodstuffs and livestock. Why? So far, it's a mystery. Tomorrow morning, I'll have some men dig up the likely hiding places. Perhaps we'll find some food that's been buried. Meanwhile, the children have to go without. My dear Lady Agnes, the tins of milk say on their labels that the contents are fit for children. They'll have to suffice for the time being. I think you should have made a better job of foraging before we reached here. Madam... I must remind you that we are not picnicking on Blackpool Beach. I am quite aware of it, and I'll thank you not to patronize me, Major Ramsden. I merely wish to remind you to pay more attention to priorities. Lady Agnes, getting this column to the coast is my main priority. How can you, if we all starve to death on the way? That is part of the same priority. Now, if you'll kindly excuse me, I have important matters to discuss with Captain Saunders. Patience, Major. There is another matter. Proper toilet and washing facilities. I was waiting for that. They'll have to make do with what there is, just like the, like the rest of us. Oh, really, Major? What kind of an attitude is that? The only one I can adopt. The women and children managed perfectly well before you arrived, and I'm sure they'll continue to do so, with or without you. Very well, Major. Any deaths from malnutrition and overexposure will be on your head. But I shall most certainly report your cavalier attitude to the war officer on my return to London. <sighs> that woman must have terrified her guards in the internment camp. <laughs> they probably released her to get some peace. She should be sent against the Waffen SS who are following us up. She'd <laughs> frighten them all the way back to Belgrade. Yeah, at top speed. Now, back to business. Tomorrow morning at first light, I want every barn, every yard dug up to find food. There's a stream a kilometer ahead, Leutnant Vesa. I think we will stop there for the night. Oh, well, there's a stream, if this ordnance map is correct, which I doubt. The area was surveyed only two years ago, Herr Mayor. Mm, you see, we're 20 kilometers from Komasek. It's the place where they were spotted, isn't it? Yeah, a small place. Population about 150. Have you changed your mind about the enemy since Lieutenant Gorin's company was badly mauled? Mm. Nasty business that. Gorin should have been more careful. He behaved as though he were following up a column of harmless refugees, not a well-armed group of escaped soldiers. Yeah, he was careless. There must be at least 150 well-trained men ahead of us. Desperate men, Lieutenant Weser. 
And desperate men are dangerous. I was really and truly astonished when you told me they had released Goran and the other men. They were fortunate. It was the British officer in charge who insisted on their release. Major Ramsden is his name. Oh, he's a gentleman. A pity this war has not been fought with more like him in command. Uh, you can look at me, Reza, but I would have done the same in his place. With all due respect, Herr Mayor, but our orders are to destroy or eliminate Major Ramsden's column. If you capture them, can I take it you will let them go again? Ah, such nonsense, Reza. This is a different matter. They are escaped prisoners, not regular troops. Oh, but I do wonder at the wisdom of my orders. At this moment, the Russian hordes are pouring in from the east, while we, a fully operational SS battalion, are ordered to capture escaped prisoners. If it were up to me, Vesa, I'd escort them to the coast and be rid of them. I would waste manpower like this. You do agree with me, like my Vesa? In all honesty, yes, Emil. But I must admit, this is a lot more pleasant than fighting Russians in a war that can't be won. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, don't quote me on that, Reza. <laughs> Nein, Herr Mayor. Promise. When we camp, I want sentries set about three kilometer perimeter, on the move constantly. Once this Major Ramsden discovers our presence and strength, he will employ terrorist tactics against us. Perhaps he knows already, so we must be prepared for anything he can offer. Would it not be wiser to overwhelm his force while it is on the march? With 3,000 men Stop and... Stop right there, Reza. What will happen next? We will have achieved our goal, lost a lot of men in the process. Can you imagine our next orders? We fight the Russians. Exactly. We shall leisurely follow up this Major Ramsden to the entrance of Rajak Pass. And there bottle him in until he surrenders. You have no choice, but plenty of time to consider it. I see a bridge... And the stream ahead, eh, Mayor? Good. Looks like a nice place to spend the night. It's hard to see the path. Yeah, it is a ghost track. I think it is time we took a rest. Yes, I agree. It's, uh, yes, it's after midnight. And we have 70 oh. kilometers to travel over country like this. Uh, Up here, down the other side. Not a pleasant prospect. By morning, we will be in Popchik's territory. <laughs> and we will have to put on our communist hats. <laughs> I find it hard to look at one, let alone pretend to sympathize. I would just as soon kill them as kill Germans. I think you'd better talk no more about killing Maria. Are you still angry with me for killing Ubak Paul? I don't want to discuss it. I'm still the same, Maria, I was early this morning. Uh, we have stopped for a rest, Maria. You stay out of this. Uh, look, uh, let's, uh, let's have a bite to eat, shall we? Huh? We need to keep up our strength, not dissipate it. What do you mean by that, Paul? Well, that's obvious. Joseph, you say it's 70 kilometers like this. What's the country like beyond? Uh, the last 50 kilometers will be forest and hills, but we will be able to keep to the lower ground. I'm looking forward to it already. If we keep to the path through back shoulders, it is unlikely we will meet any of Papchek's men. They tend to concentrate more to the east, where the Germans make good targets. Mm. All I'm hoping to see during this journey is a few helpful peasants. I do not like the path Ubak has drawn through the royalist area. It would be better to go farther west than avoid it altogether. They can't be any worse than the Red. Worse, Paul. Far worse. It would only add an extra 20 kilometers. But doing so would mean entering an area where there are many German patrols. The whole damn thing's a puzzle. All I know is we have to reach Major Ramsden as soon as possible. So far, the men have dug up five bags of grain, two casks of wine, and one of the night patrols found two goats. Goat? Females? <laughs> yeah, and I know what you're thinking, Chief. <laughs> yes, Lady Agnes and her charges will have to get used to goat's milk. <laughs> uh, and please, Captain Saunders, address me as Major, not Chief. Okay. Uh, never mind. Uh, Private Crossley reports he heard a movement in the woods about two this morning. He reckons it sounded like a group of men. 
When he challenged them, they moved off. Did he get a look at them? Only heard their voices. What language were they speaking? Well, Chief, you know Crossley. He isn't exactly the brightest star in the firmament. He reckoned it was either Croat, Slavic, or German. Idiot. They'd hardly be Japanese. Mm -hmm. Could he estimate the number? Well, I think he can count up to six, because that's how many he reckoned there were. Mm. There could be villagers trying to get a closer look at us, um, or a group of partisans. I don't think they'll give us any trouble. They're probably just curious. Anyway, Captain, keep the men digging. We need a lot more food than we've found so far. I'll start moving the column out at midday. Send a patrol about five miles ahead of us to probe and find a decent place for us to camp for the night. In spite of what you say, Maria, I've decided to follow Ubak's map. Do as you please. I shall. I don't think we have any time to spare in making detours. If we do meet up with any partisans, well, we'll just have to sweet talk them and keep moving on. But remember, Paul, I was ordered to go with you as an advisor. Correct. But I'm also permitted to use my own initiative. Joseph, have you anything to say? Why should I? I agree with your plan. And you, Maria? I have no choice but to follow. Very well. Shall we move on, then? I could have slept another two hours. Shall I get the men ready to move out, Hermione? What's the hurry, Vesa? Let them relax a little. Take a look at the scenery. Isn't it beautiful? Almost untouched by man. Brigade HQ will, will radio soon. What shall I say? Oh, give them some evasive stories. Say we are probing the valleys in our advance on commissary. I wonder if there are any fish in that stream. You will want more details than that, Hermeo. <laughs> Who, the fish? The Brigade HQ. Come, Lieutenant, smile. Where is your sense of humor? Oh, very well. Tell them we have detected signs of partisan activity and we are proceeding with great caution. Yeah, Hermeo. I shall do some fishing. We will be here until tomorrow? No. We can move on a few kilometers this afternoon. Now then, my main problem is, what am I going to use as a fishing line? Captain Saunders, do you see these carts? Oh, yeah. What about them, Major? Well, they seem quite serviceable to me. Well, you mean, take them with us? Why not? How much food's been collected now? Well, it's quite a list. Apart from the... What's happening now? They're under fire from the hills. Rifle fire and mortars. I doubt if it's the Germans. Where's, where's the Russian fellow, Dimitri uh, something or other? I'll fetch him. Look, don't bother. Just have him and some of his men go up there and find out what they can. So the rest of us can dig in and, and wait. Yes, having silenced the mortars. But just like that? Yes, Captain, just like that. They make such a damn mess. Anything else? Yes, after you send off the Russians, go to Lady Agnes and tell her to oh, take... Oh, no her... need, Chief. You can tell her yourself. She's striding up the road towards it with a really angry expression on her face. I'll, uh, I'll run and tell Dimitri. What are you yeah. going shooting about, Major? Who is doing it? My guess, it's the partisans. Perhaps they've mistaken us for Germans. Oh, this is ridiculous. Here we are being fired on, and you don't know by whom. I can assure you the matter is being attended to. By that American fellow who just ran off... <laughs> He probably thinks we're playing with cowboys and Indians, and we are the wagon train. Captain Sanders is a very able officer. Oh, well, you gather your men together and charge them. Madam, this is not Sebastopol, and we are not the White Brigade. I would suggest you take your charges and have them shelter it. We were about to say the church, Nancy. We were looking at it just then, and now it's had two direct hits. Half of them have been really in danger. First you get the children, hideous goats, milked and drinking, and then you want to see us all blown up. You're being quite unreasonable, Lady Agnes. It's better if all my charges are dispersed. As from now, then they won't all be killed in one fell swoop. Ah! Yeah. And about the goat smell. Please, Lady Agnes, we're under attack. Can't we talk about it some other time? Oh, a typical male action. If you don't like the subject, put it off until later. Look, you have to excuse me while I attend to our defense. And it's your own fault for letting them get close enough to shoot at us. Damn it. Not. I'd have been better off staying in my internment camp. Oh, 
Why do you look at me like that? Yesterday we were lovers. Now it is as though you hate me. You scare me, Maria. <laughs> I scare you? I? A woman who loves you? Yes. Because I shot Ubak? Yes, and because of your attitude. No, stop. Let us talk. No, no, no. Joseph is waiting farther along the path for us. He won't run away. Please, Paul. Uh, look, Maria, all the talking in the world won't bring Ubak to life again. It's done. I knew that you would not be able to bring yourself to do it. It was necessary for the sake of our mission. We've gone over this again and again, Maria. We share different views about it. Snipes. Here comes Joseph. We'll have to move through into the hills. Why? Germans ahead. Here? But Ubak said... There! That... Didn't I warn you, Paul? Ubak was leading us into a German trap. It is no trap, Maria. Ugh. I watched him for several minutes, and I would say they are making a concerted sweep on the partisans. How many did you see? Oh, about 300 on the very and more on their sides. But there could be double that number. Mm -hmm. Which way are they moving? Ahead of us, following the route we have to take. So, we're reasonably safe if we stay well behind and move to higher ground. Yes, but we must keep an eye out for the stragglers. There's not much vegetation higher up. We'll have trouble keeping undercover. No, there are many rocks. Well, let's go along here to the place where you saw them, and then I'll plan what to do. You see, Joseph, he takes no notice of your advice. We might just as well not be here. <laughs> I think that I should leave you and Maria alone for hmm, half an hour. It will be long enough to put your arms about her and do what is uh, necessary to improve her mood. Shut up, Joseph. Very well, very well. Stay bad tempered. Now, come on. We're here to do a job, not play school playground games. You see, Joseph, you have embarrassed him. The English are funny about... about the sex. When we looked down from the top of a ridge, I could see it was as Joseph had warned me. A long line of olive green uniforms was threading its way along the floor of the valley. And on the sides of the hill opposite us, we could see the movement of more soldiers. They were moving slowly away from us. Keep your head lower, Maria. I'm only taking a look. You see, they're heading into the Jevarak country. Well, where's that? Let me show you on Ubak's map here. Now, here were Ubak marked in deep red. It is where the communist Pavchek has most of his men. Yes. You think Pavchek knows? He will know. Yes, he will let them advance deep into the hills and then suddenly turn on them when he thinks he has an advantage. So we could be faced with a pitched battle going on in our path. It is, as I said last night. It would be better if we went farther to the west. If we keep on this track, we could fall into German hands very easily. And what do you say, Joseph? I think what we see happening could make it easier for us. The partisans and Germans will be too busy with one another to notice us as long as we keep our distance. Well, here I am again, conflicting advice from my advisors. This time you should listen to me. No, Maria, I think Joseph is right. We'll move on to higher ground and keep a close watch on the enemy ahead of us. It's uh, nearly midday, and I think we'd best find a place to sleep for a while. But I think... Uh, no, I think it's best if we all stay together. Now, come on, Maria, and for heaven's sake, stop fighting. And where have you been, Captain? Chasing partisans. Partisans? Damn it all, man. They're supposed to be on our side. I took the squad of Australians with me. Dimitri and his Russians got there first, though. And? Oh, they went crazy and killed six of them. They captured one of the mortars when the partisans ran for it. But there's another mortar still firing on us. This is higher up the hill. Dimitri's lot had to deal with it. Any prisoners? Uh, Three. The rescue shot them before we arrived on the scene. You must tell Dimitri about this shooting of prisoners. It just isn't on in my command. How will we ever find out why they're shooting at us if there's no one left to talk to? Uh, I think you'd better have a word with him yourself. He was quite resentful when you let those German prisoners go yesterday morning, you know. Damn it. I know how he feels, but he must learn to control himself. Dead prisoners are worse than useless. That's what I told him. He laughed and pointed out that dead prisoners don't eat or need guarding. They can't talk either. I want to know why they're attacking us. They can't possibly have mistaken us for Germans. Oh, yes, Major. Talking about Germans. Lieutenant Brzezinski is back. He reports a large force of Waffen SS in our rear. Oh, so soon. They're about 20 kilometers away. Look, show me on the wall map. 
Oh, yeah. They were here, here on the bank of the stream. Yeah. How many? Well, Brzezinski reckons, well, around about at least 3,000. Hmm. It seems they're determined not to let us go, Saunders. That's the way it looks, sir. There were 15 trucks, uh, around about 10 half-tracks, and a staff car. Well, they'll make slow progress through this terrain, but a hell of a lot faster than us. Yeah. Damn it. They could be on our necks before nightfall. Well, you know, sir, that's the strange thing. You see, Brzezinski says they look as warlike as a... Well, as a cage full of rabbits. What? Yeah. They were watched for quite a long time. A lot of the men were bathing in the stream, and would you believe it? Some were even fishing. Why? They must know we're here. Yeah, you'd think they'd be hell-bent on revenge for the way we cut up their advance guard. We'll have to keep a close watch on them, Captain. I Look, I suggest... I wish those bloody Russians would hurry up. This constant banging is giving me a headache. like the Germans are having a go at objects partisans. Or the other way around. Sounds like quite a big battle. There is one danger to us. If Pubchik drives the Germans back, they must come this way. I doubt if he will. By the size of the German force, they're pretty determined to deal him a crushing blow. <laughs> uh, they have tried it before, Paul. Last year, it cost them over 2,000 men. Remember, Pubchik's men know themselves too well to allow themselves to be trapped. They will lead the Germans on until it is they who are trapped and hunted down. Hmm. There seems to be a lot of activity over there. Look, between those two hills, I can see smoke. Yes, and a mass of German uniforms. A partisan strategy. Burn the ground and let the smoke blow downwind on the enemy. From what I can see from here, the Germans are massing together, just as Pavchik would want them to. <laughs> Soon you will hear his mortars open up on them. Mortars? Where will they be fired from? But from... Ah, yes, I see what you mean. Look, the best position would be this hill. Yes, you're damn right. They could be moving in on us right this minute. Quick, get your things together and let's get to higher ground. The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans... Produced by Yolan Dotman and directed by Henry Dippenfall. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Excitement, romance, and suspense. From the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. Yeah, to the right. Yes. This should do. 
Are you all right, Maria? I can look after myself. <laughs> oh, that means she is all right. Is it safe to stop here, Joseph? Yes, I think so. We have a good view of the valley, and the partisans set up their mortar positions. It will be over there, but only meters below us. I hope they didn't spot us climbing up here. No, no, no. no. The eyes will be on the battle with the Germans in the valley. <laughs> so much for this route being the quickest to rise at pass. We could be forced to hide up here for days. Well, we'll just have to make the best of it. We should rest now, and after dark, make our way down to the other side of the hill. By tomorrow morning, we'll be far to the north. Uh, that's what I was thinking. Can you bring yourself to agree with that, Maria? It's better than waiting up here. Is it worth us taking turns to stand guard? I think that a good sleep is more important, Paul. Mm. The partisans won't bother climbing this high. Right. So let's go and get some shot eye. It was only the second day of our journey through Yugoslavia towards Rajek Pass, where I was to meet up with a large column of escaped prisoners of war and internees who were fleeing west under the command of Major Ramsden. My mission was to stop them from entering the pass and divert them to the coast farther north, where they would be picked up by a flotilla of small boats. It was believed at Allied command that they would be bottled up in the pass and forced to surrender, as there was no way out of the Adriatic from there. However, I'd heard that some of the peasants in the sparsely populated area did know of a way to the sea from there. I was accompanied by two Yugoslavs who were employed by Allied intelligence services. Their task was to guide me, which was a good idea in theory. But in practice, I found they didn't like one another, and their advice was always conflicting. Worse, I suspected one of them of treachery since the moment we were ambushed when landing on the coast. Some 80 miles to the north, Major Ramsden's column had occupied a small village called Komasek, which had been found deserted. After resting the night, they had come under mortar and small arms fire from a partisan group for no explainable reason. Worse, some 15 kilometers to his rear was a battalion of Waffen SS under Major Gunther Scheer, who had orders to wipe them out or effect a surrender from Major Ramsden. Luckily, Major Scheer took a cynical view of his assignment and had decided to wait until the 200-strong group of ex-prisoners had trapped themselves in Rajek Pass. For our part, we had walked into an ambush of German troops by a large group of communist partisans under the leadership of Pubcek. The Germans had been sweeping the low hills in an attempt to push the partisans into a corner, but instead they had marched into a trap. We had fled to higher ground, where we hoped neither side would bother us. As I lay back and tried to sleep, I wondered how Major Ramsden was managing his ragtag army, a mixture of British, Russian, Poles, French, and a single American officer, not to mention some 50-odd women and at least 20 small children who had been released from internment camps when their German guards had panicked in the face of the Russian advance from the east. Well, it's all over except the shouting, Major. Good, but I'd like to know why the partisans took it into their heads to attack us. Well, you'll know soon. The Russians took notice of your orders and stopped shooting their prisoners. And Dimitri's just walked into the village with six of them. Fine. It's necessary to make friends with these people, not to fight them. Any casualties on our side? Oh, not bad, Major. Two Russians and a Pole wounded, and one of the ladies got hysterical when the mortar shell hit a neighboring cottage. I suppose Lady Agnes Collier is fit? Oh, uh, yeah. And running around like a mother hen with her chickens. <laughs> Go and see Dimitri and find out if any of the prisoners speak good English. If not, I'll have to find an interpreter. Well, Lady Agnes speaks all the Balkan languages fluently. I'd rather not know, Captain Saunders. Okay. Heaven forbid we should ever have to use her. You're right. Ah, oh, that saves me the trouble. It's Dimitri. Hello, Major. I brought this Kulak to see you. He says he speaks good English. Very good, Dimitri. Uh, sit him down in that chair. No, he will talk better standing up. The chair, please, Dimitri. Now, you see this man, eh? Kulak? He's our commander. If you do not do what he tells you, he will give you to me. 
And you know what I will do, huh? Quillet, I will put a bullet right between your big ears. All right, Dimitri, that's quite enough. Uh, what's your name? Kovacs. Alexander Kovacs, sir. Where do you come from? Komasek. This village was my home. You speak very good English. Where did you learn it? I was a student in Belgrade before the Germans came. I learned some English there, and then I learned to speak it better from Colonel Brewster. Colonel Brewster? A British military intelligence officer, sir. He used to arrange for the delivery of weapons to my partisan group. I was his assistant. And where is this officer now? He was killed in a German ambush six months ago. I see. Where are the other people from this village? They have gone into the hills, sir. Why? We had information that the battalion of Germans were coming this way. Do we look like Germans? No. Then why did you attack us? You are a strong force. And you are suspicious of strong forces? Yes. You would have been wiser to have talked first instead of shooting. A lot of men have died. All of them your own. It was to protect our homes. From what? We were only passing through. It's us the Germans are after. Who are you? You are all mixed up. You are English, yes? Yes, Major Ramsey. <laughs> then I see Russians, Polish, and others I do not recognize. But we are all fighting for the same cause, Kovacs. These men have escaped or have been released from prisoner war camps because of the Russian advance into Yugoslavia. Why do the Russians not go to join their army in the east? <laughs> you can answer that question, Dmitri. We prefer to stay here until the fighting is finished. Then we will go home. And we appreciate the help of you and your men. Now, Kovacs, you're a member of a partisan group. Which one? Our leader was Argon Korons. Was? He was killed in today's fight by your Russians. What are your politics? We support the Republican movement. The communists? No, sir. We are a separate political group. We are against the royalists and the communists. <sighs> What a strange country it is. Look, who's going to lead your group now? I was second in command. How strong are you? Excluding the men we lost today, about 75 men and women. It's a pity we had to fight each other, Kovacs, but the blame lies with your leader. I would rather that we were friends. I know that now. Can it still be so? Many men have died. Some of the group will be angry, even when they know it is our own fault. I will send you and the other prisoners back to your people. Tell them that we come in friendship. As their new leader, I'm sure they'll listen to you. I will do my best, sir. We're not concerned in your politics. Our only objective is to get safely to Rajik Pass. Your people are welcome to come down to the village to bury their dead and to meet us. Tomorrow we'll continue our march westward. It will be safe for them to come here? You have my word, Kovacs. But after we leave, the Germans will pass through, and it will be as well for them to hide again until they've passed. I should thank you, Major. Captain Saunders, will you take Kovacs to his men and release them? I will do it. No, 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 you stay here, Dimitri. I want to talk to you in private. I hope to see you again before you leave, Major. Yes, yes, perhaps there is a way we can help one another to make up for this morning's foolishness. Uh, right, Captain Saunders. Come on. Uh, please close the door behind you. Sir. You are angry with me, Doc. Yes, Dimitri, I am angry. When will you realize it's better to make friends than enemies? A man that shoots at me is an enemy. It is better to find out first why he is shooting at you. You ordered me to attack the partisans. But I did not order you to kill the prisoners. It's the quickest way to earn the hatred of those who might be our friends. This is the second time it's happened, and I want no more of it if you wish to remain under my command. <sighs> yes, Major. I will tell my men to be as gentle as stretcher bearers. Dimitri, please, you're aggravating me. I want them to fight as they have been doing, each one a hero. All I ask is that they display mercy to the man who holds up his hands and asks for it. I understand, Major. Here we are, marching through a strange country like a, like a band of brigands of old, only vaguely knowing what's to become of us. Prisoners can be useful, Dimitri. They can tell us things we don't know. 
The Germans that you wanted to shoot the day before yesterday. From them, I learned that a full battalion of Waffen-SS are moving up to attack us. Useful information, Dimitri. Mm. Did he tell you why the Germans swim and fish in the river 15 kilometers away and do not try to attack us, huh? No. That's a mystery yet to be solved. But take this man, Kovacs. What good would a bullet in his head have done? His group might have harassed us all the way into Rajik Pass. But now it's possible we've made friends. They might even harass the Waffen SS instead. I'm sorry, Major. Yes, you are right. I know, I know. All right. For the future, I will see that prisoners are taken and not mistreated. Good. Then the lecture's over. Now, do you wish me then to move my men back to keep a watch on the Germans? Perhaps they are tired of camping at the river. Well, Lieutenant Brzezinski is there. Well, look, uh, yes, after taking some rest, you can go and relieve him. My men can snipe at them from higher ground. No, 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 Dimitri. Look, if, if the Germans are enjoying themselves, leave them be. If you start shooting, they might start moving closer, which is the last thing we need. Just watch and avoid contact. Don't even let them know you're there. with a start. Joseph was close to me, looking down at the valley floor far below. All I could hear was the occasional crackle of small arms fire. A quick glance at my watch told me it was a little after six. It would be dark soon. Close by, Maria slept the sleep of the innocent. Or was it? I moved in beside Joseph and watched. It was difficult to see what was happening and who was mopping up who. A pall of smoke still clung to the valley floor from where the partisans had burned the ground, forcing the Germans under the range of their mortars earlier that morning. Now there seemed to be little movement. I saw a large group of partisans moving down there about ten minutes ago. Yeah, who won? Oh, the partisans, of course. In these areas, numerical superiority means very little. Pavchek prepared his trap and his victims marched straight into it. The Germans never seem to learn from experience. What will happen now? Well, the Germans will have had no chance to reform. Instead, they will be in groups all trying to get back to the road. Pavchek's men will follow them all the way, mopping them up. And very few will escape. Well, as long as it keeps the partisans busy, I don't mind. And then they won't get in my way. Why is Maria so angry all the time? <laughs> Please, you should know, Paul. Because we made love at Ubak's place? Yes. And now you ignore her. But she must realize this isn't some kind of a country outing. We, we can't Who be... can tell how a woman's mind works? Men have spent lifetimes trying to understand. But it is better that you do not. Do not get so close to her again. Well, I am trying to avoid it, you know. It all happened in a moment of weakness. I understand. She's... Very beautiful. And just as dangerous. Yes, I realize that now. I could never see her in the same way since she killed Ubak. It was a terrible thing to do. And you must ask yourself the real reason why. Because she believed Ubak would give us away to the Germans. You believe that? Well, what else am I to believe? Is it not possible that she killed him because she knew Ubak was really an important agent for the Allies here? Do you mean that... Maria could be in German pay? Mm, it is possible. How did the Germans know where we were landing? Somebody told them. Look, we've been over this before, Joseph. It could just as easily have been you. But <laughs> I know that I didn't. That is the difference between us. And if it was not me, then it could only have been Maria. Or Ubak. You think it could have been Ubak? In all honesty, no. He'd proved his worth and loyalty a thousand times over. Which brings you back to Maria. You hate her, don't you? Only for what I think she is. She seems to think you're the one who betrayed us. To divert suspicion from herself. But you understand my position? I can't accuse you on the basis of what she thinks. 
And equally so, I can't accuse her on your suspicions. But whichever of you it is, a mistake will be made. And then I'll know. And what will you do? I know the rules. But what I don't quite understand is... Well, if one of you is a German agent... What's to stop him or her killing the other two? That would bring my assignment to an end. Please, please, please no more. Maria is waking up. Yeah. It will soon be time for us to move, Maria. Mm. What time is it? It's uh, nearly half past six. There's very little shooting. Who won? It looks like the Pazans. Oh, a pity in a way. Pavchek and his group have become too big. Too powerful. You would prefer the Germans to win? No, but it would be good if Pavchek took a bad morning. While he is alive, there will be no real peace in Yugoslavia. Oh. Mm, I still feel as tired as when I went to sleep. There is a lot of smoke down there. The fire has nearly burnt itself out. Can we eat before we go? Mm, yeah, good idea. Uh, let me get it for you. We will have to look for more food soon. The supply Uba gave us is running low. I looked at Maria and shook my head. It was as though she had woken up a different person. The bitterness had left her voice and she seemed as bright as when we'd left Italy, which already seemed like a century ago. She opened a tin of beans and another of corned beef and then unwrapped some bread and biscuits from some wax paper and made some crude sandwiches. For a while, one could have believed it was a picnic. And then soon, the valleys filled with darkness as the sun went down behind the western mountains. And we began our descent. It would take us to a valley three miles from where the battle had taken place. Well, anyway, that was the plan. At that time, Major Ramsden watched in pleasant surprise from the steps of his headquarters as a long file of villagers passed through the perimeter guards and dispersed to the cottages that had been their homes. Behind them came a group of men, rifles slung over their shoulders, carrying the dead of that morning's fracas. As they came into the village, they looked about them with open suspicion, as though fearing a trap. But Ramsden's people remained silent and merely curious. The bodies were placed in a barn-like building, ready for burial the next day. And then in came a long column of men led by Kovacs. They cautiously passed the perimeter sentries and came to a halt outside Major Ramsden's headquarters. Major, sir. Ah, I'm glad to see you brought your people in before nightfall. It was a long and difficult meeting. Many feared a trap, revenge for our attack on you this morning. They have nothing to fear from us. Ah, oh, and these are your men, eh? Well, uh, 57 men, including myself, and 23 women, all widows or single girls. They fight uh, like, like men? Like men, sir. But they still love like women. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Many were trained by Colonel Brewster. Uh, to, uh... Fight, of course. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. To fight. And uh, all the people come from uh, Komasek? Oh, no, no. From all the villages in the hills as far away as Deveznik. Ah. All who want to fight against the Germans and support the Republican cause. And what will they do now? There are Germans close to here. We will attack them. Uh, Kovac, I'd, uh, I'd rather they didn't. Not just yet. I've just had to stop my Russians from doing that. Yes, but why, Major? I'd prefer the Germans to stay where they are. You could attack them when they try to occupy this village, like you did to us this morning. We were not very successful. Well, fortunately. Look, uh, join me for a bite to eat later. I think Captain Saunders and I can offer you a few useful tips. Yes, we have plenty of automatic weapons. As you see, we have Brenz, Sten guns. But the men would prefer to use their rifles. Yeah, well, then they'd do well to change their ideas. 
You can't beat automatic weapons. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You know, if I were you, Kovacs, I'd start getting your men to use them as soon as possible. I mean, no wonder you were overrun this morning. Dimitri's men were using captured German Schmeisers. Yes, most effective weapons. Oh. Oh, excuse me, sir. It's the Russian officer wants to see you. Uh, send him in, son. Something must be happening. Ah, Dimitri, come and join us. Take a seat. Look, there, there's some wine over there. And that... Straight back to my men, Major. I came to tell you the Germans are ready to move. Are you sure? They are loading the truck. But not actually on the move. No, not when I left. Perhaps not until the morning. Uh, I can't see them traveling by night with all that equipment. The road's little more than a, a mud track. No. We can delay them if they move. On the way here, I look closely for a place where we can surprise them. Mm. It is less than two kilometers from where they were camped. It's a pity we've got no mines. We have mines. Yeah, how many? A hundred. Wonderful. Look, can you let us have some Kovacs? About uh, 30 would do. Huh. They are all yours, Major. I will get my men to help lay them. That's damn sporting of you, Kovacs. Dimitri, you have your wish. Look, can I leave you to organize a suitable ambush? It will be a pleasure, Major. Get hold of Lieutenant Brzezinski and have his men help you. Let me see. You'll be... Oh, you'll be about 50 strong. Yes, that's plenty. Look, uh... Keep to the high ground. Yes. I know what to do, Major. <laughs> of course. Of course, Dimitri. Uh, Captain Saunders, will you take charge of laying the mines? Uh, put them, say, uh, half a kilometer ahead of where Dimitri sets his ambush. Yes, sir. Look, he can drive them forward into the mined area. <laughs> Uh, they won't be expecting anything like that. Yeah, but what if they start moving off under cover of darkness? For the life of me, I can't see why they should. No, Saunders, I'll, I'll stake my life on it. With all due respect, sir, you might be. Oh, you are a pessimist. But look, if they do move off before the mines are laid, Dimitri, I'll expect you to fight a fierce rearguard action. Of course, Major. And send someone back here to give me good warning. Yes. Because it'll take me at least a, a couple of hours to get this lot here on the road. If you will allow, my men will help by guarding your rear. You really are an excellent fellow, Kovacs. Will they agree? They will agree if it means fighting Germans. Very well. Apart from the men you send to lay the mines, the rest of your group will temporarily fall under my command. Very well. Shall we be about our business? Captain, let me show you where the mines are hidden. He's not here. He was a little ahead of us. But where the hell he's got to now? Joseph! Over here. Where? Just off the track. What is it? Down here on the ground. Look. Three bodies. Well, who's are they? No, no, no. Don't. Don't flash a light. I just want to see. Please, don't. I stumbled over one of them. The German soldiers. German? German. Their hands are tied behind them. And they've been shot in the back of their heads. Are they objects, man? It happened more than half an hour ago. The bodies, they are still warm. That means the partisans could be close by? Yes. Come on. Let's get off the track and back onto higher ground. Yes, it would be better Carnimar, if we... Carnimar! <laughs> get out! Carnimar! Carnimar! Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Diffenthal.
Springbok 930 dossier, dramatized for broadcasting and brought to you on Springbok Radio. stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. And they're all around us. Well, get a weapon and show yourself. We could try and run. No, we would not get ten meters. I think this is the time for bluff, not fighting. This is your last chance. Hold your fire. We're coming out. Torches flashed from different directions towards us as Joseph, Maria, and I stood up and came out from the trees where we had taken cover. When the Yugoslav partisans saw us, they began to move closer. They had expected to see olive green German uniforms. Instead, they were confronted by three ashen faced civilians. Guns were leveled at us as three of the partisans searched our bodies and the two knapsacks we'd been carrying. Our hands were tied behind us, and not a question was asked. The man in charge told us to follow him along the valley. Having seen no more than ten minutes ago the bound and executed bodies of three German soldiers, we wondered if the same treatment was in store for us. We were marched for some 15 minutes along a dark, barely distinguishable trail. Then suddenly we came out into a wide clearing where many partisans were milling about. To one side of the clearing was a small peasant house. We were taken inside and locked in a bare room. A few minutes later, a tall, thin man entered and stared us up and down. Who are you? I'm Lieutenant Paul Sale, attached to British Intelligence Services. Oh, an Englishman, huh? And these are my two guides. What are you doing in my territory? Passing through to the north. Your territory? I am Algar Parchek. Ah, uh, pleased to meet you. I was told that if I ran into your partisan group, you'd be helpful to me. Oh, yeah? Who told you that, Lieutenant? Uh, my coordinating officer, Colonel Egan. I have very little to do with British intelligence these days. They appear more interested in supplying arms to the monarchists than Republicans, which is a mistake for which they will soon be sorry. Well, uh, now that I've established my identity, can we be on time? You have established very little, Lieutenant. I think we will have a private talk. Bruno, come in here and interrogate these two prisoners. Yes, comrade. You will follow me, Lieutenant. I have a more comfortable room for our tete-a-tete. -tete. Does it really matter why I want to reach Rajak Pass? If you want to be successful, yes. We are fighting a life and death struggle against the Germans, the monarchists, and the Republicans. We are winning, yes. But I cannot allow strangers to pass through my area of control without knowing their purpose. You'll have to be satisfied with my word that what I'm doing is for your... Well, your benefit as well as ours. It is said that an Englishman's word is a solemn bond. And yet... We are fighting the same enemy. So why would I lie to you? When you talk of the same enemy, you report to the Germans. But the monarchists and Republicans are my enemies too. Yet your people help them. That is not in my interest, is it? Lieutenant, I need to know more about your mission. I... I can't tell you. Ah, you are choosing to be difficult. I'm following my orders. And if I have the truth tortured out of you, I will be following my instincts. I've no choice in the matter. Ah, you have been trained to resist interrogation, yeah? But of your guides, 
I am sure they know the details of your assignment. Yes, I could have them tortured and then shot. Would you like that, Lieutenant? No. But they will talk. I can guarantee it. Perhaps so. And I will know the facts, and you will have thrown away their lives for nothing. Is it worth your silence? Let me put it to you like this, Pacek. I'll give you my word that what I'm about has nothing whatsoever to do with helping your enemies. It... No, Lieutenant, your word is not enough. Now, let me see. What is there in Rajak Pass, as you call it? Ah, there is a small Republican partisan group operating a few kilometers to the east of Rajek, but they are of little importance. <laughs> Quite a puzzle, isn't it? Oh, it is a great puzzle, Lieutenant. And I shall not be happy until I know the answer. Ah, ah, wait. Yes, here it is. Ah, an intelligence report of Russian origin. Now, my curiosity has really been whetted. Two days ago, a battalion of Waffen SS was reported heading west from Nitschik towards the mountains. Now, why would Germans commit an SS battalion to go that way, huh? When they are hard pressed by our Russian comrades on the eastern border. Really, Lieutenant, the suspense is causing me physical discomfort. Are you in radio contact with any of the Allied intelligence services? I am in contact with all your intelligence services, including the Russians, as I have demonstrated. Very well. Then there's a simple answer. Call up British intelligence, and they'll give you my credentials and tell you all you need to know. What I need to know and what I want to know are two very different matters. Why is an SS battalion heading for Ratchet? It's bad news to know about the SS. Ah, you didn't know. I didn't, and it makes my mission even more urgent. <laughs> Let me give you a drink. I have some scotch whiskey here, left by an American liaison officer seven weeks ago. Uh-huh. Uh, where is he now? Captain Steiner? Uh, oh, I warned him about wandering into a monarchist area. From what I hear, he fell into Carrasco's hands and was shot. It was his name. They said it was German. He was a German spy. Poor fellow. An idealist. His mission was to arrange a truce and an eventual peace between myself and Karesh. Huh. An impossible task. Uh, it isn't going to be easy drinking with my hands tied uh, unless I try it through a straw. <laughs> oh, now that is funny. Uh, here, let me cut you free. Uh, thanks. <coughs> I had forgotten. Uh, oh, that's better. Now, I mm. think it would be wise to tell me what attacked you to Rajek. You say it is urgent, yet I could hold you here indefinitely, even until the Russian army arrives. It could cost the lives of many people if you do. It is war. We are surrounded by death for three years. It has become a way of life. Oh, come, drink. What is it you English say? Uh, Cheers. Yes, cheers. There, there is another way. I could keep you here while I send a small group of my mentor to find out your secret. Oh, that could take days. Oh, a week before they return. I know. I know. You are preparing a site for the landing of British paratroops. Well, am I right? You're quite wrong. This is becoming a guessing game, Lieutenant. Yes, and precious time is being lost. You are losing it. I can continue guessing all night and all day tomorrow, but if you tell me the truth, I will let you go on your way if your mission is as innocent as you claim. If your information is so good, I'm surprised you haven't been told about the other armed group which is operating in the Rajik area. Another armed group? You mean partisans? No. Let me look at these intelligence reports again. No, no, no. Ah, what is this? Is? Escape prisoners of war. <laughs> yes, that is it. May I ask what it says? It reports that a group numbering approximately 200 ex-prisoners and internees are slowly moving towards the Adriatic. There have been several small actions where resistance has been met en route. They are well armed and living off the country. <laughs> I am advised not to interfere with their progress should they enter my territory. Where does that report come from? From where all my most reliable reports originate, Russian military intelligence. Mm -hmm. You are on your way to join up with these fugitives? I'll give you ten points for a right answer. Oh, you English amaze me. Why was it so important for you to hide the truth, huh? These fugitives are of no interest to me. Had I told you the truth right away, would you have believed me? No. But why should I believe you now? 
Because it's the truth. <laughs> the truth. Oh, you are a very devious man, Lieutenant. Why would you want to join up with a lot of escaped prisoners, eh? You would have done better by staying at home. It's rather a confusing mix-up, actually. Earlier, they were in contact with intelligence, but, uh, well, something must have gone wrong with their radio. They'd been given orders to head for Rajik Pass, and from there to the Adriatic, where they'd be picked up by a flotilla of small boats. <laughs> Go through Rajik to the sea. <laughs> ah, British intelligence must be crazy. <laughs> there is no way out. It is like a bottle. Yeah, so it was discovered. But intelligence have been unable to contact the group to countermand the order. Uh, I've been sent to divert them away from Rajik and lead them to a place just south of Dubrovnik. Ah. They will not reach the shore. There is a heavy concentration of German troops both north and south of Dubrovnik. Yeah, I've since been warned about that. The whole thing's a mess, actually. But I've been told from a reliable source that there is indeed a way through to the west from Rajik. A narrow goat track leads over the mountains, but few of the peasants know the way. I have never heard of it. I want to see what your guides have said. Please stay where you are if you value your life and the success of your mission. Friends tell the same story. You haven't tortured them? No, not quite. My men were on the verge of doing so. Are you now satisfied I was telling the truth? Yeah. Good. Then will you help us on our way? Ah, now that is something else, Lieutenant. All right. All right. If you don't want to help, at least give us a safe conduct through your area. I want to know something first. This map was found in one of your bags. It has been very carefully drawn and accurately shows the areas controlled by myself and my rivals. Where did they come from? Does it matter? It matters a great deal, Lieutenant. I recognize the style of Upak. Did he give it to you? Yes. When? The night before last. Upak is dead. Did you kill him? No. Upak was a good friend to us. His farmhouse was set on fire, but his body was pulled out by one of his workers. He had three bullet holes in him. Can you explain what happened? No. Now, I know you are lying. His workers say that three people, an Englishman and two Yugoslav agents, have taken shelter there for a night and a day. I want to know why you killed him. I didn't kill him, I tell you. Why should I? Ubak was important to our intelligence network. This matter must be closely investigated before I can allow you to leave. Oh, for heaven's sake, Pavzek, what about my mission? I don't care about your mission, Lieutenant. I care for my old man who was a friend and a helper for many years. If I am satisfied that you didn't kill Ubak, then you will be allowed to go free. But if I find evidence to the contrary, you and your guides will be executed. Before I could realize the full implication of what Popchek was saying, his revolver was out of its holster and pointing at my chest. He shouted an order, and two of his men came into the room and took hold of me. I was hustled into a room furnished only with a crude bed and mattress. There I was left to contemplate my bleak future. I felt certain that under pressure, Joseph would tell his interrogators that it was Maria who had killed Ubak. It's a relief to know they haven't moved yet, nor likely to until dawn. How did your mind laying go? Oh, great. I went back along the trail to the place Dimitri is setting his ambush. It's an ideal place. I reckon he and his men could hold up the Germans for oh, a couple of hours at least. Especially now that Kovacs and his partisans are taking a hand in it. And the mines? Well, I went back about a kilometer and set 30 in groups of five. When the Germans make a run through the ambush, they'll drive straight into them. What type are they? Well, Kovacs must have gotten them from your people. British type, you know. Oh, well. yeah, 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 good, good. They're very powerful, enough to disable a tank. Mm -hmm. For my part, everyone's ready to move out. 
Uh, naturally, this led to an altercation with Lady Agnes, who believes sleep is more important than keeping ahead of the Germans. Uh, you can always let her stay and face up to him herself. My very suggestion to her. <laughs> and she backed off? On the contrary. She told me to give her 30 of my best men, and she'd deal with these nasty <laughs> Nazis herself. <laughs> nasty Nazis? Her words, Saunders. <laughs> I pointed out to her that perhaps the women and children were a greater priority than her playing the part of a, of an avenging Bodicea. <laughs> anyway, enough of the truculent Lady Agnes. I've sent the French, the British, and the Americans ahead to check the route. Three partisan girls offered to act as guides. Now, this damned Rajek Pass we're ordered to go through on our way to the Adriatic. Yeah? One of these partisan women told me there was no way through. Well, At the western end, we'll be faced by a tall, impassable mountain. But there must be a way through. No, I'm sure our intelligence people wouldn't make a mistake like that. I don't know. This girl seemed to know the past rather well. She says the local name for it is the Veil of Darkness. Well, if there's no way through, the SS could bottle us up inside and <laughs> turn us to ground beef. I'll have to take the risk. When we get into the pass, the men can scout around to find one of the locals. Then we'll get at the truth. Don't forget, these peasants are still living in the 15th century. Mm. Eighty miles to them is like 10,000 miles to us. This woman's only told me what she's heard, not what she knows to be true. Oh, well, it's nearly four, sir. i better get back and watch the action. Yeah, lucky fellow. I'll have to stay here and shepherd the flock and Lady Agnes. <laughs> Good luck, sir. I'd rather fight the SS. I'd been locked in the room for no more than ten minutes when the door was opened and Maria and Joseph were roughly pushed inside. Uh, uh, Paul. Paul, you're still alive. Shouldn't I be? They said you were to be executed. Oh, that's in the future. Are you both all right? No. They gave me a bit of a beating. Oh, no. Then they asked me if I killed Ubak. Uh, what did you say? At first I denied it, but it was as though they knew. How did they know, Paul? I didn't tell them. I am sorry, but it was me. So you are the traitor. No, they were about to start cutting off my finger joints one at a time, and they meant it. So you babbled everything to them. Why, Maria? Little... Sit down here with me. But you I... You brought this on yourself, you... Why should I be tormented to cover up her stupidity? We'll all pay for it just the same. Popchek's really bitter about Hubak's death. Apparently, they were old friends. Oh, how was I to know that? You shouldn't have done it, Maria. It would have been all right if we had gone farther to the west, as I advised. It would have been all right this way if you hadn't killed Ubach. Now all we have to look forward to is a firing squad. No, Paul. There will be no firing squad. Why not? When I admitted killing Ubak, I was taken to see Pavchik. He told me the mercy of a bullet was too quick, too honorable. I am to be hanged in the morning. What? I think he must have meant all of us. <sighs> now I understand why there's a high mortality rate of intelligence officers sent into Yugoslavia. No matter what they do, they're always somehow in the wrong. Only a man who has been sentenced to death can really know what it's like. You're trying to think of a way out, but intruding into your mind are other thoughts. You begin to think of the girls you once knew. The family that you'll never see again. The sunshine. Flowers. Having a ding-dong drinking session with the boys. All the silly things you've done with your life. Then you begin to wonder what it'll be like. Is there really a life hereafter? Or do you become no more than a mosquito squashed on a wall? I think my two companions were expecting me to come up with the answer. But they were wrong. Lieutenant, I suppose this woman has told you your fate. Yes, and I must protest. It will do you no good. Then why are you here? To tell you that I have contacted your military intelligence and reported your presence. They have confirmed what you told me about your mission. Did you tell them that the mission had failed because you're held out on revenge for Ubak's death? No. Instead, I tried to make a bargain with them. More supplies in exchange for your life. Did they agree? Hmm. The matter is being discussed. What about Maria and Joseph? Only your life is being bargained. No, you must include Maria and Joseph. Nor what? You will refuse to leave without them and so jeopardize your mission? Oh, Lieutenant. 
No matter what bargain your people strike with me, their lives are forfeit. I let you know when I hear more. Now, wait a minute. I... I not... There's nothing you can do for us, Paul. We are dead already. I'll... I'll insist. I want to use his radio and talk to them myself. Pavchik would never permit it. I'm sorry for all this, Paul. I know I'm to blame. And I'm glad you can admit it. What's done is the past, Maria. It's what has to be done soon that really matters. You must continue with your work, Paul. I only hope that Joseph can hold his head as high as I hold mine when that noose is put about our necks. Don't talk about it, Maria. I will have only one regret. Paul, I love you. Maria, I... I know it is not so with you. We spent only a little time together, but it was enough for me to know the truth. All I ask is that you hold me. Yes, close like this. Look at me, Paul. Into my eyes. See it for yourself. Maria, please stop it. You're embarrassing him. No, no, no. Leave her alone, Joseph. It's all right, Maria. I I understand. Joseph, have the human decency to face the wall. Maria quivered in my arms like a frightened puppy. I couldn't be sure whether it was fear or her passion. She clung tightly to me. Joseph, who'd been sitting on the floor in a corner, dutifully turned to face into it. And then Maria's lips were on mine. Her long fingernails biting into my skin through my shirt. She pulled me down onto the mattress and then... You, Englishman, come. Comrade Pavchek is waiting. Maria froze and glared balefully at the partisan in the doorway. I stood up and went with him, not daring to look behind me. I was prodded into the room where Pavchek had interrogated me earlier that night. He was sitting at a table and kicked out a chair as I approached. Yeah, Lieutenant. You see what is left in this bottle of scotch whiskey? It must be finished before I let you go. You... you made a deal? <laughs> Fifty tons of supplies will be flown in tomorrow night. You know what I will do then, huh? No? Tell me. I will lead my men against those capitalist monarchist pigs. I will have the pleasure of personally dismembering that mountain bandit Karasku. The supplies are intended to help you to fight the Germans like you did today. They are all my enemies. And that includes the people who sent them if they try to interfere. Oh, it's sheer madness, political idiocy. The kind of madness that creates wars. A drink to your safety, Johnny. What about Maria and Joseph? Their lives are beyond negotiation. We'll see about that. There's still more than half a bottle of whiskey to drink yet. How do you sing at the garden? Oh, again. The stars at night are big and bright. Deep in the heart of Texas. <laughs> reminds me of the one well, I love. Deep in the heart of Texas. Texas. <laughs> I, uh, oh. <laughs> I can't remember the next word. Here, have the last rope. I'll check. We've had a good session, and I can see dawn coming up through the window. Uh, you know what that means, hmm? Oh, don't remind me, Lieutenant. Another day. Uh, I know where there is a bottle of peach brandy. No, no, no. Oh. I, I couldn't drink any more, thanks. Uh, I just... I just... <clears throat> I just want to ask for one thing, Patrick. Uh, the lives of my guides. Oh, that is two things. <laughs> Yes, and uh, ah. you know what I mean. Both of them. Ah, uh, you have taught me a very good song. I will spare one of them to go with you. Uh, now, which one? You like the woman, huh? She is pretty, and those dark eyes, oh, such promise. Both of them, Pavchek. Choose, Lieutenant. I can't. Ah, 
Ah, you are sentimental, and this is war. People die. Our people gave you a good bargain, Pavchek. How generous and merciful can you be in return? Hmm. Are you a good gambler, Lieutenant? What do you mean? Do you see this box of paper clips? Mm-hmm. Would you say the number inside is odd or even? Now, if you can guess correctly, then I will let your companions go with you. But if you are wrong, then it will have to be the hangman. You can't be serious. Odd or even? Uh, please. Choose. Odd or even? Odd. Ah. <laughs> now count them for yourself. Huh? Forty-eight. Ah, it's a pity. Please do come outside with me to watch how bravely they die. The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Lippenthal. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Springbok 930 Dossier. stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. After gambling away Maria and Joseph's lives on the contents of a box of paper clips, I went outside with Pubchek to watch their execution. My stomach was churning as I followed him into the crisp air of dawn. Already a large group of partisans had gathered for the show. Two ropes had been thrown over the lower branch of a large tree, below which stood a tall wooden trestle. I stood to one side while Pavchek went in among his men, issuing orders and talking to some of his lieutenants. And then came the moment I dreaded. The prisoners were led out, hands bound behind their backs. Maria had her long, dark hair tied up in a bun. Joseph was pale-faced, his eyes looking down. As they were lifted up onto the trestle, Pavchek came back to my side. The girl is brave, defiant to the last. This is a crime, Pavchek. One day you'll have to pay for it. The girl murdered Ubak. Not so. You know she did. But she was doing what she thought was her duty. To murder an old and trusted ally can never be regarded as her duty. Besides, I give you a chance to save them. It is a fair gamble, and you lost. Allied intelligence might go back on their agreement to supply you arms when they learn of this. <laughs> Who will tell them? You. If I get the chance, yes. You will get no chance from here, my friend. And now that Dubak is dead, the only other man for a hundred kilometers is a indirect communication is Karescu. And I would not even like you to fall into his hands. Ah, you are ready. A burly partisan had put the nooses round the prisoner's necks. I saw the brave and beautiful Maria whisper something to Joseph. He straightened up and stared ahead. His mouth a thin line. Maria's eyes met mine, and she nodded. At each end of the trestle stood a man, waiting to kick it over. Ah, would you like to give the order? No. Very well. Alexei, what I wanted to turn away my head, but an awful, morbid fascination gripped me. The two men kicked over the trestle, and Joseph and Maria fell to the ground rolling and kicking. (laughs) 
For a moment, I thought the ropes had broken. And then I realized that they'd been untied at the other end. Beside me, Pubcheck was almost doubled up with luck. <laughs> After witnessing the mock execution, the partisan leader hustled me back into his room in the cottage. He was still grinning from ear to ear when I turned and angrily confronted him. Ah, that has put me in a good mood for the day. Where's the sense behind it, Pubchek? That was an act of deliberate cruelty. I know, I know, Lieutenant. It was also a punishment. Better to be hanged than live than to be hanged than dead, don't you think? Did you ever intend to hang them? Yes. Yes, but the girl, she was so brave, so beautiful. I did not have the heart to kill her. And it would not have been just to kill one without the other. All right, all right. So, uh, what are you going to do with them? Uh, I don't know. Uh, be reasonable, Pub Check. Just let us go on our way to the north. Y you've made your deal, and you're happy that we're on an important assignment for British intelligence. Oh. By letting us go, you can help save the lives of many others. I have told you, Lieutenant, you are free to go at any time you wish. Uh, you have kept me up all night singing songs and drinking whiskey. Uh, I'm tired. I don't want to leave without Maria and Joseph. Oh, you are a very stubborn man. That's a prerequisite of my job. I want to sleep for a while. When I wake up, I will let you know. Oh, please, Povchak, time is precious. Then go! But if you want your guys to go with you, then you will have to wait. Uh, what do you want to do? Uh, wait. Gregory! Yes, Comrade Pavchek. Take this Englishman back to his friends. Uh, uh, I think I could sleep for a week. I hope not. Far to the north, the fugitive column under the command of Major Clifford Ramsden began its slow journey west to the mouth of Rajik Pass, leaving behind the small village of Komasek. Several kilometers along the rocky road east of the village, a trap had been laid for the pursuers, a battalion of Waffen-SS. Sixty men, a motley ragtag group of Russians, Poles, British and Yugoslavs, had been waiting all night in ambush for the Germans to move off. For a reason not clear to the British Major, the Germans had spent the whole previous day camped beside a stream, the men fishing and sporting themselves in the river. It had given Major Ramsden second in command, an American Air Force captain, Martin Sanders, plenty of time to organize his ambush. Now the German lorries were loaded and ready to move. Watchers reported back that even as daylight came, their quarry seemed reluctant to move. Captain Sanders wondered why. Lieutenant Weser. Yeah, Herr Mayer. I will take a walk along the bank of the stream. Would you like to join me? The men are ready to go. Oh, there is no hurry. Ooh, it is a lovely morning. I think oh, 800 hours will be a good time to leave. Come. Uh, one of the sentries reported hearing movement in the trees further up the hill. Early this morning, about four. Mm, it is only to be expected. We are being watched all the time, if not by the partisans, then by Major Bramston's rear guard. He will be anxious to know what we are doing. Would it not be wise for us to send ahead a patrol to see what he is doing, Herr Mayor? Mm, we know what Major Ramston and his gang of fugitives are doing, Vesa. They are running before us into Rajik Pass. I told you yesterday, I would rather not make contact with them yet. Better to wait until they are nicely sealed up in the pass. Then I can negotiate their peaceful surrender. Yeah. Ah, did you see that, Lieutenant? What? A kingfisher. Oh, isn't nature wonderful? I spent most of yesterday fishing until I was certain there were no fish in the stream. And now, look, in a single dive, a kingfisher comes up with one. It makes one think. Think what, Emil? Whether the good Lord intended man to eat fish. If he had, he would have made them easier to catch. Uh, begging your pardon, Hemeo, but if we walk much farther, we could run into danger. If the enemy is watching us, we will be easy targets. Just as far as that clump of trees. And stop being so edgy, Faisa. Be like me. Ponder at the glories of nature and forget this stupid war for a while. Oh, 
It's you, Dimitri. Kanishki has just reported back that the Germans are sitting beside the lorries doing nothing. Damn. I wonder if they suspect. No, I'm sure they don't. It is as though they are just wasting time. They must know we are watching them, yet they pretend there's no one else in the world but them. There has to be a reason for it, Dimitri. With their vast superiority, they could move ahead and, and jump our column, wiping us out in a few hours. Why don't they? Project Pass. Is it possibly a trap for us? Uh, it's possible, I suppose. Major Ramsen has sent a patrol far ahead to reconnoiter. If there's any German activity there, we'll soon spot it. Oh, damn it, the Germans could sit by that stream for another week. No. Lieutenant Brzezinski's men saw them loading the lorries last night. They'll move sometime today. I wonder what Major Ramsen would do if he was here. Huh. You know the Major. To him it is like hunting foxes. Oh, yeah. Tally-ho, up and at them, lads. <laughs> Do you fancy that idea, Dimitri? I would like to, yes, but it would be unwise. We can do a lot more damage if we wait and herd the Germans into a trap. Have you seen Kovacs? Ah, that Yugoslav Kulak, no. You will be over where the landman's been laid. You don't like him, huh? Not much. If he helps us, so that is good, but with these Slavs, a man must watch his back for treachery. They change their politics and loyalties like most men change their socks. I uh, know. He seems straight enough to me. No, because you are an American. You do not have the devious mind of the slab and the crow. To them, the gun and the bomb are the solution to every minor problem. <laughs> we Russians understand because once we were the same. Oi! <laughs> ah, that is Gamokin with the news. I have a line of men relaying information all the way along the track. I'll go and see what it is. It is time for our country drive to begin. Amayo, are you driving? Yeah, I shall be your chauffeur for a while. It's a nice day for it, and I like driving. Besides, you drive over rocks and into potholes. I prefer to drive around them. Come, get in. Yeah. the column here, Mayor? Uh, very unwise. This is ambush country, Vaisa. I shall pull over here into the side and let some of the lorries pass first. All right, Vaisa. Signal them on. This road is so bad. Mm, it is good compared to what we have after Komasek. According to the ordnance map, it is little more than a goat track from there to Rajik Pass. The smoke coming from the exhaust. I think our transport people are supplying olive oil as fuel these days. The Germans are moving off. Alas, is everything ready? Da. The men have been told to concentrate on shooting the officers. <laughs> Germans without officers are like chickens without heads. Their column is all trucks. And one staff car, and that will be my target. The Schmeiss machine guns we took from the German patrol are very good for this kind of work. They're better than the stems we had before. Yeah. There's Gamokin's signal. They're coming. The men will wait for the first eight lorries to pass before they open fire. Yeah, here's the first one coming around the bend of the road now. The soldiers in the lorries we disable will spill out and run over to those rocks for cover because all the shooting will come from this side. <laughs> when they reach the rocks, they will find Brzezinski and his poles waiting for them. This damn waiting could be flying any day. Any moment now. Captain Saunders watched the black-painted lorries with their skull and crossbones emblem pass no more than 50 meters away. They traveled painfully slowly along the narrow, rutted track, their rear flaps tied open so that Saunders could see the rows of black-helmeted soldiers seated in rows inside. The sixth lorry passed, and then came the staff car, an SS pennant flying on its bonnet. The seventh lorry came into view, and then the firing started. Hey, 
Lying beside Saunders, Dimitri squeezed the trigger of his Schmeisser and poured a hail of bullets at the start car. It swerved violently to one side of the road and hit a rock. All along the road, SS troops poured out of the lorries and ran for cover as our 60 Schmeissers poured death at them from their angry muzzles. and the staff car were on fire. The other truck speeded up and passed through the smoke and fire in a run to safety. The ploy had effectively cut the German force into two parts. But Martin Sanders knew it was only a matter of time before the Germans regrouped and reversed the tide. Dimitri gave a signal and his men started to melt away up the hill and away to the west. Dimitri and Sanders followed them. They climbed the heavily wooded slope and reached the top. Far off, they watched the German lorries moving with speed into the second ambush. The leading one suddenly lifted up, nose first, a plume of flame and dust blossoming out from under its wheels. As it rolled over onto its side, the fuel tank exploded in an orange burst. Then the second lorry hit another mine. The three remaining lorries stopped in time and spewed out their passengers. Kovacs' partisans opened fire on them with machine guns and mortars. It was a massacre. Stop firing! Do you hear me there? Stop firing! Yeah, they've gone. Just melted away. You, Lieutenant Gruber, take some men and search for bodies. I want them identified. Yeah, here are you. Partisans. Oh, you're wrong, Besa. They were using Schmeisers. The ones taken from Lieutenant Goran's patrol. The sheep we are herding into Rajak Pass have big teeth. The lorries that got through are in trouble here, Mayor. Can you hear it on the road ahead? Yeah, we had better go and relieve them. Bring the lorries up! They tell some men to put the dead and wounded at the side of the road. Our medics can yeah. stay behind and clean up the mess. Yeah. When Major Shear and the rest of his column reached the stretch of the road where the four lorries had been ambushed, they were greeted by a pall of black smoke and the crackle of flame. Every one of his trapped men had died by bullet, explosion, or the cold steel of a bayonet. There were several bodies of partisans lying around, too, a fact which alarmed him. At the ambush, two kilometers back, his men had found the bodies of three, which were identified as escaped Russian prisoners of war. Could it have been two separate ambushes, one by the partisans, the other by Ramsden's men? Or had the partisans allied themselves with Ramsden's army of escaped prisoners? The medical officer reports 74 dead and 112 wounded, 32 of them seriously. Ah, it's bad, Lisa, very bad. I shall have to change my tactics. Before we move on, you will have to send out men to clear the road of mines. Yeah, Mayor. Ah, oh, mines. I wonder where they came from. It's dropped by the partisans. Uh, dropped to the partisans by the British and Americans. Mm, we'll know the answer when some of them are dug up. And I want 15 of the half-track gun carriers brought up from the rear strategy. I should have adopted earlier. Five of these half-tracks will keep station half a kilometer ahead of the main column. Yeah, and finally, I want two hourly patrols sent out to scour the hills on either side of the road. Yeah, Herr Mayor. The village of Komasek is less than 12 kilometers ahead. We can burn it as a lesson to these partisans. Burn it when we leave. You will stop there? Yeah, until tomorrow morning. <laughs> no, on second thoughts, we will not burn it. The village will be an ideal place to house the wounded. When you call up HQ, tell them to send field ambulances to evacuate them. What do you wish me to report about, about this? <sighs> the truth, my dear Vesa. Explain we were ambushed by partisans orchestrated by Ramsden's men. List our casualties and say I am advancing to engage the fugitives. They will want an estimate of the enemy force, Herr Mayor. Well, a little exaggeration will do no harm. Uh, tell them about uh, 300. Yeah. We cut them to pieces after regrouping and they fled into the hills. Yeah. That'll satisfy HQ. They prefer to hear about victories in these pressing times, eh? Lieutenant Fraser. 
As you say, Herr Mayor. Right. Shall we get on with it? By the time Captain Saunders caught up with Major Ramsden, his column had advanced 11 kilometers from the village. Dimitri regrouped his own men and the Poles at Komasek, where the villagers were preparing for their second evacuation in three days. He would hold our rear in case the Germans passed right on through the village, hell-bent on revenge for the mauling they'd received. Kovacs was also at the village, his partisan group helping with the evacuation. Hey, you! Kulak! My men did your work for you. What is that, you mad Russian? We killed most of the Germans before they even reached your landmine. You should teach your men to shoot, Dmitry. <laughs> we killed more than 60 of them. All you did was shoot at them from a distance. <laughs> we fought against 6,000, Kulak! You only had to deal with three panic-stricken lorry lords. You call it brave, huh? Anyone can fight from a distance of 300 meters from the enemy. <laughs> it takes a man to fight hand to hand. That's the Russian way, huh? <laughs> Creep up and shoot an enemy in the back, then run like the devil himself is biting your bottom. <laughs> if we were not fighting together, I would bash in your miserable face, Kovac. Huh? Yeah, look at this. What? Your people running like scared rabbits because the Germans are coming. Why don't they stand and fight, huh? Like we did when the Germans came. Don't try to fool me, Dmitri. I know all about your Russian scorched earth policy. The peasants burned their crops and houses and fled like deer before a pack of wolves. No, yeah, because they were ordered to. We Slavs are not stupid. What purpose would be served if we stayed in the village and tried to fight off a battalion of Waffen SS? They would kill us all in a minute and move on as though nothing had happened. <laughs> So you drink some brandy with me, Kulak? If you stop calling me a Kulak, I am not a Russian. <laughs> well, you are not a Russian, I know. Ah, here, one of your women gave me this bottle. Peach brandy. Drink half a bottle, then you have to be sick in order to <laughs> drink the other half. <laughs> it needs the strong stomach of a Slav to digest. <laughs> Come, we can drink it from the bottle. Very yes, sweet, sweet. Maybe I look for some more to take with me to Rajik Path. Huh? I can arrange it. You will need it to take away the dark shadow and silence. <laughs> Is it so bad? I tell you, mad Russian, you will be trapped there by these Germans and die. Then truly it will become the valley of the dead. There is a way out to the sea at the western end. No, Dmitri. And I told your Major Ramsden so. You are doomed if you go under those tall mountain slopes, like the Bulgars were 500 years ago. What happened then? And they fled from the Muslim Turks, also believing there was a way out to the west. 3,000 of them, all fierce fighting men. Not one came out of Rajak alive. It will happen again to you. Now, did you tell this to Major Ramsden? No. Why not? He did not seem interested. He says he has orders to go into Rajak, and these orders will be carried out. Three thousand Bulgar soldiers, you say. There's a lot of men to die at once. I think I'd better tell the British Major about this. It might be better if we fight our way east and meet the Russian army. I do not think the Major will agree. Tell me, Dmitri, are you a communist? Uh, da. Why do you ask? Well, I wondered. People say Russians are only communists because they have to be. Oh, oh, they do. <laughs> are you a Christian, my friend? Yes. Oh, so then you are a Christian because you have to be. <laughs> no, it is the same thing with us. Religion, politics, they all the same thing, Kovac. They dictate a way of life. Neither take into consideration human needs or behavior. Come on, my drink, drink. <laughs> I think Yugoslavia will become communist after the Germans leave. Oh, then watch my cool like friend. The rich will get poorer, and the poor, they get poorer. <laughs> then everybody can be unhappy together. It's a way of life. You are quite a philosopher. <laughs> Come with me. I'll get you some more bottles of peach bran. And we help you to evacuate the village. Several hours later, five German half-track gun carriers came up the stony road and came to a halt in the small village square. The men remained on their squat, ugly vehicles and waited. They had seen so many deserted hill villages before. 
They had also seen ambushes and booby traps before and were cautious. After several minutes passed, two of them moved off and ran round the village's perimeter, their crews carefully studying each building and path in turn. Then they returned to station in the square. A few minutes later, more half-tracks drove into the village, followed by several large lorries. Troops spilled out and began a systematic house-to-house -house search. Major Gunther Scheer chose the schoolhouse for his billet and command post. Orderlies put in a bed and other creature comforts, and then left him alone to brood. He was a much-changed man from the nature lover of seven that morning. said Lieutenant Reza. Heil Hitler. Oh, no. What brought that on? I, uh, I sought you in that kind of mood, Herr Mayor. You know damn well I stopped being in Heil Hitler moods a year ago. Do you still have them? Well, no, not in any. Sit down, sit down, and I'll let you share my depression with me. To be honest, Reza, I feel utterly betrayed. Betrayed? Am I all by who? This damned England are Major Ramsden. He should have known we were only following him. You know yourself, Razor, how I was trying to avoid serious bloodshed. Now see what has happened. They are the enemy, Hemayo. I know, I know. And we shall have to be a lot more aggressive in future. I can't allow myself to be caught like that again. Have the patrols brought in any prisoners yet? Nine, Hemayo. They have scarred three kilometers around Comese. The people must have evacuated early this morning. Probably joined up with Ramsden's column. Yeah. Uh, well, that is their misfortune because from tomorrow I go on the offensive. This Englander wants bloodshed and let it flow. Well, yeah. We will have plenty of time to admire the countryside when it is all over. <laughs> The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dittenfall. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you every day at this time, Monday to Friday, on Springbok Radio. of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. He spent many hours locked in the cottage room with Maria and Joseph before the communist partisan leader, Popche, visited us. I managed to snatch a few hours sleep, and when I awoke, it soon became plain that Maria and Joseph both appeared to be suffering from the shock created by the mock hanging they'd suffered earlier that morning. While Maria tried to maintain some semblance of her usual self-confidence, Joseph was in the throes of deep despair. Lieutenant Paul Sayle. How are you and your friends? I've been impatiently waiting for you to wake up, Popchak. Yes, that is understandable. Are you going to release us now? I thought about it, Lieutenant. I thought about it very deeply. When I fell asleep, uh, I dreamt about it. And? 
<laughs> yes, I will let you go. All of us? I, I have also been thinking of this column of fugitives you want to save before they enter Rajak Pass and become trapped there by the SS. It would not look good on my record if it was in my power to save them and refuse. Yes, you can all go. One of my clerks is making out safe conduct passes for your journey through my territory. Ah, thank you, Popchak. Remember my earlier warning to you, Lieutenant. Do not allow yourself to fall into the hands of that bandit and royalist pig, Caresco. He will never offer you the mercy you are receiving now. I felt the thrill of sudden relief surge through me. Maria had put out her hand and grasped mine as Pavchek was speaking. Joseph sat upright, his eyes fixed on the partisan leader, hardly able to believe what he was hearing. For many hours, Joseph had thought of himself as a dead man. Pavchek and two of his men led us out to the room he was using as a command headquarters. He signed the safe conduct passes and gave them to us. Have a safe journey. It is 90 kilometers to the entrance of Rajak Pass, as you call it. Travel by night across Karesku's territory. Can I have the map Ubak uh, drew up? Ah, yes, the map. Eh? I wanted to keep it as a souvenir of a dear and old friend. Yes, here it is. Let me show you something. Uh -huh. Look, you are here. 20 kilometers to the north, you are in Karesku zone. Mm. Another 30 kilometers... And you're out of it again, if you hurry. I advise you to continue your journey without stopping. We'll do that. And, uh, thanks. Gregory, give them back their weapons and supplies. Yes, comrade. The women have put fresh bread and cheese in your bags, and the water bottles have been filled. I have detailed that man, Gregory, to guide you as far as the river. You're an amazing fellow, Pavchek. One minute you want to execute us, and the next you can't do enough to help. <laughs> <laughs> the supplies your people are sending by air tonight will more than make up for my grievances. Goodbye. May you have a safe journey. As we set out from the large camp of red partisans, I felt stiff from lack of sleep. Joseph and Maria were the same, but we kept on, winding our way through narrow valleys between innumerable low wooded hills. At first, Grigori kept well ahead of us, as though he feared verbal contact. But as the day wore on, he gradually relaxed until we marched together. At one point, we were confronted by a ragged band of heavily armed men. Grigori explained who we were and our passes were produced. The men waved us on and melted back into the landscape. The sun came low on the hills. Our weariness had faded and our energy felt renewed. Paul, oh, I must say what I feel. Say whatever you like, Maria. I know that you and Joseph will disagree, but I think it would be best to avoid Karasku's tragedy altogether. We've already had this out, Maria. You know it'll add more than two days to the journey. But at least we will reach Rajak Pass safely. And too late. See the river? Uh, yes. Where's the bridge? About two kilometers east. We must stay here until it gets dark. Karasku's men will be watching from the opposite bank as far as the bridge. If we climb this hill, you can get a good view. The hill was no more than a hundred meters in height, but from it was a perfect view of the narrow river and the distant stone bridge. As we watched, we were able to see a group of ten men winding their way along the far bank to stand at the bridge. They were well armed and most certainly part of Karesku's partisan army. I hoped they would be gone when it grew dark. While I waited, I wondered about Major Ramsden's force. Was it being hard-pressed or harried by the German SS troops? Or was he managing to outpace them? Lieutenant Fraser, come in here, if you please. Yeah, here, Mayor. I'll close the door behind you. I was debriefing Lieutenant Schmidt, who has just returned from his patrol. Schmidt? Ah. He's the one who penetrated east to confirm the position of the fugitives. Yeah, Herr Mayor. He ran into a group of partisans who were guarding a passage through the valley. 
He lost three men, but he put them to flight. I wonder. Yeah? Do you think it is possible that Major Ramston has taken these partisans as allies? It seems likely. Two separate ambushes within minutes of each other is a difficult coincidence to swallow. If they were not prearranged. And the landmines the partisans used were of British manufacture. Yeah, it does seem likely. Uh, so we could be taking on a larger force than we expected. Sit down, right then. Thank you, Shane. The partisan group must number at least a hundred. That will bring Major Ramsden's force up to three hundred. Two hundred and fifty, Vesa. Remember, he has a lot of women and children from the internment camp in his column. Such a small force, yet they have done us so much damage. <sighs> but I won't give them a chance to ambush again, my dear Vesa. Oh, no. Their desperation gives them strength. Yeah, I will take that into account. But with all that, they are no match for a battalion of dedicated Waffen SS. What did HQ say when you radioed in my report? A clerk in General Ziegler's office said the pursuit must be continued and concluded with all haste. All right. Here's my strategy for tomorrow. Now look at this map. Yeah. Here we are in Komasek. The Englander will be certain to stop for the night, which will place him uh, here. Yeah. Say, uh, 17 kilometers ahead of us. Now look at the contours. They will have hills on either side. I see. Those hills will be their undoing. At nine this evening, you will dispatch three Stormgruppen of 500 men each. Yeah, yeah. The first will occupy the high ground to the north, another to the south. Yeah. The third Stormgruppen will take up a position here at the western end of the valley to prevent the enemy from moving ahead. Yeah, yeah. At first light, Stormgruppen 1 and 2 will open fire on them with machine guns and mortars. They will panic and move forward, so running into Stormgruppen 3. Is that all clear so far, Leutnant? Yeah. They will be hemmed in on three sides. Precisely. An hour before dawn, I will move forward with my main force and roll right through them. By 8 tomorrow morning, they will no longer exist. What do you think, Vesa? They cannot escape. It will be as you say. The enemy will no longer exist. Good. So let us have a drink while we go into the finer details. <laughs> after nine o'clock. Yes, but there is still danger. If you look over by the bridge, you will see a light sometimes flickers. Carisco's men are still there. I have seen it too. Paul, we can follow this side of the river west. No, and then... Maria, no. I won't skirt Carisco's territory. It has to be crossed, and it must be done tonight. If you are careful, it should not be difficult once you have crossed the bridge. If you carry on for half a kilometer, you will come to a narrow stream running north. Follow it all the way. It is very shallow and easy to follow. Do you have anything to fear from Carrasco, Maria? We should all fear Carrasco. Even Pavchek warned you about him. Eh, the man is an ignorant animal. Oh, I know. But we must be aware of him. But I sense that Maria has a better reason than they do. What do you mean, Josef? Since we left Ubak's house, you've tried to stop us from crossing his territory. Because I know the man's reputation. It is as Gregory has told you. He's an ignorant animal, an ex-mountain bandit, a murderer of women and children. All right, Maria, keep calm. I understand. <sighs> Gregory, we can't sit on top of this hill all night. Somehow we must cross that bridge. Perhaps there's a boat we can row across. All the boats are kept on the other side. Eh, very well. Let us get closer to the bridge and see what can be done. We clambered down the hill to the riverbank and silently walked to a place among the trees no more than 50 meters from the old stone bridge. For a while, we watched. In the distance, we heard an occasional voice and a laugh. Sometimes a torch would flash its beam of light across the bridge. One thing was certain. 
Carescu's men had been detailed to guard the bridge. I wondered if they knew of our coming. And if so, how? I think they are watching for you. That's exactly what I was thinking, Grigori. And they're not making a secret of their presence either. It is not usual for them to guard the bridge unless they're expecting an attack from our men. Does it happen often? Uh, not so much in the last few months. The Germans have kept us very busy. The last time was three weeks ago when we crossed the bridge and captured some supplies that had been dropped to them from British planes. Karisko was very angry. He fought in these hills for five days. Ah, you Yugoslavs and your politics. Yeah, we take them very seriously. Yes, I know. And that's what's wrong. I think you'd better keep your voices lower. Yes, voices carry far at night. I think I might be able to help you to cross. How? Do you see that long shadow to the right of the bridge? Oh, the light isn't good, but... Uh, yes, yes. What is it? A low wall. If you can get to it without being seen and take cover, I will fire across the river at the Monarchist Peaks. Well, that'll give us away, and they might just take cover and return your fire. No, you, you don't understand them as I do. Yourself and Maria do. Every Yugoslav has a streak of foolhardy heroism built into his heart. They will know it is only one gun being fired at them, and they will race across the bridge and try to capture me. Some of them may. Gregory is right, Paul. They will all rush over and only realize how impetuous it was later. And if they are chasing after Gregory, we can cross and reach the stream before they come back. With Gregory as a prisoner? <laughs> no one will catch old Gregory, comrades. You sure? I was born not three kilometers from here. I know every hillock and rock. Well, why do you hesitate? All right, let's do it. We'll go one by one. First you, Joseph. And keep to the shadows. Now go on, run. There is little chance of being seen by them. These monarchists gossip like farm wives. Yeah. Right, he's made it. All right, Maria, it's your turn. Right. Well, Gregory, thanks for your help and for the help to come. It will be a pleasure to shoot at them. Now go. I will count to 50 and then open fire from this position. Once again, thanks, Gregory. That's quite a run. That's right. <laughs> we can see the side of the bridge clearly. If they run across, we can shoot them down like mad dogs. Yeah, I know you'd like that, Maria. But just be thankful for the chance to get across. What is Grigori doing? He's finding a place to... Uh, there's your answer. They're shooting back at him. Yes, and he's behind the six of them. And another three behind. Eight over together. More. Everything depends on it, Joseph. watched the eight men run across the bridge to our side. Some of them stopped to fire at the trees to our left, and then they split up and ran along the riverbank and out of sight. We waited for a minute, and then jumped over the wall and onto the bridge. As I ran across it, I expected to be met by a hail of machine gun fire. But old Grigori had been right. They were all playing at heroes. We reached the far side and plunged into a verge of trees. It took a minute to catch our breaths. And then we struck north to find the stream that Glory had told us of. An hour later, we found it. Keep your torch shining downwards on the map, Joseph. That's right. That's right. Now, look. Here's the river. And the bridge is uh, here. Yes, I got it. Uh, now, here. You, you can see the stream very faintly marked. Mm, Gregorian's right. It leads us directly north. Thirty kilometers to go before we're clear of Carescu's gang. I call it a good ten hours walking. Eight in the morning. More than two hours traveling by daylight. That is so, but most of Carrasco's force is concentrated in the south. Yeah, I think we'll be virtually in the clear by dawn. Well, shall we get started? What is it, Vesa? It was for us, Herr Mayor. Oh, I wish HQ would leave us alone. Don't they realize it's nearly midnight? They are uncivilized of them. What was the message? I am to stand by for a special message in the Folksung Code. Oh, one of those. The general must be getting edgy and security conscious. 
You know, Fraser, I'll bet everything I own that the British broke the Folksong Code months ago. Do I have to listen to the confounded noise all night? Nein, Herr Mayor. If you wish me to sit by the receiver wearing headphones... Oh, I'll don't have... bother, Fraser. Here, have another drink. And then I shall go to bed. Tomorrow will be a busy day. With all due respect, Herr Mayor, I think you had better wait for this general's message before you retire. Yeah, yeah, of course. I shall give it an hour. After that, you will have to wake me. You surprise me, Lieutenant Wilson. I do. Mm, so much energy. Don't you ever feel tired? Yeah, but I have trained myself to sleep no more than five hours. Less than eight. I feel like a corpse. By midnight, Joseph, Maria, and I were beginning to feel exhausted. Yet we had to keep going like machines. One foot before the other. One foot before the other. At times, we were able to walk on the bank of the stream. At others, we had to wade, stumbling over moss-covered rocks. Our actions had become so automatic that we became careless. We were wading through ankle-deep water at the time. That sound. That sound did you hear, Paul? No. What sound? It was an owl. It was an owl hoot, but it was a poor one. Please, please, do stop. What are you getting at? It was not a real owl. I think we should take cover for a while. Just a second. Yeah, okay. Let's go into the trees. Joseph. It's Joseph. He's been hit. Quick, run to the side. Hurry, girl. Joseph. Joseph. Oh, I'm here. Quickly, get through the trees. Joseph. It's no good. He's dead. We must hide, Paul. I, I, I don't know. We must. If Carisco's men... Shut up, us. Maria. There are too many of them. We're being fired on from every side. No, Paul. Not again. You don't mean to surrender. If we die playing heroics, so will those people who are marching to Rajik Pass. I refuse. You can stand here, but I'm leaving you. Go then. Go while you've got a chance. Come with me, Paul, please. No. No, I'll keep them busy while you get clear. If you succeed, make for Rajik Pass and warn Major Ramsden. Well, goodbye, Paul. I'll see you. Now move it. I really did love you, Paul. For the love of heaven, go! I watched her fade into the shadows, then walked out into the open beside the stream. I saw several dark shadows of men closing in towards me. I flashed my torch. Identify yourself. Lieutenant Paul Sale of British Military Intelligence. Throw down your weapons and put your hands on your heads. I did as I was told. Rough hands searched me, and then I was marched off. The leader detailed some of the men to go after the one who had escaped. For the second time in two nights, I'd been taken prisoner by our so-called allies. Am I your? Am I your? What is it, Lieutenant? The message from HQ, it has come. Oh, is it so important? Oh, you wouldn't know, would you? I have put it on your desk. Is it a long one? I don't want to spend all night deciphering a lot of political diet. It is a short one, Herr Mayor, and transmitted for your immediate attention. Oh, it must be political then. If it were an urgent military matter, they would leave it until tomorrow. Such is the mentality of our masters. while I finish decoding. Oh, the more I read of it, the crazier it sounds. Or does it? Perhaps someone at HQ has woken up. Shall I pour you a drink, Hemayo? No, I must have my wits about me. Uh, 
GKX, GKX. Yes, I cannot find GKX in the code book. Would you like me to look? 999, nine, nine, the code is confidential. Ah, here it is. Yeah. Uh, Leuten, perhaps one small drink. You will need one as well. Is it so bad, Herr Mayor? It depends on the way I look at it. Briefly, it tells me to call off my pursuit of the escaped prisoners and proceed directly east to Korvesaken. I am to put myself under the command of General Krugel. The voucher? Yeah. That is what his friends call him, anyway. By noon tomorrow, we will have mopped up Major Ramsden's fugitives and... This message is headed urgent, immediate. Now? Are you thinking of calling off the assault? Before I answer that question, I want you to tell me something. Did you acknowledge receipt of this signal? I am to acknowledge after you have deciphered it, Herr Mayor. So, the coded version could have been received by any of my men. Yeah, that is so. Please, go and bring me the Mauser pistol from, from, from beside my bed. What are you going to do, Herr Mayor? You will approve, I hope. Schön. Now, come with me to the radio transmitter. I, I don't see how... What would happen if we were suddenly attacked by the partisans, perhaps even mortared? If this schoolhouse received a direct hit, the radio would be destroyed, would it not? Yeah. If I we... aim this mouse at the radio transmitter and fire so... ...will also be destroyed. Am I correct? Yeah, am I own? Now I cannot receive or send messages, nor do I have any knowledge of the coded signal. You will write a report that at uh, ten minutes after one, we were subjected to a minor attack from Yugoslav terrorists. They were quickly dealt with. Unfortunately, our radio equipment was destroyed and the operator killed. Yeah, I, w I will do it here, Mayor. But I don't understand how this... Will... I want you to send a patrol ahead with instructions for the storm Gruppen to return without making contact with the enemy. You will yeah. have to do it immediately while there's still time. Yeah, Herr Mayor. You still look puzzled, Lieutenant Weser. Think. We are ordered to a front which the Russians are rolling back like an old carpet. If we destroy Major Ramsden's people, I am duty-bound to return to HQ. However... If we continue with my original plan of merely shadowing them to Rajak Pass, it could take many days, even weeks, before I succeed in getting their surrender. And the signal was never received? Oh, it was received, certainly. Unfortunately, the man who received it was killed in the terrorist attack. Ah. And now that we have no direct communication with HQ, I am continuing to carry out my original orders. Which is better for us all, Lieutenant. The Yugoslav countryside or facing the Bolshevik hordes? The answer is obvious, Herr Mayor. Let me send your orders ahead to the storm group. The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans... Produced by Yolan Dotman and directed by Henry Dippenthal. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting and brought to you on Springbok Radio.
Every day at this time, we bring you dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense. From the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. The second time in 24 hours, I found myself a prisoner of the Yugoslav partisans. Joseph had been killed, and Maria had managed to run off into the darkness. I was alone and being led into the headquarters of the monarchist partisans, led by the homicidal megalomaniac Karescu, a former hill bandit turned politician. I'd received many warnings about the danger of falling into his hands, so I was fearful of what the next few hours would hold. It was beginning to get light when I was taken into the small hill village, a place that had seen little change in perhaps five or six centuries. After being roughly thrust down the steps of a cellar, the trap door was dropped, leaving me in complete darkness. Feeling around the stone walls, I felt the shape of a straw pallias in a corner. I lay down on it and pondered my grim future and the fate of Major Ramsden's column of fugitives, which I'd been assigned to divert from the entrance of Rajek Pass. think we have. Oh, it's you, Captain Saunders. What kind of a cryptic message is this? Well, I was going to call you an hour ago, but Dimitri stopped me. Oh, stop being so bloody vague. What problem do you have that you don't have? Well, I'll start at the beginning. Uh, wonderful idea. I'm waiting. Dimitri's patrol spotted two large groups of Germans. Hmm? They were overtaking us, but keeping to the high ground. Outflanking us? How many? About five to six hundred men in each group. Oh, I can slice us up That's like a... That's not all, sir. Lieutenant Brzezinski reported that his patrol saw another large group of Germans digging in ahead of us. The same number? Yeah. Damn it all. Why didn't you call me earlier? What time is it? Uh, just after three, Major. But take it easy. It isn't as bad as it seems. Oh, we're coming to the, the problem that isn't bit. Well, yeah, you could say that. Before calling you, I put all the men on full alert. Sent out more patrols to keep a close watch on the enemy's activity. And meanwhile, I'm lying here dreaming of my garden and, uh, and a wife I haven't seen for four years. So, well, just before I called you, something funny happened. Like, well, the crowd started pulling back again. Uh, no, look, I, I don't believe all this. You tell me the Germans have us completely surrounded, and now you add that they're retreating again. That's right, Major. Look, we're dealing with a Waffen SS, Captain Saunders, not a troop of Boy Scouts. How do you know that they're pulling back again? Both Dmitri and Brzezinski saw it themselves. The Krauts were digging in three miles down the valley, and then they formed up and marched off, abandoning the positions. Which way? The way they came, back into our rear. There has to be a logical reason why... The patrols are shadowing them. Another funny thing, they came in silently to avoid observation. But now they're marching out as though they don't give a damn. Smoking, talking, no precautions at all. How extraordinary. I was wondering. I mean, the war wouldn't be over, would it? <laughs> That's a thought. Yeah, maybe Hitler has seen the writing on the wall and given up. I mean, even a hard nose like him must know he can't win now. <laughs> yes, a very intriguing thought, Sanders. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Well, if the war is really over, maybe the Krauts will drive over and tell us when it gets light. Do you think so? Why not? Wouldn't it be a feather in our caps if we went there and accepted their surrender? <laughs> a very intriguing thought, Captain Saunders. Yeah, even more intriguing if the war wasn't over. Damned embarrassing, eh? Yeah. All the same, it wouldn't do any harm to pop over there under a flag of truce and find out what's going on. A few cleverly put questions should do the trick.
Heaven knows how I managed it, but I fell into a sleep in that dark cellar. Not even the rustling of the rats disturbed me. I must have been down there for some three hours when the trap door was raised. It is, man. Uh, yes? What do you want? Como? Where are you taking me? To General Carescu. I was marched out of the small building into a larger whitewashed house. Outside every door and window stood partisan guards in pairs. It was Carescu's headquarters. The room I was shown into was austere, just a desk and several chairs. I was pushed into a chair and told to wait. The man who'd led me there stood outside the door. After several minutes had dragged by, I heard approaching footsteps, and the guard in the doorway jumped to attention. I am told you are an Englishman. And you are General Carescu? Yes. And that is the only question I am prepared to answer. Identify yourself. I'm Lieutenant Paul Sale, British Military Intelligence. My superior officer told me you'd be prepared to render me assistance. Did he? What is his name? Colonel Egan. Ah, yes. He's a man who expects miracles for the few supplies he sends us for our fight against the Germans and communists. Well, there's uh, been a lot of German air activity which has caused many delays. And for the same reason, I've been sent overland rather than dropped by air. You were told by Colonel Egan to contact me? If I felt it were necessary. And do you? In my present situation, yes. With the help of the communists, you evaded my guards at the bridge. Strange behavior for a man who wishes to make contact. At that time, it wasn't necessary. I had two guides. Your men ambushed us and shot one. The other escaped. Maria Wezek did not escape. What? No. The young woman was captured an hour after you. She killed five and wounded three of my men before she ran out of ammunition. <sighs> my men report she was taken a moment before she tried to commit suicide. With a knife, Lieutenant, she tried to cut her own throat. Mm -hmm. Ugly, don't you think? A very strange behavior for a so-called ally. What was she afraid of, Lieutenant? Better still, what were you afraid of? Now, look, my assignment is desperately urgent. When she knew I'd been taken, it was up to Maria to escape to the north and complete it. But why attempt suicide? Well, I... I don't really know. Perhaps she was frightened. Oh, yes, the young woman is frightened. So frightened that so far she has refused to speak a single word. I find this very suspicious. There's nothing suspicious in our activities, General. My assignment is to head north for... You this... are bound for the place you call Rajak Pass. You know? Your intelligence services told me by radio to expect your passage through my territory. They asked me for to offer you safe conduct. Oh, well, that's a relief. I know also of your Major Ramsden and his force of escaped prisoners of war and how they are marching into a trap from which they cannot escape. Well, then you'll understand how soon I've got to get back on the road. Yes, yes, and I would normally be prepared to let you go now without another moment's delay. I would even offer you an armed escort all the way to Rajak. But no... There is a mystery to be solved before I can do that. I want to know why Maria tried to kill herself. And you will stay here until I find out the truth. I told you, Maria was frightened. She was nearly hanged by Pubcheck, and after such a close escape, she was faced with being captured again. I see. So Pavchek was ready to hang her. <laughs> Interesting. Would you care to tell me why? Well, there's no point in keeping it a secret. When we landed, we were to contact an old man called Ubak. He put us up. Karescu seemed so different to what I'd been led to expect. I told him the whole story from where we'd landed. He smoked and listened intently. Through the small window, I could see the sky beginning to lighten as the sun rose behind the wooded hills. As I talked, about 60 kilometers to the north, 
Major Ramsden and Captain Saunders were setting out along the rutted, dusty track towards the small village of Comasek. I should have my head red, Major. Why? For following you. You, you Britishers are crazy. What makes you think the SS are going to take any notice of a white shirt dangling from an umbrella? Well, it's rather obvious, which is how I want it to be. Where did you find the umbrella, anyhow? Well, one of the ladies lent it to me, uh, Mrs. Carlyle. Yeah, well, I'm surprised you're not wearing a pinstripe suit and a bowler hat. Oh, I doubt if the enemy would take my city clothes very seriously. Uh, I give up. Hello? Not that voice. Oh, no, it's Lady Agnes. Look, keep walking. Pretend you haven't heard. She's running behind us. Oh, damn it all. What does she want? Major, wait for me. If the crowd see her, it'll frighten them all together. The woman's a menace. <sighs> I suppose we'd better wait and see what she has to say. Well, I don't know what I'm more scared of. The crowds or Lady Agnes? A lady any time. Oh, Major... I thought I was never going to catch up. Madam, uh, do you realize what we're about? Oh, don't be silly. Of course I do. Mrs. Carlyle told me. Going to talk to the Germans, indeed. Do you wish us to convey your compliments to them? Is that why you're here? Compliments? Oh, I want to give them a piece of my mind. When I think of all the indignities I suffered as an internee, my, my goodness, I told them. I tell them what I thought of them, and I'm not going to miss this chance. Lady Agnes, please, you can't come with us. I am not one of your minions. Just you try and stop me. I have to do my duty, Major. What duty? As spokesman for these poor women and children back there. They have a right to be heard, too. <laughs> I finished telling Carescu about our journey. He sat for a long time, silent and thoughtful. In fact, he lit and smoked a whole cigarette before speaking. This woman, she gave a very poor excuse for shooting Obak, almost as though she had another motive. How do you mean? Is it possible she betrayed you to the Germans so that they could be waiting at your landing point? I, I don't think so. She could have been killed as well. Fanatics don't care about being killed as long as their cause is being served. How did she behave when the Germans opened fire? Um, let me see. Yes, the shooting started. It was a bit wild at first. Joseph and I ran from the jetty and hid in the long grass. Maria joined us a few minutes later. She did not run when you did. Not at first. Her reaction was slow. You mean she deliberately held back? Then when she discovered Ubek was an important agent for the Allies, she found an excuse to kill him. <laughs> Lieutenant, the woman is working for the Germans. Where is Maria now? Being interrogated. Korpek is a very thorough man. Few prisoners can withstand his methods. I think she will be happy to tell us the truth before long. And meanwhile, precious time is being lost. Yes, is it not strange? Women spend most of our lives stopping women from talking. <laughs> this one won't utter a single word. Oh, I must have dropped off by a few minutes. It was a late night. What are you looking so excited about? A very strange thing, Herr Mayor. One of the patrols report two men and a woman approaching the village from the direction of the fugitives. Two men and a woman? Do you think they want to surrender? <laughs> I hope not. You know how awkward that would be. In four days, we could be trying to hold out on the eastern border against a screaming horde of Russian troops. No, if they want to talk terms for surrender, I must refuse. How can we refuse? I shall tell them they must fight or run. Even if their surrender is unconditional? Whatever they say, the game must be played on for as long as possible. Just think of those Bolshevik hordes, Faisal. As fast as you shoot one, another ten pop up and shoot back. 
Yeah. Believe me, they are chasing escaped prisoners through this beautiful countryside. It's far preferable. Yeah, I agree, Herr Mayor. Do you wish to meet this deputation? Uh, no. Take a small patrol and meet them yourself. Bring them here to the schoolhouse. Oh, yeah, tell Gruber to clear away the dirty glasses and make my bed. Yeah, we are. can't have the place looking untidy, can we? And uh, hide the bullet holes I put through the radio. Yeah, Mayor. Well, you think the Yugoslavs would have done something about these so-called rogues? They're absolutely disgraceful. Hey, look ahead, Major. Krauts in black uniforms. Ah, yes. At last. I thought this walk was never going to end. Hold your brolly high, Major. We don't want them shooting at us. I know what to do, madam. That white shirt you have tied to it is filthy. Honestly, Major Ramsden, I'm sure you could have found something cleaner. I'm not here to advertise washing soap. The shirt is clearly white. That's an officer leaving them. Walking forward on his own. Do you want me to go and meet him? Indeed not. We'll stand here and let him come to us. Yeah. Straighten up, Saunders. Oh. And for heaven's sake, stop grinning like a Cheshire cat. Look at him. Typical Nazi. I'm tempted to snatch that brolly and give him a good hiding with it. Oh, just look at the arrogance. Don nearly lost the war, yet still they strut about as though they own the world. I trust you'll take him down a peg or two, Major. Lady Agnes, please let me do the talking. Well, certainly. As long as you say the right things. Stay where you are. I intend to. I you may approach. Identify yourselves. Major Clifford Ramsden of His Majesty's Royal Artillery. I wish to talk to your commanding officer. Who are you? Captain Martin Sanders, U.S. Army Air Force. Both of you are escaped prisoners, yeah? I repeat, I wish to see your commanding officer. Who is the woman? I am Lady Agnes Collier, young man. And you will kindly address me with respect. Uh, Mayor Ramsden, my commanding officer is Mayor Shear. He is waiting to see you at his headquarters in Comasse. Please follow me. I must have been talking to Karescu for well over an hour before he suddenly stood up, excused himself and left. The door remained open and a guard stood outside. Karescu returned a few minutes later. He wore a frown, which I took as a danger signal. I have been to see the woman. She still remains silent. Uh, let me talk to her. Perhaps she thinks my mission must be kept from you, and maybe... She, she... knows we have all this information. Just taken a lot of punishment, but will say nothing about herself. Your other companion, the man who was shot, Yosef, he was a genuine patriot. I've had people checking on their identities. Yosef's past is known. For the woman, Maria, her past is like a stone wall. I was told she escaped from the concentration camp with Joseph. Uh, that we have established. I am interested in what Maria was doing before. Was she with a partisan group, as she told you? Or was she placed into the concentration camp as a spy? Look, I, I'm sure there's a much simpler explanation for her silence. Can I talk to her? You are concerned for her safety? Yes, I am. Perhaps you are in love with her. She is very beautiful. Uh, no, no, I'm not in love with Maria. But she says she's in love with me. Ah, a one-sided love affair. The worst kind. Have you been close to her? Made love to her? Uh, well, yes. I see. Yes, yes, you can talk to her. Thank you, General. Do not thank me yet, Lieutenant. You may learn things you do not want to know. Karescu accompanied me out of the room and outside to a small cottage. In what had once been the kitchen-come-living room, I saw Maria. She was stretched out naked on a wooden table, her limbs secured by cord running beneath the table. Her head hung over one end, and a cord was about her neck, from which hung a wooden pail. A man was slowly filling it with water, which gradually increased the pressure on her neck. Her eyes were firmly clamped shut. I gasped with horror at the sight. That is enough for the present, Kordbeck. I think you are losing your skill. Hurry, untie the woman. She will fight. Not when she sees our visitor. Now hurry, Kordbeck. Here, 
Throw this blanket over her for the sake of decency. General Carrescu, how could you allow this to be done to a woman? Have you seen what the Germans do? This is not a war for the squeamish, Lieutenant. All right, Corpet, come outside and leave the Englishman with his woman. For a moment, I stared at Maria in horrified silence. She sat on the edge of the table, a dirty brown blanket draped over her. She looked back at me, her eyes dull and resigned. I went to her and put my arms on her shoulders. Maria. So they did not shoot you. Carrescu knows all about our assignment. Why did you stay silent? I was not questioned about the assignment. They want to know about me. Who I am, where I came from. I will never tell them. Why not, Maria? Carrescu told me you tried to kill yourself. Yes, I was too slow. A knife snagged in my shirt and I... Why, Maria? Why? That's what aroused Carrescu's suspicions. Paul, I begged you not to come into this territory. Had we gone a few kilometers to the west, there would have been little danger. What are you hiding, Maria? Is what Carrescu thinks true? Yeah. How would I know what he thinks? He thinks you're a Nazi sympathizer. A spy for them. Yes, I thought so. Sooner or later, that man, Korpek, will break me. He knows how to do it. His present methods of torturing me are only games for his own pleasure. What are you saying? That Caresco is right. Paul, I am working for the Germans. What? For two years now. Oh, no. Maria... How? Why? How long have they given you to speak to me? Until I call outside. Then there is time. Paul, I worked for the Germans because I thought it was for Yugoslavia's good. You see for yourself how confused the politics are here. The Germans came and I thought they would bring order and discipline. You were wrong. No. Order would have come in time. They talked me into spying for them, which I did gladly. I spied on two parties and groups until I became known. Then I went into a concentration camp to spy. It was hard. They hated it. The Germans arranged for me and Joseph to escape together because he was a known agent for the Allies. So you arranged the ambush when we landed? Yes. And Dubak? I did my duty. But I really did want to see you get through to Rajek. After our time together at Ubak's house, I, I could not betray you. Maria, I, I'm shaking all over. You will have to let go of me, Paul. There is no way my life can be saved. It is the way of going that frightens me. What do you mean? Their way of killing a traitor is so slow and so terrible I cannot bear to tell you. It will be my end unless you help me. I know I don't deserve your help, Paul, but please do this last thing for me. What do you mean? The rope. Strangle me with it. Oh, Maria. If you can't, can't then, then guard the door and give me a few minutes to hang myself. No. Paul, for the love of heaven, I beg you, don't let them put me to death in their own way. You would never forgive yourself for refusing me. For you some ice cold water after your long walk. Uh, yes, please. I think you're being altogether too polite, Major Ramsden. Eh? It's time you told this miniature Hitler what you think of him in his third Reich. Please, Lady Agnes, will you leave this to me? If the good lady thinks she can antagonize me with the name of Adolf Hitler, she's sadly mistaken. He's a person for whom I hold very little esteem. And that applies equally to my adjutant, Lieutenant Weser. Now, may I ask why you have come here, Major Ramston? It is not customary for a Waffen-SS officer to negotiate with escaped prisoners of war. Do you still believe that you can win this war? You have come so far to ask me this? Tell him straight, Major. Tell him to take his black uniform butchers away from here before they get butchered. Lady Agnes, for the last time... May I take it you are not here to discuss terms of surrender? That's exactly what we're here for. Major Ramston, 
I am not empowered to consider any terms for your surrender. They would have to be... Listen to him. That is an insult. I'll have you know, we are here to discuss your surrender, not ours. Oh, no. Lieutenant Fraser. Diario. Bring me a bottle of cognac. I think this river water has gone to my head. The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Diffenthal. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. Would you rather have me punished by suffering a terrible, lingering death at the hands of Carisco's men? Do you want me to describe what they will do to me? No, Maria. There must be another way. I, I can plead for your life. Like you did with Pavchik. Oh, no, Paul. These people will show me no mercy. I'll say that my mission depends on you. They know differently. Paul, face up to it as I have. I am dead. And it's the way I have to die that concerns me. I have been a traitor, even to you. But do me this last favor. The rope, Paul. No, no, I, I can't do it. Then watch the door and let me do it myself. A minute, perhaps less, and it is all over. Please, Paul, go and stand at the door. Maria, listen to me. I, 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 uh, no, Maria, I can't let you do it. Let me go. Don't let them do it to me. There's another way. There is not. There can't be. Come back. Come back. the woman. Tie her down again. No. 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 Tigress until the door burst open and Carescu and his henchmen ran into the room. Corpec hit her hard while Carescu held me from behind, trying to pull me out of the door. Through watery eyes, I saw Maria go limp and fall across the table. Corpec heaved the rest of her up and began tying her down into the position she'd been when I'd first come into the cottage. I felt the cold muzzle of Carescu's gun at my ear, and he pulled me outside, kicking the door closed. She tried to kill herself again, yes? Yes, for fear of what you will do to her. The same reason why she tried to kill herself the first time. <laughs> she kills others very efficiently, but is an abysmal failure at suicide. Come, we shall go back to my headquarters. And leave that animal to continue the torture? Yes. You're as inhuman as he is. Yes, I have no pity for traitors. She worked two years for the Germans and sent many people to their deaths. She killed five of my men only a few hours ago. What kind of mercy does she expect? She says you will kill her slowly. Our punishment for traitors and collaborators? Yes. She will die slowly and painfully. My people will demand it. Now come. I will make arrangements for my men to take you north to Rajek. Meanwhile, to the east of Rajek Pass, the bizarre meeting under a flag of truce between Major Ramsden and Waffen-SS Major Scheer had reached a strange impasse 
when Lady Agnes Collier had demanded that the Germans surrender to Major Ramsden's small force of escaped prisoners of war and internees. The cognac, there, sir, quickly. Ralph. Now, really, yeah, Lady yeah. Agnes, you must leave this discussion to me. I would. If you said the right things, Major, the Nazis are losing the war on three fronts. How dare they even suggest that we surrender to them? Such conceited audacity. I tell you, Mr. Churchill, we'd have an apoplectic fit. Madam, I was horrified at the thought of your coming to this meeting. You claimed it was to represent the women and children in my column, but now you're trying to negotiate the virtual capitulation of the entire Third Reich. Now, please, may we have some order? Vesa, you cannot serve cognac like that. Bring the proper cognac glasses. By bringing about the downfall of Hitler and his nasty bunch of gangsters, I am serving the interest of those poor women and children. As for that American fellow you brought with you, he hasn't said a word since we came into this room. Perhaps the lady would like some of this fine cognac. <laughs> Stolen from the French, I'll be back. Yeah, but it is of fine quality. Please try it. I'll die first. Major Ramsden, would you object if we spoke in private? Lieutenant Fraser will attend to matters here. I feel sorry for him. But, uh, yes, I think a private discussion would be more fruitful. Hmm. No underhand deals, Major. I think that must be left to my discretion, Lady Agnes. I suggest you drink the cognac. If you don't, some German will. At least you'll be depriving him of the pleasure. Major Ramsden, we are enemies, but that does not prevent us from behaving in a civilized manner, man to man. I agree. However, your Waffen SS has hardly earned the reputation of such behavior. There have been excesses, yeah, I must admit so. But I am not of that mold. Twice your people have fought effective rearguard actions against me, actions which have led to heavy losses in men and equipment. But I am not a man who seeks revenge. With my force of 6,000 men, I could have swallowed your entire column without effort, but I have not done so. Answer me one question, Major. Is the war over? The war finished? Nein, I have not heard so. A strange question, is it not? I had a good reason for asking. My radio is out of commission, and the behavior of your men last night led me to, well, believe hostilities are ended, or very close to it. <laughs> ah, so your men were spying on us, eh? You had us in a trap, Major, yet you pulled out. There seemed to be no other explanation. Yeah. The intention was to overwhelm you. But something cropped up which made me change my mind. I decided to withdraw my men and continue the pursuit. Why? I wonder, should I tell you? Uh, let me put it like this. If you and your group escaped to the sea, what would happen to you? Well, for my part, I'd be given a week's leave and then placed back on active service. Yeah. You will be back in the fights but on the winning side. But if I bring the fight between us to a rapid conclusion, I and my men will be sent east to fight the Russians. Mm. Rather you than me, Major Scheer. Yeah. So you see my dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you could always follow Lady Agnes's suggestion and surrender to us. We are Germans, not Italians. We are soldiers, not opera singers. So what's the alternative? I continue to pursue you at a respectable distance of, say, ten kilometers. We can have perhaps a few patrol skirmishes, but no more. That way, both our honors as soldiers will be preserved. What a damn fine idea, Major. You are making for Rajak Pass, yeah? Well, I suppose that's pretty obvious by now. You will be bottled up inside because there is no way out to the west. Our people seem to think differently. If they are wrong, you will be trapped. I would not be able to withdraw to let you out again. I would be forced to fight my way out. Yeah. And if you happen to know a weak spot in my lines, it would be easy, yeah? What would you do then, Major Amston? Head for the sea south of Dubrovnik. Which would give me many more days of pursuit. Perhaps as long as two weeks, if you moved very slowly. And when we reach the sea? Ah. Now, there lies a problem. Can you offer a solution? An easy one. We leave by sea, 
and you arrive three hours too late to prevent us. Yeah. This would take altogether six or seven weeks. I wonder how the war situation will have changed in that time. It could be all over. Major Sher, everything we've talked about rather boggles my mind. To put it in a nutshell, we make a gentleman's agreement not to attack each other in any degree of force, and I continue my march to the sea with your battalion following ten kilometers behind. Yeah. Can we agree on that? With pleasure. All that troubles me is our departure from the coast. Will you let us go in peace? On that point, I can give no guarantee. When the time comes, I might feel honor-bound to demand your surrender. In that event, I will feel honor-bound to fight you. Then we are in agreement, yes? Yeah? It's to my advantage, so yes. Will you shake hands with an SS officer? To seal an agreement like this, gladly. If he's made any kind of deal whatsoever with these monsters, he shall personally report the matter to the war office. Uh, if you get the opportunity, Lady Agnes. Oh, I'll find a way. Hey, you, young man, form a small cognac. Yeah, Lady Agnes. I, I must say this. You're a lot more polite than those guards I had in the internment camp. Oh, swine they were. Called me woman. They did. Uh, can you imagine it? Oh, that was their way. Keep the prisoners humiliated. Mm. Lieutenant Fraser, arrange for a half track to take our guests back to their lines. Yeah, ma'am. The white flag displayed on the radio antenna. Oh, yeah, and uh, put a case of cognac on it with my compliments. That's very kind of you, Major Sher. What has happened? Are we suddenly friends? Nothing has changed, Lady Agnes. Oh, it's still at war. Yes, we're still at war. One of my group leaders, Anton Georgios, will take you to Rajak. He will take 12 men with him. Why so many? You will have to pass two major roads which are used by the Germans. You could run into trouble. Now, look, General, I can't sit here discussing the future when a woman I know is being tortured to death only a few yards away. Ah, put her out of your mind. She's gone, dead. Not yet. By tomorrow night, she will be. Can't you show her some mercy? No, it is out of the question. Well, why is it necessary to torture her now? You know she was working for the Germans. But she was not yet admitted her guilt. When she does, the torment will stop. Well, at least until the time for her execution. Look, do one favor for me, General Carescu. Let her die quickly. A bullet. Uh, it is an honorable death. She dies as a traitor to her people. Does it make any difference to you? Yes, and please remember, I'm doing you a very great favor by giving you an escort to your destination. There is a limit to what I'm prepared to do. Have you no pity for her? <laughs> None. She's like a wasp that has stung my nose. Forget the woman, Lieutenant. Instead, think of your mission. You know, the extent of a people's civilization can be easily judged by the way they treat their prisoners. You insult me by that remark. You insult yourself by your own behavior, General Carescu. It is in my power to subject you to the same treatment as the woman. I know. And by doing so, you'd insult yourself and your people even more. Nobody has ever spoken to me like that. And because they've been too afraid. Are you not afraid of me, Englishman? I'm shaking all over, but I must speak the truth. The truth? What is the truth? The truth is only what a man wants to believe. Exactly. Which is why you believe that torture can be performed by men of honor. But you know, it's not the truth. Torture is just an expedient way of interrogating or punishing the helpless. It's easy and, to some people, pleasurable. Do you think I take pleasure in this? It's possible. No. If her punishment is death, then a bullet will do it quickly and efficiently. Anything worse than that can only be barbaric. Ah, you use that word. Many years ago, they used to call me the barbarian. By your enemies? Yes, the police. It wasn't meant to be a compliment. No, that is true. But you live up to it. Englishman, your tongue is running far too loose. I'm telling you the truth. Ah, so we are back to that day. Tell me another truth, Englishman. Are you still shaking? All over. <laughs> Seems that Corpac has made her open her mouth at last. Yes, Carrasco, you are a barbarian. You don't know any better. Is she? 
Yes, General. Tell Corbett to stop. I want her ready for execution immediately. General. Well, that's some small mercy. It is a very great mercy, Lieutenant, because she will die in the way you have asked. A bullet through the back of her head. I will even spare her the indignity of digging her own grave. Well, I suppose I must say thank you. Thank me after you have fired the fatal bullet. I stared at Karescu in horrified astonishment, half hoping he was just testing me out. But he wasn't. Are you ready to object? If you do, I will countermand the order and the punishment will continue as before. Well, what do you say? If I must, then I will. It will be done under the tree outside. Korpek will come when she is ready. When I went outside with the partisan leader, I saw Maria standing alone in the shade of a gnarled old tree. A few of the partisans had gathered round, and from their mutterings I guessed they felt cheated by the means chosen for Maria's death. I paused, staring at her face. It was now bruised, and there were dark rings under her eyes. And yet she stood straight. Her dark hair was now piled high in a bun on top of her head. It had been done to make it easier for the executioner, me. Karescu nudged me. Here, take my gun. Two shots only. I, I don't think I can. For her sake, you will. Go, do it now. I looked at the gun, a German Luger pistol. I checked it, instinctively playing for time. But I knew it was useless to prolong the agony. I slowly walked towards Maria. And when she saw me approaching, she realized the truth. Her eyes lightened, and a thin smile came to her bruised lips. You will be my executioner, Paul. It, it was this or the other way. You talked Caresco into showing me this mercy? It was difficult. I will die with a prayer for you on my lips, darling. Oh, don't, Maria. You make it harder for me. No. All what you do now for me is wonderful. It is an escape from terror. The only kind of escape possible for me. And I would rather you fire the bullet than any other man alive. Be done with it, Englishman. I don't know what to say, Maria. A small farewell kiss will help. Now, I will turn my back. Count to ten, and my prayers will be finished. Maria. Now. Shoot her, man. Now, Paul, now. Ah. Again. The female partisans picked up Maria's body and carried it away. You did her a great favor, my friend. Yes. I know it was not easy for you. I'll have nightmares about these moments. Would she have had nightmares about the killing of Ubak, of the five men she killed earlier this morning, or the poor people she betrayed in the concentration camp? I know it's impossible to justify what Maria did, but she sincerely believed she was doing it for her country. A traitor's excuse. Let me arrange for your escort. Your time is running out. A German half-track bumped along the narrow trail towards the tail end of Major Ramsden's tiny ragtag army. They saw a group of their Russian rear guards stand up from behind their cover to watch them pass. The sight of them rang alarm bells in the Major's mind. He asked the German driver to stop. Why are we stopping here? It's a long walk. It's all right, Lady Agnes. Don't upset yourself over nothing. Captain Saunders... I want you to pop over to our Russians and stay with them until this half-track has safely passed again. Yeah, but why, Major? Do you think that... I'm gonna... damn sure they'll shoot it up on the way out. <sighs> I want you to see it doesn't happen. You know what they're like. Okay. I hope Dimitri's with them. He's the only one who can properly understand English. Then you'll have to make do with sign language. Yeah. Initiative, Captain. Make use of it. I wish you would practice what you preach, Major. I'll see you later, Saunders. Driver, you may continue. Well, Lieutenant Fraser, 
What do you think of my arrangement with the English major? You don't look as happy as I feel. May I speak the truth, Herr Mayor? You always do, Weser. That is why you are my adjutant. Yeah, sit down and speak your mind. Did that English milady leave much cognac? The bottle is here under the table. Yeah, she can drink a lot. It was her way of getting revenge on us, so I understand. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Well, Lieutenant. Theoretically, the arrangement is good, Rio, but so many things can go wrong. For example? We have an excuse that the radio is out of commission and cannot receive fresh orders. But headquarters will certainly send messengers and probably a new radio. Yeah, we will have to worry about that when the time comes. What else? Major Ramsden has nothing to gain by attacking us, but he has been joined by a partisan group. Do they follow his orders? If they don't, he will have to deal with them. Next problem. If indeed Mayor Ramsden cannot get out of Rayek Pass to the west, you will arrange for him to break through our lines and head northwest to the coast. Yeah? Correct. So? The 9th Panzer Group is stationed just south of Dubrovnik. They will wipe out Major Ramsden and his fugitives. Hmm. The ninth Panzer's true. Mm. I had overlooked them. In that case, Major Ramsden will have to take a chance with them, won't he? Which is no chance. Yeah. I wonder, should I warn him? I suggest only when it becomes necessary. <laughs> yeah, the decent thing to do, as the English would say. Uh, pour me some cognac, razor, and some for yourself. Yeah, Major. Can you see any other problems? I do have a question, Herr Mayor. Go on. If British intelligence is correct, and the fugitives do find a way out of Rajak Pass to the west, will you go in pursuit? Yeah, of course. But I don't think we need worry about that. There is only one entry and exit from Rajak. You can be certain of it, Razor. May I now tell you why I came here? Why? I thought you came to join me in a lunchtime cognac. What is it? One of our patrols has brought in a prisoner. A prisoner? Oh, ho! Oh. Iron crosses all round, Vesa. What is he, a partisan or one of Ramston's men? Neither, Hermione. Or he is an English. He is an escaped prisoner of war. Was he armed? With a pistol, Hermione. Hmm. <sighs> well, he should be shot, of course, but no. Send him ahead. I'm sure Major Ramston can use the extra help. I think he should be interrogated first. For any particular reason? He is well-dressed and well-fed, Herr Mayor. I have a feeling that he could be part of another group of fugitives. Yeah, uh, interesting conjecture, Weser. Yeah, have him brought here. Ah, uh, nine. Let us enjoy some lunch first. Yeah. Gruber, bring in the food. Apologize for the delay, Lieutenant, but there's been a complication in our arrangements. Soon after dawn, a German attack was made near Vesili. And less than an hour ago, Pavchek's men attacked in force across the bridge. It makes a man wonder whether Pavchek and the Germans are working in collusion against me. I don't believe it. Why? Pavchek had a heavy engagement with the Germans the day before yesterday. He badly defeated them. Ah, yes, I did hear something about it. So the victory has gone to his head, and he thinks he can do the same against me. As for the Germans, well, perhaps they are just trying to scare us back into the hills with a show of strength. How does this affect my situation? I can't give you the escort I promised. Anton Georgios is one of my best commanders. The best I can offer is a reliable guy. Well, that'll do fine, as long as we have a promise of safe conduct from you. That will be done. When can I leave? It will take her half an hour to get ready and say goodbye to her parents. My guide's a woman? Anton's sister, Violetta Georgios, a very courageous girl. Last year, she overwhelmed a machine gun position and killed five German soldiers. All by herself, mind. <laughs> you are the most fortunate of men, Lieutenant. Few men would refuse to spend the night alone in the woods with Violetta. 
but none have dared for fear of our brother. All I want is to reach Rajik Pass before Major Ramsden. Which brings me to another point, Lieutenant. Your oh. task is to divert this English Major from Rajik, and that's all? Yes, yes, I have to pass on an order for them to swerve northwest to the coast south of Dubrovnik. Because there is no way out to the coast from Rajik? Yes. British intelligence made an error when they sent their last signal to Major Ramsden. They did not. I beg your pardon? If we had spoken of this 30 minutes ago, I would have agreed that there is no way through Rajek. But I would have been wrong. Are you telling me there is a way through? When I instructed Violetta to take you to Rajek, she told me she and her family once lived high on the slopes of Rajek. Yes, there is a way through. But it is known only to a very few of the hill people. Violetta is one. You mean she can guide us through? She says it will be a very difficult journey, but yes, I will order her to guide you to the coastal plain. Oh, I can't believe it. This is the first good thing that's happened since I left Italy. <laughs> ah, my good friend, you will find traveling with Violetta a very good thing. I don't think you need have fear of her brother. Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Diffenthal. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. of excitement, romance, and suspense. From the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. Soon after telling me I was free to go on my way, the partisan commander Carescu brought to me the promised guide, Violetta Georgios. She stood in front of me and smiled coyly. For my part, I blinked back in astonishment. But for her rough peasant clothes, I could have easily mistaken her for a schoolgirl, rather than a woman who had single-handedly assaulted a German machine gun post and killed its occupants. But she was a beauty who would have done justice to a cinema screen. Her long, dark hair fell loosely about an oval face and across her shoulders. Round, innocent, hazel eyes twinkled at me. But her beauty was offset by the Russian-made submachine gun which was slung over one shoulder and the German Luger automatic at her hip. And I had no doubt she was expert in their use. My commander has ordered me to guide you to Rajik Pass. Uh, yes. And over the mountain goat track which leads down to the coastal plain. I was very relieved when Carescu told me you know the route. Uh, no one was sure it even existed. It exists, but very few know of it. My family lived high on the slopes when I was small. Mm -hmm. My father used to take Anton and me with him when he hunted the mountain goats. And you're certain the path will take us through to the coast? Once my father took me into the small village on the coastal plain... It was called uh, Viasco. The people stared at us in surprise. It was the first time in living memory that the journey had been made. Um, is it difficult? Parts of it, yes. Ropes will be needed for climbing. It's that bad. At one point, you will need the ropes to span a deep ravine. How many people will be making the journey? Uh, about 200. Uh, that includes a number of women and small children. <laughs> My first thought is to say, impossible. But I have learned that desperate people can work miracles. Well, they must be pretty desperate by now.
However, Major Ramsden's column of fugitives was not as desperate as I thought. Making a deal with the commander of the pursuing Waffen SS column had taken a great worry from the Major's shoulders. Rather, it did until Captain Saunders, his second in command, gave vent to his feelings. Look, sir, how do we know this Major Shear will keep his promise? Well, he gave me his word. <laughs> the word of an SS officer? I hope you're not laughing at me, Captain Saunders. Well, no, but. Well, it's just the thought of. Well, the SS haven't got a fancy reputation for honorable behavior, have they? That's true, Saunders, but Major Shear is a different breed. He'll keep his word. And his reason for making our truce is quite legitimate. Would you like to be sent east to fight the Russian army? Oh, I can't say I would, Major. But what's to stop him having a sudden change of heart? Now, for instance, he might get orders from his headquarters he can't ignore. His radio's out of commission. Oh, there are other ways of sending messages. If Major Shear found himself in a position where he has to fight us, I think he would give me fair warning. This isn't a war between knights in shining armor, sir. Chivalry died a long time ago. I don't think you're in a position to tell me about war, Captain. I went through three years in the trenches in the first war, and I've been in military service since. What's your experience? Well, two years. As an Army Air Force officer, when you were shot down when raiding the Ploesti oil field. Hardly sufficient military experience to conquer a farmyard. I'm a good judge of character, Sanders. Major Shea will keep his word. Damn it all, the column appears to have stopped. There must be some hold up ahead. Uh, go and see what it is, will you, Sanders? Heil Hitler. I have brought the prisoner, Herr Mayor. Oh, all right, all right, Vesa. There's no need for all that just because we have a visitor. These Englanders are not so easily impressed. I am Major Kunta Shia. Please sit down. I don't mind if I do, Major. The weather's keeping fine, don't you think? I want to know who you are. Uh, Albert Ryan, Sergeant Number 467612, and that's all I'll be telling you. They're really smart, them black uniforms, aren't they? You were captured just outside this village while you were spying on us. You are wearing civilian clothes. Oh, yes, well, let me tell you about that. You see, the army uniform was in ribbons, so a few days ago I burgled the farmhouse and, and swiped the farmer's clothes. I could have you shot. Oh, you wouldn't do that to me now, would you? You know, I'm just a poor squatty who's fed up with fighting and he wants to go home. You would all like to go home. Where have you come from? I was in the prisoner of war camp at Linvac, and there was an air raid one night, and a bomb blew a bloody great hole in the fence, and I went through it like a rat up a pipe. And I've been wandering around the countryside ever since. Mm. How long ago did this happen? Oh, it was about six weeks ago. You were carrying a Schmeiser machine gun and a pistol. Hardly in character for a man who claims he is tired of fighting. Oh, there are some nasty people up in those hills. A man has got to protect himself. Why were you spying on us? Oh, I was just curious. I didn't see many Germans in the hills. Uh, I, uh, I suppose you'll be sending me back to the prison of war cage. These wanderings of yours, Sergeant, did you do them alone? Well, I did have me eye for meeting up with a pretty girl somewhere, but it seems I was out of luck. By the rules of war, you are a spy and should be shot. But I got to wear something, didn't I? I? I mean, I couldn't very well wander around naked with me sergeant stripes glued to me arm, now could I? My uniform, it just fell off. You know, it was so ruddy rotten. Do you know of a Major Ramsden? No, no, I can't say that I do. He is in charge of a large group of escapees. They must be some 20 kilometers further along the road from here. Instead of shooting you, I could send you ahead to join him. That's a funny idea. And why would you be doing a thing like that? Call it capriciousness, if you wish. Yeah. Yeah, that is what I will do. Uh, Lieutenant Weser, take Sergeant Ryan ten kilometers up the track and set him free. Yeah, there I am. You'll, uh, you'll be giving me guns back, will you? Certainly not. Oh, you're a hard man, Major. I'm sure you'll be provided with all the weapons you need when you join Major Amston. I ask for you to do only one thing in return. Here it comes, here we go. I will do no spying for no, you. No, 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 nothing like that. 
Just tell Major Ramsden that I have sent you as a sign of good faith. It sounds odd to me. Major Ramsden will understand. No, Paul. Stay back here. Why? Something wrong? There is a road ahead. It would be better if we wait until dark before crossing. Well, if it's just a road, we can dash across it. No, it is not so easy. If you look at the map Ubeck gave you, you will see that we will have to travel along the road to a bridge. The bridge must be crossed, and it is probably guarded by the Germans. The road is used for carrying military supplies to the coast. So we have to wait here? No, there is a cottage close by. The old lady who lives there knows me. I must avoid delays, Violetta. They are necessary if we are to succeed. German convoys are frequently ambushed by partisans, which is why the road is heavily guarded. There are patrols, guard towers, and armored cars. To go within a hundred meters of the road in daylight is to risk being seen. All right, all right, you win. Well, let's go and see this old lady. She isn't a witch that lives in a gingerbread house, is she? I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. <laughs> it doesn't matter, just a little joke. I'll explain it later. Sergeant Albert Ryan, eh? I can use a man like you. If you don't mind me saying so, I thought my number was up when the Jerry's caught me. I thought it was a bullet for sure. Yes, Sergeant, you were most fortunate. Oh, and the boss man gave me a message for you, sir. Eh? He said I could go as long as I gave it to you. A message, you say? Well, it went something like this, sir. I was to say I was being let go as a sign of good faith, or whatever that means. He said you'd understand. Very good, Sergeant. Yes, I do understand. I, uh, I was talking to Corporal Ruskin when I first came in. He says there's a lot of Ruskies and Poles here. Oh, we're a League of Nations Army, Sergeant. My adjutant's American. There are some French and Danish ex-prisoners, too. But I'll find your infantry experience useful, Sergeant. And the others, sir? What others? Well, the lad I broke out of the camp with. Oh, I thought you said you were alone. Only when I was nabbed by the Jerry's. There's 50 of us all together. Uh, we've been wandering around all over the auction, you know, eating and taking what we can. 50? Why, how splendid. All infantrymen like yourself? Well, no, 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 not exactly, sir. Most of us. Uh, but there's 10 Yankee soldiers that got taken in North Africa. Uh, well, you know, they're not bad fellas. They're just a bit green when it comes to foraging for the grub. Where are they? Oh, they're about six miles from here. Uh, there's a valley running parallel to this one, just a bit farther, farther north. Uh, we was trying to make it to the coast, and one of these hill farmers told us there'd be there'd been some fighting over this way. So I came over to take a look, see. Uh, I tell you, sir, I, I was a bit shook up when I saw them black SS uniforms. For a time, I thought they was going to string me up right there and then. Can you bring in your companions? Oh, that's easy, sir. I I can have them here by the morning. Well, I'll be staying here for the night. Bring them by all means. My, my, how splendid. Fifty extra men. And he says there are ten of your own countrymen, Saunders. Uh, soldiers who were taken prisoner in North Africa. Hey, Lady Agnes is making noises about the rations as it is, sir. Mm. Stores are going to get mighty thin with fifty extra bellies to fill. Fifty extra men to forage, Saunders. Think of it like that. Yeah. A good soldiers trained to live off the land. If this deal of yours with Major Shear is so great... We can do without them, you know, sir. My, my, you have turned sour these last couple of days. Is Lady Agnes getting you down? Uh, I guess you could say that. She's like a pet peat nipping at my heels all day. But Major, what'll you do with the extra men? Well, most of them are infantrymen. I'll replace our Russian and Polish rearguard with them. I think their bloodthirstiness could lead to unnecessary clashes with the German patrols. And what'll you do with the Russians and the Poles? I want to send them on ahead to Rajek Pass. They can search the western end for signs of this path that would lead us down to the Adriatic. In spite of what everyone tells me to the contrary, I'm sure there must be a way through. I'm sure British intelligence wouldn't send us on a wild goose chase. Oh, I wish I had your faith in mankind, Major.
cottage is there, but there is something amiss. Huh? I can't see anything wrong. She had some pigs and two cows. I can't see them. And where is the dog? He can sniff a stranger a kilometer away. All right. You stay here. I'll go closer and take a look. No, that is my responsibility. I know the cottage and the outbuildings. Oh, really, Violetta, you're forgetting that I'm a trained Did soldier. Did they teach you about the things that happen in these hills? Do they teach you about treachery and the rivalry of the partisan groups? Please, Paul, stay here and cover me. I had to admire her stealth as she slowly wriggled forward into an open grassy space which led to the house some 50 yards away. Halfway there, she got to her feet and ran, stooped, to the wall of an outbuilding. She looked inside and then darted to the wall of the cottage. For a few moments, she disappeared from my view. And then I saw her stooping low under a window. Violetta had circled the building, and it was obvious by her caution that something was indeed amiss. Violetta emerged, momentarily glanced through the window, and then sprinted across the grass to my side. Three men, partisans. They must have killed the animals. There is a lot of blood in the barn. What about the old lady? I don't know. The partisans are sitting at a table, drinking and telling jokes. Mm. Do you know who they are? Communists. They are part of Pavchek's brigade. They must have pre- penetrated this far since early this morning. Yes, Karaskiu said that Pavchek's group had launched an attack. There must be more of them. The animals must have been killed for food and the carcasses taken away by the others. There's no reason why they would have killed your friend. No. They will kill anyone who has helped or in any way supported Karescu. She is dead, as certainly as night will soon fall. Okay, so let's move out and find a position nearer to the road. No. What do you mean, no? I mean that those men are my enemies. They have killed Mother Karpeska. I can't just walk away and leave them to enjoy their spoils. Do you mean that... I will go to the door and shoot them. At the same time, you shoot at them through that window there. Now, wait a minute. It will take only a few seconds. You're crazy. What if there are more of them nearby? We will shoot them, too. Now, look, Violetta, my mission is more important than your feelings for revenge. If you walk for a kilometer that way, you will see a German watchtower through the trees. Wait there for me. Uh, hang on. If you have no stomach for this, then I will spare you the horror. <sighs> all right. All right. But I'll take the door. Very well. But wait for me to begin firing through the window before you push open the door. I checked. It is standing ajar. You will find the red pig directly ahead of you. I circled the cottage using some bushes for cover. When I reached the door, Violetta was already stopped under the window, her submachine gun gripped in both hands. She stood up and poked the muzzle through the glass, and then... As I heard the glass break, I kicked open the door. Three men stood up jerkily from a wooden table. They spun around like grotesque puppets and fell with a dull thump to the stone floor. There had been no need for me to open fire. They had stood up directly into Violetta's line of fire. I walked over to the bodies and stared at them. A moment later, Violetta came into the cottage and began searching. Stuffed in a brush cupboard, she found the body of old Mother Kopeska. These swines have tortured her. Look, do you see the marks? Before we leave, I want to bury her. Uh, But the others might come back. I don't think so. But if they do... I will be quite happy to fight them. All right. I suppose there must be a spade somewhere around here. Ah! There you are, Major Ramsden. Oh, no. Really, it's quite preposterous. What is, Lady Agnes? The milk situation, of course. I've spoken to your Captain Sanders about it, and he ignored my request for an increase in the ration. The man is callous. He's merely doing his job. His job is to starve poor helpless infants. I'd expect it from your Gestapo friends, but certainly not from our own side. Madam, the Germans are not my friends, as you so fondly believe. Oh, no. And why did that brute of a lieutenant try to get me drunk on his filthy stolen cognac? To quieten you down, perhaps? Well, thank you. Not to cheapen yourself by trying to insult me, Major. 
Why didn't you ask the Nazis for some powdered milk? Made it part of whatever deal it is you, you made with them. Lady Agnes, kindly leave the running of things to me. I will, if they're done efficiently. I'll bet those Nazis are up to their cauliflower ears in powdered milk. I have enough supplies to seal through the next three weeks. I've ordered extra for the women and the children. It's not enough. It's more than they received in the internment camp. Now, please be satisfied. This is not intended to be a, a Sunday jaunt in the country. I'm warning you, Major. This callous attitude of yours will be reported to the highest authority when we reach safety. Don't you think we have enough men? If we include Kovacs' partisans, there must be over 300 of us. Kovacs is only going with us as far as Rajik Pass. And the partisans are providing their own food. Indeed, they've been sharing it with some of our men. Oh, I haven't seen it. You do surprise me. I thought nothing escaped your eagle eye. The engineers report two more of our lorries are back in service. Ah, good. But I don't know for how much longer we can continue using them. Beyond this village, the road peters out to little more than a track. If it rains, the whole column could get bogged down. The patrols report that the lorries could probably make it for the next 30 kilometers. Hmm. Yeah, I hope so. Then we'll abandon them and just use the half-tracks. I think you can post orders that I will move out at uh, six in the morning. Uh, uh, it's been quite comfortable here, but unfortunately, good things can't last forever, huh? Nine, then. Uh, any sign of Major Amston's patrols? Uh, no, Mayor. His Russians and Poles are holding positions about 15 kilometers away. They will probably abandon them tonight. Yeah, but post lookouts to make sure we don't want to be caught in any more ambushes. One never knows the good Major might have had second thoughts about our agreement. <laughs> I doubt it, Mayor. The agreement is more to his advantage than our own, and he is well aware of it. I've been thinking about that Irishman we released this morning. And the enemy planes flying low. American Boston. They're giving our vehicles a pounding. Oh. Yeah, well, that's a relief. They're not staying. They must be heading for, for a target further to the east. Ruffin has his headquarters, I hope. Our position will have been reported back to their base, Herr Mayor. I know, I know. There's nothing we can do about it. They will give us a second strapping on their way home again. Let's go and check the damage. Then leave the lorries here in the village and order the half-tracks to move into the trees. Yeah, I mean... We can afford to use the lorries, but losing the half-tracks could be a disaster. the bodies of the partisans lying on the floor of the cottage. By the time we'd finished burying the old lady, the sun had already disappeared behind the western hills, and dusk began to deepen the shadows. Violetta led the way towards the road. The death of her elderly friend had obviously affected her deeply, and she said very little on the journey. At a fork in the track, she took my arm and led me off the path. A few yards farther on, I saw the vague silhouette of a distant watchtower. It overlooks the road. There is one every three kilometers along this stretch of the road. German foot patrols and armored cars operate between them. Oh, no, I can understand your caution. Not many convoys pass at night, fortunately, so the patrols are more lax. Our biggest problem will be in crossing the bridge. Mm -hmm. I heard about the way you crossed the bridge last night with the help of Pevchek's men. You won't find this one so easy. Oh? The Germans guard it closely. It won't be so easily tracked. Is there no other way to cross the river? For a good swimmer, yes. Well, then we can swim across. I never learned to swim. <sighs> How wide is it? About a hundred meters. And does water frighten you? <laughs> it will take more time than we have to spare for you to teach me to swim. Well, all you have to do is to lie back and relax in the water. I'll do all the work. You make it sound very simple. Well, it is, as long as you don't panic and put up a struggle. All right, I'll tell you the truth. I'm afraid of water. 
More than you're afraid of Germans and Pobchak's men? It might sound stupid, but yes. When I'm close to water, I feel as though I'm about to fall in and drown. Some people are like that about heights. Well, we might be lucky and find a boat. The Germans destroyed all the boats. Hmm. Okay, Violetta, how were you planning to cross the bridge? By climbing across the girders underneath. It has been done before. By you? Well, no. Uh, I, I don't like that idea. Look, let, let's cross the road and get as close to the bridge as possible. We'll worry about it then. An armored car. Yeah. It will call to the next watchtower and come back this way in about 15 minutes. Right. Let's make a run for it. No, not yet. Wait and listen. Oh, we're lucky that this... Listen. Hey, we're not alone. It could be a patrol or even Pavchik's men. Well, I hope it's not. Shh. I want to hear their voices. Germans. A patrol is coming this way. Keep absolutely still. And pray they don't walk into us. Violetta and I cowered deep in the foliage of a bush, expecting to feel the sudden thud of bullets in our bodies. And then we realized the guns were not being fired in our direction. About 300 meters away, a skirmish was being fought between a German patrol and a partisan group. I thought it would be a very good idea to take advantage of the confusion and make a dash across the road. But Violetta held me back. No, Paul. What? You must what? stay here. Come on, don't be ridiculous. Don't you see this is a tremendous opportunity? They're, they're busy fighting each other. We Watch can... what happens, Paul. Huh? And listen. Hey, the armored cars come back. Yes. The patrols are in radio contact with it. Others will arrive soon. We could be trapped here. I know. But to move would be certain capture or death. Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Diffenfall. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. Violetta and I lay huddled close to one another in the cover of a dense bush, listening to the sound of a German patrol fighting it out with some unknown partisan group. We were less than 20 meters from the road, along which had just come an armored car. From it, a searchlight penetrated the trees at the side of the road, and several men came out to join their comrades. All we could do was sit tight and hope to remain undiscovered. The fighting seems to be moving the other way, praise heaven. The Germans were closest to us, so they must have put the partisans to flight. And they could have been your people. No. We learned a long time ago the futility of trying to lay an ambush on this road. 
Very little happens that the Germans don't see. It cost us a lot of brave men in the past. The Pavchek's group are stupid enough to try. Oh, perhaps they didn't realize how well the road is guarded. Perhaps. I'm glad the Germans got them. If we were to be captured, rather it be the Germans. I'd rather not be captured at all. Shooting is dying down. Uh, oh, a second armored car. Oh, there'll be a dozen swarming to the scene. But we, if we are lucky, the German patrol commander will talk to them on his radio and call them off. Well, I hope the patrol doesn't come this way searching for fugitive partisans. No, it will be all right. They would have run the other way. But we must wait for two or three hours before moving out of cover. Ah, and this started out to be such a simple mission. Don't despair, Paul. Think of how many other men would like to spend a few hours in a bush with me. <laughs> oh, in a dangerous situation like this? <laughs> it adds pleasure. <laughs> I was already uncomfortably aware of her closeness to me as we huddled under the foliage. To my eyes, she was a vague, sweet-smelling shape. A glint of light momentarily reflected in her dark eyes. Her face was turned towards me, and her soft hand touched mine and gently squeezed. of two clumsy teenagers. We kissed many times and held one another close. How quickly the time flew. The two armored cars left to resume their patrol, and then there was a silence disturbed only by the chirping of the crickets. I think we can move on. <sighs> if we must. We must. Yeah, I see what you meant about flavor. Do you do that often? No. You are the... First man I have ever been alone with. Mm. Does it sound strange to you, Paul? My brother Anton never let me out of his sight. He is worse than a jealous lover. And now he isn't here? I can be what I am, a woman. <laughs> <laughs> but Anton will lie awake at night with worry, especially since he knows I am alone in the mountains with a wicked, immoral foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> is that what I am? No, of course not. <laughs> But we country people have some very peculiar ideas about strangers. Well, I suppose it's the same the world over. I even hear it in England. England? I used to read about England at school. How different it must be. Yeah, I'm colder. Oh, wait till winter comes to these mountains, Paul. Then you will know what cold really is. Yes, I would like to see England, London, and all those people, millions of them. But this is no time for dreaming. We must cross the road. I'd always considered myself to be a man with a built-in resistance to the opposite sex. But never had I been so close to a woman with such subtle, yet unconscious, seductive power. As she left my side, I resisted a fierce temptation to pull her back beside me. Instead, I meekly followed her down a steep incline to the edge of the road. She paused, listening, then tugged at my sleeve. We ran side by side across the tarmac and threw ourselves into some undergrowth on the opposite side. Again, we listened. And then I heaved a sigh of relief. Only the crickets broke the dark silence. We must climb up a few meters and follow the road west until we reach the bridge. Right. Which way does the river flow? To the north? Uh, northwest. Mm -hmm. Is the current swift? Not at this time of the year. There has been very little rain. Okay, Violetta, I know an easy way we can cross. If we climb over this hill, can we reach the bank? Yes, but I told you there are no boats. Oh, don't worry, we don't need a boat. I won't try to swim. You don't need to. Well, then how Just are Just we... leave it to me. Now, come on. Uh, that will be all, Gruber. Just leave the wine. So, Lieutenant Vesa, the American Bostons did not come back. To have service shut down. <laughs> oh, I doubt it. There were at least 20. It's likely they went back by another route. All the same, they know our battalion is here, so we can expect further air attacks. Some more wine. Thank you, Herr Mayor. This time tomorrow night, we won't be having dinner in such comfort, I'm afraid. Just think, Reza. 
In a few months' time, the war might be over and we can go home to live normal lives. Isn't that something to look forward to? If we have a home left to go to, the Allied air raids are causing such terrible destruction. Yeah, I know. My home is in Hamburg, and I hear it is raided almost every night. Oh, why can't that megalomaniac in Berlin make some kind of deal? Surely this is a way of salvaging something out of this mess. He still believes he can win the war. <laughs> Against the combined power of America, Britain, and Russia? Only a madman could believe that. Yeah, hey, Mayor, but uh, a madman. It amounts to just that, Vesa. We are like toys in the hands of a madman. It might sound crazy to you, but when that loudmouthed English milady had the gall to demand our surrender, I was tempted. Though of course, it was impossible. But I thought later how nice it would be to have been able to say yes and bring it all to an end for us. Nineteen men killed and thirty-three wounded in that air raid. For what? To satisfy the vanity of the party leaders. Two years ago, I uh, what was... What is that? Wait. Do you hear motorcycles? Stop car. It's a motorcycle escort. Damnation. I will go out and greet our visitor. Preferably with a hand grenade. watched through the window as Leutnant Weser went out and crossed to where the newcomers had stopped in the middle of the village square. A sentry opened the passenger door of the staff car, and the tall figure of a man in SS uniform got out. As Weser approached, he faltered and then snapped into a salute. Mayor Scheer's heart skipped a beat. Plainly, a senior officer had been sent to replace him, or, at least, demand an explanation for his disobedience of orders. Weser briefly spoke to the officer and then led him towards the schoolhouse. As they drew closer, Shear's heart skipped two more beats. He recognized the man as SS Colonel Schwartz, a man he dreaded meeting even in ordinary circumstances. A party fanatic of the worst kind, a man who would sing patriotic songs as he piled his own family into a gas chamber, if the Fuhrer demanded it of him. Shear turned away from the window. The evening had turned sour. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. I have been traveling since eight this morning. An unpleasant, uncomfortable journey. Can I offer you some refreshment here, Colin? What do you think, Sheer? A stupid damn question. Lieutenant Weser, will you see to the colonel? Yeah. Well. Maya, uh, something wrong with your radio. Yeah, it was damaged beyond repair in an air raid. Coded orders were sent to you. The radio operator acknowledged their receipt. We awaited your official acknowledgement. It was not received. The only explanation I can think of is that the message was received by Sergeant Heinz a few minutes before he was killed in the raid. One of our reconnaissance planes reported that your battalion was still here instead of returning to HQ. Mm. Uh, the last orders I received were to pursue and destroy the column of escaped prisoners. Well, that order has been countermanded. You are to proceed directly to put yourself under the command of General Krugel of Goboskin. I see. And the escaped prisoners? A detachment of the 9th Panzer Group will engage them at Potvor, and they will make their run for the coast. There's only one route they take, so why waste a whole battalion of SS to chase them when a dozen Tiger tanks can wipe them out in minutes? I wondered the same thing, Herr Colonel. I will expect you to give orders to move out at first light, my Oshir. It will take you five days to reach Koboskin, as it is. General Krugel is digging in to meet the Russian onslaught. My men are already under orders to move in the morning. It is merely a change in direction. Uh, did you happen to bring a radio transmitter with you? I am not employed by the Third Reich as a delivery boy. You will be able to pick one up from HQ as you pass on your way to the Eastern Front. Can I give you some wine while my man prepares your food? Yeah. The best, Moselle. <laughs> you seem to live very well, Major. I make the best of things. I was less than a kilometer from the village when I met the first sentry. Your precautions seem to be rather lacking. Your perimeter sentry should be at least three kilometers out. There are reports of partisan activities in this area. 
Indeed, I remember you sending in a report that you were ambushed by them. There are few partisans in the surrounding hills now, Herr Colonel. My patrols have scoured the hills for 20 kilometers around. Did you take any prisoners? Yes. I trust you executed them. Yeah, after intensive interrogation. Very good. Will you be returning to headquarters tomorrow? Originally, I was being sent to relieve you of your command. However, this was changed at the last minute because I am urgently needed elsewhere. I have told my escort to rest until four, and then we will return. It will still be dark. I must reach HQ by three tomorrow afternoon. I have been posted to the 13th Waffen SS at Sarajevo. Where are you going? There is a matter I must see to, if you would kindly excuse me for a few minutes. So tell your man to hurry up with the food. Meanwhile, I'll help myself to some more wine. Faisal, come over here. Yeah, Emil? What are you doing staring up at the sky? Something I have not done for years. I was praying. Is everything all right? No. The man is here to see what we're up to and to order us to join General Kruger. So we have to turn back in the morning. Not if I can help it. With all due respect, Herr Mayor, I do not see how it can be avoided. Schwartz gave me the glimmer of an idea. He and his motorcycle escort are leaving at four in the morning. I want you to take a half-track and get to Major Ramsden as fast as you can. Herr Mayor, his, his rear guard would shoot me up before Use I... Use your searchlight to announce your presence. Take someone with you who speaks Russian and Polish... A message must be sent to him as quickly as possible. What kind of a message? If it's not too late, I want him to arrange with his partisan friends for Colonel Schwartz to be ambushed a few kilometers down the road. May your I know, Beza. But think of an alternative. It seemed ages before Violetta and I reached the riverbank. The water was dark and very slowly flowing. The opposite bank was a vague patch of blackness. In the dim light, Violetta looked up at me. Well, tell me how we get across. Well, before I do so, I want to tell you something. Yes? I want you to know that no matter what happens in the future, I don't want to see you hurt. Something strange and beautiful happened to me an hour ago. A completely new experience. I mean, when we were close together. What are you trying to say, Paul? Kiss me, Violetta. Yes, but... <clears throat> I hit her just below the ear, and she slumped unconscious in my arms. I knew it was the only way to get her across the river. I wrapped our weapons and other possessions in waterproof material and pulled her into the water. It was icy cold and came up to my waist. I rolled Violetta onto her back and took a lifesaver's grip on her. With a deep breath, I gently pushed myself away from the bank. I knew I had to reach the other side before the current swept us down to the heavily guarded bridge. Between holding up Violetta and the weight of our equipment, it was a great struggle. At first, it seemed as though I was making no progress at all. And suddenly, luck was with me, and I was caught in a gentle eddy that pushed me into midstream. For a few minutes more, I was in a sort of limbo. And then a second eddy pushed me out on the main current and towards the bank. On my left, I caught the loom of lights above the darkness. The Germans had the bridge illuminated, and it was getting uncomfortably close. If there was a patrol or a sentry on the riverbank, he would easily see and hear the splashing. And then, mercifully, my feet touched bottom. I dragged my burden up to the bank and gasped to regain my breath. The timing had been perfect. Even as I lay Violetta down on the grass, she began to stir. A glance downriver told me what a narrow squeak it had been. The girders of the bridge could be plainly seen no more than 200 meters away. <coughs> oh, feel better. Come on. It's all right. Oh, what? We, we made it. We made it. We crossed the river. What happened? How? I, I'm sorry. I, I had to put you to sleep for a while. And we uh, swam across. Swam? <laughs> well, you uh, slept all the way. You hit me. Yes, but as gently as possible. It was more like a little jab under the ear. How do you feel? I have a headache. Don't worry, it'll pass. Tell me when you're ready and we'll move on. You actually swam across the river with me? I was out there in the middle? Uh-huh, without a word of protest. Oh, it's cold. 
Well, if you don't mind me coming a little closer. Anything to get warm. Helmut, stop the half track here. Kamerad, we want to talk. Kamerad, I want to speak to Mayor Ramsden. I send him by you, sir. Lieutenant Weiser, adjutant to Mayor Scheer, commander of 16th Battalion Waffen SS. Come out, Arnold. Walk forward to me. Herr Lieutenant. Wait for me here, Helmut. Where are you? Walk straight ahead with your hands on the back of your head. Stand where you are. So... You are Major Shields, adjutant, huh? Fine price to fall into our hands. Are we attempted to shoot you? I have brought an urgent message for Mayor Ramsden. <laughs> and it is a fine half-track. We could make good use of it. Please, I must see your commander. I, Commander Rearguard. What kind of message would you have for Major Ramsden, huh? Why would he want to talk to you? It is important and most urgent. Uh, how urgent? It can save many lives on, on both our sides. All right. I take you to the Major, but it is a long walk, three kilometers unless, uh, yeah, we can use your armored vehicle. How many men are inside? Only the driver. Good, it will save us a lot of time. Major. Major? Mm. Yeah, what is it? No, oh, it's you, Dimitri. Oh, this was to be my first early night in day. Major, I have a German officer outside. He says he is Major Shear's adjutant. What the face are here? Oh, what's happened? Have you taken him prisoner? No, no, no. He penetrated our line in a half track with his searchlight switched on. He says he wants to speak to you. I'll see him. Oh, and tell the guard to bring me some coffee. Come inside. Good evening, Herr Mayor. It's nearly good morning, Leutnant. Dimitri tells me you brought me a message from Major Scheer. It is very urgent and it affects us all. Early this evening, SS Colonel Schwarz arrived and... ...to organize the partisans to ambush Colonel Schwarz? Mayor Scheer hoped you would cooperate. What a very strange request. If the Colonel returns alive to command headquarters, the battalion will be forced to turn back and join General Krugel to face the Russians. Then a detachment of panzers will be sent to destroy your column. As you see, Mayor, it is in both our interests for Colonel Schwarz to, uh, disappear. Major Scheer could arrange for his own men to lay an ambush. That would mean letting the men know of our, uh, our agreement. The Mayor thinks that this would not be wise at present. There are some who are still hardline Nazis. Hmm. It would be too late for me to organize Kovacs and his partisans. You do realize that your visit here means that my men will know of our arrangement. I do not think it matters from your side. You are all of a like mind. Yes, that's true. Very well. Dimitri, are you there? All right, come into the tent. How would you like to ambush an SS colonel and his motorcycle escort? <laughs> Does it get like a mouse, huh? <laughs> I would like nothing better, unless there's a way to find myself back in Moscow's Gorky Square. Now, look, there's very little time. Does this German officer want us to kill his comrades? That sounds strange to me. The reason will be explained to you later, Dimitri. Uh, Leutnant, how many men in the escort? Ten men altogether, Mayor. There are four motorcycles with sidecars... And a staff car containing a driver and Colonel Schwarz. Well, Dimitri, how many men do you need? The sidecars have the machine guns mounted on them? Yeah, but they are leaving at four when it is still dark. Aye, and five men can do it, Major. There must be no survivors. I would take three miles the partisans gave to us. Now, the main problem is how to get you there in time. It's a half-track. I can take your men a kilometer short of Komasek village. Then they can skirt around the hills and be in position on the other side of the village long before Colonel Schwarz gets there. Of course. <laughs> How do you like the idea of taking a ride in a German half-track, eh, Dimitri? <laughs> Very much, Major. I was already wondering how we could steal it. Now, forget that nonsense for now. Now, let me see. It's nearly midnight. Uh, plenty of time. Go and organize your men and equipment, Dimitri. Violetta and I traveled in silence for a kilometer north of the riverbank. 
There were sure to be German patrols on this side of the river, too, so we exercised maximum caution. It was slow going until we came to a rocky plateau. Yes, I know where we are. Uh-huh. Ahead of us is a ravine. Uh-huh. We will have to climb down and follow the valley north. Is this still Karescu's territory? No, we left that behind at the river. There are small groups of partisans of all colors between here and Rajik Pass, but they will give us no trouble. Yeah, that's what I thought about Pavchik and Karescu. Ah, uh, there is a difference. South of here, the partisans have to fight every day for their survival. But the Germans very rarely come here into the Montenegrin mountains. There are a few villages and the men play at being partisans. But mostly they fight among themselves. They have been little affected by the war. And the supplies occasionally dropped to them by the Allies are used to fight their private wars. How far to Rajek? 35 kilometers. It is rough country, but I think we can reach it by tomorrow afternoon. You mean to keep going? We can sleep when we arrive. Oh, by then I'll be more dead than alive. Don't worry, Paul. I know how to revive you. May I share? Yeah, here, Colonel. You were sleeping? Oh, just a nap. I will be leaving in a few minutes. Your guard has left to call my men. One last word before I leave. Yeah? I took a close look at your damaged radio equipment. The holes in it were made by nine millimeter rounds. They did not come from a passing Allied aircraft. Perhaps you can explain? Are you sure? Do you question my intelligence, Herr Mayor? Oh, nine, nine here, Colin Allen. All I know is that we were attacked, that the radio operator was killed, and the equipment destroyed beyond repair. I asked Sergeant Huber about the air attack. He informs me that there has only been one, which was yesterday afternoon. Then Sergeant Huber is mistaken. Uh, if I remember correctly, Sergeant Huber was out on a long-distance patrol the night it happened. Corporal Hellman as well? Corporal Hellman. Corporal Hellman was the man who showed me where the damaged radio equipment had been hidden. Stowed, Herr Colonel, not hidden. Are you trying to suggest that something underhand has occurred here? Yes, that is correct, Mayor Scheer. And I will be submitting a report to headquarters for the matter to be investigated. I think you have behaved rather deviously. I can only guess at your motive. And your guess is? You did not want to receive orders from headquarters that would send you to the Russian front. No man in his right mind would want to be sent there. Yeah, that is just the kind of response I expected from you. I am empowered to take action against you myself, but I shall leave that to the investigating officers. Something else was told me by Sergeant Huber. You received a party of these escapees under a flag of truce. That is correct. For some unaccountable reason, they believed the war had ended and came to accept my surrender. You have made a written report of this? Yeah. Their audacity astonishes me. What did you do with that deputation? They came under a flag of truce. I sent them back, naturally. I would have hanged them. Well, it is time for me to leave. I suggest you prepare a good defense for yourself, by your sheer. I don't think that will be necessary. Have a pleasant journey back to headquarters. I can see no reason for you to smile. Oh, something funny came into my mind. Well, I'm in no mood for jokes. Hi, Hitler! Heil Hitler. And watch out for potholes on the road. Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Diffenthal. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio.
sky. We bring you dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense. From the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. A few minutes after four in the morning, Waffen SS Colonel Schwartz set out with his motorcycle escort through the darkness on his long journey back to his regimental headquarters. His safe arrival could spell disaster for battalion commander Gunther Scheer and his adjutant, Lieutenant Beza. They didn't wish him a safe journey through the Yugoslav hills and had indeed made arrangements to ensure that he would meet disaster rather than themselves. As a result, a former Russian officer, Dmitry Arkinov, now an escaped prisoner of war, waited for the arrival of Colonel Schwartz. With him were four other former Russian soldiers, who now formed part of Major Ramsden's column of fugitives, who were fleeing towards the coast. Two landmines had been planted in the path of the expected vehicles, and the five men nursed Schmeisser machine guns. Dmitry looked up the rough, narrow road and saw the loom of approaching lights. Weapons were cocked, and fingers curled around five triggers. With lights dimmed, two motorcycles, each with a gun-mounted sidecar, approached. Then came Colonel Schwartz's black staff car. Behind it followed two motorcycles. Then, as the leading motorcycles drew level with Dimitri's position, one of them touched off a mine. of the staff car swerved to avoid hitting the shattered motorcycle and... Before they could organize a defense, the men on the rear motorcycles were cut down. Within seconds, it was all over. The Russians came out from their cover, counted the bodies, and were satisfied there had been no survivors. They took a circuitous route around the village of Komasek, and on the other side were met by Lieutenant Weser in an armored half-track vehicle. A nod from Dmitri told the German officer that the Russians had done all that was expected of them. They climbed aboard the half-track and were given a lift back towards Major Ramsden's column of fugitives. With a grin, Dmitri had only one thing to say to Leutman Bezer. This is a fine vehicle. One day, we take it for ourselves. Good morning, Herr Mayor. I have just returned the Russians to Mayor Ramsden's column. Good. What was their report? The nod and a grin from their leader. It was not very communicative. Typical, typical. Did they suffer any casualties? Nine, not even a bruise. So, in an hour, you will detail a patrol to go east down the road where they will find the bodies, yeah? Yeah. Uh, put Sergeant Colvin in charge. Mayor. His written reports are always very precise and convincing. Then you can get some sleep. You left orders for the battalion to move at eight, Herr Mayor. I think you will have ample opportunity to sleep while we are on the move. Yeah, Herr Mayor. I counted ten bodies. There were no survivors. I think you very good SS Major Frame will be content with our work. No, I know how you resent my having contact with Major Shear, but, but we are the real beneficiaries of this uh, dialogue. An enemy is an enemy. I know, I know, Dimitri. I appreciate how you feel, but there's much more to war than soldiers lobbing hand grenades at each other. Ah, do not trust any German. All I say is beware. This SS Major could lead us all into a trap. We have an arrangement about that. Huh. Would he honor any arrangement with you, Major? There's nearly 6,000 men less than 30 kilometers behind us. We are less than 200 if I don't count Kovac. He's unreliable parties on four. Does a fox make a deal with a chicken, huh? If it means escaping from the farmer's shotgun, yes. <laughs> you see, I'm as good as you Russians at making up analogies. Believe me, Major Shear could overwhelm us in no time at all, but he has a very good reason not to do so. 
That was why this Colonel Schwartz had to be killed. He was a danger to us all. He could have upset our arrangement and brought an SS Panzer group to cut off our escape. I don't understand any of this, Major. Yes, I can understand how confusing all this must seem to you. Very well, Dimitri. It's only fair that I take you into my confidence. You and your men have been loyal and you've done some magnificent work. If I could issue medals, I'd give each and every man the highest award. Hmm. Thank you, Major. Those words alone are an honor to hear. I will relay them to my men. Please do. Now, let me explain to you what transpired between Major Shear and myself when we met. And Major Shear has kept his word. His request for us to deal with Colonel Schwartz is proof of this. Do you understand now? Uh. Yeah, it is clear, Major Armstrong, but it's a very strange war where even your enemies are your friends. Not friends, Dimitri. For the time being, we're in a state of coexistence with Major Shear. I think the time will come when the truce ends and we have to fight once more. But I think Major Shear will do the honorable thing and give us advance warning. It is best to be prepared at all times. Exactly. How long can Major Shear pretend to remain in ignorance of it order to go and meet the Soviet army, huh? Two days, perhaps three. A lot longer, I hope. At our present rate of progress, I expect to reach the entrance to Rajik Pass by tomorrow night. After you've had some sleep, I want you to take your men ahead to patrol the area. Now, if you make any contact whatsoever with the Germans, I want you to let me know right away. You suspect the trap? Not from Major Shear, no. But stationed some 80 miles north is a Panzer group. They know all about us. Their commander might have already sent a force to deal with us. I doubt it, but I, I must consider all possible. If we leave then, the rear will be over. No, no. Your men will be replaced by 60 British and American prisoners. They'll be joining us sometime during the morning. Oh, I heard about them. As soon as I've briefed these newcomers, I'll send them out to relieve your men. Uh, it's nearly 7 o'clock. Look, call Captain Sanders for me, please, and tell him to get everyone on the move. Meanwhile, my own progress towards Rajik Pass was going well. May I even say blissfully? Violetta was no longer just a guide. During the night, we had become lovers. And it was just as she said, the dangers we had faced merely served as a spice to our lovemaking. Now, as the sun rose above the eastern hills, we walked confidently along the floor of a valley. But we still exercised caution. Though few people lived in this area, there was a slight danger of running into one of the partisan bands, many of which suffered from a paranoid distrust of strangers. We kept a few yards off from the tracks, using what cover we could. We are making good time, Paul. Yes, I know. But even so, I'm a day behind schedule. For all I know, Major Ramsden and his people have been trapped in Rajik Pass and wiped out by the buff and SS group that's chasing them. We will be there by noon. Even if we take a rest now? Yes. Good. I feel as though I've been through a mango. What with swimming that river and, uh, um, well, all the rest. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you can laugh at me. Violetta, mm. I know your people don't take a serious love affair lightly. Here. Sit down beside me on this rock. Yes, Paul. We do take love very, very seriously. When a woman tells a man she loves him, it comes from a fire in her heart. And do you love me? If I did not, we would now be at least ten kilometers closer to Rajek. Then what I say now comes from a fire inside my own heart. Violetta, when we get a chance, I want to marry you. Oh, Paul, I do so much want to say yes, but... Is, is something wrong? I am thinking of you. Danger does add a spice to love, but it does something else. A man and a woman together facing danger will make love just to relieve the tension of this situation. I know. I have seen it many times with other men and girls in Karescu's partisan group. It was not a fire in their hearts. It was fear. I see. So you think what happened between us was created by fear? Oh, not for my part, Paul. I love... I mean, I know I love you. But do you love me in the same way? Well, of course I do. Haven't I just asked you to marry me? But if we live through this, and when times become normal, when all danger has passed, 
Will you not regret our marriage? Oh, for heaven's sake, Violetta, why should I? Think, Paul. What am I? A peasant girl from the mountains of Montenegro. You are educated, while I can hardly read and write. What will your friends in England say when you take me to your home? Oh, they will say how beautiful you are, and how lucky I am to have found such a treasure in the mountains. That is only what you hope they will say. Why, Paul, I know only two words in your language. Hmm? What are they? Yes, and no. <laughs> well, that's enough for a start. And as from today, you start learning ten English words a day. <sighs> and as for my friends, they can admire you, be jealous of me, or they can go to hell. Now, will you marry me? No, not yet. Your letter, please. We will stay as lovers until I know you will not regret marrying me. How will you know? I will know when the time comes. It will be a time I know it will be safe for me to propose to you. Oh, you're a strange and beautiful creature. In the next two weeks, we could be hanged as spies, Paul. Shot as traitors or killed in action against the Germans. Let us live as lovers who believe each moment of love is their last. Because, Paul, it may be so. Get a couple of men to help you with that cart. Yes, sir. Well, oh, Major, hmm? weird Irishman and his group are here. Oh, where? The back of the column. <laughs> you think we're a ragtag army? You should see the state of them. Yeah, I can imagine. Mrs. Clitheroe is doing what she can with clothes, and Sergeant Watkinson is checking their weapons. I want to see that Irishman. Uh, what's his name? Uh... Oh, Albert Ryan. Yes, Albert Ryan. You'll discover in time, Captain Saunders, that all Irishmen are weird in one way or another. They either drink too much or fight too much. But they're damn good soldiers if you can inspire them into following orders. Letting them work it out for themselves can be somewhat dangerous. Do I detect a note of uh, bigotry, sir? No, laddie. The voice of experience. Well, anyhow, Sergeant Ryan will be along as soon as Mrs. Clitheroe has done something about those... Uh, Peculiar peasant pantaloons he was wearing. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Uh, how many did he bring in with him? Uh, Fifty-three. Eleven American and forty-two British. <laughs> yeah, most of the British are Irish by the sound of it. I see. Well, whatever they are, they're most welcome. We'll have need of good fighting men to get us over the last lap. You still intend to try to find a way through Roger Pass, Major? Yes, that's a problem I must face. Kovacs assures me there's no way through to the coast, and once inside, that we'll be trapped. I don't think I dare risk it. After all, I can't ignore what the local peasants say. Yes, I know our last order specifically said we should go by way of Rajik Pass, but what if military intelligence made a mistake? No, well, they're not infallible. If you're interested in my view, Major, I think we should turn north and skirt the mountains. And risk walking into a panzer brigade? Oh, dear. Damn it, what rotten luck getting our radio shot up like that. Oh, here's Ryan. And a fine day to you, sir. Sergeant Ryan reporting for duty, sir. Uh, stand easy, Sergeant. I'm glad to see you and your group arrived safely. We uh, we could have joined the column very early in the morning, sir, but I thought we should get a good sleep first because I know that you'll be needing us for duty right away. Uh, have you seen Sergeant uh, Watkinson? Oh, that I have, sir, yes. I gave him a list of all the men with me. Good. Are you the senior NCR? Uh, no, no. There's a Sergeant Ferris with the Yanks, sir, but we all got along very nicely. Mm. Captain Saunders, uh, you'll take charge of the Americans. Yes, sir. I'll see them right away. No, no, no. No, stay and listen to what I have to say to Sergeant Ryan. Sir. Our present rear guard consists of some 20 Russian and 15 Polish SKPs. I'll be sending them ahead to scout Rajek Pass. You and your men will replace them, Sergeant. That's very good, sir. The lads, they're spoiling for the fight with them Jerry's behind them. Then they're going to be disappointed. You're to remain about six miles to the rear of the column. Should you see an advance party of SS, you will fire a warning shot over their heads. Honest, sir? Won't we give ourselves away like that? Exactly. The Germans will fall back and wait until you've vacated your position. That's a funny idea, sir. We have an arrangement, Sergeant. So we don't do nothing except just watch for them? That's the idea, yes. 
What if they don't retreat, sir? Say they just keep coming on. Send a messenger back to me and fire more warning shots. And if they still keep coming on? Well, you'll have no choice but to shoot to kill. It's a funny way of fighting a war, sir. <laughs> You're the second to say that today. I'll just say this. It's convenient and it avoids unnecessary bloodshed. Well, if you say so, sir. I do say so, Sergeant. We have a truce. And any man found violating this will be severely punished. You can trust me, sir. I'll get the men together and warn them. Good. Captain Saunders, go to St. Ryan and see his men understand the position. And then tell Dimitri that he can withdraw his men from rearguard duty. And Lieutenant Brzezinski? I've already briefed him. He and his men left uh, for Rajik Pass an hour ago. Violetta and I climbed to the top of a low hill. Looking out to the east and north, we could see a landscape of undulating scrub and forest. We were almost at the foot of a tall, bleak mountain. Beyond it reared a second, even higher mountain. I felt a sinking feeling in my stomach. The mountains looked so grim and forbidding. Violetta pointed to the northwest. Rajik Pass runs west between those mountains, Paul. And you were brought up there? We knew nothing else. My father and grandfather were born there on the high slopes of the mountains. We kept sheep and goats. Why the high slopes? When you have seen it, you will understand. Only very early in the morning can the sun reach Rajik Pass, and then for only half an hour. It is narrow and rocky at the bottom, and dark, like the inside of a deep well. Very little can grow, but higher up it is a little brighter, and grass and bushes are able to grow. It is a lonely, silent place. There is a story that many hundreds of years ago, an army was trapped in Rajik Pass by the Turks. They were all killed. And what about the path out to the west? I don't know. Perhaps the path was not known in those days. Well, I hope you're right about it. Do you not believe me? Well, of course I believe you. It's just that, well, I feel uneasy. Remember, you were only a small child when you went over it. I can still remember it. The way through will be very difficult and dangerous. But the path is there. Well, let's carry on. I hope Major Ramsden's column is far away. I have to be careful we don't walk into the arms of the Germans. Oh, well, I have never known a road as bad as this. <laughs> no, of course. It is as you told me, there is no road, just a goat track. The Ahammer, your hands in another three kilometers, there will be nothing but a rocky valley floor. We will abandon the lorries and camouflage them, then we shall have to travel like Major Amstens people on foot. You can use one of the half-tracks, Neil. Yeah, I am tempted. But no, not for a while. The exercise will do me good. You know that, Lieutenant Racer. Walking is the finest exercise a man can do. I thought that running... Ah, was... for short, but perhaps. But a man can walk and walk without getting tired once he becomes accustomed to it. And in what better place could a man walk? <laughs> Look at it, Lieutenant. Raw nature, unspoiled. If not for those damn diesel fumes, we would be able to smell the freshness of the countryside. Not for long, Hemayor. From what I have heard, Rajak Pass is bleak and desolate. Very little grows there. Well, whatever it is like, it must be an improvement on the eastern front. Compared to that, my dear Reza, even living in a cave is preferable. Yeah? The deeper we go into the mountain foothills the less likely it is we will receive orders from headquarters. Huh? <laughs> oh, anyway, let us not worry. Look out on the beauties of nature huh? and try to forget the harshness of reality. Here, try one of these cigars. Stop here for a while, Paul. Oh, <clears throat> gladly. But why? Is there a reason? This hilltop commands a view of the entrance to the pass. Hmm. I think before going closer, it is better to make sure we are alone. Oh, well, I can see what you mean by it being a grim place. Yeah, it reminds me of those gruesome fairy stories I read when I was a little one. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? How small kids love being scared. Do you know, I remember when I was in school and someone... What is it? We are not alone. I don't see anything. Over there on the right. See the outcrop of rocks? Yeah. There are men passing by. There, do you see? Yes. Yes, there's... Oh, 
Well, there's about a dozen of them. They are being very careful, as though expecting to be attacked. See how they keep to the shelter of the rocks and bushes. Who are they? Surely they're not Germans. It is a mystery to me. No, not Germans, and certainly not partisans. They all wear the same uniform, but rough and ill-fitting. Could they be your English soldier? No. If I didn't know better, I'd say... <sighs> no, that would be ridiculous. In war, even the ridiculous is possible. You think they are Russians? Yes, but I can't be sure. What in heaven's name are Russians doing this far west? The last I heard, they were 400 miles away. <sighs> no, Viola, they can't be Russians. It is possible the Russians parachuted some men into the mountains to harass the Germans. Yes. Now, that is a possibility. The fact that there's supposed to be a Waffen SS battalion in the area could have attracted them. <sighs> All right. Supposing we have Russians and Germans in the vicinity. What about Major Ramsden and his group? Is it possible they could be already inside the pass? No, no I don't think so. If that were the case, the Germans would be guarding the pass entrance. And as you can see, there's no one there. The Waffen SS won't make any effort to conceal their presence. Yet these Russians, if they are Russians, these men are heading for the bar. This is all so damn confusing. Perhaps we can make contact with them. No, not until we can positively identify them. I can go alone, pretend I'm a peasant girl. No, Violetta. Just the thought of what could happen to you makes me shudder. I think the best plan is to wait here and see what happens. the disciplined movement of the mystery soldiers in the drab khaki uniforms. We counted 15, and they all cautiously advanced up to the entrance of the pass and regrouped. Then they split up into two parties and began to climb the sloping ground on either side of the pass. Their behavior gave me the impression that they were staking out an ambush. Soon they were lost to sight, and we were enveloped in a desolate silence. Not even a bird chirped. Well, Paul, do we stay here? Uh, I don't know. Everything is as clear as a handful of mud. Having come all this way, I can't take any unnecessary risks. You know, it might be better if we wait until dark and then head east looking for Major Ramsden. If that is, if he and his people haven't been wiped out by the Waffen SS. If they fought it out, we would find evidence of the battle. Yeah, that's true. Another way would be to make contact with the local partisans. They would know what has been happening. After recent experience, you know how suspicious I am about partisans. With all due respect to yourself, Fioletta. I understand. What would they be? Communists? The main group here are Republicans. That's all I know. Their base is the village of Komasek, about 60 kilometers east of here. Oh, 60 kilometers. Are we sure to run into some of their people before traveling that far? The Republicans won't give us any trouble. They tend to concentrate on fighting the Germans rather than other partisan groups. Well, that makes a refreshing change. Well, we'd better make a start. Uh, you know, I'm getting rather tired of sitting here. Sit down, Paul. Hmm? It is not wise to show yourself yet. And we must keep to... Down, Paul! What the hell? We saw earlier. We must have seen us and doubled back to him. Damn, they've got us cold. To, to run down the hill. No, no, forget about it. That would be just plain suicide. If only we knew who they are. I don't know what to do about this. Violetta, I'm sorry, but I've decided that we'll have to surrender to them. Oh. There's no other way. And I will say goodbye now, Paul. Goodbye? What the heck are you talking about? What do you mean? I mean that I will shoot myself rather than be taken prisoner. What? Oh, no, Violetta. Please, Paul. If you really love me. All around us, drab, khaki-clad figures moved towards us. But for the moment, they were forgotten. 
Instead, I stared, transfixed with horror, as Violetta clicked the safety off her automatic pistol and raised the muzzle to her mouth. was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dippenthal. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Thirty dossier. Every day at this time, we bring you dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. Present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. I saw the muzzle of Violetta's gun going up to her open mouth. Her eyes were wide, looking at me. Around us, men in drab khaki uniforms closed in, firing an occasional shot over our heads. I was frozen with horror at what I knew Violetta was about to do. And then, as the muzzle went into her mouth, I acted, and the palm of my hand slapped the side of her pistol. Uh, no, Paul! That's not the way! Oh, please, give me the gun back. I, I don't want them to take me alive. Uh, don't be too hasty, Violetta. We don't even know who they are. If you really love me, Paul... They're firing have... over our heads. Stand up and raise your hands. No, give me my gun. I'm sorry. Get down, Paul. At least let them... Uh, there. You see? They stop shooting. They're staring at me. Now get up and stand beside me. This is madness. They will torture and kill us, I know. As long as they're not Germans, I can talk my way out of this. They're closing in. Leave your weapons where they are. Go. He speaks Croat. With a heavy accent. A Russian or a Polish. Oh, come on, do as he says. Now, you are partisans, Doc. Uh, well, we might be. Who are you? I ask the questions. What partisan group? We are not partisans. What else can you be dressed like that, huh? You are Russian, the Red Army. It makes no difference to me whether I take you back dead or alive. If you refuse to answer my questions, it will be dead. For the last time, who are you? <laughs> facing me was big. His ill-fitting uniform was dirty and patched in places. The weapon he pointed at me was a German Schmeisser machine gun. In a flash it came to me that these men were certainly not Russian paratroopers or even regulars of the Red Army. The big man's eyes narrowed as he waited for my answer. Well, have you no words to save your life? I'm Lieutenant Paul Sale of British Military Intelligence, Section MI9. Ah, you can prove this? It would be difficult. And a woman? She's been my guide. <laughs> if you are an Englishman, you tell me of your princess, the daughter of your king and queen. There are two princesses, Elizabeth and Margaret. Hmm. 
Very good. Another question. There is a statue of a famous warrior on the embankment of the Thames. Who is it? Do I get a prize for the right answer? Perhaps it will save your life. Now, give me the answer, please. Queen Bodicea riding a chariot. You will also find Cleopatra's needle on the embankment. <laughs> that is what I wanted to hear. And the Houses of Parliament and the Tower uh, of London. Enough, enough. I take you to Major Ramston. Uh, you, Ramston. Know. you know the Major? Do you? Well, he's the man I need to contact. Where is he? Some kilometers over that way. Are you satisfied about my identity now? Da. Good. Then you will kindly introduce yourself. Lieutenant Dmitry Akenov of the Red Army. I and my men were taken prisoner at Odessa. We escaped from the prison of war camp just before the SS execution squads arrived. We joined up with Major Ramsden ten days ago. Safety in numbers. <laughs> you can uh, take us to Major Ramsden then? Uh, I will leave some men to guard the entrance of Rajik Pass. The Major's radar was damaged, so he'll be pleased to get news from his superiors. Violetta leaned against me, relieved and drained by the tension of the previous few minutes. The burly Russian officer shouted some commands to his men. We had our weapons returned and then followed Dmitri Arkhanov down the hill in an easterly direction. Three other Russians accompanied us. Paul, I don't know what to say except thank you. How are you feeling now? Better. A lot better. I accepted death, and now I find I am gloriously alive. You can trust these men? I'm sure of it. Anyway, there isn't any choice, but they seem genuine enough. What were those strange questions the Russian asked you? <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps he's visited London as a tourist. Uh, hey, Lieutenant Akinov. Star, what is it? Have you been to London? <laughs> Where all the rich men wear top hats, sir. That is what I was taught at school, but the answer is no. Ah, uh, well, I thought not. But where did you get the questions you asked me? Major Ramsden taught me. I'm to ask them if I meet a man who claims to be English. Uh, the questions for Americans, French, Italians. <laughs> it was so simple, even a tourist could have answered them. Uh, how, how far will we have to walk? Four or five kilometers. First, we meet Kovac's partisans. They are stationed two kilometers ahead of the main column. Partisans? Are they from Kamasep? No. Their leader promised to help the major as far as they pass. Then they will go back to close the road behind the Waffen SS battalion. You mean ahead of the Germans? No. I mean what I say, behind. They will cut off any attempt the Germans might make to contact the battalion. Well, that doesn't make sense. The battalion commander will be in radio contact with his headquarters. Oh, no, the radio is out of action. Now, look, I, I don't understand any of this. Surely it would be better if the road was blocked ahead of the Germans. Ah, but the major has a truce with the German battalion commander. It is making life easy for us all. But I'm sure Major Ramsden will explain everything to you. An SS battalion must be at least 6,000 strong. How many are in Major Ramsden's column? Oh, about uh, 300, including women, children. And he's made a deal with the Germans? I find that hard to believe. Ah, it is strange, but there are good reasons. Well, Major, this is as far as we can take the lorries. Yeah, I can see that. Let me see. It's half past four. I think we call it the day, Vesa. We can spend the night here and move on tomorrow. Yeah, man. And get the men to move the lorries under the trees and camouflage them. With a little luck, they will still be serviceable when we come back this way. But the partisans will take them. Not if they are temporarily disabled and the parts are hidden. Uh -huh. I will place the sentries and send out patrols into the hills. Within a two-kilometer radius will be sufficient. Uh, look at that sky, Lieutenant. The Man. clouds are heavy with rain. I think we can expect a thunderstorm. Yeah, the summer is finished. Uh, a pity. But autumn is also a beautiful time of the year, is it not? The leaves turn brown and fall. And it gets very cold, Hamayo. Oh, Reza, I can see you do not have the soul of a poet. Go and post your orders and leave me alone to meditate on the glories of nature. 
It's going very slow, Major. I know. I know, Saunders. The baggage carts are the problem here. I don't know whether it wouldn't be better to abandon them and have everything carried. Well, the column would move faster. But then I have to think of the small children. Oh, damn it, yes. We'll abandon the carts when we move off in the morning. You'll have to organize some baggage details. We're no more than five kilometers from the entrance to Rajak Pass, Chief. Wouldn't it be better if we just pressed on until we get there? I've told you before, Captain Saunders, I'm not one of your Red Indian chiefs. Oh, sorry about that. It slipped out. As for your question, I'd prefer not to travel after dark. Dimitri hasn't reported back yet from his patrols of the pass's entrance. Heaven knows what he might have found there. For all we know, a brigade of pouncers is waiting there to pounce on us. Well, I doubt if they'll send a pouncer brigade to deal with us. Oh, I didn't believe they'd send a battalion of seasoned Waffen SS after us either, but they did. No, Captain, I think we'll keep our eyes open for a good place to camp for the night and then press on at first light. Hey, hey, look, sir. Coming in from the west. Light plane. Yeah, reconnaissance aircraft. I can't quite make it out. It, it looks like a Lysander. Well, anyhow, it's one of ours. He's keeping altitude. Well, can you blame him with all these ruddy mountains and high hills around us? Yes. RAF markings. Could have been sent out to check on our position, Major. But it's been seven days since they heard from us. They're sure to be wondering what's happened. Damn. Wish I had a wireless transmitter. He's dipping his wings and... Hey, look. A parachutist. Well, <laughs> that's one way to get a message to us. <laughs> Come on, Saunders. Let's go and receive our visitors and get the latest news. Parachutist made a good landing on a hillside. Even before he'd discarded his harness, he was surrounded by a large group of men with guns leveled at him. Major Ramsden and his adjutant breathlessly broke through the ring and introduced themselves. The parachutist introduced himself as Colonel James Horton, attached to a special intelligence services unit. He stripped off a black one-piece jumpsuit and stood tall and resplendent in his military uniform. With all due deference to the visitor's rank, Major Ramsden led him down the hill to where the long column of rickety wooden carts and travel-weary people were passing by. The Major told his adjutant to order the column to camp. Colonel Horden's eagle eyes took in every detail, yet he said very little. In fact, he was being pointedly evasive about the purpose of his arrival. Major Ramsden began to feel uneasy. When the large tent used as command headquarters had been erected, Ramsden and Horden were left alone. Uh, the orderly will bring us a meal as soon as it's been prepared. I had a large meal before I left Italy. One never knows if one will survive the flight, you know. The Luftwaffe has been very busy hereabouts, according to our reports. Now, I can't say we've seen any German planes lately, sir. The, the last time was over a week ago when our radio was destroyed. Ah, so that's the reason we haven't heard from you. Yes. Blast it. I should have brought a transmitter with me. Your position was reported to us yesterday when some U.S. planes passed over on a bombing mission. They gave the SS chaps behind you a bit of a walloping on the way. Yes, we heard it in the distance. When we realized you were so close to Rajak Pass, Colonel Egan decided to send me to put you on the right track. Don't want you bottled up in the pass, do we? A week ago, we sent an intelligence officer to make contact with you, a Lieutenant Sale. Did he arrive? No, not yet. Ah. So it's as well I stuck my neck out and flew in to join you. Sale must have been captured or fallen foul of the partisans. They're a damn tricky lot, you know. He was coming to you across country. Landed him on the coast with two guides. Haven't heard a peep since. Well, why wasn't he flown in like you? Risky business right now. ME-109's everywhere. It's touch and go if my own pilot will get back. Nice chap, too. Still, it had to be done. The idea was to stop you from taking these people into Rajak Pass. There's no way out, you know. Dead end. The SS will trap you there and cut you to pieces. I rather suspected as much. Intelligence made a mistake ordering you here. Damn silly of them. The only way is to turn north and then west. Correct. Oh, yes, by the way, I'll be taking command of the show from now on. We'll get the lads all sparked up and give the Nazis a bit of a walloping on the way home, eh? Uh... I think I'd better put you in the picture. Uh, 
Uh, some water with it, sir. No, thanks. I'll drink it straight. Have you had a set, too, with the SS yet? Well, yes, we did have a couple of shows. They got the worst of it, I'm glad to say. Uh, my adjutant, Captain Saunders, will show you his reports, of course. Uh, now, about turning north... Oh, yes. We want you to make for a strip of coast about 15 miles off Dubrovnik. Uh, excuse me interrupting, sir. There is a problem. I've been told a brigade of panzers is stationed there, and one of the groups has been ordered to engage us when we're clear of the rocky terrain. Panzers at Dubrovnik? I didn't know that. They're standing by as reserves for the Italian campaign. You seem to know a lot. Are you sure this isn't just a rumor? Well, sir, you'll understand when I explain everything to you. You see, Major Scheer, who's commanding the SS battalion behind us, he warned me about the panzers. He, he, what's this, Ramsden? You mean he just trotted along here and warned you, just like that? But, no, no, not exactly. Uh, I went to see him... Give me another drink while I digest this. Something strange happened two nights ago which made us believe that perhaps the war was over. I went to see him under a flag of truce. In a nutshell, I came away with a gentleman's agreement between us. We don't attack him, and he doesn't attack us. A gentleman's agreement with an SS commander? You astound me, Major. There are no gentlemen in the SS. Major Shear is an exception. Why should he even consider a truce? He's no more than 15 kilometers behind you, with a force that could mop you up in an hour. Phew. I thought you were all oddly relaxed here. He, he needs the truce as much as we do. Look, Ramsden, I think you'd better start this story from the beginning. Yes, I, I suppose it must sound rather confusing. Mind-boggling, old chap. Another brandy, if you don't mind. The sun had dropped behind the hills when we wearily made our way into the encampment. I was pleasantly surprised to see how well everyone appeared. Several women stared at us as we passed. Their clothes were patched but clean. The children ran in front of us, calling to us in English. Dimitri and his fellow Russians clapped their hands and good-heartedly shooed them away. An assortment of men in makeshift uniform stopped their drilling and looked at us with curiosity. There were tents and wooden carts everywhere. It reminded me of my history lectures about medieval armies on the march. As I was to learn later, that's exactly the way the march to the coast was being conducted. The Russian officer held up a hand close to a large brown tent, and we stood with our escort while he went inside. Major, I have a surprise for you. I say, who is this ragged fellow? Oh, this is Lieutenant Dmitri Arkhanov. He's in charge of a group of Russian escaped prisoners who joined us a couple of weeks back. A bloody Russian, eh? Oh, he and his men have done sterling work. Uh, Dmitri, this is Colonel Horden of the British Military Intelligence. Sir? The, the Colonel's taking over command. Uh, was there something you wanted to tell me? Hmm. We captured a man and a woman at the entrance to the pass. The man claims he's English. He wants to see you. Did he give a name? Uh, what was it? Uh, 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 Lieutenant Paul Sale. Ah, excellent. So he's alive and safe. Ah, I could have saved myself an uncomfortable journey. This is the fellow I told you about, Ramsden. Mm. Tell him to come in. Uh, there are no Germans at the pass? No, Major. I've left 16 men under Sergeant Kerensky to guard this slope. Good. Uh, tell this Lieutenant Sale to come inside. The woman, too. The woman must be one of the guides we sent with him. I say, the fellow looks pretty civilized for a Russian, but can you really trust them with my life? Oh, I wouldn't go that far, Ramsden. Why didn't they march east to join up with their own army? Well, that would have been suicidal for them. The Germans are putting every available man in to stem the advance of the Red Army. In no time, they'd have been recaptured and probably executed. Ah, so there you are, Lieutenant Sale. Uh, so you got here at last. Yes, uh, good evening, sir. You look all in. Have a bad trip, did you? Uh, well, it was hair-raising, sir. Well, I am Colonel Horton, and this is Major Ramsden, the man who has so cleverly got the column this far. How do you do, sir? How do you do? 
Uh, the woman is Violetta Georgius, and she's guided me here from the partisan Carescu's territory. Good show, young woman. Uh, she speaks no English, I'm afraid. Oh, rotten luck. Fine-looking girl, I must say. What happened to the guide you brought from Italy? One was shot in a partisan ambush. Uh, the woman, Maria, she was... Well, she was executed. It was found that she was working with the Germans, you see. I say, she was one of our agents. She admitted everything to me before I... Well, before she was shot. She had been working for the Germans all along. Oh, well, war's a tough business. You can never tell with people, especially these Yugoslavs. They either love or hate, nothing in between. Uh, the colonel flew in only two hours ago to warn us against going into the past. That's the message that you were bringing to me. Uh, it would have been better to have flown me in the first place. Only I uh, wouldn't then have met Violetta, of course. The Americans warned us the skies were black with ME-109s. Didn't see one on the way here, though. Really quite odd. <clears throat> yes, sir. Oh, um, are you and the girl, uh, rather close, if you're not, I mean? Uh, well, um, I suppose I could say yes, sir. I see. Well, rather irregular. Major Amsterdam, I need a detailed report from this officer on his journey as soon as possible... The American fellow who was acting as your adjutant can help him out. Yes, Captain Saunders will help him. Um, he won't be far away, Sale. Um, excuse me, sir. I have a favor to ask if you don't mind. I, I haven't had a real sleep in oh, five days now, and I'm completely fagged out. So do you mind if I... I'm sure you can stay awake long enough to write it, Sale. That will be all. Oh, yes, report to me at six in the morning, and I'll outline your future duties. Yes. Uh, Colonel, I, I think the lieutenant would be able to present you with a more precise report after he's had some sleep. Don't you think? Both he and the woman look dead on their feet to me. Oh, very well, Sale. But I want the report as soon as feasible. Dismiss. Yes, sir. And um, thank you, sir. Major, shall we get down to some serious business? Yes, I brought with me a new ordnance map of the area. Good one. Produced by the Americans with the help of aerial photographs. Until now, this has been a very sparsely populated area, and we had very little information about it. Yes, I can understand that. I can certainly believe that. Things haven't changed much in the last eight centuries. The whole area is crisscrossed by nothing more than goat tracks. Yes, we've spent the last three days traveling along one of them. Before I left, I planned a route we can take. Now, see her, Major. Yes? Less than a mile north of Roger lies a valley. It's, uh, it's quite long. Now, yeah. let, let me see. Uh, one, two, three. Yes, I should think about seven miles. Yeah, I think you're right, yes. Now, it's fairly flat... Very wide. And that will take us over to here. A spot of rough country for another mile. And then we come to this valley over here, which runs northwest for, let's see, about five miles. Would you care for a drink, sir? Oh, yes, please. What a good idea. Here we are. Oh, splendid. Now then... As you can see, the hills are lower now. And there's a small road which goes along here. Yes. And there we are. We come out onto the coastal plain. Now, from there, I should think it's less than 50 miles to the sea. And I have in mind this bay here. No rendezvous has been arranged yet, has it? Oh, no. But there are three agents living along the coast with shortwave transmitters... When we're close enough to give an ETA, I'll send a message to the nearest one to be relayed to Intelligence HQ. Hmm. It'll take oh, 15 days at least to make the journey. Oh, oh! I'll find a way to jolly us along a bit quicker, Ramson. Our greatest danger will be, uh, will be here when we break out onto the coastal plain. Oh, the panzer this Major Scheer warned you of. Yes, the panzers, but uh, also from Major Scheer himself. 
Oh? Our truce lasts until we make our run for the sea. He can offer no guarantee of being able to maintain it beyond that point. Now, personally, Ramston, I think this whole truce is a sham. Can't you see the way his mind is working? He wants you to go into Radic Pass. Then he can seal you up nicely and starve you into surrender. Why else would he warn you of a panzer brigade to the northwest? Really, I don't even believe the panthers exist. What we have to do is keep a close watch on this lot. Avoid letting them within ten miles of our rear. After tomorrow night, when this sure fellow realizes we're not going into Rudrick Pass, he will turn nasty. Mark my words. Ramsden, it will be our rear we must watch. We must lay mines and ambushes to slow them down. Well, only if the Germans show signs of aggression. We are at war with them, Ramston. The Germans have been showing signs of aggression since day one, since the 3rd of September 1939. I don't need to be reminded of that, sir. However, I did give Major Shear my word of honor. Very damned chivalrous of you, my dear Major Ramston. However... The days of chivalry are long dead. We will wallop these SS blighters on every possible occasion, starting from tomorrow. Now then, I want you to give me a full list of the men you have, their names, ranks, nationalities, and what duties they are performing at present. I'll fetch Captain Sanders, sir. He has all the details. <laughs> Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dippenfall. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Springbok 930 Dossier. Every day at this time, we bring you dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense. From the files of interesting and fascinating people. Present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. Ah, there you are, Sanders. Oh, hi, Chief. I mean, look, you can call me any darn thing you like right now for all I care. Why, is something wrong? Rather. Colonel Bloody James Horden is taking over command of the column. Oh, that's pretty rough. I'll be taking over your job. Heaven knows what he'll be detailing you to do. By the way, he wants to see you. What for? He wants a detailed list of every person in the column. Names, dates of birth, what? sex, everything you can think of. He thinks he's in command of the Brigade of Guards in Barrow. Oh, no. He's asking for the impossible. Oh, he won't understand the meaning of the word. But it could take me days. Well, that's a pity, Sanders, because he wants it now, this instant. I can't. I'm sure you'll be able to talk your way out of it, old chap. Say, does he know about our deal with uh, Major Shear? <laughs> oh, yes, but I don't think he approves. He says we must wallop the Waffen SS every now and then. Well, what does that mean? Uh, that's one of his words, meaning to knock hell out of them. Oh, he must be joking. 
I mean, Major Shear only has to sneeze and we'd be overrun. I know, I know. I don't like it. I thought he seemed a good guy. Well, you'll find out for yourself in a few minutes. He's impatiently waiting for you and your statistics. Oh, no. Oh, a Lieutenant Sale came in with a, a partisan woman an hour ago. Did you see him? Sure. I fixed him up with a small tent. They're pegging it up just down by the stream. Well, I'll pop down there and have a chat with him while you walk into the jaws of death. Oh, no. Good luck, Saunders. Telling me that no figures have been kept. Damn it all, I've never known such sloppiness in all my life. We've been on the move most of the time, sir. It isn't easy to keep details. A weak excuse for inefficiency, Sanders. Here I am leading a large column of fugitives to safety. And I know nothing about it. A bit absurd, don't you think? We managed very well until this afternoon, Colonel. Do I detect a note of defiance in your voice, Captain? No, sir. But I do resent being treated like a sort of messenger boy. You're here to take orders and obey them, Sanders. Sir. Oh, very well. Can you give me any details, for instance, how many fighting men we have? Well, I can do that, sir, yeah. There are 218 able-bodied men altogether, but that isn't counting a band of partisans commanded by a man called Kovacs. They are helping us as far as Rajak Pass. He's got about 80 under him, but... A lot of them are women. Oh, I don't want to know about partisans, Saunders. They're usually more trouble than they're worth. What about our regular strength? Let me see. Uh, we were joined by a group of Americans and British this morning. Uh, that made uh, 122 British in Commonwealth, 27 Americans, 26 Russians, 23 Poles, uh... There are nine French, nine Dutch, four Norwegians, six Danes, eight Belgians, and... Yeah, well, I, I think that's about it. And how many is that altogether? Uh, 234, sir. That includes nine officers. Ramsden said it was like the League of Nations. Now I see what he means. I suppose they're a pretty unruly lot. We all get along fine together, Colonel. From what I've seen today, they're all badly in need of some very stiff discipline. Can't say I like the idea of having Russians with us. Well, Lieutenant Arkhanov and his men have proved their reliability time and time again, sir. <sighs> well, I suppose I'll have to put up with them, grin and bear it. What? We also have 18 wounded, but only two of them seriously, sir. Very well. Tell me about the civilians. Where do they hail from? Well, they're all British, sir. We've got no male civilians with us. Go on. They were all in the same internment camp. Seems the guards got jittery and deserted. But before they went, they released the prisoners, and the British ones joined us about 15 days ago. How many? 46 women and 8 small children. What do you mean by small? Babes in arms and toddlers? Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I was forgetting Lady Agnes. Lady who? Uh, didn't Major Ramsden tell you about Lady Agnes Collier? Would I be asking you if he had? Hmm. She joined us a few days ago, soon after ordering her way out of an internment camp to the north of here. What do you mean by ordered her way out? When you meet Lady Agnes, you'll understand, sir. She apparently ordered her guards to let her go. And they did. How extraordinary. Uh, she's got a way of taking command, sir. At the moment, she's taken charge of the women and the children. A good thing. Damned if I want to be bothered. Well, Sanders, forewarned is forearmed. Now then, I want to know about weapons, ammunition, and food supply. I know you must be feeling exhausted, Lieutenant. Yes, I, I am. Sir. Look, I just want to know a few details. Uh, did you actually reach the entrance to the pass? Yes, sir. And then we were intercepted by Dimitri's Russians. At first, I thought they were going to shoot us as spies. <laughs> yes, that sounds like Dimitri. Uh, what was it like in the pass? It's a pretty grim-looking place, sir. The trees end just short of it, and there's rough scrub and rocks from then on. From what I could see, the floor of the pass is just rocks. The letter tells me that no one lives there nowadays. Uh, and the slopes? Steep, with bare rock and patches of bush. 
Violetta says higher up, uh, about a thousand feet where the sun can reach, there's some poor grazing land where they used to keep sheep and goats. How does she know so much about Rajik? Most of the locals, they just shrug and say no one ever goes there. Well, Violetta's family used to live on the higher steps. Uh, they were the last to leave about ten years ago. Well, that's very interesting. So she knows it quite well, eh? Yeah, good show. Uh, the foot of the pass was known to the people who lived there as the Vale of Death. Uh, a very grim name. Yes. Uh, the story goes that a few hundred years ago, a, a Bulgar army was trapped in the pass, and they were starved and wiped out to a man by Muslim invaders. Which would have happened to us had we gone in there. Yes, sir. It's, uh, it's as well we were warned in time. Another day, and we would have been trapped. Uh, but you're wrong, sir. There is a way out to the coast. But but you were sent here to divert me from the past. Yes, I know. But military intelligence was right in its first assumption, eh? Hey? You see, there's a goat track at the far end of the pass. It's a very difficult path, but it can be done. How do you know this? Violetta. She told me her father once took her over the other side to a town called... What was the name, Mara? Um, uh, yeah, uh, Viasco. Viasco? Mm. Well, I'll, I'll check it on Colonel Horton's new map. He says it's the latest American aerial reconnaissance photographs that have been used in making this map. You say she actually remembers the route? Well, I, I don't know that for sure, sir. She would have to take a good look around to find it. She was only... Well, she was very small when she did the trip. By heavens, son, you, you've given me a lot of hope. Look, there are panthers to the north of us, and I wouldn't like to see us having to run the gauntlet through that lot. Look, I I'll leave you to sleep now. We'll be moving out at seven. Find out all you can from this young woman, and we'll talk about it again tomorrow. All right, sir. Oh, you said earlier that she doesn't speak any English. Uh, that's right, but I'm trying to teach her. Well, we'll, we'll have to use you as our interpreter. Have a good sleep, laddie. Thank you, sir. I thought you were dead asleep. I heard you talking to someone outside. Yes, yes, it was Major Ramsden. Did you tell him about the track leading out of the path? Yes, I did. But get some sleep now, darling. We're in safe hands. There's nothing more for us to worry about. I hope you're right, Paul. But I have a funny wriggling sensation in my stomach. It tells me that all is not well. At six, I was called by an orderly. By that time, the camp was already alive with activity. Rough wooden carts were loaded and mules put into the traces. Dozens of people were at the stream, washing and bathing in the chill morning air. A smell of cooking came from a makeshift kitchen in the center of the camp. Except for the profusion of weapons, no one would think a battalion of Waffen SS was only a few miles in our rear. After a quick wash of the stream, I was approached by the American officer I'd met the previous night. Oh, hi, Paul. Oh. Feeling a little better today? Oh, like new. Good. Say, uh, that's a pretty girl you brought in with you. <laughs> yes, I know. So hands off, all right? Oh, I see. It's like that, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, last night, the colonel said I had to G you up into making a full report on your journey. Uh, I was rather hoping you'd forget. Oh, no such luck. Anyhow, when we move off, we'll ride one of the carts for a spell while we ride it out. It's not going to be easy with all those bumps. Yes. Why can't he accept a verbal report? Oh, search me. Seems like he's a stickler for the rule book. Mm, which was designed as an excuse for field commanders who lost battles. Mm, that's a great way of putting it. Well, anyway, I'm glad we're turning north instead of heading into the pass. What? Well, it sounds a real creepy place. It, did you say the column's turning north? Oh, yeah, that's right. Our Russians have reported a track three miles farther on. It'll take us on a roundabout route to the coast. I think you're wrong. When I spoke to Major Ramsden last night, I gained the impression we were going into the pass. But, Paul, there's no way out. I mean, isn't that why you came here? To warn us away? There is a path. Huh? Uh, look, if you'll excuse me, I'll see Major Ramsden. He's with the Colonel. Yeah, right. I'll see both of them.
You've no more landmines, you say? Uh, we never had any. Uh, when we ambushed the SS, I borrowed some from Kovacs. Oh, Kovacs. Kovacs? The, the partisan leader. Oh, that fellow. Has he any more? Oh, plenty. British made. They were dropped to him by our people. There's no problem then, Ramston. Requisition all he has. Well, I'll ask him. Uh... Tell him. Don't ask him. Asking invites refusal. Just tell him we want them. Colonel, may I point out that Kovacs won't take kindly to orders. He's, he's under no obligation to help us at all. Damn it, old man. He got the bloody things from us in the first place. Tell him we need them back. Yes, sir. <clears throat> ah, here's that young fellow, Sale. Good morning, Lieutenant. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Have you brought my report? Uh, no, not yet, sir. I wanted to tell you something about Roger Pass. Perhaps Major Ramsden discussed it with you. I was just about to do so, Sale. What about the pass? Sale told me last night that there's a track at the far end which will lead us to the coast. Utter rubbish. Military intelligence. Check very carefully after their initial mistake. There is no way through. But the young woman that Sale brought in with him knows the way. She's actually been down to the coast along it. When? When was it, Sale? Ah, uh, it was about 12 years ago, sir. Her family farmed on the upper slopes. She must have been a child. She was, sir. Children have very fertile imaginations. Is her family still there in Radjik? Uh, no, they moved south to more fertile land about 10 years ago. Well, I can't risk the lives of so many people on the memory of a girl. If we move into Radjik and there's no way out, that's it. We're finished. We could be just as easily wiped out if we run into the Panthers. There is a chance we can avoid meeting them. No, we will follow my original plan northwest to a point south of Dubrovnik. But, Colonel, look... If... That is final. I want to hear no more about it. Now, will you kindly see this Kovacs fellow and take his landmines... As for you, Sale, get on with your report, and I'll see the Major later to assign your duties. Colonel Heydrich. Yeah, Herr General. Has Colonel Schwartz reported back yet? Not yet. It is possible he's been delayed, sir. I have a battalion of 6,000 men out in the wilderness and can't make contact with him. What a ridiculous situation. Oh, there's been a lot of enemy air activity in the last few days. It is possible Major Shear's radio has been put out of action. Yeah, that seems to be the only logical explanation. All the same, we cannot run a war like this. It was those damned fools in Berlin who ordered me to send Shear after those fugitives. Just one of a batch of ridiculous orders I've been receiving lately. Colonel Schwartz had a, an idea fixed in his head that uh, Shear was malingering. Schwartz was always bloody-minded. If one of our pilots bailed out and landed in his garden, Schwartz would demand to have him charged with trespassing. <laughs> Shear is a good man, reliable. He's been in my command for three years now. Imagine how I felt having to send him off west after a bunch of escaped prisoners. Colonel Schwartz dislikes Shear intensely, sir. I know, I know. It was a mistake to send him. When he does arrive back, he'll produce a written report that will stretch from here to Belgrade. Ah, but I do wish you would hurry up. He might return with the battalion. Not Schwartz. He'll be in a hurry to join the Ninth Pencils at Dubrovnik. He wants to take a group of tiger tanks to meet the fugitives when they come out of the mountains. If you don't mind me saying, Herr General, I think it would have been better to have left Major Shear to finish them, and then report to the Eastern Front. Yes, I agree. Well, it is too late now. Looking through Major Shear's earlier radio reports, there's quite a lot of partisan activity along the road to Commissar. Are you suggesting that Schwarz might have been ambushed by a partisan group? It is possible. Give him another three hours and report to me for a review of the situation. Your commander does not believe there is a way through the pass? He thinks I am a liar? No, no, dear letter. It's not like that. He... He just doesn't want to risk so many lives. You were very young when your father took you to Biasco. But he did take me, Paul, and that proves there is a way through. All right, I agree with you, Violetta, but I'm not in charge, am I? 
Colonel Horton isn't the type of man I can argue with. He is a fool, a blind, arrogant idiot. I should go to him myself. And shout at him in a language he doesn't even understand? Oh. I'll throw you out and tell you to go back to your farm. I am not under his orders, so I will go into the pass myself and find the goat track. Uh, that's an idea. I will go now, this afternoon. Uh, don't be hasty. I want to go with you. The column is turning north very soon. We will go then. Uh, no, wait, wait. First, I'll have to get his permission to go. What if he refuses? Oh, I don't know. I'll just have to phrase my argument well enough to sway him. Just give me some time to think. How long would it take? Half a day through the pass. Then we will have to climb up the slopes to the house my family abandoned. Well, that will take four hours. After that, it will take a day to check the track. Well, that's, uh, that's almost three and a half days before we can rejoin the column. Ah, oh, there is a problem. The Germans following the column. By that time, they will be between us. Damn it. Is there another way of reaching the column? The, the Germans will have passed the entrance to Rajik Pass by then. We can catch up by outflanking them. The country is very rough and hilly, but yes, it can be done. But it will add another day. Yeah, a day that can't be spared. And then there's yet another even bigger problem. How can the column retrace its steps with a battalion of SS in the rear? Of course, Paul. It's just hopeless. There's only one way. Mm -hmm. You must talk this commander into entering the pass. Well, I don't know how I'll do that. The progress of the column was very slow. The people had now been doing it for so long that walking had become a habit. Make no mistake, though, it was well organized. Armed men flanked the hills on each side of the column. Three miles to the rear was a Sergeant Ryan in charge of some 40 British soldiers. Scouting ahead was Dmitry Akinov and his Russians. Kovacs' patriots walked with the column. After considering my dilemma, I left Violetta and went in search of Colonel Horden. He was walking with Major Ramsden at the front. I don't know what happened to the Luftwaffe. According to our intelligence reports, the area is swarming with ME-109s, yet we haven't seen a plane all morning. The intelligence must be wrong. We've seen very few German aircraft, apart from a, a minor strafing before we reached Commerset. When you lost your radio? Mm. Well, it's very odd, Ramsden. Damn it, I do feel uncomfortable having all those Germans behind us. Something must be done about it. How far back do you say they are, Ramsden? About ten miles. If they come closer, St. Ryan will send ahead to warn me. Oh, here's Lieutenant Sayer. I wonder what he wants. Uh, you asked for his report. Oh, yes, of course. Seems quite a bright fellow. Excuse me, I... I'd like to have a word with you, sir. And I to you, Sale, have you brought your report? Uh, I, I, I haven't quite finished it, sir. Oh, do put a little pace into it, Sale. I'll be sending you on a little reconnaissance patrol tonight. Oh, ah, uh, yes. I know what I wanted to speak to you about. That woman. Yes, sir. I hear you share the tent with her overnight. Uh, yes, sir. It's not a thing I approve of. Hardly conduct becoming a British officer in the field. Uh, but, sir, we're in love. We want to marry at the first opportunity. Oh, really, Sale? Marry a peasant woman? Good heavens, man, she can't even speak English. Uh, sir, I must object to your... Lieutenant. Right That's enough. Let me speak to Colonel Horden about this. Yes, sir. Go and finish your report, and I'll speak to you later. Seething with anger, I fell back and waited for Violetta to catch up with me. It gave me time to compose what I had to tell her. I don't see what you can say that will make any difference, Ramsden. I think you treated Sale very harshly, sir. He should know better than to get involved with the local women. Damn it all. One can't even trust them. Look at the one which was sent with him as a guide. He told me himself that she was spying for the Germans. Sir... This is not like a normal campaign. Most of us were prisoners. Well, why, some of the men haven't even seen a woman in years. I'll not tolerate blatant immorality in my command, Ramsden, and that is final. 
many of the men are cohabiting with these partisan women. Then it must be stopped. I'm horrified. Is your moral fervor worth all the trouble it will cause? Their behavior offends me, Major. In future, I want the men separated from the women when the day's march is finished. Gracious me, we can't afford to compromise our moral fiber. What about the others, sir? The French, the Poles, the Belgians? The rule applies to all. Very well, sir, but uh, I can see trouble looming. Come in, Heidrich. Uh, any sign of Schwarz yet? None, Herr General. I telephoned the Chazerny post to see if he had passed there yet. Hear me. What now, Heidrich? Somehow we have to get a message to Major Scheer ordering him to turn back. And perhaps the Luftwaffe could help out. <laughs> the Luftwaffe. Two days ago they lost 33 planes on the ground. Every serviceable plane is now on the Italian and Eastern fronts. If we are to reach Major Scheer, it will be overland. Come, come, come. Let us look at the map. We must be very close to Rajik Pass by now. Uh, yes, look at it. J just a blank space on the map. There's a supply road to the south of it, Herr General. The Wehrmacht keep it guarded by a system of watchtowers and armored cars. Forty-five kilometers from the pass, but what lies between? Partisans. Not many, but nothing will pass through without their knowledge. I was thinking of asking the Wehrmacht to send a patrol across. Oh, they would never survive. Even a force of 500 men could find itself hard oh, pressed. this madness, Heidrich. We are occupiers of this damned country. Yet our troops have to be confined to main roads. There must be a way of relaying orders to Shear. May I use the phone, Herr Herr? Yeah. Get me Wehrmacht headquarters. Grinch, this is an urgent request from General Valia. I want to know if you have anyone in radio contact with us in map reference um, 7347. Yes, but hurry, please. You think intelligence might have an agent in that area? It is possible, but intelligence can be very devious. You know how bad feelings are between the Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS. But they have been ordered many times to give us their fullest cooperation. They claim to do so, but I have my doubts. Ah, yes, Grinch. Where do you say? And his name? All right, I don't need it. Can you get a message to him? Yeah, Grinch. I shall call you back shortly. Meanwhile, call him up and tell him to stand by for the message. Look, I don't care. Get clearance from your commandant. If he doesn't cooperate, then a call to Berlin from General Valde will bring him to attention. Ah, good thinking, Heydrich. I'll compose the message now. I'll use one of the older code words. Did Grinch say where his agent is? He has a small cottage just north of Rajak Pass. From there, he could reach here in a few hours. We should have done this earlier instead of sending that strutting idiot Schwarz. Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Diffenfall. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Thirty dossier.
this time, we bring you dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense. From the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. Since his arrival by air only 24 hours earlier, Colonel Horton had succeeded in upsetting just about everyone close to him. It was only a matter of time before the high morale created by Major Ramsden and Captain Saunders would break up into a hundred petty squabbles. When we made camp that afternoon, our march had taken us eight miles north of Rajek Pass on the new route proposed by the Colonel. In spite of the fact that Violeta Georgius had insisted there was a way through the pass to the coastal plain. After the march had stopped and shelters were being erected, Captain Saunders had the unpleasant task of telling all the officers and NCOs that in future the men and women were to be separated after the hours of darkness. Colonel Horden found that any form of what he considered to be immoral behavior was abhorrent to him. That was bad enough. But an even worse idea was about to be launched. Major Ramsden, come inside, please. Yes, sir. Did you get the landmines from Kovacs? He gave me 60. Is that all he had? Yes. Oh, very well. You can send some sappers back along the trail and lay 20 of them at varying distances between here and where we turned off from the trail leading to Rajak Pass. Sir, can I make one last appeal to you? Well, what is it, Major? By doing this, you're breaking the truce between ourselves and the German Waffen-SS commander. I made no truce with him? No, but I gave him my word that we would not engage in aggressive tactics if he did likewise. Look, Ramson... We've been over this once before. We are at war with these blighters, so I see no point in playing footsy-footsy with them. The truce you made with this major share is unwarranted and quite unnecessary. We have enough fighting men in this command to harry the SS into keeping their distance. They are keeping their distance anyway. And, and because of the truce, a lot of bloodshed's being avoided. Their blood, Ramston, not ours. Very well, sir, but this decision will cost us dearly. I don't think so. May I have your permission to send a message back to Major Shear to tell him that the truce has ended? How can you stand there and suggest such a thing, Ramsden? Really, would you like to give him a map showing him where the landmines are being laid? He promised to warn me if he was forced to change his strategy, and I did likewise. At least allow me to do the decent thing, sir. Decent thing indeed. Permission is not granted, and I want to hear no more about this so-called truce. During the day, the American, Captain Saunders, had told me about Ramsden's truce with the German SS battalion. As I listened, my attitude changed from incredulous to cynical, and finally to one of thankfulness. If our party could march on its way to the coast in peace, without fear from them, then so much the better. So it came as a shock to me that evening when Saunders approached me and dolefully shook his head. You're on duty tonight, Paul. Well, I might just as well be. Violetta's furious because I can't stay with You're her. You're taking a party out to lane mines. Where? Back along the road. But, but I don't understand. Why? What about the truce? Apparently our new commanding officer doesn't believe in making truces with Germans, especially the SS. See, so we'll have to fight all the way to the coast. You will. What? How do you mean? I'm pulling out, Paul. I have had a gutful of your Colonel Horton. But you can't just You're pull... damn right I can. I'm going off with the others. Which others? All the non-British. We don't have to be under this man's command if we don't want to be. Well, uh, yes, that's true. 
Our duty is to escape and do our best to make our way back, not put ourselves under the command of a, of a crazy guy with ideas of committing a glorious suicide. But what about the Russians and the Poles? Well, we haven't heard from them yet, but when they hear about the colonel's orders separating us from the women, they won't stay. I guess they should be coming in from patrol soon. Yeah, well, we'll be left with just over a hundred men and all the women and children. Wrong, Paul. Hmm? Most of the women and kids are coming with us. Well, that'll cause a stir. What are your plans? Well, the original one. We are going into the pass. But you don't know the way. Violetta does. But you want Violetta to show you? That's the idea, Paul. Where is she? <sighs> She's uh, sulking somewhere over there. You mind asking her for us? Well, no choice, have I, really? Well, I hope you'll stick your neck out and come with us. I wish the hell I could, but I'm directly under Colonel Horton's command. I'd be accused of desertion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, look, um, Martin, are you sure you know what you're doing? Look, that maniac is about to start warring with a battalion of SS that are sitting right on our tails. <sighs> yes. Meanwhile, he's marching northwest to where a panzer group is parked, awaiting for our arrival. Right now, pal, we are on a suicide course, and I want no part of it. I'm keen on getting back home to L.A. one day soon. All right. Let me break bonds and go and see Violetta. Come in, Major Ramsden. Join me in a drink. I'd rather not, sir, if you don't mind. I do mind. Here. It'll cheer you up. Have you given the mine-laying detail my instructions? Colonel, we're about to lose half of our forces. What do you mean? The French, Americans, Belgians, Dutch, Norwegians, and the Danes are going off on their own. They can't. Is there anything to stop them, sir? The Russians and the Poles have just come in from patrol, and they're also considering doing the same. Why, Ramsden? What is the matter with them? Your order about the men being separated from the women after nightfall started it. This is ridiculous. What are they, soldiers or bloody gigolos? How dare they even think of doing such a thing? They're leaving tonight for Rajek Pass. The SS will chop them to pieces. Not until the truce is broken. And that won't happen until tomorrow morning when the first mine explodes. Oh, yes, uh, that's the second reason for their departure. The breaking of the truce. Oh, they can damn well go for all I care. Make sure they take none of our provisions, though, and keep an eye on our ammunition supplies. We'll have to allow them a fair share, sir. It sounds to me as though you're on their side, Ramsden. Are you their spokesman? Just the carrier of bad news, sir. Captain Sanders has taken charge of the breakaway group, and he'll be in to see you just as soon as he's got a decision from the Russians and the Poles. We'll be left with 108 men. Correct, sir. And the SS will be coming at us with 6,000. They won't leave much for the panzers to do at the other end of our route. I have to think of these women and children. Uh, the men... Most, most of the women and children will be leaving with Captain Sanders. They are nearly all British subjects. I'll stop them. <laughs> By shooting them, sir? I'll take no more of your insolence, Major. Tell this bloody yank to report to me now, instantly. Paul. Please, Violetta, I'm begging you. It, it's for your own safety and all the others. And you will be killed by the Germans. No, 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 no. With luck, just captured. I'll go into the pass only if you come too. I've explained, darling. I can't. I'm duty-bound to follow Colonel Horden's orders. He is a madman. No, no. Just a pompous, arrogant, blind ass. Well, Violetta? I... I don't know, Paul. I'm all confused. Will there be anyone who can speak my language? I hope so. But if not, you'll just have to communicate by sign language. Will we ever meet again? Oh, yes, darling. I know we will. Come here. Mm. Paul. I've told Sanders to see that you get in the boats with the rest. In Italy, you can contact Colonel Egan and uh, tell him everything. He's a good man. He'll do his best to help you. Oh, Paul, how can I leave you here? 
in such terrible danger. You must. Now, don't worry. I think I have a knack for survival. Major, is that you? Yes, sir. Have you found that bloody American fellow yet? Uh, no, sir. He won't be back for a few hours. Won't be back? From where? He went to tell Major Shear that the truce has expired. He did what? He's a party to the truce, sir. He obviously felt it was only fair to let Major Shear know. Damn the man. I could have him shot. I don't think so, sir. I can. I won't have my officers consulting and assisting the enemy. May I remind you, sir, that Captain Saunders is not one of your men. I'm sorry, madam, but the colonel is busy. Give me my foot. I'm going to see him. Shoot me, if you like. Who the hell is that? You're about to have a visit from Lady Agnes Collier, sir. Oh, yes. So you're the martinet everyone is talking about. I beg your pardon, madam. It's not just my pardon you'd better beg, Colonel. What's the matter with you? You gone mad? Uh, Colonel Horden, uh, may I introduce Lady Agnes Collier? Uh, uh, oh, uh, delighted to meet you, Lady Agnes. If you are, you won't be when you've heard what I have to say. <laughs> Lady Agnes Collier, a rotund Tweedy woman in her mid-fifties, glared with open contempt at the discomfited Colonel Horden. He'd backed away into his tent and put down a glass of whiskey on the table. Lady Agnes followed him, her eye fixed on the glass. Where do you think you are, Colonel? Playing soldiers at your favorite officer's club in the Strand? I was barely able to believe my ears when I was told about the orders you gave. And now, look at the result. Oh, madam, may I point out that I am in charge? I this... wouldn't put you in charge of a child's model railway. Have you any conception of what is happening? Uh, please, uh, Lady Agnes. Be quiet. I... Hear me out. By heaven, I've had my quarrels with Major Ramston, but at least he was a man who was in touch with reality. In one dreary day, you have succeeded in bringing everything to ruin. Don't you realize that we could be wiped off the face of the earth at any moment? That the men in this column have been out defending us, yet you... And your blind moral bigotry separate the men from the women folk who crave the company of them as much as the men do theirs. What kind of madness is this? Uh, I am surprised to hear a lady of quality saying such oh, a thing. Oh, reality, Colonel. Reality. These are not normal conditions. We are struggling for our lives. Leave your moral ideals for the society in which you live. Yesterday, most of the men and women were frightened but as happy as they could be in these conditions. Today, they are in revolt against your sheer arrogant and intolerant bigotry. This stupid order must be rescinded immediately. Uh, I have my duty. A duty to, to get us all to safety. And what have you done? Changed our route away from Rajak Pass and into the waiting guns of the German panzers. I call that rank stupidity, Colonel Horton. Uh, there is no certain way through the park. Oh? What about the partisan girl who came in with that nice young officer yesterday? She lived in the past, but you've chosen to ignore her. Well, if she's wrong, then we will be bottled up inside the pass and forced to surrender. May the good Lord forbid it. But it's better to surrender ourselves than march into the relentless guns of the tiger tanks that will be waiting for us. I've heard enough. I don't know where you come by your information, it's Lady It's common Agnes, but... knowledge. For these two reasons, most of your force is leaving tonight for the pass. Naturally, I will join them. On my way here, I heard that the Russians and Poles have decided to follow Captain Sanders into the pass. We'll be well guarded. But I do feel sorry, with all my heart, for the poor British soldiers you will be dragging to destruction with you. Well, thank you, madam. Now, if you will As kindly... As for your suicidal plan to break the truce we made with Major Sher. I the very thought of it almost leaves me speechless with anger. You can be certain that when I return home, a full report of this will be handed to my nephew at the war office. Major Ramsden. Yes, Lady Agnes? I'm sorry for the harsh words which passed between us over the last few days. I know what a strain it must have been. 
But at least you were a man strong enough to take it. Not like this, nincompoop. You will have to follow behind him, I know. But all I can say, on behalf of the women and children, is God bless you. It may make a miracle that will take you safely home in one piece. Good night. Good night, Lady Agnes. And thank you. Good night, Colonel Horden. I am now going to pray for another miracle from the Lord, that he will bring you to your senses before it is too late. One with me, Ramston. Oh, sorry, sir. I have to go out and make sure... I want to talk this over. Quietly and rationally. Please join me. Very good, sir. Who did you put in charge of the mine-laying detail? Uh, Lieutenant Sale, sir. They'll be leaving at ten. I want them stood down. Very good, sir. I'll go now and make sure... No, wait a minute, Major. That woman... Is she always like that? She says what she thinks, sir. And you yourself had trouble with her? Well, only about supplies. It was more of a bantering nature than serious. She was very serious with me. <laughs> she was indeed, Colonel. I saw a smile playing at the corners of your mouth when she was talking. Do I take it you agree with her? I'd be lying if I said no. So. You agree that the men should be awake half of the night toying with these women? That we should march into a pass where we can be hopelessly trapped? That we should continue our unholy alliance with the SS? I do, sir. I sincerely believe it's the only way we can survive. I see. Well, thank you for your honesty. <sighs> you were very popular with the men. Even the foreigners. Well, that's for others to say. Yes, I can see you were for myself. And my usurping your command is resented. No, sir. No, no, that's not true. It was the severe changing of routine, uh, the breaking of the truce, the change of destination. These were the seeds of resentment. I was merely obeying my instincts, Ramster. Instincts are not always right, sir. Especially when one's not thoroughly conversant with the situation. I thought I was. I fully agreed that we should go north instead of risking the pass. But when I heard that the girl knew of an escape route to the west, I... Well, I felt that it should be tried. What would you have done? I would have stayed at last night's campsite and sent the woman with a patrol into the pass to verify its existence. And the SS behind us? Major Shear would have stayed where he was. There was nothing to fear from him. I felt most uncomfortable with him almost breathing down our necks. He's not breathing down our necks. He would have probably been happy at the delay. It sounds damn strange to me. If it were a German army group behind us, yes, I would have found it more credible. But the SS? They're men like ourselves, sir. Like the Wehrmacht, they want to avoid being taken by the Russians. Our being here is a wonderful excuse for them. <laughs> Another drink, Major? Well, there's very little left in the bottle. I brought another. Oh. Well, sir, with just a hundred men and no civilians to herd, we can at least make better time to the coast. I don't want the foreigners and women to leave. How will you prevent them? I countermand the order, stopping them from mixing with the women. And not break the truce with Major Shear? Oh. The truce will continue as long as we are not attacked. There's a problem now. What's that, sir? If we go back along the trail to Rajik Pass, won't the SS battalion be in our path? Uh, it's eight miles, sir. No, but they'll be very close. You mean to go back to the pass, sir? Why not? Everyone else seems to think I should. Like that confounded woman said, I must face up to reality. Hello, Captain Santos. Sir. Did you have much difficulty finding your way here? I'll say. I nearly got shot up by one of your patrols, Major. Yeah, it is difficult at night time. 
Perhaps they mistook you for a partisan here. Sit down. Can I offer you a drink? Oh, some of that cognac, if there's any left. Oh, I still have three whole cases. Oh. I take it you have brought me an urgent message from Major Ramston. How is he? Oh, he's a bit down in the mouth. He's no longer in charge. No? What happens? Has he been hurt? Well, not physically. Yesterday afternoon, a British Army officer dropped in on us, and, well, he assumed command. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, the same thing nearly happened to me. We saw the plane drop a parachute. Have you brought a message from this new commander? No, Major. No, I'm here on my own initiative to warn you that the truce is off. Unfortunately, Colonel Horton does not agree with it. Oh, a pity. So, we are at war again. I'm afraid so, Major. It looks like it. It is a foolish decision. And I see your column has not gone into Rajak Pass as we planned. Well, that's our new commander again. Well, I shan't ask you how your people intend to engage us. No, but I'll tell you this, Major. Whatever you do, be careful of the track ahead of you. I see. Thank you, Captain. You do realize that I am now compelled to do my best to attack and destroy your column? Well, of course, that's taken for granted. And I shall have to make plans to do so as soon as you are gone. (sighs) Yes, sir. But anyway, thank you for warning me. It was an honorable act, sir. Presumably, your new commander has no intention of doing so, huh? Well, I don't know. He uh, he might have. I will have Sergeant Kruber and the patrol escort you back to your own rear guard once your safe our truce is ended. Perhaps just one more glass for the roads? And to a quick end to this damned war. I'll be glad to join you in that, sir. Lisa? He's relented? For the good of us all. Thank heaven. Oh, but uh, what about the others? The ones who were leaving? They're being told of the colonel's decision. Well, how did it happen? What made him change his mind? A little bit of humility and uh, a lot of Lady Agnes. Uh, who is she? <laughs> You'll know when you meet her. She must have seen you because she mentioned about Violetta knowing a way through the pass. Ah, yes, yes, well, Violetta spends most of the day with the women. Some of them are able to understand her a little. There is a danger there, sir. Some of the others might still decide to go it alone. I hope not, because there's strength in numbers, and if our truce with the Germans holds out, it could be plain sailing from now on. Captain Sanders told me that the truce with Major Shear will only last until we make our final run to the coast. Quite right, Lieutenant. We shan't be making that until we've climbed over the pass and reached the coastal plain at Viasco. Then we're back at war again in earnest. I see. So the Germans will follow us into Rajik Pass? <laughs> yes. And you never know, they, they might lose their way trying to find the goat track that your young lady is leading us to. Uh, by the way, where is she? Uh, inside her tent, cleaning her machine gun. She took a Schmeisser from the store cart this morning. She's been cuddling it like a baby all day. <laughs> Excellent training for a housewife. Well, you can tell her the good news. Uh, give her something else to cuddle, huh? Uh, good news, Violetta. You're going with me, Paul? Uh, but put your gun back together again and listen. We're all going with you. Everyone? Mm Mm-hmm. And leaving that terrible man alone? I mean everyone. First thing in the morning, we're turning back towards Rajik Pass. Oh, Paul. (laughs) We can stay together. That's right, darling. All the way to Italy and beyond. But but you will be in trouble if you are seen in my tent. The order separating us has been rescinded. Everything is as it was before. Uh, no, no, but it's actually better. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> well, you'd better pick up all those springs, triggers, and bolts and see if you can clean it and put them back together again. I wouldn't like to try. 
We were really happy together as we nestled in one another's arms. The war seemed, for a few short hours, to be a continent away as we gently made love under the cover of the rough canvas tent. We were not to know that the SS camp had become a sudden hive of activity only minutes after Captain Martin Sanders had left Major Shear. A staff meeting was called, and plans were made for a full-scale assault on our unsuspecting column. Violetta and I slept the sleep of the innocent, while sudden death was being prepared for us less than ten miles away. The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Diffenfall. Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Springbok 930 Dossier. stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. entwined with Violetta under the rough canvas tent. I was tired, yet somehow unable to sleep, and a feeling of uneasiness began to butterfly in my stomach. Then it came to me what was wrong. I sat up, slipped on some clothes, and crept out of the tent. It was dark, and few people could be seen, apart from a number of armed sentries. I asked for Captain Sanders, and was told he'd just returned. I found where he'd pitched his tent, the Russian officer, Dmitri, was with him. So you're not going with us, Dmitri? We have all agreed to stay together. The English colonel has canceled the order preventing the men and women from staying together. And at first light, we are returning to Rajik Pass. Oh, damn it all. We can't, Dmitri. The colonel has also decided to maintain the troops with the SS. It's too late, man. <clears throat> oh, hi, Paul. Uh, what's too late? Well, I called out the truce, and now Dimitri tells me we're going back to the pass. Uh, yes. Colonel Horden changed his mind after Lady Agnes put a, a little pressure on him. We will be cut to pieces. Major Shear has called a meeting of his officers, and we're now at war again. Oh, no. Did you specify a time? No, Paul. The truce ended when I passed Sergeant Ryan's rear guard. Oh, hell, now we're really in trouble. Yeah. Have you told anybody else? Well, I've only just got back, and Dimitri nailed me. Mm. How far are the Germans from Rajik Pass? Two miles the other side. We're eight miles away. we better tell Major Ramsden and the Colonel. Well, I'm going ahead to bring back my patrols. Okay, Dimitri. If we're not here, follow us up as a rear guard, will you? If it is possible, now. You go and snatch what sleep you can, Paul. I'll see Ramsden myself. I'll try, but whatever happens, we'll have to move fast. Oh, don't I know it. For all we know, the SS could be moving up on us right now. And you did the honorable thing by warning Major Shear that the truce was over. But you should have specified a time for its ending. Even noon tomorrow would have been all right. Yeah, I know that now, Major, but well, I was feeling a bit angry. In war, a man must use his head, not his heart, sir. Mm. I'd better call Colonel Horden and give him the bad news, but I can guess what his attitude will be. 
goodness me, Ramston. I knew no good would come of this. I was right the first time. We must push on to northwest to Dubrovnik. I should never have allowed myself to be talked out of it. We'll have to widen our patrols to prevent the SS from outflanking and encircling us. That was their tactic before we called the truce. Yes, do it. Use the partisans. Oh, they've gone. Gone? Where to? Back into the hills around Comasek. A few of their women agreed to remain behind. So the blighters have left us in the lurch. I suppose we can expect it from them. Well, Kovacs agreed to help us as far as the pass. We're now eight miles past it. He kept his promise. Is there no way of contacting him? Well, perhaps one of the women... On second thoughts, no. We'll manage on our own. At first light, we shall continue our march along the valley. All I need do is keep the SS at arm's length. Send young sail out to lay mines as we originally planned. Excuse me, sir. May I make a suggestion? Carry on. Perhaps Sanders or I could go back to Major Shear and ask him to reinstate the truce. I never liked the idea of the truce in the first place. No, it would make us out to be fools. I think the truce should have been maintained whichever direction we marched. It's all in the past now, Ramsden. Send out sail and his mine-laying party... And don't forget to widen the perimeter of our patrols. Very good, sir. Ooh. Well, sir, did he blow up? Actually, he took it quite calmly. It was an excuse for him to carry on along this valley as he originally intended. Yeah, well, Shear's going to come up behind us tomorrow and convert us to dead meat. There'll be no stopping him. I know, I know, Saunders, but what can I do? Look, I could go back and tell Shear it was a mistake. You'll get shot at minutes after you leave Saunders Ryan's men. Well, I'll take the chance. No, 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 don't risk it. Have you got a light? Oh, sure. Thanks. It might be a better suggestion if you and the others took off to Rajak Pass as you intended. After all, there's no reason why you lot should die like rats in a trap. Oh, I've already thought that through. By the time I've aroused everyone and got on the road, it'll be after two. By then, Shear will have sent up men to cover our rear guard. We will run right smack into them. Go up into the hills and wait for the SS to pass by. Well, yeah. Yeah, we could do that. Oh, I don't know. Say, who's that? Uh, looks like Dimitri. Yeah. Didn't you say he was going ahead to call in his men? Yeah, well, something's brought him back. Uh, we're here, Dimitri. Who's that with him? Look, he, he's holding the fellow by the scruff of the neck. One of my men was bringing his prisoner in. Who is he? Calls himself Andrei Kossart. He mistook my men for a German patrol. Borodkin played up to him. He has to be taken to Major Sphere. I see. So the fellow's a spy for the Germans, eh? Uh, can he speak any English? Well enough, Major. Why did you want to see Major Scheer? I was bluffing. I thought I had accidentally run into a German patrol. You're lying, Kozat. How would you have known the German commander's name? Spies get shot, Cosette. I am no spy. I keep sheep down the valley. What was the message you had for Major Shear? I have no message. The message can be painfully extracted from you. Is that what you want? No, no, please, please. I, I, I can tell you nothing. Dimitri, uh, my patience is exhausted. Take him off and find out all you can, and then shoot him. No, no, please. Come, please. let us have a talk. No, no, I, I cannot tell you anything. Huh? You're getting harder, Major. Will you really let Dimitri shoot him? Does it matter? Well, back to more important matters. I'd better call on uh, Lieutenant Sale and his mine laying party. Hey, Dimitri's too. bringing him back. One lie, and I tear you apart with my hands, huh? Yes, yes. What is it, Dimitri? He says, he tell you, Major. You will not kill me if I answer your questions? I have a family, a, a wife, two boys, a girl. They, they, they Tell me everything and I'll promise you your life. I received a message to take to Major Shear. It is here in, in my hat. Well, come on, let me see it. Ah, it's in German by the look of it. Here, you can understand this, Saunders. Have a look, sir. <laughs> it's gobbledygook, sir. You mean code? Oh, probably. 
but I can work on it. Well, Lieutenant Sale knows some of the German codes. Take it to him. Oh, yeah. I'll be as quick as I can. Can you understand it, Cossack? No. I was just told to take it to Major Shear. It is very urgent. Who told you? It was a message direct from General Valda of the Waffen SS headquarters. Yeah, interesting. But what I want to know is, who actually handed you that piece of paper? I wrote it out. How? I mean, how did you get the message to write out in the first place? Radio. Radio? Yes. You have a wireless transmitter? Yes. Battery operated? (laughs) Yes, there's no electric in my cottage. How far away is this cottage of yours? Five kilometers down the valley. Dimitri, take this man to his house and bring back the wireless transmitter and whatever batteries you can find. Any objection, Cosette? No. Take a dozen men with you, Dimitri, and be as quick as you can. This is like a prize from heaven. At last we'll be able to get through to Allied intelligence. What will you do with me? The war's over for you, Cosette. And you will keep me as prisoner? For a while, yes. Until you meet the Panzer Tanks. Uh, that won't be for a while yet. Tomorrow, perhaps. Hey, What do you mean? I was told that after delivering the message, I am to meet the tanks and guide them into the valley. You're telling me the absolute truth, Cosette? A group of panzers was ordered out this afternoon. They will not be far away tomorrow. Coming from the north? Yes. Oh, no. So we're already trapped. You will have to surrender. How many tanks? Twenty. Oh, it's bloody hopeless. Before you surrender, will you let me go? I told you all I can. If you've told me the truth, yes, I'll let you go. No, you should hang him. No, no, no. He may yet prove useful. Oh, why didn't we go into Roger Pass in the first place? I thought you had. It is the reason I mistook the patrol for a German one. You... You could have been well inside the pass by now and approaching the western end. The SS would have had to follow you on foot. You sound as though you suddenly changed sides, Kozak. Ah, the Yugoslavs. They're always changing sides. They change loyalties like an infantryman changes his socks. Can I ask you a question? What is it? Why did you not go into Rajak Pass? Well, it was thought there was no way through to the west. No, there is. No. Do you know it? This is my country. You can guide us? I can. No, Major. He could lead us into a trap. We're already in a trap, Dimitri. We cannot go back. Somehow, Dimitri, we have to. You, Cosette, come with me to see Colonel Horden. just managed to fall into a deep sleep when Captain Saunders called me. I crawled out of the canvas and peered at him. He held a slip of paper out to me. I'm sorry to break up the romance, Paul, but Uh, Major Ramsden thinks you might be able to decipher this. What is it? One of the locals was taking it to Major Shear. Dimitri's man managed to intercept him. See, the dope thought they were Germans. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. Well, can you make it out? Right, hang on a minute. I need more light. Let me fix this. Yeah. I don't know what you'll make of it. It looks like a load of gobbledygook to me. Uh, there you look. Yes. Numbers and letters. I worked for a while in our deciphering branch in London, you know. So you can make sense of it? Well, not yet. These things take time. Yeah, we haven't got a lot. Yes, I know. Uh... This could be SZL-47. Yes, yes. If I substitute the fourth letter for the seventh and vice versa, then the S becomes a Z and the Z becomes an L. Yeah, that could work. And if it does, it's a pretty old code they've used. Well, how long do you reckon it'll take? Well, if it's what I think it is, about half an hour, perhaps less. Okay, Paul, get weaving. I'll be with Major Ramsden when you're finished. So, there is definitely a way through the pass. Hmm. A pity I didn't know this yesterday. <clears throat> no need to look at me like that, Ramsden. I wasn't willing to accept the childhood memory of a chit of a girl. But this is different. You, Cosette, should be shot as a spy. You do realize that, don't you? The officer said that he would not kill me if I helped you. It is not for this officer to say. Now, about this wireless of yours. 
It is not on fixed frequencies? No. Good. We will find it very useful. If you get a chance to use it, sir. If we meet up with those pantsers late tomorrow, a radio will certainly not save us. Oh, if only we had some anti-tank weapons. I don't suppose your partisan friends have any? I told you, sir, they left earlier this evening. Damn nuisance. Hmm. Have you extended the patrols, Major? Yes, sir. And the men are out laying mines? Not yet, sir. Why? I was about to order Lieutenant Sale to organize his party when Dimitri brought this man in. Captain Sanders sent the coded message to Sale in the hope that he could decipher it. Ah, yes, I see. Uh, Lieutenant Arkanov, take the prisoner outside for a minute while I talk to Major Ramsden. Yes, sir. Someone could have. Look, Ramsden, I've been thinking about this truce we had with the damned SS. If it could be extended for a little while longer, sufficient time for us to go back and into the Rajik Pass, why, it would be the answer to most of our present difficulties. Well, I agree, sir. And you were saying something earlier about the possibility of Captain Sanders going back to Major Shear. I think it's too late now, sir. He wouldn't get very far beyond our rear guard. Damn it, old man, he could try. It's one man's life being risked to save us all a small price to pay. Well, if Sanders is willing, yes. Of course he will. The man's a soldier. Well, a former U.S. Army Air Force pilot, sir, not quite the same thing. And he's under no obligation to take orders from us. Oh, that's the trouble with having allies. You never know where you stand with them. Look, I'd be willing to go and see Shear. After all, the truce was originally negotiated by me. I don't think I can afford to lose you, Ramston. No, I can't agree to that. <clears throat> oh, it's you, Sale. Uh, yes, I'm looking for Captain Sanders, sir. The coded message. Did you manage to break it? Yes, sir. It was a simple one. It's the old SZL-47. Oh, yes, I know it. I wonder why they used... An old one like that. Is it, is it possible that they wanted it to fall into our hands? Yes, that's a factor we must consider. Right, let me see it. I see. Now, this is the original, and this is the translation. Uh, my German's a little rusty, but... Uh, uh, excuse me, sir. I've written an English translation on the other side. Ah, Yes. Why, this is just what we need. It's an instruction to Major Sher to withdraw and immediately bring his battalion back to HQ. Uh, there's more, sir. Oh, yes, I see. A panzer group has already been dispatched to eliminate us. Oh. So this Yugoslav chappie was telling the truth about a panzer group. Well, the answer to our problem is quite simple. Once Major Shear has this message, he will obey and withdraw. Then we march back to Rajik Pass and head for the coast. But how will he get the message, sir? Ah, hmm. Things are never as easy as they appear. Perhaps if Sanders goes back and tells Shear about the intercepted message... Now, Shear's unlikely to swallow it, even though he has been expecting a message ordering him back east. He's been out of communication with his HQ, and that gave him the excuse to continue following us deeper into the mountains. Shear doesn't want to receive this order, because it means his battalion will be sent to fight the Russians. Oh, dear, this is so damned complicated... But if he did receive the message, then he'd be forced to withdraw. I suppose so, sir, but now there's no truce, he'll probably overrun us before he does. It wouldn't delay him for more than a, a few hours. Wait, I have an idea. Sir? You said earlier that this Yugoslav chap is willing to work for us. Well, yes, sir, but there's no gauging his reliability. Why don't we release him and let the fellow take the message to Major Shear? Well, he'd be sure to tell Shear that we know its contents. So what? There's nothing in it we don't know already. It won't alter the fact that the message comes from General Fowler. Well, I suppose it might work. Lieutenant Sale, tell Dimitri to bring in his prisoner. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, something else I've thought of. Let the chap tell Shear we captured him. It will work to our advantage. Ah, here he is. Now, Cosette, I've come to a decision on your future. 
Don't look so downcast, man. You can perform a service for us. Are you willing? Yes, Colonel. Right. I am releasing you, and you can take your message to Major Sher as you were ordered to. Lieutenant Arkanov will see you through our rear guard, and from then on, you're on your own. You want the Germans to get the message? Of course. And you can also tell Major Sher that we captured you and deciphered it. Tell him that as a token of good faith, we have allowed you through. Good faith? You will take a second message, one I shall write, explaining certain matters to Major Sher. Can I depend on you to deliver it, Kozat? Yes. And bear in mind, you will be working in the interests of both Major Sher and myself. Yes, I'll do it. But first... I want you to write a note to your wife explaining that she is to hand over your radio equipment to my men. They will. I can promise you that no one will be harmed. Colonel Horden's mental gymnastics were suddenly so frenetic that Major Ramsden and I looked at each other in surprise. I had a feeling he was being somewhat hasty in his decision, but couldn't put a finger on what I felt was wrong. Without consulting us regarding its contents, he penned a quick note addressed to Major Shear. While he did so, the Yugoslav wrote a note to his wife. Horden's note was handed to Kozat, and Dmitri was ordered to take him through Sergeant Ryan's rear guard on his way to the SS lines. Then I was dispatched with ten Commonwealth soldiers to Kozat's cottage to bring back the radio equipment. We had to move fast if we were to be back before dawn. When Colonel Horden and Major Ramsden were alone, the Colonel sent an orderly to fetch Captain Saunders. Well, Ramsden, all we need to do now is wait and hope for the best. May I know the contents of the note you sent to Major Shear? Oh, it's no secret. I asked him if he were agreeable to an extension of the truce, and that Captain Saunders will be sent to attend the arrangements at 0400. Presuming this Yugoslav gets through with his message, the Germans will be expecting Captain Saunders. I can't help feeling that we're overlooking something, sir. I have considered every possible eventuality, Ramson. Of course, a lot depends on Major Scher's feelings when he receives his orders. These foreigners can be damned erratic, you know. <laughs> Kozat knew every inch of the route, and when he passed through Sergeant Ryan's rear guards, he climbed up the side of the valley. After dodging two German patrols, he came down to the camp and surrendered himself, demanding to be taken directly to Major Scheer. Instead, he was taken to the Major's adjutant, Leutnant Weser, to whom he poured out his story and handed over the two messages. After a cursory glance at them, Weser called his commandant. I wish these Britishers would make up their minds, Weser. After making me spend half the night in planning a strategy, they decide to ask for the truce to continue. Yeah. Have you finished decoding that message yet? I won't be long, Hemeyon. I don't know what to make of these people. It is as though... Yeah, I know what the reason might be. No, you? When I spoke to this American Captain Saunders... He did not seem very happy about this new commander, uh, uh, Colonel... Uh, uh, Colonel uh, Horden. Yeah. This is the pig-headed man who does not believe in making deals with the enemy, no matter what the advantage is to himself. Yeah. He is the man who called off the truce and was treacherously not ready to warn us. Now it would seem that Major Amston has made him see sense. Do you think that is the case, Weser? Yeah, Herr Mayor. Yeah. But now they are not going into Rajak Pass. A truce is not necessary. We can pursue and harry them for days and days. A week or two at least. I do not think so, Herr Mayor. So? Why? I have just finished decoding the message. Uh, uh, let me see. I see. Oh. So General Volga is getting very desperate if he finds it necessary to send me a message by these means. The contents are predictable. But what is this? 
We will meet a group from the 9th Panzer Division by the day after tomorrow, if we continue on our present route. Yeah, and then we shall have no more excuses for staying here. Oh, in ten days, we could be facing those damned Bolshevik hordes to the east. I can see two alternatives, Hemio. I'm listening, Razor. You could wipe out the column of fugitives now, tonight, and then slowly turn back the way we came. Yeah, but we will gain very little time by doing that. The second alternative is to induce the fugitives to enter Rajak Pass. Then we can follow them through. Trap them and starve them out. Yeah. It could take weeks. <laughs> Tanks would be useless in the past. It is infantry country. Herr Major, we would not be able to starve them out. Why? Because they can reach the coastal plain from the western end of the pass. They can? But were we not told that there is no way through? There is a way. And this Yugoslav spy knows it. We could follow them. Catch them up on the coastal plain and force their surrender before they can reach the sea. Yeah, even better. By the time all this has been done, the infernal war might be over. Good thinking, Vesa. Uh, but the spy, is he willing to guide us? I think so. If he refuses, I can have him tortured and shot for giving information to the enemy. We can always say he escaped from the British, who had confiscated his coded message. Therefore, our instruction from General Volda was never received. <laughs> yeah, Vesa, it all fits very nicely. Uh, please make arrangements with our advanced patrols to watch for Captain Saunders. And the Yugoslav? Keep him under guard until we know which way the ball is bouncing. Uh, and now, Reza, I would appreciate a few more hours sleep. One thing does puzzle me, Hammer. Why would the British send us one of the few men who can guide us over the pass? Uh, that is a mystery, Reza. Are they really that stupid? It would appear. <laughs> There's no accounting for the way their minds work. The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dickenfall. Springbok 930 dossier, dramatized for broadcasting and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Springbok 930 dossier. stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. I went off with a group of men to the home of the Yugoslav spy, Kozat, to take possession of his radio transmitter. Meanwhile, knowing that it might be rather awkward for him to ask Captain Sanders to return to the SS battalion, Colonel Horton suggested that Major Ramsden could be more persuasive. What? You want me to go back and, and talk to Major Shear again? Our survival's at stake, Saunders. Our only hope is to go eight miles back into the pass. If Major Shear's men advance, they could cut us to pieces. Sure, I know. Oh, well, I guess it was my fault in jumping the gun and telling Shear our little truce had ended. 
In a way, yes, but you were doing the honorable thing. But now we need the truce to continue. The German patrols will shoot and ask questions later. I don't think so. Colonel Horton has sent a note to Major Scheer to tell him that you'll be coming through at 0400 hours. And how did he manage that? Well, he decided it would be best to let Scheer have the message that we intercepted. He released the Yugoslav spy and told him to deliver it. He let him go? Yes, and he added a message of his own to expect you at 0400. Hang on, Major. Am I hearing you right? This Yugoslav spy... What's his name? Kozat. Yeah, yeah, Kozat. He's now with Major Shear, right? Well, I said so twice. Major, the man who definitely knows his way out of Rajek Pass, and you've sent him over to the Germans? I don't believe this. But by heaven, you're right, son. Yeah. Look, so much was happening that I never thought... And it was this to... colonel's idea? Well, yes, he made a quick decision to send Kozat over... Dear me. Yeah, dear you. Dear us all. All the same, Lieutenant Saleswoman can guide us over the pass. Kozat merely confirmed the existence of a route. Aren't you forgetting something, Major? This Kozak can now guide the Germans across. They can chase us all the way to the coast. If there's no truce. You remember what Major Shears said. The truce only lasts until we get close to the sea. Then he is not honor-bound not to attack us. Oh, dear. I think I should have stayed in the prison of war camp. At least there, my only worry was how long the war was going to last. But it's up to you, Saunders, to renegotiate a truce with Shear for as long as possible. Yeah, if he's in the mood to negotiate at all. before four in the morning, Captain Saunders said goodbye to Sergeant Ryan, who was in charge of our rear guard, and set out along the floor of the valley. It was very dark, and at any moment he expected to be fired on by an advance SS patrol. He had walked no more than a mile when he saw a bright light suddenly switch on a hundred yards ahead, picking him up in the darkness, its brilliance almost blinding him. Then it started to move slowly towards him. He realized it was a German half-track gun carrier. Captain Saunders stood his ground and waited. Good morning, Captain Saunders. Morning. I want to speet to Major Shear. He sent me to meet you. Please get inside. Uh, are you Lieutenant Vazer? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I'm right pleased to find you aren't shooting at me yet. No, Captain. Not yet. I... I hope your major is in a good mood. I do not think so. He has been kept awake for much of the night. It makes him very irritable. As Major Ramsden would say, oh dear. You do realize, don't you, Captain Saunders, that this is a very strange way to run a war? Major, I was quite prepared to allow our previous arrangement to run for as long as feasible. Then you tell me your new commanding officer no longer wants a truce with me, and I make my plans accordingly. Major, I was only Then doing when what... I have everything ready to go, you come here with a request for another truce. Really, I find it very difficult to understand. Can you give me a good reason why I should cooperate? We... We want to take our column back to Rajak Pass. Why? Because that's the way we want to reach the coast. Oh, I see. You succeeded in decoding my message from General Volda. Yeah. And you know that a group of Tiger tanks are on the way to intercept you. Well, Captain, it could be in my interest to allow you into the pass, I suppose. Yeah, it is no country for tanks, is it? Not even our newest tigers. So then you agree to reinstate the truce? No, not exactly. Uh, please, drink your coffee. Oh, yeah. Thanks. It will be a limited truce. Very, very limited. Major Shear, any kind of truce is welcome. Well, let me acquaint you with my position. At present, I can advance and destroy your column this morning, and when the Panzer Group arrives from the north, they will find nothing left to do but return to base. Then I will be compelled to return to my own HQ. 
This, of course, I have no wish to do, as you must know. Yeah, I sure do. You'll be sent to fight the Russians, won't yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. But if you go into Rajak Pass and I go after you, then you will be safe from the Tigers and General Walter will be forced to order me in pursuit. A pursuit that could take quite a long time. A week, perhaps more. And that is what you propose? Yeah. When your column is inside the pass, I shall keep my force at the entrance until I'm joined by the panthers. They will be in radio contact, and I shall be able to explain the position to General Volda. The truce between us will last for as long as it takes the panthers to reach me. Well, that means late tonight. No. No, I think they will take longer. Possibly next morning. Huh? Yeah. I would say our truce will last until about this time tomorrow. Well, Major, it's better than nothing. Well, I, I better get back and get our crowd on the move. I will get Lieutenant Preysha to take you back while I issue new orders to my officers. Oh, thanks, Major. And my regards to Major Amston. Sure. As for this Colonel Horden, perhaps I will be able to speak my mind to him when he is a prisoner. We found Kozat's house. It was in complete darkness. After surrounding it, myself and two South African soldiers went forward to the door and knocked. A frightened woman answered, and I told her why we had come. Without any further explanation, she showed us where the radio transmitter was kept. The South Africans packed it up while I checked on the external aerial. It had been carefully concealed high in a tree close to the house. I stripped it down and we made our departure, after assuring the apprehensive woman that her husband was safe and well. Obviously, she knew what we'd been up to, so she was left wondering who we were, because she never screwed up sufficient courage to ask. The house stood high on a hill overlooking a valley, and as we were beginning our descent, one of my men put a hand on my arm. Look, sir. Uh, what is it? The loom of light, sir, over there. It must be about 10, 20 miles away. Well, you're right. Oh, I wonder... Surely the Panthers can't have traveled this far south already. Oh, well, the new Tiger tank is a fast mover. Uh, come on, chaps. we better put a move on. We don't need telling twice. It was impossible to gauge the distance. We had not seen the actual lights, just the loom of them in the darkness, weaving and dipping as the vehicles traveled along rocky valley floors. There was no doubt in my mind as to what they were, and we left at the double. The sooner we got our column on the march back to Rajik Pass, the better. Well, that sums it up, Colonel. The truce only lasts until the Panzers reach the pass. Twenty-four hours is long enough. Yeah. And then Shear is going to come chasing through the pass and over, thanks to your sending him the one man who can show him the way. <coughs> uh, an oversight, Sanders. Uh, with your permission, sir, I'll get the column on the march. Everyone's up and getting ready. Good. We'll start out as soon as possible. The Germans have patrols reaching close up to Sergeant Ryan's position. We'll have to pass them. Hmm. Rather awkward, what? Well, a bit unnerving, but I'm sure that Major Shear will keep his promise. I pulled back the Russians and the Poles from their position and told them to cover us on the march. Sergeant Ryan and his men will go ahead of the column and take up fresh positions at the entrance to the path... And then they'll revert once again to covering our rear. Uh, hang on a minute, Major. Are we taking the mules and the carts into the pass? Well, we can use the carts to barricade the pass at some narrow point. Ryan can use them to hold off the Germans when they come after us. All that we're going to need for a week will be packed onto mules. Lieutenant Sale's young lady claims we can use them halfway... And then we'll have to abandon them at a ravine where we'll have to cross by rope. Cross a ravine? By rope? All these people? It's the only way. Oh, damn it all, Ramsden. You can't expect the women to go dangling over bloody ravines on a rope. Well, if they want to cross, they'll have to. And the wounded? Well, I, 
I think we should worry about that when the time comes, sir. Can't say I fancy playing Tarzan of the Apes myself. Well, let's just hope it might not be necessary. Damned undignified, I must say. I don't think we got time to worry about dignity, sir. With a Waffen SS on your tail, Colonel, I think you'll make it. I'll thank you not to be personal, Sanders. Very well. Shall we get everyone on the road? Major Ramsden, I would like you to go on ahead and take over St. Ryan's party, just in case those Germans do get belligerent. Have you withdrawn all our advance patrols? Yeah, Herr Mayor. They are just coming in now. Oh, I wonder if I'm doing the right thing. What do you think? Well, I can't be sure, Herr Mayor. Neither can I, Vesa. Well, it's done now, and I've given my word. What troubles me, Herr Mayor, is that the men know we are voluntarily allowing the Britishers to retreat into the pass. Yeah. Well, it is a tactical move, is it not? As far as our men are concerned, we are about to bottle the enemy up inside and starve them out. Leo? Oh, don't worry about it, Weiser. Unless, not to reason why, huh? as some famous British author once wrote. Uh, Mayor, what am I to do with uh, Kozat? Yeah, Kozat. If he didn't know a way over the pass, I'd be happy to leave him dangling in a tree... Our military intelligence people must be out of their minds using peasant shepherds as couriers. You know how unreliable these Yugoslavs can be. Yeah, I know. Uh, by the way, did you find out how the message was given to him in the first place? Uh, he has uh, radio contact with intelligence, Herr Mayor. Well, we can't allow the fellow to go, and we can't trust him to stay. Nein. I suggest we keep him like a prisoner until we have a use for him, yeah? Yeah, Herr Mayor. I will arrange for a, for a round-the-clock guard to be kept on him. Keep his hands bound behind him, and no less than four guards at one time. Yeah, Herr Mayor. If Ramsden's people get over the pass, we could be faced with an impossible task with Cosat. Yeah. He must be watched every minute. Colonel, something or other. I see you came to your senses at last. Good morning, Lady Agnes. Mm. My name is Horden, Colonel James Horden. Oh, yes. So you told me last night. I'm glad to see that we're moving into Rajek Pass at last. What made you change your mind, Colonel? Many things happened during the night, and I concluded that it would now be to our advantage to do so. Actually, I came to tell you I've heard a rumor that the carts are being abandoned in the park. Quite correct, madam. Which means the children and provisions will have to be carried. We will be keeping the mules. I'm told the route through the pass is impossible for wheeled vehicles. Well, as long as we have the mules. As far as the ravine. What ravine? You will have to swing across a ravine on a rope, my dear Lady Agnes. I see. Something like the old assault course, huh? Went on many a one with my husband before the war. Bit of a challenge, you know. You went on assault courses? My dear late husband was in command of one at Haythrop. Oh, great fun. We used to do it every Sunday without fail. Oh, uh, I see. Mm. You see, um, you can't get rid of that pot belly, Colonel. I think you'll find it a frightful disadvantage when you go across. When I arrived back, the column was already beginning to wend its way along the valley towards Rajak Pass. It was already light, but heavy clouds obscured the sun and brought the unwanted promise of rain. We handed the transmitter to Sergeant Manley, who had been in charge of the communications before the previous radio had been damaged beyond repair. Then I ran ahead and found Colonel Horden standing on a rock, watching the passing column. 
Lady Agnes was just leaving him, her face beaming a satisfied smile. However, Colonel Horton seemed far from pleased. So your back sail. Did you get the radio transmitter? Uh, yes, sir. As well as a battery and a hand crank. Good. I think we can make use of it tonight. Uh, what's more important, sir, the Panzer tanks are coming. You actually saw them? I saw the loom of their light, sir. They could have been anything between 10 and 20 miles down the valley. Oh, damn it all, man. They're not expected until tomorrow. Ah, uh, here's Captain Saunders. Saunders, over here. Yes, Colonel. Lieutenant Sale says he spotted the Panzers. No, not already. For the loom of their lights? Yes, I'm afraid so. Unless something delays them, uh, it could be here before midday. Gee, that is going to cause us problems. Do you actually think they could catch up with us before we get everyone into the pass? That's uh, a distinct possibility, sir. Dear me, what a tragedy that would be. Well, we still have the 60 landmines that Major Ramsden got from the partisans. Oh, by Jove, yes, the mines. Yeah, good thinking, Pa. Yeah, we can lay them between here and the pass. Yes. And I'll get a detail together and uh, make a start. Oh, good man, Sale. Get on with it. Yes, I will. Right away, sir. Oh, I don't know what you feel, sir, but... I reckon that's some shock, knowing they could have gotten this far so darn quickly. We'll have to get a move on, Saunders. Yeah. Remember, our truce only lasts until the Panthers meet up with the Waffen SS Battalion. Then they're going to chase us into the pass. Dash it all, what rotten luck. Well, I'll go and see everyone along. I reckon at the present rate, half of them are going to be caught. Try telling a mule to hurry up, and he'll just look at you and come to a standstill. The path that the column trod was narrow, with steep hills rising more than 300 feet up on either side, a foretaste of Rajek Pass itself. The floor was rocky and strewn with boulders. In parts, it was less than 20 feet wide, which suited me because it gave me plenty of opportunity to strategically lay the mines. But it made hard work for the column as it slowly toiled its way towards the rearing entrance to the pass. Major Ramsden watched with Sergeant Ryan from halfway up a slope as the first carts came into view of the pass, our Russians and Poles in the van. I went a mile into the pass very early this morning, sir, and I can tell you, after what I saw there... It'll be hard going for them. Well, that's very interesting. What do you see, Sergeant? Oh, there's just steep slopes and boulders as big as houses blocking the way. Blocking the way completely? Ah, from the look of them, they'll never get the carts past, sir. Well, maybe that won't be such a problem. Uh, but people and mules can get by. Aye, sir, but like I said, it'll be bloody hard going. Well, that's all right. We'll be abandoning the carts once we're inside. Uh, now, this is what I have in mind, Sergeant. I want you and your men to barricade the pass with them and hold off any pursuit. Yes, sir, that's a very fine idea. The Germans will be able to outflank barricade by climbing the slopes, but it'll cost them plenty of men. And then by the time they come down the slopes, we'll have scooted. Good. I can see you know what we're about. Ah. Uh, sir, sir, there's, there's something else that's been, uh, that's been worrying me a bit. If you don't mind me asking, sir, when that American officer went back to the Germans, he was... He was making some kind of a truce with them, uh, like the one we had before. No, no, not, not quite the same, Ryan. This one's a wee bit more shaky. Was there something in particular that made you ask? Well, uh, one of the lads was waving before and telling me that something was coming down the other way. Look, look, you can see it now, sir. Look over there. You see? See? One of them jerry half tracks. Uh, uh, yeah, yes. We can chase it back, sir. There may be more of them behind. No, it's stopped. I don't think so, Sergeant. The, the crews are getting out. Just just pass me those binoculars. Let me... Hold on a bit. Hold on a bit. You'll have to adjust them because I was looking for them a few minutes ago. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, I can see them quite clearly. It's Major Shear and his adjutant. They must have they must have come to see our people going into the past. <laughs> I tell you, it's a it's a great temptation, sir. What is? Well, one flick of the hand, sir, and my lads could wipe them out in a single bar. Oh, don't even think of it, Sergeant. Keep your infernal hands at your sides. Dear me, just the thought of it's enough. <laughs> and if you don't mind me saying, sir, I got another thought, sir. <laughs> 
We could even take them prisoners, sir. That would be a feather in your cap. Now, a truce is a truce, Sergeant. In fact, I think I'll pop down there for a chat with them. You what? You're going for a chat with the SS? Do you mean... Do you mean you're going for a chat with the SS just like that? Like what? Well, well, I don't know. Like, like it's, like it's Sunday afternoon in Hyde Park. Oh, one never knows. I might learn something to our advantage. Uh, but see your men cover me, sir. I'll do that, sir. Just in case. A fine morning for a walk in the country, yeah? <laughs> in my opinion, there's too much walking in the country. You're lucky having those half tracks. We are, yeah. But there'll be no use to you in the pass. If you come after us, it'll have to be on foot. I know. But that is in the future. Your people are making good time. Yeah, they have every reason to do so, knowing how close you are. Apart from two patrols in the hills, all my men are still in camp. Fraser and I thought it a good idea to come along and see how you are managing, without being too obvious about it, of course. You're still managing to avoid taking orders from your HQ? <laughs> yeah, so far. But I can't make any more excuses once the Panzers arrive. I hear that you lost command, Major Hamston. Yes, indeed. This new man strikes me as being... Uh, well, uh, different. What gives you that idea? He was ready to break the truce without informing me. I was very angry when I heard that. Well, at, at that time, I, I don't think he fully understood the situation. He does so now? Oh, yes, Major Shear. He knows. One of your men is coming down, Major Ramsden. Oh, so he is. I can't quite make him out. Oh, yes, it's Captain Saunders. I seem to be seeing a lot of this American officer. Nice fellow. Quite civilized for an American, I mean. Oh, he stopped. I think he wants you to go over and speak to him. <laughs> Perhaps he has some great military secret to convey. Something I should not be allowed to hear. Uh, what is it, Saunders? Bit of bad news, sir. The Panzers are coming up behind the column. You mean that Lieutenant Sales saw their lights an hour or so before it got light. He reckons they could be here pretty soon. Deary me. I hope we can get everyone into the pass first. Well, I think we'll make it. Lieutenant Sale has gone back to plant some mines. <sighs> well, Saunders, it was a very short truce. Are you going to tell Major Shear? Ah, no, that's a question. Should I? Well, he isn't expecting them till tonight or tomorrow morning, so he's about to be caught napping. I'll tell him, Saunders. Yes, it's only fair. It'll give him a chance to deploy his force at the entrance to the pass before the tanks arrives. You, you know, look a bit more businesslike. When do you think the tail end of the column will be inside the pass? Say, uh, another hour? Well, let me go and give Shear the bad news. I hope he takes it well. was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dittenfall. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Thirty dossier. Every day at this time, we bring you 
dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense. From the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. A long column of escaped prisoners of war and internees was at last entering the forbidding Rajek Pass. I had gone back with a squad of men to lay mines, which we hoped would delay the imminent arrival of a panzer group. Major Scheer, who commanded a battalion of Waffen-SS, and with whom we held a shaky truce, watched with his adjutant. The two men stood beside a half-track carrier and watched the distant fugitives marching into the pass. Major Ramsden had just been told that the Panzer Group could be expected at any time and pondered whether to let Major Shear know. Deciding to do so, he walked with Captain Saunders to the hot track. You have bad news, Major Ramsden. Yes, one could certainly say that, but I think it's only fair that I tell you. Your Panzer Group will shortly arrive. Today? You, you mean today? A matter of hours. How do you know? One of my officers patrolling north of here saw the loom of their lights far up the valleys. There's no other explanation for moving lights. I see. Then you know what this means. The truce is at an end. Yeah. When will your people be inside the pass? About 30 minutes. There was no need for you to tell me this, you know. I thought it best to warn you. Well, thank you, Major. Your gesture is appreciated. We will return to our men and move forward to the entrance of the pass. By that time, your column will be safely inside. I hope to have the pass sealed off before the tanks arrive. <laughs> then we are at war again. It has been a brief pleasure knowing you, Major Amston. Perhaps one day we might meet again. In an atmosphere of peace, I hope. Not as a prisoner. Yeah, it is what I meant. One part of me wishes you good luck and success, yet my duty forbids me to allow it. I understand. Come, Faser. We have a lot to do. Yeah, ma'am. Well, he won't be able to use his half-track in the past. Yes. St. Ryan told me what it was like. I'll be the same. Oh, well, now to war. When the German half-track had disappeared from sight, Ramsden and Sanders trudged over the rough ground to where the last remnants of the column were moving into the pass. It seemed more like a huge railway cutting, with steep slopes rising high on each side. Looking at it, Ramsden realized why it was called the Veil of Darkness. Because only the very early morning sun could penetrate its depths. The slopes were rocky, where little vegetation was able to grow. Even at the entrance, huge boulders made a passage so difficult that the men could walk no more than five abreast. Difficult for travel, but thankfully, easy to defend. As for myself, it was nearly nine when my party had finished laying the mines. One of my men, an Australian, listened at the ground, claiming he could hear the sound of approaching tanks if they were less than five miles away. He heard nothing. Then we made our way back to Rajek Pass, just in time to see half a dozen German half-track vehicles coming to a stop at the entrance, and a number of SS troopers deploying themselves along the trail. There was only one way we could get through. My ragged party formed up behind me, and we walked towards the pass entrance, like a school teacher taking his class out on a nature course. My heart was pounding as the SS soldiers stared at us, but none made a move to stop us as we passed by. One cheeky Aussie even gave them a thumbs-up sign, or something rather similar. Then we came into the shadowy gloom of the pass and hurried on to join the rest of our column. About a quarter of a mile along, we met up with Sergeant Ryan and his 40-strong rear guard. Here, the pass had narrowed to no more than 15 feet, and all the mule carts had been abandoned. Ryan's men were hauling them together and building a barricade between two immense boulders. 
There you are, Lieutenant. We was getting worried about you. What's going on back there? The SS are blocking the entrance. We had to walk right past them. It's a wonder they didn't shoot at you. The truce is over, you know. Well, it is when the Panzers meet up with Waffen SS. And according to the uh, ear of Corporal Dennison, they're still a few miles away yet. Uh, there's no tiger tank going to make it up this pass. When the Jerry's come, the will have to use Shanks' pony. I think we can give him a rough time, sir. I don't think you'll see them for a while yet. If I were you, Sergeant, I'd let most of your lads get a kip. Ah, that's all organized, sir. Once we've finished the fair game. Oh, this is a gloomy hole, isn't it? Yeah, I would use it to its best advantage. Oh, don't worry about that, sir. But tell me, hmm? if you was in the Germans' boots, how would you go about trying to get past this? Well, uh, at night. That's what I was thinking. I'd send men with small arms climbing up the sides to try and outflank you. Oh, well, they'd know if they did. You know how sound travels at night and inside the walls of this pass. We'd be able to hear a butterfly tie in his boot laces. Anyway, I'll send a few of the lads up the sides myself just to make sure. <sighs> Such a pity we've got no mortars. If you could hit the sides of the pass down there, you'd bring down tons of rock on the enemy. You better keep them on the hop. I hear the partisans had mortars, but they've got off and taken them. Ah, uh, it's your young lady that knows the way through, isn't it, sir? Yes, that's right. Uh, how long does she reckon it'll take to get out? Well, it's hard to say, Sergeant. A week, perhaps even longer. Uh, first, we have to find the goat track that will lead us over the pass. And that can be a problem. Well, me and the lads can hold up the turret for quite a long time. There's no need to worry about that, sir. I'm glad to hear it. A lot depends on you now. I caught up with the column a mile farther up the pass and reported to Colonel Horton, who was walking with Major Ramston. So, the panzer tanks were not as close as you thought, eh, Lieutenant? According to Corporal Dennison's hearing, sir, he stuck his ear to the ground and listened. Rather odd behavior? Uh, yes, well, he's an Australian, sir. Oh, yes, that explains it. Uh, well, I mean it's an aborigine trick. He says you can hear something approaching five miles away. Sounds fishy to me. Eh, Ramsden, what do you think? <laughs> well, it's possible. I've heard the American Indians do the same thing. At a time like this, I think we need to know every trick there is. Quite so, quite so. Well sailed. We've kept you very busy, so I expect you'd like to see your girl. Uh, well, yes, sir, please. It's time she was brought into the picture, Sail. She can't speak any English, so you'll have to find out from her as much as you can. We need to know how far we have to travel like this before we begin to climb. And by then, we'll need to know the exact location of this route over the pass and then down to the coast. I think I told you, sir, that she isn't exactly positive. We need something more substantial than that. What do you say, Ramsey? Well, I suggest that after you've had a good sleep, you and the young lady go ahead of the column and find the route. Yes, I would about to suggest that myself. I'll see you're not bothered again, and you can leave at first light tomorrow. Very good, sir. Right, Lieutenant, carry on. Good man, Colonel. Naturally, which is why he was selected for field intelligence work. A pity we can't talk to that girl ourselves. I feel uneasy, you know. Our entire survival now depends on her memory, and she can't even speak English. Really, it's quite extraordinary. I think it'll be all right, sir. Well, I hope so, Ramsden. I say, wouldn't it be awful if she turned out to be a Nazi spy and she marched us straight into a trap? Well, if you recall, Colonel, we were already in a trap, and at present we're marching out of it. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Besides, if this girl is a spy, I'm sure Sale would know it by now. As you say, he's a good intelligence officer. <laughs> past the body of the column and found Violetta helping the other women and their children. She was relieved and delighted to see me, and we walked together through the bleak valley. I soon found myself carrying a little girl with pink cheeks and blonde hair, when, in reality, I felt utterly exhausted after the long night, and longed for the time when we would camp, and I could close my eyes and let reality slip away for a while. 
At noon, Major Shear just finished blockading the entrance of the pass when we heard the first explosion far along the valley leading north. What was that? It came from up the valley. Partisans. They are attacking the panzers. Shall I take our half tracks up there? Nein, to... Lieutenant, wait. But they may need help, Mayor. The tanks can easily withstand an attack from the partisans. But I would say that explosion came from a mine. Yeah, the Britishers have laid mines behind them to delay the tanks. Another one, you see. If you take half tracks up the valley, you'll also run into mines. It takes a lot to destroy our latest Tiger tanks, so let us not concern ourselves with them. We have our own business to attend to. You were telling me about Lieutenant Becker. Yeah, ja, Herr Mayor. He went half a kilometer into the pass with a patrol. The British have blocked it with their carts. Is the blockade manned? Yeah, Lieutenant Becker estimated about 30 to 40 men. We will make an assault on it later this afternoon. It will be very difficult, Herr Mayor. The sides are very steep with little cover, and the foot of the pass is only five meters wide where the barricade has been placed. Very well. I shall reconnoitre it myself later, but first I will wait for the tigers to arrive. If they arrive. They'll get through. Ah, a thought has just struck me. If one of our tigers could get as far as this barricade, it could blow it to rubble. Lieutenant Becker was most emphatic, Herr Mayor. It is impossible for a tank to reach us. The valley floor is littered by huge boulders. Not even one of our half-tracks could approach the barricade. That is why the British have abandoned their carts. So, it is infantrymen's work. Very well, Vesa. We will overwhelm it by sheer weight of manpower. I can't allow 40 men to hold back a whole battalion of waffen SS. An hour later, a group of 17 Tiger tanks rolled into Major Shear's position at the entrance to the pass. From one of them emerged a tall, blond, youngish man who introduced himself as Major Franz Dieter. Shear gave him a quick rundown of the position. Dieter looked disappointed. Oh, I was hoping to catch these British as sandwich between us. But now they've gone into this pass. Hmm. It could be difficult, yeah? For you, impossible. Why? I sent a patrol down earlier, and they reported back that it was impossible for any kind of vehicle. Oh, our new tigers are wonderful beasts, may I share. It may surprise you what they can do. Lieutenant Grassler, go a kilometer into the pass and report back. Yeah, I come on down. He uh, could get stuck there. Oh, I don't think so. Uh, now then, Mayor, your HQ have desperately been trying to get in touch with you. Yeah, now radio equipment was smashed when we were stopped by American planes. And they want you to return and leave these fugitives to us. Yeah, I shall use your radio to call up General Volder. But first, I want to see how you, your Lieutenant Kreisler, fares in the past. We hear the explosions earlier. Yeah, yeah, we ran into mines. Three of my tanks has their tracks damaged. Oh, no, seriously. My engineers are repairing them. We were supposed to pick up a guide, but he didn't arrive. A man called Kozak. Uh, we have him with us. We waited for him. What is he doing here? He was bringing a message to me when the Britishers intercepted him. He escaped, but it was too late by that time for him to meet you. From what I hear, these fugitives are using very aggressive tactics. Yeah. They were being aided by local partisan groups. Twice my column was ambushed. <laughs> I'd like to see them try to ambush a tiger tank. Can I offer you some coffee? Oh, yeah, yeah. That would be most welcome. Uh, Gruber, bring some coffee and tell Corder to provide refreshment to Mayor Dito's men. Yeah, Herr Mayor. I should have gone with Grassler to see for myself. These uh, partisans you mentioned... Did they go into the pass with the Britishers? No, I don't think so. There is something about Rajek Pass that the locals fear. It has a very bad reputation. Oh? For what? When I questioned Kozak, he told me it was based more on superstition than anything else. Something about a Bulgar army being trapped inside and wiped out by the Turks a few hundred years ago. Yeah, like we will wipe out the Britishers now. Strange how history repeats itself, yeah? 
They are fools to have gone into the past. It surprised me until Cosette told me there is a way through to the coast. Oh, there is not. My brigade commandant checked and was told that once inside the pass, the Britishers were finished. Everyone thought that. They are wrong. Oh? This man Cosette, he is one of the few who knows the route. And the Britishers? Do they know? Yeah, they do. And somehow, I don't think your wonderful new tanks will be very good at mountaineering. Ah, you hear that? That Langressa is giving a demonstration to the enemy. He can't have gone very deep into the pass. Hmm. In my opinion, my Odita, I think your tiger is in trouble. Lieutenant Gressler's tank was indeed in trouble. It had nosed its way down the narrow track, maneuvering around the scattered boulders and into a more open position. Two of Sergeant Ryan's men had been stationed high up the rocky slope and on sighting the tank had opened fire, mainly as a warning to those at the barricade, but also to keep the enemy pinned inside its steel walls. The tank made an attempt to turn and then hit a mine which blew up part of its track. The turret swiveled and elevated as the gunners tried to pinpoint the snipers, but to no effect. All they could see was bare rock. A few minutes after the firing stopped, Gressler decided to abandon the tank. He and his men scrambled out from the turret, and the two snipers found themselves with real targets. Three of the tank crew fell under their fire before the others escaped from their line of fire. Gressler was one of the lucky ones. It's only what I expected, my dear Mayor. Oh, the fool should not have abandoned his tank. He knows I would have sent assistance when he didn't return. If the Britishers have snipers laid up the slope, then you would have suffered even more casualties. That sir. is not a problem. I think you will have to face the fact that it is impossible to use your tanks in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And I think now it is time I called up my HQ and explained this whole position. During that morning, Colonel Horden had decided to send Captain Sanders and ten other Americans to join Sergeant Ryan, while the Russians and Poles were sent ahead up the pass. Sanders arrived just after the Tiger tank had been abandoned. He must be bloody stupid to send a tank down here. Yeah, and how? Uh, you know, I, I couldn't believe my ears when I heard it. And then the lads up the hills, they opened fire on it. Yeah? <laughs> and when he tried to turn, it hit one of them mines and we put there this morning, you remember? Mm -hmm. Oh, it was beautiful. It blew one of the tracks clean off, it did. And after a few minutes, the crew abandoned it, and the lads got three of them. They got three, I tell you. And the rest, they scampered like rabbits back up the pass. <laughs> So, Sergeant Ryan, we have a tiger tank, huh? Well, well sort of. Uh, we've not been down to take a look as yet. Oh. It only happened about half an hour ago. Either. Are your men still up there in the rocks? One of them came back to report, and I sent four more out. The rest of the lads are, are trying to get in some kip. It could be a long and a very busy night. Yeah, I guess you're right, Sergeant. Well, if they come at all, it'll be under cover of darkness, that's for sure. I, uh, I hear, uh, I hear that you're taken over here, are you, Captain? That's right, Sergeant. But all orders will be relayed through you, of course. Yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine, sir, yes. Uh, some of them might not take kindly to take an order from a yank if you don't mind me speaking the truth. Oh, that's okay, Sergeant. I know now where I stand. And I see you brought some of your lads, sir. Hmm? Yeah. And in view of what you've just said, uh, I'll keep them under my own direct command. Well, what are your plans for after dark? I'm placing ten men up on each side of the pass, and if the jerry comes at us, I think he'll try to outflank us by using the slopes. Mm. I don't think we'll see any more tanks. Well, that's our bet on anyway. Anyway, that one over there is blocking the way, and Wilson says it's almost as effective as our barricade here. Yeah, I guess it must be. Hey, uh, how about a bit of adventure, Sergeant? 
Let's go along and see if maybe we can make use of it. Oh, you know, there's something in that, sir. <laughs> we might be able to use the guns against their former owners. Using the shortwave radio provided by Major Dieter, Scheer got into direct contact with General Valder. After making a hasty explanation for his inability to make earlier contact, Major Scheer made his most telling point. The fugitives were almost certain to escape to the coastal plain, unless he was given permission to pursue them into Rajek Pass. A few minutes later, he rejoined Major Dieter in the crudely erected lean-to, which now served as his command point. My orderly has been looking after you. Ah, yeah, good. That was very good. It was my first real meal in three days. My previous orders are cancelled, by the way. I am to pursue the Britishers and prevent them from reaching the coast. Is that so? And that is what you wanted, yeah? <laughs> I won't deny it. Very well. I will call up my own HQ shortly and explain there is nothing that we can do to assist. <laughs> That's right. Not unless your tigers have wings. I shall suggest that I am sent round the mountains and south again along the coast. Perhaps I can cut off the escape route. I think it will be a waste of time. No? My men will catch them long before they can leave the pass. Well, Major, we shall see. You admitted to me earlier that the sheep you are herding have long teeth and a lot of cunning. You may have need of my assistance yet. Before you call up your HQ, my dear Mayor Dita, try some of my cognac. Guva, bring the cognac. Yeah, I have Ah, it will make it easier to explain the loss of one of my tanks. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan, but I'm sure we can make some use of it. But the guns are fixed, but the turrets swiveling the elevation are working. What we could do is fire a couple of shells back down the pass. You mean a sort of defiance? Yeah, that's right. Okay, let's do it then. You know how the gun operates? Well, it's a bit fiddly, but I can work it out. Uh -huh. Hey, Taffy, take three men up past them boulders and keep an eye out for the enemy, will you? Okay, Sarge. All right, come on, Captain. Let's get inside and work it out. Yeah. I think a little higher. Hold on. That'll do it. I got no idea where it'll hit. Well, it'll go in the right direction. That's all that counts, sir. Yeah, okay, then. Ready when you are. All right. Well, here goes. Hey, the saints preserve us. Oh, like exploding a firecracker in a bottle. Did you hear that, sir? It hit something. Yeah, I wish I knew what. Come on, sir. Let's send them another. Well, why not? All right, you ready, sir? When you are. Right. Here you are, Jerry. Another present is on its way. <laughs> this must be shaking me up as much as the enemy. At least we know when it's coming. Yeah. Hey, say, I bet we're bringing down... Oh, half the mountainside. Oh, so long as it's that way and not behind us. <laughs> Are you ready for another, sir? Carry on, Sergeant. We were at least four kilometers farther down the pass. Colonel Horton was concerned, believing the Germans were storming Ryan's barricade. But the biggest surprise was to the Germans. The first shell landed on a hillside a few hundred meters beyond the entrance of the pass, bringing down tons of rock. The second landed even closer, 
causing damage to three half-tracks from the ensuing landslide. The third shell, and the ones that followed it, also took their toll. was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dippenthal. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense. From the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. shells being fired blindly from the abandoned German Tiger tank were causing a lot of damage to the enemy stationed at the entrance to Rajik Pass. Most of the damage and casualties came not from the shells themselves, but from tons of rock sliding down the steep slopes. They are using that damn tiger of yours. I know, I know. How much ammunition does it have? Fourteen rounds. I'm sending a fourth into the pass to stop it. Veza! Yeah, I may know. Take 50 men into the pass and silence that gun. Be quick. Grab the first men to hand. Yeah, have my own. You see the kind of teeth our sheep have now, Major Dito. They will even use their own to bite us with. I will see that Lieutenant Grassler gets severely punished for abandoning his tank. Mm, that won't help us now. Look, if they can fire at us from that position, we can fire back. When you form up two or three of your tanks to fire back into the pass, I think they will be more affected by landslides than we are. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Schneider! Gordon! was Captain Saunders and Sergeant Ryan who were gleefully firing the gun of the tiger. They had no way of knowing what damage they were causing, their action being more a gesture of defiance. After the initial shock of firing such a weapon in the close confines of the pass had passed, they were now at ease and enjoying themselves like two schoolboys with a tin can and a few ounces of carbide. How about raising the elevation to maximum, sir? Well, depends on how high it'll go. Let's see. Yeah, I guess that's as high as it'll go. It won't drop the shell back on top of us, will it? No, not high enough for that. Let's give it a try. Come on. Yeah, that's all it'll be, sir. This is the last shell. Okay. Are you ready? All right. Hang on, sir. I'm not loaded up yet. Okay, ready? Yes, sir. Well, that's it, Ryan. I'm a bit disappointed. Well, it was good fun while it lasted. I wonder if we hit any of them. My guess is that every one of those shells sailed right on past them. Uh, uh, sure, he's coming up. Slide, sir. Uh, that's it. Let's go. We must have hit something, if you ask me. We can't just walk off and leave this tank for them, can we? I mean... Can't you see? We've blown it up. Come on, disable it, then. Disable yeah. it. Yeah. We can get into the engine and smash it up a bit. Well, there won't be much time, but let's give it a bash. I say, Ramsden, sounds like a real old battle going on back there. Yeah, I can't think what's happening, sir. Maybe Jerry's found a way of getting his tanks into the pass and he's giving Sergeant Ryan a whopping. I don't see how. 
I must send a man back to see what's going on. Back of my neck is prickly. There's no way at all of sending tanks into the pass. It's possible the Tigers are firing blindly inside the pass in the hope of hitting something worthwhile. Yes, that could be so. Well, if Ryan and Sanders are under heavy attack, they'll send a man ahead to warn us. Okay, Sergeant, never mind the tank. I didn't expect them to start shooting back. They're bringing the pass down around our ears. Let's get the hell out of here. They do their own fellas very much good, though. Where are they? Close 500 yards away. Too close for my liking. Let's get back to the barricade. Our men up the slopes can snipe and slow them down a bit. Lieutenant Vader and his SS troopers took cover when the shells came over from the Tigers at the mouth of the pass. Some shells dropped short, narrowly missing, burying some of them under the ensuing landslides. When the shelling ceased, Vesa ordered his men forward to where the tank lay uselessly askew. While his men kept a watch for snipers, he examined it. The radio had been smashed, as had everything else that was breakable. Guessing the enemy had fallen back to a defensive position, he decided to return and report to Major Shear. Nine, Hammer, your The bombardment did not affect the enemy. I see. They had moved more deeply into the pass. If I may make an observation, Hamayor, the bombardment actually created more problems for ourselves. So, in what way? The explosions have brought down many landslides, which we will have to pass. As for the tank, it will take engineers many days of clearing rubble before it could be repaired and brought out again. Oh, yeah. Act in haste, repent at leisure. Yeah, lightning tracer. It's not a good idea. Nein, I mean. Did you see the enemy? No, they had fallen back. I would guess they have built a prepared position deeper down the pass to hold us, while the main column continues its march to the far end. Mayor Dieter is making a damage and casualty report to his brigade HQ. They will not be very pleased with him. Meanwhile, Herr Mayor, we are forgiven by General Walder. Our reputations are preserved. And if we capture the fugitives before they reach the coast, they will be much more enhanced. In fact, I don't know why I lost my temper earlier. In reality, it is quite a beautiful day. Once again, we are officially in pursuit of Major Ramsden's ragtag army. Oh, if only there was a way to slow him down. <laughs> Think about it, Wazer. We could talk it over again once we have got rid of Major Dieter and his damned panzers. He is coming over, Herr Mayor. Yeah. So let us look busy, huh? Eh? Yeah, Mayor. I want you to tell Lieutenant Keller to pick a hundred of the best men. Under cover of darkness, they are to probe deep into the pass and find the enemy rear guards. Their job is to overrun the position before I move up the battalion. Yeah, Henry, I, I will see Lieutenant Kellett immediately. And what's new from your brigade HQ, Major Dieter? I am to return as soon as possible. <laughs> I thought so. The three tanks with broken tacks are being repaired. They should be ready soon. Will you stay long enough to have dinner with me? No, I want to leave within the hour. <clears throat> the brigade has received special orders from Berlin. I think it is possible we will be moving to the front. The Italian or to hold back the Bolsheviks? The Italian front, I think. Hmm. You are lucky, hmm? Ah, I think so. There will be plans for us to hold back the British and Americans while the Wehrmacht prepares winter positions along the Po Valley. We have been expecting such an order for several weeks. So you won't be meeting us on the coastal plain? No. There's more important work to do instead of chasing escaped prisoners of war. As the Wehrmacht learned on the Russian front, the most dangerous enemy is the one which operates behind the front line. What is the good of occupying a country when you can only use the large towns and main roads? It is less than half an occupation, my dear Mayor Dita. <coughs> Strictly between us. I think we should withdraw from these occupied countries and defend the fatherland. Well, yes. At least that way we can be sure of being buried in our own soil. That is a defeatist attitude, Mayor Scheer. A realistic one. With huge allied armies attacking from the east, west and south, it is too late for a successful defense of the fatherland. Our only solution is a political one. And I fear even that is too late. 
I hope you are wrong. Even now, the Fuhrer... Is... So do I. But every day that passes convinces me that I'm wrong. Oh, a man can only see the truth of a situation when he's able to strip away his patriotism and his political fanaticism. We've lived with these two blindfolds for too long, Dieter. There are some fanatics who still believe victory is possible. I do. Yeah. Think about it. Think deeply. It is not what you truly believe. More like wishful thinking. Well, uh, I don't think we should surrender. Better to die in the ruins, eh? Because that is what it means, you know. You younger men are the future of Germany. It is the fatherland's future to be squandered in useless bloodshed. It is a matter of honor. Honor? <laughs> oh, my dear Dieter. If you survive this war, you will look back after a few years and remember this conversation. The last vestige of our honor was sacrificed when we invaded Austria, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Russia. But who cared then? We were winning. on my feet when Colonel Horton ordered a halt for the night. We were in a place where the pass had widened to 150 yards, which gave us an opportunity to group in a defensive circle. Tents were erected on the dry, stony ground, and patrols sent out to scour the surrounding slopes. Almost in a daze, I helped Violetta erect the rough canvas tent. Then I lay on the ground and fell into a deep sleep. The nights were beginning to grow colder, but I slept unaware when Violetta lay beside me and her body warmth mingled with my own. In fact, I think everyone was exhausted. Well, with one exception. Ah, uh, Colonel, I've been looking for you. Uh, oh, good mm. evening, Lady Agnes. I'm rather concerned about the children. Yes? It's getting colder, and they need more blankets. I'm afraid I can't help you there. But you'll have to help me, Colonel. We need more blankets. There are none. Since you are now commanding this column, I suggest you find a way of getting some. Oh, be reasonable, madam. Where can one obtain blankets in the middle of this desolation? That's Sergeant Lowe, the one who looks after the stores. I'll bet he has some tucked away somewhere. I'm sure they will all have been issued. I don't believe it. Oh, I'll ask him tomorrow. I want them tonight. Lady Agnes. I have had a very difficult and tiring day. I was just about to sleep. We have all had a difficult day, Colonel. I'm rather surprised that our people sent a man who can't take the rigors of a march. Oh, madam, I can take the rigors. However, I do need to sleep sometimes. Please, if you can leave this until the morning, I'll... What's this here? I see your bed has two... Well, three blankets. It has? Yes, Colonel, three blankets. Really, I call that disgraceful. But uh, I... Uh, there you I... are, ready to roll yourself into three blankets. While there are little mites out there rolled up in old coats and canvas. I, uh, I didn't realize... As the commander, you should know. Now, call yourself an officer and a gentleman. Those poor children could freeze to death. And you wouldn't know a thing about it. I shall see this matter is reported to the highest authority. Madam, I am the highest authority. Here, yes. But not where we are going. Believe me, Colonel, I'll see you roasted for this. Oh, here, take the blanket. I shall. Oh, indeed, I shall. When you stripped them from your bed and folded them. And if you feel cold in the night, I suggest you see Sergeant Lowe and get some from him. You can bet he'll be sleeping with more than one blanket this night. Yes, uh, yes, I, I'll see him. In fact, I'll go and see him right away. Good. In that case, I shall go with you. As darkness fell, Major Dieter departed with his tanks up the valleys to the north, the way he had come the previous night. 
Major Shear heaved a sigh of relief and ordered Gruber to bring his dinner. While Lieutenant Keller went off into the pass with his assault force, Shear and Vesa sat down to a plate of pork and sauerkraut washed down with the best cognac. Well, have you uh, any ideas? Are you, uh, you mean to slow down the Britishers? Yeah, what else? What Mayor Dealer was saying made sense, Herr Mayor. If a force stood by at the coastal plain, they would fall right into the trap. Oh, damn it, old Vesa. You're talking about capturing them. We are. I'm talking of delaying tactics, a way to keep them inside the pass. If we can do that, then all I have to do is sit and wait for them to surrender. It might take a week or more, then perhaps another week to take them to a prison camp. Here, have some more cognac to lubricate your brains, huh? <laughs> Thank you, Herr Mayor. The only way to stop them is to send ahead some men to block the path that leads over the pass. How could they get ahead of the enemy? I don't know, Herr It Mayor. would need a force of at least 50 men. Hmm. Ah, but wait, perhaps not. What if this path were destroyed, blown up, made impossible? Mayor? Then they would be hopelessly trapped. It would need only three men with explosives. You mean get this man Kozak to guide them? Yeah, Kozak is the key to the problem. Perhaps he knows a way for a small group of men to bypass the Britishers. Yeah. If he is one of the few men who knew the path, then he must know this path like I know Hamburg's Reaper Bar. Shall I go and get him now, Amir? No, no, no. Not yet. First, let us think this over very carefully. Where is Cosette now? We are under constant guard, as you ordered, Herr Mayor. Is he... Resentful. Yeah, he is protesting about his treatment all the time. It is difficult to put your trust in these people. Very difficult, Vesa, and yet... Yeah. I think we must make him feel more at home. A resentful worker is a dangerous ally. What we must do is release Kozat and bring him here to join us. Give him a good meal and some cognac. <laughs> smother his ruffled feathers, yeah? Make him laugh and feel at ease. Then he will be happy to help us. What do you think, Reza? Yeah, Herr Major. He is a, a peasant, really. A man like him will be easily pacified. When we hear from Lieutenant Keller, then go and bring him to me. You know, Reza, I might even stoop and apologize to cause that. <laughs> <laughs> then follow up with a little flattery, huh? Are you asleep, sir? No, just deep in thought. Bart has just come in and he says there's movement down the pass. He's sure? A bit further down from the tank. They heard a sort of metallic sound, like a like a gun striking a stone. Sergeant Walker sent Bart hit back with a warning. Better stay on the men, too. I've done that already, sir. Uh, I wish we knew what we were up against. Ten crowds or a thousand. Well, we'll know when Sergeant Walker fires the flare. Should be any time now. Yeah, it could be just probing to see our defenses. If they were trying to climb the slopes and outflank us, we'd know by now. Stern. Stern, are you there? I'm here, Captain. As soon as you hear any shooting, take off to the main column and let them know we're under attack. Okay, sir. Hey, to be quiet now, will you? Be quiet. The next man that talks gets me rifle muzzled up his left nostril. They must be past that tiger tank by now. They must be creeping along on their fat bellies. Hey, what's that? It means the chair is climbing the slopes. Oh, come on, why doesn't Walker fire his bloody flare? Oh, that sounds close. Here we go. Fire only when you've got a target, lads. You, you see them, Captain? Oh, 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 we caught them like it's with the bloody pants down oh, there. Some of them are starting to climb down the slope. Catch the bloody grenades! Oh, 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 the last thing like this. It's like shooting them targets at the fun fair's call. Lieutenant Keller had led his men into a deadly trap. Most were caught on the floor of the valley when the white flare illuminated the scene. Ryan's men, perched on the slopes, could see everything. And with rifle fire and grenades, they caused havoc among the startled German force. Some ran deeper into the pass and were caught in deadly machine gun fire from the barricade. 
Others tried to take cover up the slopes and were easily picked off by careful sniping from the opposite side. The lucky ones were those who fled back the way they had come until they were out of range. Lieutenant Keller was one. When he had reformed his group, there were only 11 left, three of whom were wounded. In the distance, the third flare flickered and went out, and a black silence fell once again over the veil of darkness. <laughs> yeah, sir. That'll teach them to keep their bloody distance. Yeah, well done, Sergeant. I don't think we'll see them again tonight. All the same, keep your men at their posts. You never know. Hey, you lot, this isn't a party. Keep your voices down, will you? Oh, I don't know. You'd think they'd won the bloody war. Look, you'd better find out our casualties. Uh, we didn't have none. I'd have known before now if we had. There'll be a lot of Germans wounded. Well, they'll have to stay out there, sir. Can't risk my old men's lives looking after them, you know. No, I guess. Sometimes they only pretend to be dead or wounded. And as soon as we approach, they take half a dozen with them. It'll be even worse in the dark. Oh, I suppose you're right. I think you're wrong about them having another go tonight. I bet when the survivors get back, their commander will be so hopping mad he'll send out another lot. And you can bet them fancy soft boots of yours that they'd be ready for us. Do you think they'll really do that, Ryan? I mean, after all those losses... They got 6,000 men, sir, maybe more. So what's a hundred or so? Yeah. Maybe next time they'll come in thousands and, and just try and overrun us by sheer weight of their numbers. Well, we've no prepared position to fall back on. Well, we don't need them, sir. We're not going to fall back. Look, I'm sorry, sir. I know you were put in command, but you're not exactly a soldier, are you? I mean, what am I to say? It's okay, Ryan, I know. Me, I'm an Air Force pilot, and I can see strategy is your forte. My what? You're good at strategy. Oh, yes, well, my dad spent six years ambushing the English in the streets of Dublin. Huh? It taught me a lot that did, you know, even... <laughs> And here you are fighting for the English, huh? Uh, not fighting for them, sir, only with them. Oh, yeah. I'm a soldier. And we English, Irish, Scots, and the Welsh, we sticks together when these stupid continentals start getting sort of uppity. <laughs> and what happens in Ireland? It's our business. Yeah, yeah, Ryan, of course. Yeah, we just like a good fight, that's all. Yeah, there's no harm in that. It's in the blood, you know. Yeah, we know all about you yeah. Irish guys. When the Itais like singing, the Germans, they like strutting around, taking orders and playing noisy music. The French like eating funny food. Now, the hang on there. <laughs> hey, please, no, the Scandinavians too. They like running around with nothing on, you know. Those nudist fellas <laughs> in the snow, rolling about and bashing themselves with twigs and all that. <laughs> it's called national character. Well, we Irish like a bloody good shenanigans. Shenanigans? <laughs> yeah, we're hooligans, all of us at heart. <laughs> okay, so tell me, what would a hooligan do in a situation like this? Ah, now there's the question. Well, sir, it'll take an hour for them juries to get back and report what's happened. Yeah? And then say a couple of hours for them to organize a bigger assault force. I think we should leave half a dozen men here and go down the pass to a nice narrow spot nearer to the entrance. What? And then when they come marching in, bam, we'll give them hell. Now, wait a minute, Ryan. You mean, you mean walk right into them? If we move now, we can be there before they leave. But, oh, oh, we can save them a long walk. Eighty-nine men, Herr Major. Eighty-nine men, Fesser. No, I can't believe it. The Britishers were waiting for them. But so many men. Keller reports that the enemy were positioned up on the slopes. Our men had no cover. It was dark. The enemy used flares. And we were here thinking all that noise was Keller's men overrunning them. It is time we taught them a lesson, Fesser. Yeah. He hit yeah. us badly twice before the truce, and now once again. We must give them good reason to fear us, yeah. 
They will not expect us to attack again tonight, Hammond. Yeah, but to just march blindly into the pass would be dangerous. Gellar says the enemy was high on the slopes. Yeah. The night can still be our friend. If we send two assault groups along the slopes, we could be in a position to attack before it gets light. It will be very difficult to move along the slopes, Mayor. They are very steep. It will be slow and arduous. There are still six hours of darkness. We will use everything, flamethrowers included. A thousand men, Vesa. Is this man, Kozak, he could help us. Yeah. Have him go to me after you have detailed Leutnants Keller and Gerber to form two storm groups. But Kozak must not be told of what has happened in the past. We will butter him up, as I suggested earlier, then find out whether our men can move along the slopes. Yeah, Herr Mayor. And Vesa smiled. We need to give Kozak a good impression. Mayor. He will only be an ally for as long as he believes we are invincible. The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dittenfall. Dramatized for broadcasting and brought to you on Springbok Radio. stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. Stung by having suffered heavy losses when a large reconnaissance force was badly mauled in Rajik Pass, SS Major Shear is determined to overwhelm his enemy's rearguard by sheer weight of numbers. But before giving final orders for this assault, he sends for the Yugoslav spy, Kozat, from whom he needs information. You will appreciate that before I could put any real trust in you, I had to verify your credentials. This I did by radio while Mayor Dita was here with his panzer group. You trust me now, Major? Yeah, and I must apologize for the uh, treatment you received. It was uh, regrettable. And this fine meal you have given me, is it to make up for my confinement? In a small way. Mm. Am I free to go home? There is a service I need from you first. As one of the few people familiar with Rajak Pass, you can be of great value to us. In what way? The British and their followers have gone deep into the pass, leaving behind a strong rear guard. In the early hours of the morning, I am sending a large force in to dislodge and overwhelm them. In the close confines of the pass, it will be the quality of your men that counts rather than their numbers. We are Waffen SS, may I remind you. The best trained soldiers in existence. Your enemy is desperate. I would rate them higher. As you wish, Cosette. I will tell. What I need to know is if it is possible for my men to move safely and without detection along the slopes. Only with great difficulty. Their progress would be slow. Very slow, Major. On very high ground above the pass are narrow tracks made by the peasants who lived there many years ago. They are overgrown and difficult to identify. How high are they? Three to four hundred meters. Good. We will make use of them. There is a problem, Major. 
Once you have climbed to these tracks, there is no way down until you reach the far western end of the pass. Why? The tracks are high and they go higher and higher. The side of the pass are steep, sheer cliffs. I see. Hmm. How far is it to the western end of the pass? Thirteen kilometers. But there is another problem. If your enemy is watchful, <laughs> they will detect a large number of men passing. How? Sound, Major. Because the sides of the pass are so narrow and steep, the smallest sound reaches a long distance. Even a whisper can be heard from below. If the men travel slowly and carefully... Then the British will reach the far end of the pass before they do. Well, I can't allow that to happen. I have another cognac here, Cossack. Captain Saunders and Sergeant Ryan have moved their men down the pass and almost within sight of the entrance. Using every boulder, withered shrub and crevice, the men deployed themselves to ambush the force they expected to be sent against them. Then they settled down to wait. By heavens, you can just about hear them. You must have good ears, Sergeant. I got big ones. Do you really think they'll risk another attack like the last? Yes, they will. Look at it from their point of view. If they hang around and wait, Colonel Horton and the rest will reach the end of the pass and start climbing out. The juries can't afford that to happen if they're going to stop us, can they? Oh. And it's going to be a damn sight more difficult trying to get at us in broad daylight. It's tonight or never. Well, I hope Lieutenant Sale's girlfriend was right. About what? Well, she told him there was no way up to the top of those slopes. If she's wrong and the Germans find a way, we're in a sticky position. Some of the lads went up to try and find a way this morning. They had to give up. Only a trained mountaineer could get up there. Yeah, but it makes me feel uneasy. I reckon it was wrong to let that uh, Yugoslav fellow... What was his name again? A uh, Kozak, That's yeah. his name, yes. Go over to the Germans. I mean, he knows this pass maybe even... Well, even better than Violetta does. After all, you got to remember, she was only a kid when she lived here. Why didn't she go off with the rest of the women? Because she wanted to stay with the lieutenant? Well, yeah, but what do you mean by the rest of the women? You know, them women from Kovac's partisan group. Yeah, but they're still with the colonel. Ah, no, they're not. What? Didn't you know? Last night they left to join their menfolk. From what I heard, they were too scared to go into the pass. <sighs> well, I guess you can't blame them. Ryan, how long do you think we should wait here? Well, it gets light at about half past six. If the Jerry's don't make a move, I think we should pull back to the barricade about about six. Yeah, well, that's a long time yet. It's getting pretty cold, isn't it? There's no harm in you walking about, sir. Just don't stray beyond them boulders. Those boulders over there. Uh, what do you think, Reza? I think uh, your original plan was best, sir. A frontal attack on the Britishers before daylight. And sending a small party ahead to the pass over the path. Yeah, but I would have liked to send a large force ahead to outflank and sandwich them in the pass. If it succeeded, it would force a quicker surrender from them, Herr Mayor. If that is your intention. Yeah. Yeah, I see your point, Rita. Here, Cosette, a group of, say... Four men could easily get past the Britishers? With care, yes. All right. Let me tell you my plan. Herr Cossard, I would like you to guide three of my men to the path that leads out of the pass. The idea is for them to use explosive to render it impassable. Is it possible? Yes, very easily, Major. And what does this path look like? One has to climb up from the end of the pass to the old grazing fields. There are a number of ancient abandoned cottages at about 600 meters, where the slopes of the pass level out. A kilometer to the west, there rises the peak of the mountain. The old goat track is overgrown, but uh, I know it. 
We will have to climb to a hundred meters up the mountain, and then there is what looks like a cave. But it is, uh, it is really a narrow passage leading to a wide ledge. After a kilometer, the ledge narrows to no more than a meter in width. Then it widens out into a ravine. This has to be crossed by using ropes. At first sight, it seems impossible, but there is a way. Enough, Herr Cosette. This passage you mentioned, if it were blown up, what then? The way to the west will be completely blocked. Hmm. Good. Then that will be your assignment, Herr Cosette. How long will it take you to reach this place? Hmm. Two days. Well... The sooner you leave, the better, then. Uh, Lieutenant Weser. Yeah? Uh, Sergeant Fritsch can choose two men to go with him. Uh, I think he's the ideal man for the job. I agree, Herr Mayor. As for our attack on the British rear guard, we can proceed as we planned earlier. Bring Fritsch here to me, and then see if our assault groups are ready to leave. Yeah, Herr Mayor. Another glass of cognac before you leave, Herr Kozak. Ah, thank you, yes. You want me to leave right away? Uh, yeah, I think it would be best. But first, let my assault groups clear the enemy rear guard from the pass. How far in do you need to go before you can begin to climb up the slopes? There is no need to enter the pass at all. It can be climbed from half a kilometer down this valley to a path which leads to the upper slopes of the pass. Ah, good. So there will be no need for you to wait, then. I am ready to leave as soon as your men are ready, Major. But tell me, when the way has been blocked, will your men permit me to go home? I will give Sergeant Fritz orders to that effect, yeah. Yeah, it is all clear, Herr Major. Do not let this Yugoslav guard leave you until he has brought you back. And one more thing. Don't allow him out of your sight, huh? You must know from your own experience how treacherous these Yugoslavs can be. I will see that he is closely guarded. Mm. Don't misunderstand me, Fritz. He must not know he is under surveillance. Huh? He must think we trust him. Who have you chosen to go with you? Weber and Lang, Herr Mayor. Well, I don't know them. Uh, two very good men. Experts at demolition. Oh. Uh, speed is important, Fritz. That passage must be destroyed before the British reach it, so you must not allow anything to delay you. Because it says it will take you two days to reach. But that is at the Yugoslav pace. I want you to force march and reach it in less than 36 hours. I won't permit a break until the demolition is completed, Herr Major. Good. A lot depends on your success, you know. Are you ready to leave now? Yeah, Herr Major. Lang is packing our equipment, and Weber is with the prisoner, with the, uh, the Yugoslav. Mm. Fritz, don't even think of him as being a prisoner, huh? He might sense it, you know. Because that is an ally. Please try to remember that. It was a little after two in the morning when an Australian private, who had been scouting a hundred yards ahead of the ambush position, reported to Sergeant Ryan that there was the sound of activity ahead. Safety catches clicked off the waiting men's weapons, and Corporal Brinkley's finger was poised on the trigger of a flare pistol. Could he see how many? Only that there seemed to be a lot. Uh, shades of what went before. There were a lot last time. Oh, well, this is a big lot. He said they were making no attempt to keep quiet, so that means there must be a hundred or so. A hundred? That many? Oh, hell, Ryan, and we're fifty. Oh, don't worry. Fifty men can hold off an army over a fifty-foot wide stretch like this. No problem at all. And the lads up the slopes will have a bloody field day. Don't forget, Captain, we got all the cover. They don't got none. Yeah, I guess you're right there. Hey, listen, I can hear him coming. What? Are you ready with that flare, Blinkley? Uh, yes, Sarge. Let him get a bit closer. They think they're a long way back from here, so we'll... 
They'll just come marching on till we hit them. What the hell was that? I don't know. Came from down there at the entrance to the pass. Wait a minute. The tanks, maybe? No, no, no. Maybe more shells were slid over. No, of course not. I can't understand it. Those explosions are coming from the German camp. All right, All right but never mind it, sir. We're going to make our own bangs in the tick. Yeah. All right, Frenchy. Let's have the daylight. As the flare burst into a dazzling bright light, the defenders saw a packed mass of German SS troopers wedged between the walls of the pass. Rifle and machine gun fire rained on them from above and to their front. The surprise was complete. The SS officers shouted their orders, and men tried to scramble up the steep slopes where they could take cover and return the British fire. But as Sergeant Ryan put it later, it was like opening up on the New Year crowd in Trafalgar Square. After the initial shock had passed, a large group tried to charge the men defending the floor of the pass. They were cut down in swathes, men clambering over the bodies of their comrades, only to add their own to the growing mound. But still they came on. Oh, oh, made us saints preservers. There's a damn sight more than I expected. Yeah, you can say that again, oh, Ryan. We can fox them by pulling back to the abandoned tank and then later to the barricade. The lads will know what to do. Yeah. McKinley, take ten men back to the tank. Right there, sir. Well, that takes care of that, but, Ryan, what about the guys up the slopes? Ah, they're all right. Jerry won't be able to get them. Oh, heaven forbid. Ryan, they've got flamethrowers. Hurry, McKinley, before we get roasted. Oh, no. He's down. The guy with the flamethrower got hit. That's a bloody good job, too. Look, you, you better get back as well, sir. I'm pulling all the lads back in a tick. Hmm? Do you want another flare, sir? I don't like hell, Brinkley. Get yourself back to the tank and wait. You better go with him, sir. Okay, if you think it's best, but, Ryan, whatever you do, don't be long. Don't worry about that, sir. It's all worked out. In the face of the endless stream of oncoming SS troopers, several armed with deadly flamethrowers, Sergeant Ryan pulled back his men in an orderly retreat running back a few yards to the next boulder, firing a few bursts, and then back a few more yards to the next cover. The 20 snipers up the slopes kept up a murderous fire and had the sense to concentrate on the flashes given out by the flamethrowers. It took 30 minutes for him to reach the abandoned tank, where McKinley's men were rested and ready. The Germans were still 500 yards back down the pass. Your fire! You there, Brian, this is not a bloody circus! Brinkley, where are you? Over here, Sarge. Get ready with the daylight, will you? Hey, McKinley, can you see them yet? No, sir, not yet. Oh, you know what they'll be doing, don't you? They'll be regrouping. Yes, we got a big problem, though. Ammo, it's getting pretty low. Oh, no. A few more minutes like that, and we'll be down to using rifles. I'm sorry now we smashed up the tank's innards. Yeah. We could make use of its machine guns. Wait a minute, Ryan. Is there no more ammo at the barricade? Uh -uh, only for the rifles and a few grenades. Well, hadn't we better pull back there now? No, 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 sir. No, I don't think so. We can hold out nicely here for a while. Yeah, but the barricade... Now, the... Excuse me, sir. But can you imagine what them flamethrowers are going to do to the barricade? We made it up from the abandoned carts. They'd make a lovely fire. Oh, hell yeah. Damn it, I never thought. <sighs> flamethrowers, they're a dirty weapon. I wish we had a few. I, I just don't know. I can't understand it. I mean, the Germans can't have just melted away, Ryan. McKinley, send the man up the path to Recky, will you? Get on with it, Irison. You heard what the sergeant said. This is really starting to give me the creeps. Yes, and me too. You, uh... You don't suppose the Germans have possibly gotten up the sides of the slopes and, well, maybe outflanked us, Ryan? That'll be the last straw. 
The last thing we need is a horde of stormtroopers coming up behind us. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think they've done that. My own lads up the slopes would have kept harrying them. Yeah. You'd have heard them. Well, I don't know. If they're regrouping, they're taking one hell of a time. She <sighs> could see a little better. Yo, know, gee, it's nearly three already. Uh, uh, Sarge? Yes, what is it? Who's that? It's Bates, Sarge. I think I got some some more bad news. Because unless I'm very much mistaken, there's somebody coming up behind us. What? Oh, no. I'm telling you, Sarge. I heard him with my own ears. McKinley, you cover me while I take a good look. Look, hang on, Ryan. I'm coming with you. They're, they're coming and moving among the rocks. Just down there. Oh. Come on, come on, come on, come on, oh. quick. Okay. Wait a minute. He's right. I heard... Who goes there? <laughs> oh, that is where you're hiding. Oh, no. Oh. oh it's Dimitri. Gosh, you nearly stopped me heart, you did. Oh, well, I hope he's brought all his bloody Russian pals with him. Is that Captain Saunders? It's me, all right, Dimitri. And Sergeant Ryan. And you're a right welcome sight to see. Not that we can see very much. Okay, Dimitri. What brings you here? Colonel Horton. He sent us back to help. Oh, thank I was sent to tell him we were under attack. Well, you've come right in the thick of it, Dimitri. Huh? Well, it's very quiet. I was told it was an emergency. I don't see any fighting here. Oh, well, it's all over for the time being. I tell you, we've been giving the SS a real great whacking. Yeah, but no matter how big the whacking, we're expecting a fresh attack at any time. Sergeant Ryan has sent a man down the pass to see what the delay is. Now, come on, Dimitri. Did you bring all your men? Of course. I brought all 25. And I am disappointed. Dis... What do you mean, disappointed? Because Why? you had the first open battle with them. Oh. <laughs> Still, I suppose half a battle is better than none at all. Yeah, but, Dimitri, we got a big problem. We're getting low on ammunition. But we have plenty for our own weapons. Oh, thank heavens for that. Well, bring your own men in and, and join us at the tank, then. You have a tank? Yeah, we have a tank. The Germans sent a tiger into the pass, and, uh, of course, it got stuck. Then it hit a mine when it tried to turn. Come on, Dimitri, you might as well come and take a look at it. All right. Harrison's back, Sarge. Says there's not a jury anywhere as far as he can see in here. Hey, did you hear that? Isn't that peculiar? Did you, did you hear them, Captain Saunders? Yeah, the cherries, they pulled back. Damn strange. I wonder why. There were two good reasons for the German withdrawal. The losses they had experienced were horrendously high, and a messenger had arrived to tell the field commanders that the camp was under mortar attack. In a state of utter confusion, the SS officers ordered their men back, carrying with them their wounded. The mortar bombardment had ceased soon after Major Scheer ordered his men up into the hills. The attackers had melted away as mysteriously as they had appeared, and their pursuers found nothing more than footmarks on the rocky hilltops. The attack had been organized by Kovacs, the partisan leader. The woman who had returned from the fugitive's column had told him about the imminent arrival of a panzer group, which he considered to be a prime target. But as he and his men looked down, the panzers had already left. Instead, they found the Germans massed about the entrance to Rajek Pass, taking little regard of what was in their rear. Kovacs placed 20 mortars on the hilltops and then attacked. Although it lasted for less than 15 minutes, it caused considerable damage to men and equipment. Believing the mortar to be the preliminary to a major assault, Major Scheer ordered his men out of the pass to repel it having no idea at the time how badly they, too, had been mauled. Partisans, they hit and run like cowards. They had plenty of time to escape, Herr Major. I thought we'd left the partisans far behind. Now, who is in charge of our rearguard patrols? Lieutenant Gerber, Herr Major. But his men patrolled those hilltops at midnight and saw nothing. I have a good mind to charge the man with negligence. 
We'll be sure those damned Yugoslav terrorists were watching his patrol every single step of the way. Yeah, I Do you want to see him? No. There's nothing to be gained from talking to an idiot. What was the damage? 33 men killed and four half-tracks destroyed. Oh. You know, it's, it's criminal. If I can just lay my hands on just one of them, I'll, I'll, I'll hang him on the spot. Far worse happened in the past, Hermione. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, don't remind me, Reza. How can a disaster like that overtake us? We were outguessed, Hermione. The British has moved down the pass to less than 500 meters from the entrance. They found good cover and waited. A, a thousand men, Reza. A thousand SS troopers thrown back by, by a handful of, of, of ex-prisoners of war. It is unbelievable. Lieutenant Gresler thinks they would have succeeded had they not been called back. Yeah. So he's suggesting it is my fault. Nine, nine, Herr Major. He says that the Englanders were retreating when the message came. We have lost nearly 300 men tonight, Reza. How can we explain that to General Volda? You won't have to, Herr Major. Now that Data has left with his tigers, there is no way of communicating with HQ. Hmm. Yeah. I suppose that is one consolation. And if we push every man into the pass tomorrow and overrun the enemy rearguard, we will have turned defeat into a triumph. Yeah, but at what cost? No, Reza. I have a better idea. Let Kozak do his work in blocking that pass. Mayor? And when the enemy are really trapped, that will be the time to make them sorry for tonight's work. The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Diffenfall. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Springbok 930 Dossier. Every day at this time, we bring you dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. Present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. While Major Shear and his SS battalion were licking their wounds at the entrance of Rajek Pass, Kozat and three German SS troopers were making their way south, then west onto higher ground. The going was rough, but the German Sergeant Fritsch had chosen his men well. They climbed steep slopes littered by boulders of all sizes, crossed the tops of hills, moving ever higher. Sometimes Kozat would flash a torch at the ground, and there would be a slight shift of direction. They had heard far-off sounds of battle echoing across the stony hills. Fritsch shrugged it off, presuming his SS comrades were making the escaped prisoners of war wish they were back in their cages. Soon they were high enough to see the sun begin to rise over the tops of the distant eastern hills. Do you have to climb much higher? No. About half a kilometer we come to some of the old grazing lands. And there will be slopes, but nothing like the hills we climbed at night. Where's the pass you're following? 
Hey, oh, sheer. Said we would find paths up here. <laughs> paths? These are not real paths. Perhaps 50 years ago a man could see them clearly, but uh, people have not lived up here for a long time. See this? Uh, it is overgrown, but look. I can't see anything. No, but it is there. I pulled the grass to one side, and now do you see it? A stone. A large stone. And see how it has been worn, eh? It was once a place where a man sat to watch the flocks of sheep. See here? This groove is where they sharpen the knives. Yes, I believe you. And three kilometers on, we will come to some cottages where these shepherds live. Well, who cares? Ah, we can rest there for a while, eat, and make something to drink. We are not stopping for rest, Kozat. The commandant has forbidden it. We can rest on the way back after we have blown up the passage and the Britishers are safely trapped in Rajak Pass. At first light, I was awakened from a deep sleep of exhaustion. Violetta had been up before me and collected two plates of food from the field kitchen. After eating, Violetta checked our equipment while I reported to Major Ramsden. My advice, if you need it, is to travel light and fast. We're taking three days' emergency rations and our weapons. Uh, nothing else. Well, I wish you every success, Sale, and I'll pray that your young lady's childhood memories are accurate. Everything depends on them. Violetta is well aware of that, sir. Do you want me to report to Colonel Horden before I leave? No. Uh, no, I don't think that would be advisable. I think he's still sleeping. Is he sick? No, I told his orderly to let him sleep until just before we move off. He had a late night. Uh, well, I don't remember much of last night. Did something happen? Oh, there was something of a tussle when the Germans tried to get into the pass last night. See. Captain Sanders sent a, a message back that they gave up after a while. The colonel sent Dmitri and his Russians to give a hand. And the colonel stayed up to hear the results? Well, no, not exactly. Um, he had a bit of a run-in with Lady Agnes, it seems, just oh. as he was going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> He's terrified of her, you know. Yes. Um, she's still complaining about the milk rations? Sir? No, no, it was rather chilly last night, and she demanded more blankets for the children. They're a hard commodity to find. Well, she took his, and then she went along to our supply sergeant and confiscated his blankets as well. <laughs> she, she said that they could do with old coats and <laughs> canvases. It, it was a real to-do. I'm sorry I missed it. Well, I'd better be on my way. Well, good luck, Sale. Make absolutely sure you found the right path before you come back. Right, sir. From what I can gather from uh, Captain Saunders' report, I think that Major Shear will be coming hard on our tail. We can't afford to make mistakes at this stage of the game, eh? I'll make doubly sure, sir. Regards to your lady friend. Uh, that's fiancé, sir. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Good show, Sale. There's a pretty girl. Here it is, daylight and still no Germans. You sound a little disappointed, Dimitri. <laughs> the less I see of Germans, the happier I feel. And if you'd seen that last attack, you'd feel the same way. Hmm. I want to take my men down the pass to see what is happening. Huh? Now, look, I wouldn't advise that. Now, let him go, sir. I was going to suggest some of my men go. I just want to see the place where you fought. There will be weapons and ammunition lying there with the dead. Yeah. Just what I was thinking. When my lads came in from up the slopes, they said a lot of the dead and the dying have been left down below. Yeah, well, heaven knows how many men they lost. I reckon it must have been a hell of a lot. Well, enough to make them think. Oh, yeah. And hopping mad. Well, they can get as mad as they like, but it won't get them past this position without losing a few hundred more men. Yeah, which brings me to another thought. How many did we lose? Uh, seven and two wounded. Private Peter oh. shot himself in the foot when he was trying to reload. Oh. Like I told him, like I told him, it's more haste to less speed. But only seven dead, Ryan? I mean, that's miraculous. Well, it would have been less if it wasn't for them bloody flamethrowers. What? They use flamethrowers? Yeah, that's right. While you're scouting round, will you see if you can bring a couple back? 
Some of the men using them got shot. Maybe they was left behind. Yeah. I have been looking for a flamethrower since we escaped from the camp. Corporal Barangi is an expert with one. We find at least two. One for you and one for me. <laughs> if I see any live Germans down the pass, I send a messenger back to tell you. <laughs> He's a lively one, isn't he, sir? Yeah, I guess. He's a good man to have on our side. I'm going to get some of the lads to roll bowlers down here and stack them up around the tank. It'd make a pretty good barricade. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to take a look at the tank's machine guns. Maybe I can repair some of the damage that I, uh, that I did yesterday. Yeah, well, it's not going to be easy. I know, I know, that's right, yes. Like to say, we Irish are better at smashing things than making them. Anyway, Gary Watson's pretty good at mechanics, though. Maybe he'll find a way to make them work again. Oh, and the stacks of ammo for them. So it'd come in handy when Jerry pokes his nose up the pass like he did last night. When did he leave, Ramston? Uh, about half an hour ago. You briefed him properly? Oh, of course, sir. About the radio we pinched from that Yugoslav oh, spy. No, it's no good. You mean those silly blighters broke it when they brought it back? Oh, no, no, it's working. Well, what then? We can call up uh, Allied Intelligence and tell well, them what... No, no, that's impossible, sir. Not while we're down here in the pass. Why not? I mean... Well, the mountains, they, they cut off our ability to send and receive. It's quite hopeless. Oh, damn it all, Ramsden. We go to all that effort for nothing. It's ridiculous. Oh, no, when we move on to the higher ground at the end of the pass, we should be able to communicate then. Well, that could be day. Well, I, I know, but there's very little Allied Intelligence can do for us in the pass anyway, sir. Perhaps drop a few supplies, but we can manage with what we've got for the time being. Oh, that reminds me, sir. Captain Sanders sent for more ammunition. Ah, oh, rather send him a message to fall back closer to the column. Well, he says that he has a very strong position where he is now, sir. But the distance between him and us will increase daily. I'd feel better if he moved back. And why more ammunition? Well, it was a hell of a battle they fought last night, sir. Uh, three and a half hours, according to Sanders' report. He estimates that the Germans lost at least 300 men. Oh, does he? I say, splendid work. I had no idea. 300, eh? That will make that ruddy Major sure wish he hadn't cut the truce short. What? <coughs> yes, sir. Well, the day's starting well, Major. I think you can send a message down to Captain Saunders, and he can hold the position until tomorrow morning. Then he can fall back three or four miles and establish a fresh one. <laughs> I say 300 men, eh? Mayor Ramsden, by Jove, it was a grand idea I had in sending Saunders back to take charge. Uh, uh, if you'll excuse me, sir. Why, uh, what is it? It's, uh... Lady Agnes, she's coming over this way. Oh, no, no. Tell her I'm too busy. Uh, look, Ramsden, come here. Oh, damn. The column very slowly wended its way at less than half a kilometer an hour through the narrow pass. Dmitri Arkinov and his men came on the scene of the previous night's fight. Among the many dead, they found several wounded. Remembering Major Ramsden's orders of a few days previously, Dmitri, with great difficulty, prevented his men from killing them off. Instead, they were placed between two large boulders and ignored. The Russians collected a huge quantity of automatic weapons and ammunition and began taking them back along the pass to the newly constructed barrier. To his delight, Dmitri found three undamaged flamethrowers. Shortly before noon, the operation was completed, and one of the men who was guarding the site reported to Dmitri that a German patrol was carefully moving up the pass towards them. Unable to establish their numbers without engaging them, Dmitri withdrew his force to the barricade. I don't think there were many. Possibly a small patrol sent to find out where we are. 
Well, they'll know if they wander this far. I set the flame torch up between those rocks. Over Wait, there. one is mine, Bob. Yeah, that's right. And two are yours, Ryan. What do you use yours for? Lighting cigarettes? <laughs> <laughs> no. Lighting up Germans, my friend. Send them back to Berlin in a blaze of glory. <laughs> You're right. Anyway, we're ready for them. McKinley, signal the lads up the slopes to keep their eyes peeled. Jerry's on the way. They don't learn easy, do they? Well, it's the only way they can get at us, so they got no choice but to keep trying. Maybe they think we've pulled back away to keep close to the column. Yeah, well, then they've got a surprise coming. Unless they found a way over the top. No. If that Kozat fella knew a way over the top, they would have used it last night instead of, well, instead of wasting all those men. I want to put some of my men up those slopes with yours. Eight of them are excellent snipers. That's your welcome. Just get them to remember the signals, though. Daytime, this one blow and this whistle, and that means open fire. Two blows means cease fire, and at night, we don't shoot until we see a white flare. Good. That's simple to remember. I will explain to them. Well, sir, all we can do now is just sit around and wait for them. Oh, give me flying a plane any day. Walking too far ahead. Sorry, Sergeant. I thought you were close behind me. We're not used to climbing up and down rocks like this all day. Weber, Lang, come here. Lang. They're finding it more difficult than I do. See over there, it is the remains of a cottage. Yeah. Tell me, how far is? The pass from here. Over, over the way, about uh, three kilometers. And that was to stop me from bringing 200 men along to come down on the Englanders from the other end of the pass. You will have to ask your commandant that question. It is possible to do it, but we would not have moved so quickly. He was anxious for us to reach our objective as soon as possible. Yeah. That is so. But for the sake of your men, I think you should let them take a short rest. Just ten minutes. Then they have no trouble keeping up with us. Uh, yeah, I suppose it might help. Over there. We'll stop and rest for a while. Violetta and I made good progress along the pass. The deeper we went, the more I realized what a desperately bleak and gloomy place it was. Although it had widened out to about 30 meters across, it took on the appearance of a deep ravine. The sides were now steep, naked rock, rearing steeply up on either side to a height which was impossible for me to estimate. We hoped to reach the end before darkness. Meanwhile, behind us, the column made its way in our footsteps at a painfully slow pace. Well, what did you find? Oh, it's, it's quite impossible for them to move any faster, Colonel. You can see for yourself the difficulties. At this speed, it will take us all day to make three blasted miles. Well, at least we're safe from attack as long as Sanders can hold sheer. Oh, I just want to get out of this pass. I never thought a place could be so depressing. And that woman... The very thought of her leaves me speechless. All the heart's in the right place, sir. Last night I had a nightmare. And she was the principal character. Oh, she takes the welfare of the women and children very seriously. I wish she would stay with them and stop bothering me. Oh, that's an impossibility for a woman like Lady Agnes. How did you deal with her, Ramsden? Well, when she shouted, I shouted back. We... We exchanged insult for insult. It was quite simple, really. For you, perhaps. Do you know what I dreamt? I dreamt a message came from our intelligence chaps giving her command of the whole show. Can you imagine such a thing, Ramsden? She was wearing my uniform jacket and swishing everyone with a bloody riding crop. <laughs> 
No, I didn't think it funny. I woke in a cold sweat. It was a horrifying experience. If you don't mind my saying so, sir, it's best not to take her too seriously. She has family connections at the war office. Well, as long as we get the column to the coast, I don't think we need worry about that. You'll see, when we reach Italy, she'll be ready to sing our praises. Oh, I can't imagine that, friends. Oh, she's her. not all frost, sir. And as far as the women and kids are concerned, she's looked on as a saint. Oh, Saint Agnes, perish the thought. It will be dark soon. Hey, look what I found in my pack. Huh? Uh, booze? <laughs> you remember Kovacs, sir? Huh? Yeah. He gave me some bottles of peach brandy. This is the last survivor. <laughs> oh, yeah, but is it wise to drink, Dimitri? I mean... Do you ask me, is it wise to drink? What a stupid question. The answer is yes. But didn't you know that in the old days, soldiers went into battle roaring drunk? Maybe in Russia. Everywhere, my friend. Oh, that's just a story, yep. Dimitri. Look at the British Navy, huh? Does it not issue rum to its men? Is that not true, Sergeant? Yeah, that's like it's true. Good, so drink. Here. Uh, okay. Thanks. <coughs> Here, now you, Sergeant. Strong stuff, huh? No, that's not, thank you. Ah. It's not bad at all. Ugh. But I'd much prefer a pint of stout. Ha! Soon it will be dark. Give it to me. Ha! It is dark here for most of the time, huh? <sighs> when we have finished this bottle, I will send a relief to the men upon the slope. Now, no, I'm ahead of you. Mine were relieved an hour ago while you were telling jokes to your men. Yeah, and they must have been very funny. The Germans at the end of the pass must have heard the laughter. <laughs> You like to hear them, Doc? Uh, well, maybe not now, Dimitri. No. Very well, then. Later. Then I will tell you about the time Adolf Hitler found Heinrich Himmler hiding in a cupboard wearing a yellow and pink party dress. <laughs> Come on, tell me now, tell me now. Okay, Dimitri, you sold us on it. Go on, give us the rest. <laughs> All right. It was at Betch's garden, and Himmler retired early from a party, huh? He went into the wrong bedroom. <laughs> ah, well, this is better. Grass and a few bushes. This is where the mountain people graze their sheep and goats. They must have been tough to live up here, though. Oh, yes, Sergeant. They were very hardy people. But it became too much for them. The young ones did not want to live here, and more and more went to live at the south end of the pass. I see. The last people to live here were the were the Giorgio's family. That was about uh, 15 years ago. But you know the place so well. I was recruited by the German military intelligence at the time Italy invaded Albania. My first assignment was to provide a contour map covering a hundred square kilometers. You drew a contour map? No, no, I am a farmer. The man who recruited me came to Yugoslavia as a tourist. We spent three weeks in the mountains and he made sketches and notes and from these he made the map. But you didn't tell him everything, yeah? Everything I knew. Our intelligence did not know there was a way out of the western end of Project Pass. Ah, uh, Herr Singler was told. Oh, yes. He must have been overlooked when he made his map. I even took him as far as the passage we are going to blow up. Yeah, damn intelligence services. They're always making mistakes. What is that over there? Uh, we are coming to the end of the grazing pastures. Now we will have to start uh, climbing again. Oh, I thought we were finished with climbing. Just a hundred meters. Then we will be walking downhill for the next um, three kilometers. Uh, it's getting dark. I think we will take a short rest and eat. Very wise decision, Sergeant. An hour 
before darkness fell, Violetta and I finally reached the end of the pass. The bare rock face narrowed, and then it came to a point, completely barring the way. Violetta spent the next 30 minutes going to different points in the rock face, and then she called me over. A narrow cleft, partly filled by fallen debris, led upwards, stepped by jutting pieces of rock. By using the rock debris and the natural steps, we were able to begin climbing. It wasn't as difficult as I had expected, but it took what seemed an age before we came out onto a narrow plateau. It was now almost too dark to see. At the moment, as we emerged from the cleft, Kozat and the three German SS men were finishing a meal of bread and sausage, and they were no more than three miles away. Kozat sat close to Sergeant Fritsch, and for a very good reason. Oh, it has been a hard day, Kozat. Yes. I feel more like lying back here, sleeping until morning. But we have a job to do. Are you ready, man? Yeah. Just one more thing, sir. And uh, what is that? This. Kosat made a quick grab at Fritsch's gun. But the sergeant's reflexes were too fast for him. The men struggled for a moment for possession of the weapon. But as Lang and Weber ran to help Fritsch, Kozat let go, and he ran for his life into the darkness. No! Stop firing! We don't want him dead! Come on! We have to catch him before we lose him altogether! Kozat ran a few hundred yards, circled round to the rocks they had intended to climb, and began the ascent. The three Germans used torches to search in the dark, presuming Kozat had run away in the direction from which they'd come. When he was no more than 30 feet up, Kozat's foot dislodged a rock and it bounced down with a clatter. He was over there, climbing the rocks. Quickly, after him. Realizing his danger, Kozat increased his pace, and being a man of the mountains, he easily outpaced his pursuers. But even a mountain man cannot see in the dark. As he reached the top of the climb, he ran blindly forward, and his foot stubbed a rock, causing him to fall forward. His head glanced off the side of a rock, and he rolled over, unconscious. That was how Sergeant Fritsch and his men found Kozat some ten minutes later. Lang, tie his hands together. Yeah, boy. Then he recovers consciousness. Herr Kozat and I are going to have a talk. When I have finished, he will beg me to let him lead us to the passage. And when he has done so, we will let him go. There's a bullet through the back of his skull. The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dippenthal. Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Springbok 9.30 Dossier. Every day at this time, we bring you dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense. From the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. It took half an hour for Kozat to regain consciousness. When he did, he found his hands tied behind him. A torch clicked on, dazzling him. Sergeant Fritsch looked down at him over the beam. There is 
A punishment for treachery, Cosa. Mm -hmm. Running away is not treachery, Sergeant. I was scared. Scared? Scared of what? Scared that you will kill me when I show you the passage through the mountains. My orders were to return you to my Oshir. But now it is different. Where did you intend to run? To the Britishers? No. No. Yeah. You would go and warn them. No. I am an agent for the Wehrmacht intelligence. You were, Cossack. You were. But now... Do you know what I think, Cossack? I think you have changed sides. No, no I swear it. You no. proved that you can't be trusted. I'm sorry I ran away. Please... I told you, uh, I was frightened. I, I thought you meant to kill me. Yes, well, now there's a strong possibility that I will. Weber, take off his boots. Yeah, well, Sergeant. What are you going to do? A man with no boots and his hands tied behind him cannot run very far in the mountains. I can't walk so far with no boots. Please, my feet, they will be torn to pieces by the rocks. That is a just punishment for trying to run away. How far is it to our destination, Cossack? We can reach the passage by noon tomorrow. Right. Lead us directly there, and I'll give you one promise. You can have your boots back. My feet will be so torn I won't be able to wear them. I don't need to promise anything. Then after you have blown up the passage, you will you will let me go? Yeah, Cossack. I will let you go. Why not? <laughs> Shut up, Lang. I mean it. Make no more trouble. And take us to the passage over the pass, Cossack. And I will give you back your boots and freedom. was a moon, but it spent most of the night obscured by cloud. Violetta and I continued on up, across and up again, over bare, stony ground. Plainly, her childhood memory of the route from the pass was returning, and she rarely hesitated in leading the way. It was cold, yet I was damp with sweat from my exertions. Just before dawn, the ground flattened to a moderate slope, and I felt the welcome softness of grass under my feet. Then, as the sky began to lighten, I saw we were following close to a low stone wall. Violetta stopped and sat on a rock. From her pack, she took out a tin of emergency ration and opened it. You have some chocolate, Paul? Uh, it tastes more like mud, but... <laughs> yes, thanks. I'm told it's good for promoting energy. Look over there. Can hmm? you see anything yet? Yes, yes, I can just make out a... Yes, it's a building. This is where my father grazed his sheep. And that was our house. Oh, so and this is where you were brought up then, huh? When we have finished this, I want to go and look at the house. Uh, of course. I'm interested. But uh, we can't stay long. No, I understand. I would like to see what is left. How far is it from here to the route out of Rajek? Not far. We can be there before noon. There were other houses far over there, mm -hmm. towards the other end of the path. The people who lived there left two years earlier than us. It seems a hard country. Yes, it was. Water was a problem. There is a fresh water spring about a kilometer from the house. Every morning, my mother, my two brothers, and myself had to go there for water to last the day. Why, that's primitive. <laughs> yes, that is the right word. Why did your father stay for so long after the others left? It had been his only home. Our people lived up here for many hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. In the old days, they scratched a meager living from the ground, and I suppose they were happy with what little they had. They lived in isolation, most never meeting a stranger in their whole lives. You see, they didn't know any better. But times change. 
And the young people went in search of a new life and mixed with the people in the lowlands who lived a much easier life. Right. There was good land for the taking and water ran everywhere. So, over the years, the mountain people abandoned their homes and went south to what is, in comparison, an easy life. Paul, that house was my family's home for three or four hundred years. My father cried when he left. Yeah, I can understand that. But when we settled near to Vazi, he quickly stopped crying and told everyone what a fool he was for staying up the mountain for so long. It was a new world. I can remember now my mother staring as my brother turned a pump handle and out of it flowed water. It was like magic. <laughs> and they were friends, people we could talk to. Girls of my own age to play with. Mm. There was even an inn at Vazi. For the first time in his life, my father used money. He'd never had money? Oh, he had a little money. Just a few dinars left to him by his father. They were kept in a wooden box. A relic from the day a stranger came and, and bought an old carving from grandfather. There was no use for money up here. So it lay in the box for years. The second night we read Vazi, my father went to the inn and came back drunk. His few dinars gone. <laughs> but he was happy. How did you live in Vazi with uh, no money and no home? Oh, there were other families there from Rajik. They cared for us until my father got work and built a small house. In less than a year, he was sowing crops on his own small farm three kilometers outside Vazi. So it all ended well, hmm? Until the Germans came. My oldest brother, Joseph, had joined the partisans. One day, some Germans came to the house. Joseph was asleep, and they caught him with a gun. My brother and I ran away through the back door. They shot my mother and father then hang Joseph in a tree outside the front door. I'm sorry, Fioletta. I, I didn't it's think... All, it's all right, Paul. I have taken revenge for them many times over. Come on. It's light enough now for us to go to the house. Violetta's story left me with a deep sadness in my heart. While she seemed to suddenly shrug it off, it was the past... I walked behind her towards the distant house, which stood between two low hillocks. It was made from dressed, dark brown stone. Half of the roof had fallen in, and a stone porch in the front had collapsed, creating a pile of rubble in the doorway. Violetta, ever cautious from her years as a partisan, stopped and held up a hand for me to do the same. Her Schmeisser machine gun leveled at the door, and I heard the metallic click of the safety catch being taken off. She moved to one side and peered through one of the windows, and then she walked round the side. She was out of my sight for a whole minute before she walked round the other side to the front. She raised a booted foot and jabbed it at the door. It collapsed and she walked inside. I followed her, not a little awed by her efficiency, she was standing in the middle of what had once been a living room. I had forgotten how small it was. Well, it was a long time ago. But I remember this table and these wooden chairs. Yeah. Uh, all your furniture was left behind? How could we have taken it? All we carried was a bundle each of clothing. Nearly all you see here was made by my father. And those that came before him. Oh, yes, a few things came from the outside world, but mainly from other families who had bartered them. This is where my brothers and I slept. Such a tiny room, isn't it? There, Anton and I slept in that bed. Joseph in the other one. And this is my father's room. Everything as it was. Oh, Paul. 
Seeing this makes me feel so sad. Sad you left here? Sad to remember a life that is past and gone. But I'm glad we left here. At least Mama and Papa tasted a little of an easier life before... Before... Oh, Violetta, come on. This is doing you no good. It is a fact, though, that if we had stayed here, my father, mother, and Joseph would have been alive today. No Germans would have troubled them here, here on Rajek Pass. Oh, please, Violetta, we must get on. No, Paul. Leave me alone for a few minutes. I couldn't refuse. So I went outside and left her staring at the rough, homemade furniture of her parents' bedroom. The room where generations of her ancestors had been conceived. I sat on the rubble outside the front door and waited for her to break out of her fit of nostalgia. The sun was coming up over the distant hills, bringing with it warmth and brightness. A wonderful change from the chill gloom of the past so far below. To the east, there stretched long grass, broken only by numerous rocky outcrops. It came to an end at some rocks about half a mile away. I blinked and shaded my eyes. Was it a movement I'd detected? I watched carefully before shaking my head. Hadn't Violetta told me that no one lived up here anymore? I lit a cigarette and watched the bluish smoke curl up in the windless air. Our column had spent the night camped over a distance of 300 yards in a part of the pass that had narrowed down to less than 30 feet across. Major Ramsden had carefully studied the site and found it would make an excellent defensive position for our rear guard when they withdrew from their present position that morning. Before the column began its day's march, he sent back a messenger with orders to Captain Saunders. The American read the note, dismissed the messenger, and turned to Sergeant Ryan. Orders to pull out. From the martinet? No, no, from Major Ramsden. He's left a marker at a place he thinks would make an ideal position. Yeah, but I like it here. Well, maybe you do, Ryan, but don't forget the column is getting farther away by every hour. Well, he must be at least six to seven miles away by now. Where's Dimitri? Oh, he took some men to scout up the pass. He's, uh, he's sulking because he drank the last of his peach brandy and the Germans didn't make an attack last night. <laughs> can't say I'm sorry. I had a good night's sleep for a change. That's right, and me too. We all did. I wonder what they're up to. Uh, the Germans, I mean. Oh, still trying to count how many men they lost. I don't like it, Ryan. Ah, we're as safe as houses up here. Nobody can get at us from the top, if that's what you're thinking. Yeah, well, I'd rather not take it for granted. Well, the locals, they should know. Oh, sure, the locals should know, but they didn't know that there's a way out of the pass to the west, did they? Now, ask yourself how much else they don't know. Excuse me saying so, sir, but I, I think you've got an attack of the jitters. Oh, come on. Let's get the hell out of here. Get your men together, Sergeant. What about the Russians? Well, send a man down to tell them. They can catch us up on the way. Right you are. Private Blexley, get your pink unwashed body down here. Will you have to double? <laughs> Come along. Move that mule a bit faster there. Oh, what a way to fight a bloody war. I'm sorry I ever... Oh, no. Preserve me from this. Ah, there you are, Colonel uh, Horton. I've been looking for you. Uh, good morning, uh, Lady Agnes. Good morning, my foot. What is this I hear about you? Uh, I'm sorry. I don't understand. It's all your fault that Mrs. Robinson has sprained her poor ankle. Why, I, I don't even know the lady. You don't have to know her, Colonel. It's all because of your orders telling us to move quicker. We're doing the best we can. But I want to reach the end of the pass before dark. At all costs. I, I'm sorry, Lady Agnes. I can't be held responsible don't for... Don't you dare adopt that tone with me. 
I hold you responsible for everything, Colonel Horton. You're the man in command, so you're the man to whom I must voice my complaints. Major Ramston is in charge of the actual muck. I see. So you want to pass the buck, as those awful Americans say. Well, you can't fool me with such utter nonsense. Pace is too fast for my charges, and I demand that you slow down a little. We are already traveling at a snail's pace. Snail's pace for a hulking, ugly brute like yourself. Do you thought of those poor women? Some of them having to stumble along with babes in arms? How would you like to carry a baby through this confounded pass? It can easily be arranged. Madam, please be reasonable. Poor Mrs. Robertson doesn't feel very reasonable at the moment, so why should I? I'm warning you to slow the pace before there are more injuries. Now look at what we have to walk over. Over landslides and round huge boulders, hour after miserable hour. We started the march less than half an hour Don't ago. Don't nitpick with me, Colonel. I'm not in the mood for it. Slow the pace, or I'll tell my ladies to sit down and not budge another inch until you come to your senses. I won't be threatened. I see. So you want to declare war against us, poor defenseless women and children. Very well. So be it. Uh, Lady Agnes, uh, please, please. Well, Colonel... Uh, I'll send a man to order Major Ramsden to slow down our pace a little. Thank you, Colonel. I knew you'd cooperate when you knew the facts. All right, Paul. I'm ready to leave. Look at this. A uh, photograph? My father and mother, when I was little... Mm. A traveling photographer came and took pictures of all the families. Mm -hmm. That's me, Anton, and that one is Joseph in the front. I shall take this with me. How old were you? About three, I'd say. Probably. I don't really know. Why are you looking over there? I, uh, I just thought I saw something move among those rocks. Oh, it must be a wild goat. There must be a lot of them up here. Yes, right. Well, which way do we go? This is the difficult part for me to remember. Over that way, where you see the two peaks. The passage lies somewhere between them. Well, let's hope we can find it quickly. The column should reach the end of the pass by tonight. Oh, oh no. No, look at my feet, Sergeant. I don't give a damn about your feet, Cossack. Keep marching. Very soon it will be impossible. Look at them. Yeah. Losing some blood might do you some good. No. Now keep on moving. No, I can't. My feet are beginning to swell. And... Oh, very well. Weber, give him back his boots. But I'm warning you, Cossack. Make one wrong move. And you won't just lose your boots next time. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. <laughs> oh, my feet are so sore. Help him, Weber. You see another house over there, Cossack? Yes, yes. It, it, it is the most westerly of the pastures. The people who lived there were the last to leave. Now, come on, hurry up. I don't want to waste any more time on this. Yes, you've... Uh, but first... Oh, oh, it, it's not going to be easy. You'll get used to it. Just start walking, Cossack. Now, come on, don't stand there looking at your feet. All right, all right. Yes, it is a little better. Long you stay behind him and prod him forward when he lags. Yeah, Start marching, Kozak. Oh. This must be the place Major Ramsden men. Yes, that's that's the marker. Yeah. Yes, it looks all right. Not very wide. Plenty of boulders to make a barricade. Uh, there is no way anyone can get up those cliffs, is there, Ryan? No, no. But I'll take a closer look in a tick. Mm -hmm. McKinley, start work on the rocks, will you? Right, on, Sarge. I wonder what happened to Dimitri. Uh, he and his men can look after themselves. I reckon they're not far behind us. Whatever he's up to, it'll be to our advantage. No, no, not there, you great dope. Make us start over where those two big boulders are standing. Use them as part of the barricade. I can send another man back to hurry Dimitri along. Don't worry about him. Those Russians have their own ideas of fighting a war. Darn effective, too. I do know he's sore about missing the battle we had, so maybe he went off to start one of his own. Mm, sure, I, I wouldn't put that past him. Hey, Mitchum. Yes, sir. Go ahead to the column and report to Colonel Horton that we are digging in here. And then come back as soon as you can, will you? Yes, sir.
As Kozat and the three German soldiers passed close to the house, Sergeant Fritsch sent Weber to take a cursory look inside. A few minutes later, the soldier caught them up and handed something to Fritsch. The sergeant turned to Kozat, holding the object up between the thumb and forefinger. Tell me, Kozat, how do you explain this? What is it? You have eyes. It is a cigarette butt. And it is certainly not 15 years old. No, it is impossible. Why, it is still damp. Correct. I would say it was smoked less than an hour ago. I, I can't see... Weber, did you search the house thoroughly? Yes, Sergeant. It was an English Virginia cigarette. Yeah, I feel the British has up in here. How? You know how, Cossett. They've reached the end of the pass and climbed up here. There's no other possible explanation. They will be searching for the route over the pass. It goes without saying. But where are they now? We are two hours' march from the passage, Sergeant. I'm sure they will have gone over that way. And the problem is how many are there? This was the only evidence, Weber? Some footprints in the dust, Sergeant. But there are no more than two or three. Small party sent out ahead to find the way. Well, we have the advantage of knowing they're here. And... Where they are hiding. And I keep an eye on our Yugoslav friend here. I want you both to go ahead of us. Long to the right, Weber to the left. Keep low. Yeah, when you're in the open, signal back to me if you see anyone. Convinced that there wasn't another living soul for miles around, Violetta and I had dropped all caution as we walked through a desolate landscape of rocks and stunted bushes. I began to worry because... On two occasions, Violetta had led me along a deep cleft, only to find ourselves faced by a sheer rock wall. I'm sorry, Paul. It is not easy as I hoped it would be. All these rocks and hills seem alike. Yeah, but you have to keep trying. I know, I know. Now, look, uh, just let's stop a minute and think, huh? Now, what do you remember best? The two peaks and the passage in between. Right. What did the passage look like? I can't remember. It, it was dark, very dark. It wasn't open to the sky? No, I don't think so. More like a tunnel, then? Yes, a tunnel, cold and dark. So, what we're looking for is something, something like a cave entrance. I remember that before the tunnel, there was a short climb over a lot of loose rocks. Where there had once been a landslide, hmm? Yes, I think so. All right. So that's what we're searching for. A lot of loose stones and a cave entrance above it. Oh, there are a lot of caves, Paul. My father used to come here hunting bears. Bears? There are bears? Oh, well, yes. Quite a lot of them. I see. Well, I'm very glad you told me. <laughs> because the last thing we want to do is to... Well... <laughs> Go gaily marching into a bear's den. All right, I'll keep my safety off and my eyes peeled. They are afraid of humans and run away. Just be careful not to corner one. Then they become very dangerous. Well, now you've warned me, I'll be a bit more cautious. Come on, let's try and find the right place. We continued our search. But after a while, I began to grow more worried. I could sense that Violetta was lost and bewildered. And I would have been even more worried had I known that less than half a mile away, we were being hunted by three Waffen SS men. The Veil of Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dippenthal. Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Springbok 930 Dossier. This time, 
we bring you dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. We present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. As we searched among the rocky hillocks and loose boulders, it became obvious to me that Violetta had forgotten the way over Roderick Pass. Her childhood memory had failed her, and at the same time, threatened the lives of the 250 fugitives who had entered the pass in the hope of escaping the Waffen SS and reach the Adriatic coast. The thought of having to return and report our failure to Colonel Horden spurred me to greater efforts. I knew it was only a matter of time before Major Shear, the commandant of the SS battalion, ordered his men into the pass to overwhelm our rear guard and force our surrender. Finding a way out of the pass to the west was our only hope. Violetta and I stood in front of a sheer rock face, and I heard her heave a deep sigh. I'm sorry, Paul, but it's hopeless. We'll work our way back, only slower and uh, more carefully. If we'd passed it, I would have recognized it, Paul. It has to be here, Violetta, somewhere. Anything could have happened over the years. Landslides are happening all the time. Sometimes we even suffer from minor earthquakes. Well, I can't go back yet. Can you imagine our reception? Well, old Horton would explode. Imagine the alarm when our people realize they're hopelessly trapped. No, Paul. Not completely trapped. Huh? Why? What do you mean? If the people come up out of the pass to here, it is possible to march northeast and come out in the valleys 15 kilometers north of the pass entrance. You didn't tell me that. It was never necessary. It was easier to march through the pass, wasn't it? Well, all the same, we must avoid going back that way. If the SS don't get us, the Panzers will. Hey, that's a nasty thought. Yes? Well, if it's possible to get from here back to the valleys, then it must be possible for the SS to do the opposite. No, Paul. It would be impossible without a guide. A man who has lived in these mountains, and there are very few of those. It is a long and difficult journey. The Germans have a man who knows the pass, perhaps even better than you do. The man called Kozat. Kozat? Mm -hmm. You didn't tell me about him? No, no, I, I forgot. Then we could be in terrible danger. If his man led a large force of Germans here, we would be trapped even if I did find the passage through the mountains. How long would it take for them to reach here? Oh, two days, perhaps three. And that's how long they've had. Violetta, we're in serious trouble. Kozat was indeed leading a party of Germans towards the mountain passage. But it was a party of only three, Sergeant Fritsch and two troopers, with orders to blow up the escape route. However, Kozat was not a willing guide. He'd been caught attempting to escape, fearing that the Germans would kill him once their mission had been completed. Now he was being carefully watched, and his hands were tied behind his back. Troopers Lang and Weber were searching the country ahead, while Fritsch prodded Kozat along. During a brief visit to Violetta's old house, I had smoked a cigarette. The butt had been found, alarming Fritsch into the fact that somebody had been there within the previous hour. What he didn't know was how many of us there were. While Violetta and I talked, the Germans were moving very close. You said there were a lot of caves here, but I haven't seen any yet. Yes, Paul, that puzzled me, too. I remember seeing several caves when my father brought me this way. Well, both of us can't have missed them. Let's continue the way we were going for a while longer. And... <coughs> what was that? There's somebody near. Or perhaps one of the bears you warned me about. Quick, over here, behind the cover of these rocks. <coughs> Perhaps the worst is already happening, and we've bumped into a German patrol. No, we would hear their voices. Well, what then? There. Huh? Do you see him? 
He's standing up, looking around. Oh, yeah. Oh, damn. SS trooper. Give me a count of 20, then go and see if you can talk to him. Pretend you are a peasant. Feel that? Oh, what the hell? She was gone among the rocky outcrops before I could object. I looked at the German, who was now slithering down a pile of loose rocks about 30 feet away. I put down my machine gun and gave a slow count to 20. Then I stepped out into the open, a broad smile on my face. I walked towards the astonished man who brought up his gun to the ready. I forced the grin to widen, knowing well how difficult it is to shoot a man who's smiling at you. I drew closer. The German licked his lips. Then a blurred figure darted out from behind him and a knife slashed across his throat. <coughs> the SS trooper sagged, then fell face forward. Behind him, Violetta stood with a long, bloodied knife in one hand. By the time I reached her, she was wiping the blade on the man's combat uniform. Don't make any loud noises. If there is one, there must be more. After retrieving my weapon... I followed her round a hillock until we looked out across a stony, bare, undulating landscape. About a hundred yards away, I saw Sergeant Fritsch walking beside Cosette. Violetta nudged me and nodded her chin towards our left. Another German trooper was climbing a slope. They have a prisoner. I can't think who. Stay here. When you hear a shot, shoot the man with the prisoner. Then watch to see if there are any more Germans. Now, wait a minute. Let me go. <laughs> with those boots on? This was no time to argue. So I brought up the muzzle of my Schmeisser and aimed it at the German with the prisoner, who were walking towards me along a stretch of sloping ground. I waited for what seemed like an age, and then... My finger squeezed the trigger. Both the German and his prisoner went down and I saw the civilian rolling down the slope. When all was still, I counted to ten, then stepped out from my cover. But it was a bad mistake. Shots hit the rocks beside and above me, and I was showered in chips of stone and dust. Moments later, when I looked for where the German had fallen, he was gone. To my left, I saw Violetta moving out of cover and start walking towards the prisoner who had rolled down the slope. I went looking for the German, but he'd taken refuge somewhere amid the maze of hills and boulders. In a gully, Violetta was untying the prisoner's bonds, and I went to join them. They were forcing me to show them the passage over the pass before killing me. Who are you? What's your name? Cosette. Your Cosette? The man who was spying for the Germans? He's a traitor. I've told you, they were going to kill me. I'll kill you. Easy now, Violetta. If he was working for the Germans, no, he please, is... I want to hear his story. Carry on, Cosette. I made a terrible mistake by helping them. They were going to blow up the passage to stop you from escaping. I tried to escape, but they caught me. It is my right as a partisan to execute this traitor. You know exactly where the passage is? Yes, I do. Then you're the answer to my prayer. How far away is it? Not more than half a kilometer. Will you take us there? Of course. Then I want the privilege of killing him. Shut up, Violetta. Use your head. You couldn't find the passage. What would she know about passages through the mountains? I was born here. What is your name, girl? None of your damn business. Listen to him, Paul. Now he has the cheek to interrogate me. I only asked because I knew all the families that lived up here above Rajek. Her name is Violetta Georgias. The daughter of Stefan Georgias? You knew my father? I knew him well. We were friends before I lived here. Oh, it must be 20 years ago. He was the last to leave Rajik. How is he? Your friends, the Nazis, shot him. And my mother. Then they hanged my older brother. Oh, I'm sorry, Violetta. The next time my name comes from your mouth, I'll replace it with a bullet. But please stop that kind of talk, Violetta. Cosette can help us, and in return, we can help him. You have already helped me, for which I am grateful. All I want now is to see my wife and children again. Show us the passage, and you're free to go. No, Paul. I'm not going to let you harm him. Not now, not later. We'll see about that. There were just three German soldiers? Yes, the man who escaped was Sergeant Fritsch. They were looking for you. Looking for me? Uh, at the house, you left a cigarette butt, and one of the soldiers found you. <sighs> Damn stupid of me to leave it lying there. 
Yes, but I never dreamed there was another person for miles around. Do you happen to know what Major Shear was planning for us? From what I understand, his idea was to block your escape route and then starve you into surrender. Well, that suits us perfectly. We could be at the coast before he realizes we've left the pass. You are forgetting Sergeant Fritsch. It will take him some time, but he will find his way back and report that you rescued me. Not if we catch Fritsch. You stay here while I do some hunting. I will be... Okay. Don't don't leave me with her, please. That's just what I was thinking. Violetta, how would you like to go hunting? You can kill Sergeant Fritsch with a clear conscience. Yes, I can, Paul. But it changes nothing. Take cover over there in the rocks in case he doubles back this way. Violetta move up the slope with a pang of guilt. I felt it should have been my duty to hunt down Fritch. Yet I also knew that if I left her with Kozat, he would be dead before I got back. There was no choice. A live Kozat was more important than a dead German SS sergeant. Because Kozat knew the vital route over the pass, his life was, in harsh reality, more important than Violetta's. And I realized that, in spite of my love for this raven-haired beauty. Cosette and I moved to the shelter of some rocks, and I gave him a welcome cigarette. When I was first taken by your people, I wanted to stay then. Instead, I was asked to take my message on to the Germans. I did it as a service to your colonel. My plan was to secretly find my way back to you, but... I was kept under guard every minute. Then I really began to hate them. When I was told to lead Sergeant Fritsch and his men to the passage, I thought it would give me a chance to escape. I nearly succeeded. The sergeant took away my boots and tied my hands. <laughs> Do you want to see my feet? They are cut and... Uh, no, 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 please. Uh, don't bother. I, I believe you. When he saw I could work no further... He let me have my boots back. But even now, my feet are so painful. Uh-huh. Uh, this will interest you. I met your wife. Met her? Yes. I took some men and uh, I confiscated your radio transmitter. She, uh, she... She was all right? Yes. Yes, don't worry. She was all right. She let us help ourselves. Uh, naturally, she didn't approve. She must have been terrified to see a lot of foreigners storming the house. Now, there was no storming involved, Cosette. I simply knocked on the door and walked in. You did no harm to her? Of course not. She even smiled when we left. Oh, thank you. Tell me something. What made you work for the Germans in the first place? Well, they gave me money a long time ago, even before the war started. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you lived in these mountains, you would know what it means to have money. Most people here scratch a bare living from the ground. Money is something only rich people have. Uh, I was told that one day the Germans would come and bring order and prosperity to everyone. <laughs> and like many others, I believed it. When they came with their guns and arrogance and treated my people like slaves... It was too late for me to back out. I was like an observation post. I had to radio the movements of partisan groups back to Wehrmacht headquarters. Sometimes I told the truth. Other times... <laughs> well, you understand. Yes, yes, I, I think I do. You told them lies. Yes. They expected information, but here there are very few partisans. I invented some for the sake of having something to report. <laughs> well, I must say that's uh, at least a redeeming factor. Who's that? <laughs> it's you, Violetta. He has gone. Oh, damn it. How long will it take him to get back to me this year? If he has a good memory, about 48 hours. He might be wounded. 
There was no blood where he fell. Paul, you are a bad shot. Uh, well, uh, I don't think it's that, Violetta. You see, I, I fired a bit too much to the left, deliberately, for fear of hitting Kozak. Hmm. A pity. You should have got both of them. Who was carrying the explosives? The two soldiers had it in their packs. All right. We'll find it and explode it. Why bother? Well, this Sergeant Fritsch might be the conscientious type. You see, he might follow us and try to do the job alone. Oh. And if there's no explosives, then he can't. Yes, of course. So let's get rid of it and then find the passage we've been searching for all morning. Project Pass, Colonel Horton walked to the head of the column and found Major Ramsden. Ah, oh, there you are, Major. The pass is beginning to get very narrow. What? Yes, not even a monkey could climb up the sides now. We should be coming to the end soon. Yes, sir, I'm already keeping a watch for a way up. There must be one, otherwise Lieutenant Sale and his woman would have been back yesterday. Shall I send a message for Captain Saunders and his rear guard to pull back to the column tonight? Yes, it would be as well. I say, has he sent back a report on last night's activity yet? Well, I, I haven't read it completely, but yes, sir, he has. Everything was uh, quiet. Hmm. I wonder what those SS are up to, eh? Well, if I can read Major Shear's mind, I think he'll hope to starve us out, believing that we're trapped here. Uh, not if that fellow Kozat has told him there's a way out to this end. Well, perhaps he didn't. Uh, we don't know, do we? No. It's damn suspicious, Ramson. Putting myself in Shear's place... I'd throw every man into to this pass to stop us. Well, he tried that, and Saunders and his men cut him up. Well, a few hundred, Ramston. Sheer has 6,000 in his command. Oh, no, his lack of activity bothers me. Do you think it possible this Kozak fellow knows of another way, that perhaps he's leading a force of SS to intercept us? Oh, I, I hope not, sir. Well, you know, it would account for him abandoning his attempts to get past Sanders. But there could be another reason. Oh, well, name it. When we had a truce with Shear earlier, his motive was to spin this operation out for as long as possible to avoid being sent to the Eastern Front. I don't think that anything's changed. Oh, could be, could be. I, I think that the worst Shear will do is send out the occasional patrol to see where we are. Oh, dear. Well, I hope that is the case, Ramsden. I wonder what Sale and that girl are doing now. With luck, they might be back before nightfall. If they've found the way over the path. Yes, and it's a big if. Kozat was limping as he led us in among the bare rocks. A mile ahead of us, two peaks reared up towards the sky. From the corner of my eye, I carefully watched Violetta, sensing the outrage she felt at my fraternization with a man she considered a traitor. At any moment, she could find the temptation too great and raise the barrel of her schmeisser. Soon we came to a place where a pile of loose rock and boulders told of a past landslide. And ahead was a steep slope littered with debris. We have to climb up there. Right. Well, tell me, do you uh, remember any of this, Violetta? Oh, Paul, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, all right. I tell you what, you stay right here where we are. Get, get some rest. Kozat and I will climb up. And you follow when I call, okay? Right. Be careful, Paul. Never trust an enemy. Especially a traitor. Oh, don't you worry about that. I am being careful. Perhaps when I tell her my story, she will begin to understand. Yeah, perhaps. I will never understand the mind of a traitor. With Kozat in the lead, we climbed up the slope. It was some 20 yards to the top, and then it leveled out. 
Another 50 yards ahead was the dark hole of what looked like a large cave in a wall of soaring, solid rock. Cosette pointed to it. That was the passage we were to blow up. Oh, and you were so close to it. In the certain knowledge there were allies nearby, I would have led Sergeant Pritch in circles until I found you. Violetta, come up. We've found it. Would you have found it by yourselves? Well, I don't know. It's possible, I suppose. You see, we hadn't looked yet in this area. And Violetta knew we had to climb a slope before reaching the entrance. Let me give you a hand. There we are. Well, there it is, Violetta. Do you remember it now? Oh, yes. I remember. Shall we go and look? More than that. I want to check it as far as we can. With Violetta leading, we entered a damp, cold tunnel which seemed to lead beneath and to one side of the peaks above. It grew dark and I flicked on my torch. There was the scuttling of small creatures to get out of the light beam. Only then did I realize what a narrow squeak we'd had. Only one small explosive charge in this tunnel, and all hope would have been lost for our column of fugitives. After several minutes, I saw a point of light ahead, it grew until I could see the beam of afternoon sunlight gleaming in through the exit. We came out onto a wide ledge, which dropped hundreds of feet down to a valley. Perhaps it was my imagination, but I could swear I got the scent of the sea, although it was still very distant. This ledge winds around the mountainside until it gets very narrow, and only one person at a time can pass. Then there is the ravine to cross. Ah, your memory is returning. There was nothing wrong with my memory. All right, all right. I've heard enough arguing for today. Now, come on. Let's go as far as the ravine. How far is it, Cosette? Oh, no more than half a kilometer. Half a kilometer. Hmm. What's beyond the ravine? A gentle downward journey all the way to the coastal plain. You will come to Viasco, a small town where you might get fresh supplies hmm. if the Germans are not there. Oh. We're hoping they won't be. There is a danger. If they know you have got over the pass, they will have time to send a force to attack you. In that case, we'll have to fight our way to the sea. Cosette? Yeah? I wonder how sincere you are about changing sides. Oh, Violetta, come on, don't start all that again. I want an answer to the question. Well, Cosette? I can only offer my word. That counts for very little. How far would you go to help her? As far as you ask. Even to killing your old friend? Yes. What's all this about, Violetta? You know I don't trust you, Cosette. But you can do something to prove your sincerity. Something which may save you from retribution when this war is over. Name it and I will do it. What are you getting at? It is quite simple. Cosette has the means to contact the Germans by radio. If he sends a message to them that we are trapped in the past, there is no reason why they would send a force to intercept us on the plane. Yes. Yes, you're right. Well, well, well. So you can think rationally again. Hmm. That's a splendid idea. Well, Cosette? Yes, I will do it. And they will believe me. But a word of warning, Cosette. What you send will be carefully examined for danger symbols. Uh, what do you mean? There are special phrases which, when used, warn the recipients that the message is false and being sent under duress. Yes, of course. We use the same system. And I'm warning you, Cosette. I know the codes. I promise you, the message will be believed. The message can be sent as soon as we get back to Colonel Horton, and we've climbed on the higher ground. It's impossible to receive and send in this pass. I suppose you realize this means you'll have to go back with us? Yes, but it's much better than a bullet in the head from Sergeant Fritch. All right, Cosette. You need have no fear from my gun. Come yes. on. Let's find this ravine. The sooner we do so, the sooner we can start on our way back. I can imagine Colonel Horton's getting jittery by now. 
Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dittenthal. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Every day at this time, we bring you dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. Present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. We had been led by Kozat from the tunnel and out into the brilliant autumn sunshine. Unseen, but no more than 40 miles away, lay the Adriatic Sea, our longed for destination. In the knowledge that Kozat had spied for the German occupation forces for many years, it was difficult for Violetta to even look at him. She had revised her idea of shooting him since she realized he would be more useful to us alive. For my part, I believed he genuinely wanted to help us and so make up for his past wrongs. I was prepared to give him the chance. With a battalion of Waffen SS ready to attack our column of 250 fugitives, we were going to need all the help we could get. The three of us stood on a wide ledge and could see many hundreds of feet below the floor of a valley. The ledge wound round the mountain, narrowing all the time, until there was only enough room for a single person to pass. Kozat was taking us to see the greatest hazard of all, where our people would somehow have to cross a ravine. It took almost an hour to reach it. There, you see... It will not be easy to cross. Yeah, but how did people cross it before? Many years ago, there was a rope bridge. If you look over there, you will see the wooden post that held it. Uh, was the bridge there when you crossed, Violetta? I remember there was just three ropes spanning it. Well, how did you cross? My father carried me on his back. While clinging on the three ropes? Mm -hmm. Well, it must be all of a... Well, what, a, a thousand feet to the bottom of the ravine? My father was born in the mountains, Paul. He crossed this ravine many times. Two ropes were used as handholds, and the third was for the feet. I think we've got a major problem here. We are not going to get 250 people across here like that. It can be done, but slowly. There is no other way. She is right. The ledge peters out to nothing, and the only other way is back the way we came. <sighs> All right, but it'll be no joke. While I was pondering the logistical problem of getting 250 people across the ravine, far down Rajek Pass, Captain Sanders, who was in charge of the rear guard, was pondering another problem. Hey, that's a mighty fine barricade the men have constructed, Ryan. Hey, it's bloody hard work, sir, if you ask me. It took 50 men over an hour to get that one boulder into position. Yeah, well, it was worth it, though. If Major Shear wants to get his men past here, it'll cost more than just a few hundred. Yes, you're right, sir. And if they come at us at all, all at once, 
They'll be packed together like sardines and we'll cut them down like with a scythe. Ooh-hoo. And then we'll turn their own flamethrowers on them. It'll be a real barbecue. The grizzly devil. I don't <laughs> give a damn what happens to them, Captain. Just as long as I can get home in one piece. Which reminds me, Ryan. No sign yet of Dimitri and his men? No, no, not a pipe. Now, they've not been fighting or we'd have heard the den. Hmm. I wonder what he's up to. Well, these Russians, they prefer to go it alone, fighting like guerrillas. You mean guerrillas, huh? Yeah, like I said, guerrillas, you know. <laughs> Can be pretty effective, too. Remember the Spanish Civil War, do you? Sometimes a guerrilla group of ten men could hold up a whole army for days, you know. Well, that's the kind of warfare these Russians like. You're an expert, Ryan? No, it's what Dimitri told me. Hit and run, he says. Keep the enemy guessing and the worrying. Well, I can't see how he can use those tactics in Rajik Pass. Oh, leave it to Dimitri. He'll find a way. Well, I mean, didn't we hold up the SS only the night before last? Forty-odd men against a thousand or more? Yeah, true. And where we have to obey orders from Colonel Horden, Dimitri takes no notice and does as he likes, and Horden can't do a thing about it. Oh, well, talk of the devil. Yeah, that'll be Dimitri and his lads. Mm. I bet me rotting old cotton socks that he's been sitting there waiting for the jerrys to stick their noses back into the pass. Oh, and it seems like they did. Well, I hope they're going to be okay. Dimitri and his men, I mean. Ah, uh, yeah, they know what they're doing, sir. They're lucky blighters. I feel like having another go to hunt myself right now. Well, if Major Shearer decides to send his men into the pass in force, you won't have long to wait. In the meantime, Ryan, keep your eyes peeled for Dimitri coming back, will you? <laughs> By the sound of it, it might not be long before he makes a strategic withdrawal. deep in thought as we made our way back along the ledge to the tunnel. All sorts of possibilities occurred to me. What if there were no ropes available? I remember informing Ramsden that Violetta had told me there was a ravine to cross. It hadn't perturbed him, so it was possible he did have ropes among the column's equipment. I hope so, for there was no other way the column could cross that 30-foot ravine without wings. I took a last look at the sinking sun, took a deep breath, and followed Kozath and Violetta into the dark tunnel. A few minutes later, we emerged on the other side. Are we going straight back to the column, Paul? Yeah, as fast as we can. But keep a close watch around us. You never know. That Sergeant Fritsch might be lurking around with homicidal intentions. I think you scared him. And he didn't know there were only two of you. Before you rescued me, he thought you might have been a patrol of 12 or 13 men. If he is as smart as I think he is, he will be hurrying back to report to his commandant. Yes, I think so, too. Violetta, how long will it take us to get back into the pass? If we can hurry, sometime tomorrow morning. Right, so let's hurry. How are your feet, Cosette? Still painful. If you wish, I will wait here for you to return with your people. Oh, that could take oh, three or four days. And Cosette will have gone home. No, no, I made a promise and I... I think you'd better come with us. I can't afford to take chances, Cosette. We need you to send that message to your friends at Wehrmacht headquarters. Yes, very well. Cosette was right about Sergeant Fritsch. Thinking he had run into a large patrol... He'd managed to lose himself in the maze of rocks. After making certain he wasn't being pursued, the German SS sergeant began to find his way back along the way he had come. Fritsch had a first-class sense of direction, and he knew that now the chance to blow up the tunnel had been lost, it was imperative to get back to Major Scheer with all haste. And as he traveled, his mind worked frantically on a plan. getting closer. Must be just round that bend in the pass there. Dimitri hasn't got much space for maneuver. His men could be getting cut to pieces. I could take some men ahead to give a hand. We all stay where we are, Ryan. Going out and getting yourself shot up helps no one. Here they come, Sarge! I 
can't say nothing. Yes, I can. It's them, Dimitri's fellas, running like King Kong's hot on their heels. But I don't say Dimitri. Oh, there he is. There, with another feller. They're throwing grenades. And here they come. Come on, Dimitri! Lieutenant Arkhanov is an officer, Ryan. I don't think you'd better call him by his first name to his face. It's a funny time to worry about that. Anyway, he's a bloody Russian, and that's different. Unless you want me to call him Comrade. Oh, forget I said anything. Most of them have reached the barricade. Hey, Mitchell! Have you been counting them? 17, some broadside! That'll make 19, including Dimitri and his pal. Mm. Oh, and here they come. Get ready to fire on the side of the enemy! Williams, are the flame swords ready? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, uh, my friends, what an afternoon. <laughs> What's been happening, Dimitri? Uh, Sergeant Ryan, you'd better be ready for an assault. There are about 500 Germans just around the bend in the pass. <laughs> but there were a lot more an hour ago. All right, we're ready. You ambushed them? Uh, three kilometers down the pass. Then we fought them from boulder to boulder all the way here. <laughs> they marched into every little trap we set. So we could look forward to holding back several hundred very angry Germans. Uh, uh, but only until they see how well we are protected here. Oh, Sergeant Ryan, you made a very strong defensive position, eh? Yeah, but they won't run away when they see it. No, no, but they will send back for reinforcement first. I don't think they will trouble us until early tomorrow morning. All right, lads. Snipers only, unless there's a mass assault. You, uh, you lost some men, huh? Yeah, the only six. A good score, eh? Mm. Yeah, we are so hungry. I would like some of that emergency Russian chocolate. Ah, we're up to our ears in it. Help yourself. Ah. Hey, Milton, roll out the tins of chocolates, will you? I thought I found somebody who'll eat it. <laughs> Captain Saunders and his men waited for the first SS troopers to appear around the bend in the pass. And waited. Three hours later, they were still waiting. What the hell are they doing, I wonder? Oh, heaven knows. They're waiting for reinforcements to come up. They will have looked around the bend and seen this barricade. Yes, I don't think they will have gone back. Most likely they'll be digging in and consolidating their positions. Well, we can send a couple of men down to take a look. Uh, if the Germans are there, the men will be caught in the open and killed. No, no, it is better to wait. I think they will bring out some anti-tank weapons or mortars to break up this barricade. Yes, that's what I'm afraid of. But because of the high walls of the past, they'll, they'll have to show themselves in order to fire them. You've seen how good our lads are at sniping. Yeah, it'll be dark in an hour. Oh, I wonder if they'll try anything at night. Well, we're under orders to move in closer to the column in the morning. Well, that's a pity, if you ask me. I think we could have held out here for quite a long time, you know. Well, when you move back, I and my men will stay for a while. It is possible the Germans will try to chase you. We can hold them off from here. It's sort of rear guards, rear guard. I don't like that idea. But it makes sense to me, sir. Well, from our angle, sure. But it could be the end of you, Dimitri. <laughs> no, perhaps not. But I would like to change something here. If your men could help, Sergeant Ryan. You just say the word. Well, at present, there is one long line of boulders which protects us from a frontal attack, huh? But if the Germans use grenades or mortars, there is nothing to protect our backs from the blast. I think a second line of boulders along here with two small openings, that would give us greater protection, huh? Yes, I... I see what you mean, yes. Yeah, but is there enough time? Soon it'll be dark. If and... I put all me lads on it, we can finish it in a couple of hours. Good, good. Now, come on, let's get it done. Hey, Corporal, come over here. I've got a big job in mind for all you lot. Luckily, the long trek back to the column was mainly downhill. Yet even so, tiredness crept up on us. We had been two days without a real rest, and Cosette for even longer. Just before dark, I decided that it would be counterproductive for us to carry on, and told Violetta and Cosette we would take a five-hour break for sleep as soon as it became dark. Though they didn't show it, I knew they were relieved. 
When visibility was close to zero, we found a comfortable hollow between some rocks, and we settled down. Meanwhile, at Major Shear's makeshift command post at the head of the pass, the SS Commandant had his evening meal and patiently waited for a report from Lieutenant Razor, who was debriefing an officer sent back from the assault group inside the pass. Oh, yeah, that was very good, Kruber. Even goulash tastes good lately. If there's no more cognac, bring me a bottle of peach brandy. It's a little sweet for my taste, but there's not much choice. Ah, yes, Lieutenant Faiser now. Uh, bring two glasses. Yeah, Herr Commandant. The news is a mixture of good and bad, Herr Mayor. Sit down and don't spare my agony. <clears throat> Lieutenant Gresler has consolidated a position six kilometers into the pass. The enemy's rear guards had abandoned its earlier positions and pulled back. Dresda followed up and in a running fight killed six of them. Englanders? No, Russians. Ah. So they're using the Russians for rear guard duty again. Our own losses were quite high, I'm afraid, Herr Mayor. The enemy had prepared an ambush which was to be expected. Lieutenant Gresler dislodged them by weight of manpower. I told him to avoid open confrontation. Even a child could realize that any attempt of ours to storm their prepared positions will lead to heavy losses. The Grazda attacked when he discovered the position was being held by fewer than 20 men. At what cost? 32 killed and 18 wounded. <laughs> a poor bargain, Deza. Lieutenant Kressler was told to watch and wait. No more. If Sergeant Fritz... And succeeded in blowing up the enemy escape route, it is pointless to lose men in attacking them. Yeah, Herr Mayor, but I think uh, Gresler yielded to the temptation. The man's a fool. I think I'll replace him with Luber. I agree. Luber is a more cautious man, Herr Mayor. Yeah, well, that is how we must act. With caution and the minimum of pressure on the enemy. It is not in our interests to force them into surrender yet. After all, Vesa. We can spin this siege out for as long as three weeks or more. Yeah, Emil. Well, oh, thank you, Gruber. I think you had better bring a meal for Lieutenant Weser. Huh? Yeah, Herr Commandant. Literally everything depends on Fritz's success. Uh, but I have a feeling I should have sent more men with him. But the Yugoslav claimed it would slow them down. Speed was the essential factor, Hemio. Speed? Yeah. But what if the enemy sent a patrol down the pass and up to the crossing? I think Fritz will reach there first. Yeah? You think. But you can't be sure, huh? Well, he should be back late tomorrow. Then we'll know for certain. Here's to his success. Prost. Prost. <coughs> it is strong, am I? Yeah. And too much can produce a bad hangover. <clears throat> About Gresler, Herr Mayor, shall I replace him? Yeah, it would be best. Tell Luber to report to me for briefing before he leaves. Since Gresler adopted an aggressive policy, why has he stopped only halfway along the pass? The Englanders must have reached the far end by now, surely. But he pursued the Russians as far as a sharp bend in the pass. The enemy took cover behind a high barricade of rocks that had been built across its width. Even Gresler balked at trying to take it by frontal assault. It would have meant his men are moving up in an open patch which was less than ten meters in width. So he stopped. Good. Lieutenant Lieber can prepare a similar defensive wall as the enemy and stay behind it. A sort of stalemate. From there, he can send small patrols out to ascertain the enemy's position. And if he is attacked? It is unlikely, but in that event, he will naturally respond. Just sufficiently to chase them away. Then, my dear Fraser, all we have to do is sit here, enjoy the autumn sunshine, and wait for our friends to get weary and hungry enough to unconditionally surrender. If you don't mind my suggesting it, Herr Mayor, I think it would be a good idea to send a strong force of men over the pass just to let the enemy know we have them at both ends. You mean to the place I sent Fritsch? Yeah. When he returns, he will be able to show them the way. Hmm. True, true. 
But don't you think that could force the enemy into an early surrender? Well, of course, it depends on how well uh, informed their guide is. But if it is possible for Fritz to reach the passage by traveling over the pass, will it not be possible for the enemy to reach the passage, find it blocked, and then come back towards the east by the route used by Sergeant Fritz? Yeah, I suppose it is. According to Kozat, it is a long and difficult journey. But one way they would take rather than surrender. I must have another drink. Uh, look, Reza, we do not even know for certain if they have a guide. Until Kozat came, we were certain there was no way out of the pass, yeah? But just assuming they do have a guide, will he know the high ground route to the east? I do not know, Herr Mayor, but it might be as well to consider it as possible. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting thought. Now, let me think it through. Mayor. If the enemy went by that route, it would bring him out in the valley some ten kilometers north of here, yeah? Yeah, if they use the same route as Kozat. Kozat said there was only one possible way, so we must take that as read. Very well. After Sergeant Fritz has returned and reported his success, I will send a force down the valleys to keep a watch. I wonder how long it would take the Britishers to make the journey. Oh, four or five days. Perhaps even longer, Herr Mayor. Hmm. Well, taking everything into consideration, Visa, I don't think we have anything really to worry about. Nine, have I? Drink up and uh, have another. came like a thick felt curtain drawn over the inhospitable landscape and it grew very cold. Violetta soon fell asleep in my arms but I lay awake. Nearby I could hear that Kozak was restless. I wondered if he was waiting to be sure we were both asleep and then to disappear among the rocks. There was no reason for me to believe that he was more interested in our welfare than that of his family. Once I was asleep, there was nothing to hold him. Gently, I freed myself from Violetta's embrace and got up. You are still awake? Yes. And you know I am. It is difficult. I am overtired. It sometimes makes sleeping difficult. <clears throat> you know, I'm wondering how far I can trust you, Kozak. I know. You think I will desert you? Huh? Yes. I was waiting until I heard you breathing deeply. Then I would be certain that you trusted me. And then run away? <laughs> it would be a great temptation, but no. Why not? The Germans will lose this war. Even they know it now. When they leave, there will be a witch hunt. Men and women who help them will be rounded up and executed. My only hope of survival lies with you. If I help the Allies, they will help me when the time of retribution comes. I cannot throw away this chance to help you for emotional reasons. Your people will help me in return, won't they? It'll go on record that you were instrumental in helping us to escape, yes. Perhaps Colonel Horton will go one better and allow you to go with us to Italy. Oh, I don't know about that. My, my wife and children... They'll be safer with you away. In a year or so, you could return as a hero, perhaps. You'll be able to say you only appeared to be helping the Germans, while in reality you were helping the Allies all the time. What happened today is evidence to support it. But your girl, Violetta, she knows the truth. I haven't told her all you told me. Besides, I don't think she'll give you away. Ah, if only... I'll speak to Colonel Horton for you. You will? Yeah, that's a promise. You're in love with Violetta George, yes? Yes. <laughs> She's a beautiful girl, and her father was one of the finest men I ever knew. It will be hard for her when you leave. Oh, she'll be with me. It will be allowed? I'm going to marry her. And take her to your country? Whenever possible, yes. 
It will be strange to her. Does she speak your language? <laughs> when I met her, she knew only two words. Now it's six. <laughs> At such a pace, Violetta will be an old lady before she can gossip with her neighbors. <laughs> oh, that might be an advantage. Well, I'm going back to her and try to sleep. I'm prepared to trust you, cousin. You can, I swear it. Very well. Good night. Good night. And I think you are very lucky to have such a beautiful blanket to keep you warm. I lay back in Violetta's arms and let the warmth of her body sink into mine. Yet sleep still eluded me. In spite of our talk, I felt that I was making a mistake in trusting Cosette, and my ears were unconsciously listening for any untoward movement from him. Our guns were lying just between us, so there was very little chance of Cosette getting at one of them. But finally, after a good 15 minutes, exhaustion took over, and I fell into a deep, dreamless sleep. Darkness was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dippenthal. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio. Thirty dossier. Every day at this time, we bring you dramatized stories of excitement, romance, and suspense from the files of interesting and fascinating people. Present The Veil of Darkness, a story of violence and intrigue by Ron Evans. It was two in the morning when Violetta woke me. Into my brain came the instant question. It is time to get ready, Paul. Uh, Cosette. I have just woken him. Oh. I put the muzzle of my gun into his ear. <laughs> It worked. Oh, that's cruel. But effective. Here is some chocolate and a cup of water. Oh, uh, thanks. You know something? Mm -hmm. You'll make me an excellent wife. <laughs> well, as long as you don't wake me up with a gun to my ear. Oh, that will depend on you, my darling. <laughs> I have given water and chocolate to Cosette. Good. And uh, do you feel a bit better about him? Only a little. Sometimes I wish he would try to run away just so I can hunt him down. Well, he could have run away during the night, but he didn't. It proves that he's sincere about wanting to help us. I have told you about my people. They can change their loyalties by the hour. Mm -hmm. And you? No, Paul. I am like a little bird happily trapped in a golden cage. Open the door and I will cry. The door is welded shut. <laughs> well, back to reality. How long will it take us from here to the foot of the pass? If the column has reached the end, about seven hours. Ah, that makes it about nine in the morning, hmm? Mm-hmm. Oh, we made good time. It is quicker traveling downhill. Right. Well, let's get on our way, then. Cosette, are you ready? Yes, and wide awake. <laughs> Don't complain. At least Violetta didn't squeeze the trigger.
By the time day broke, we were clear of the flatter land above the pass and had begun to descend steep, treacherous slopes. Even when the sun rose, its rays never touched us. Already we were into the region where the sun never shone. The long column of SKPs had reached the end of the pass just before darkness the previous evening. They had settled for the night, but by six in the morning, everyone was awake and waiting for orders. They looked out at the soaring bare rock walls on three sides and wondered how there could possibly be a way out of this awful place. They felt like goldfish stranded in the bottom of a gigantic fishbowl. The field kitchen soon began doling out breakfast, which went a long way to relieving anxiety. Major Ramsden took his meal with Colonel Horton. You know, Ramsden, I think it would be a good idea to send some men out to look for a way up, instead of being wholly dependent on Lieutenant Sales' return. Mm, I've already done that, sir. Oh, jolly good. I feel positively trapped here. Yes, it is a bit unnerving. You know, I've travelled around the lot, Ramsden, but never have I seen a place so dreary as this. One could get bloody claustrophobia here. On the march here, I scanned the sides of the pass very closely. If there is a way up, it's very well hidden and damn tough going, too. And that French chap, uh, LaRue, he claims to be something of a mountaineer. He says there's no way we can climb those sheer cliffs. They must be all of 600 feet to the top. Oh. Yeah, very depressing. More coffee, Ramsden? Oh, thanks. I'll help myself, sir. Damn nuisance being out of sugar. Actually, I'm looking forward to getting back to Italy and a decent pot of tea in the officer's mess. Oh, I've forgotten what it tastes like, sir. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. You've ordered Sanders back? Oh, they should be on their way back now, sir. Good. He can build a good position half a mile back down the pass. Yes, I saw an excellent spot, no more than eight yards wide. I remember it. Yes, he can dig in there until everyone is out of the pass. Had any news from him yet? Well, Dimitri and his chaps had a running fight with the SS yesterday afternoon. They lost six men. But the Germans pulled up short of the barricades Sergeant Ryan's men had built. Those damned Russians. Hm. Seem to be doing a splendid job, I must admit. Don't give a damn about anything except walloping Nazis. Can't say I blame them, and I'm damned if I'll stop them. Sanders has done well, too. Surprising, considering he's really an Air Force man. And an American to boot. Now, from what I hear, it's really Sergeant Ryan who's running the show. Sanders is really a, a figurehead. Yes, probably. A real mixture he has there. Aussies, New Zealanders, South Africans, Canadians, Indians, Russians and Americans. Boggles the mind how he keeps them in order. After this, I'll most certainly recommend him for a decoration. A fine fellow, in spite of being an Irishman. <coughs> oh, sorry, old chap. Got a bit of Irish in you yourself, eh? Hmm? Uh, my father, Carl. Oh, good, good. Well, we're all British together, aren't we, old chap? Hmm. As long as we give the old Nazis and those Japanese upstarts a good walloping, that's all that matters. Well, Major, shall we go on our tour of inspection? Uh, right, sir. Oh, I think Lady Agnes was hovering around in the hope of seeing you. She is? I see, yes. Uh, well, on second thoughts, I think perhaps another pot of coffee would be in order. Violetta's sense of timing was good. It was a little after nine when we scrambled down a steep cleft in the rocks, bringing down with us a shower of debris, and stood firmly on the floor of the pass. A few yards away stood three soldiers, their weapons aimed at us. One of them, Corporal Baker, recognized me and escorted us into the encampment. Leaving Violetta to be fussed over by Lady Agnes, Cosat and I reported to Colonel Horden, who was still drinking coffee with Major Ramsden. By Jove, I'm damn glad to see you back, Sale. How was it, and what are you doing with this fellow? I thought we'd sent him to his masters. Ah, uh, well, it was uh, pretty heavy going, sir. Did you find the way out? Uh, thanks to Kozat, yes. And your little lady friend? We were searching for the way through when we saw three German soldiers, sir. Kozat was their prisoner. Hmm. Strange twist of fortune for you. What, Kozat? They were forcing me to show them the way over, and they were going to kill me. Just three of them, you say? Uh, there's a passage which runs under the side of the mountain. Uh, they were going to blow it up, which uh, 
Well, that would have trapped us all in the pass. I see. Sounds pretty serious to me. Major Scheer and his whole bloody battalion could outflank us by going over the top of the pass. Then, hmm, if Kozat and three of his pals can do it, well, it's all rather alarming. Yes, sir. It is true there is a way, Colonel, but it is a very difficult route. From what I could understand, Major Scheer wants to keep you trapped here and starve you into surrendering. What do you think, Major Amson? I think we should start moving out as soon as possible. Yes, I agree. What happened to these Germans? We killed two, sir, but um, I'm afraid one escaped. Uh, he didn't hang around, so I think he's making his way back to report to Major Shear. Kozat, how long would it take him to send troops to intercept us? If Sergeant Fritsch returned late today, three days or four, perhaps four. And how long do you think it will take us to the other side, sir? Oh, there are a host of problems, sir. Um, I'd say four or five days at least. Then we'd better pray that our Major Sher doesn't act immediately. I think we must work on the assumption that he does. Of course, of course, Major. Will you get everyone ready to leave? With the greatest haste, Colonel. And better send a man along to Captain Saunders and tell him to fall back and follow us up. About this place where we climb up from the pass. Yes, sir. Where is it? Ramsden and I looked for it when we passed yesterday and all we saw was sheer cliff face. Um, well, it's about half a mile back, sir. A cleft in the rock wall. Uh, we'll need ropes if we're to get everyone up to the top. Uh, we'll need ropes to cross the ravine later on, sir. Yes, so I hear. Well, Major Ramsden tells me we have plenty of rope, so that is not a problem. A damned pity you couldn't have gone after this German sergeant and stopped him, though. Violetta tried to catch him, sir. Can't leave things like that to a woman, Lieutenant? Uh, actually, the implications of his escape didn't strike me until later. Far too late for us to start searching. Pretty remiss of you. You have to see the kind of country we were in to fully appreciate the problem, sir. It's a maze of rocks, everyone looking like the next. And this young woman couldn't find the exit, eh? We were looking when we bumped into Kozat and his escort. She would have found it eventually, but uh, Kozat took us directly there and saved us a lot of time. Why do you believe you were going to be shot, Kozat? Uh, as I tried to escape, but they caught me. And why did you try to escape? I wanted to come here and warn you. But you're on their side, Kozat. Not now. I came with Lieutenant because uh, I want to help you. Is that correct, Sale? Ah, uh, yes, sir. You seem uncertain. Well, at first he was worried about his wife and children, sir. And then we thought up an idea where he could be of considerable assistance to us. Something only Cosette can do. What is it? By doing it, sir, he will require our protection. Both from the Germans and his own people when the war is over. What happens after the war has nothing to do with me. We could help, sir. Where is all this leading? I suggested we could take him with us to Italy, sir. I think he could be useful to Allied intelligence. When he returns to Yugoslavia, it will be known he was on our side. By Jove, that's asking a lot. The man's a traitor to his own kind, a pretty rotten type, you know. He won't be rotten if he gets us out of a fix, sir. What fix? If Major Shear comes down the pass and finds we've left, he could send a signal to his headquarters. And just in case Sheer can't catch up with us, they're likely to send a force to intercept us on the coastal plain. Yes, that is true. Kozat is still trusted by the Wehrmacht. By using the radio, he can fool the Germans into thinking we are still trapped in the past. Hmm. Yes, there's something in that. They will believe me. The problem is, the Germans will send out patrols to see where we are. Major Sheer will know within hours that we have left. I know for certain that Major Shear is not in radio contact with his headquarters. His transmitting equipment was destroyed in an air attack. When the Panzers paid their brief visit, it's likely they supplied him with one. No, the Panzers left before I did. And I know for certain he still has no radio. If he finds out you have left the pass, it would take him three days to get a message to his headquarters. By which time, we could be almost over the pass. But, but wait... If Shear can't contact his HQ, 
Then why would the Germans send a force to intercept us anyway? Is it not possible they will send troops to intercept you if they are uncertain of the position? The Germans are not people to leave things to chance. Mm Hmm? Yes, and a call from you will assure them that all is well. Yes, Colonel. Well, it can't do any harm, but the radio can't be used until we reach higher ground. Cosat will be able to call them up by tonight, sir. Hmm. Apart from this, Cosette, what possible use could you be to Allied intelligence? I know by heart the present displacement of German forces in Yugoslavia and Hungary. I'm in possession of many codes. For instance, I know the 9th Panzer Regiment has been ordered to the Italian front. I say, they're the blighters who were stationed at Dubrovnik, aren't they? They will be leaving in a few days. Hmm. All right, Cosette. I'll take you to Italy. And make it known that I am working for the Allies? Yes, yes. I don't think you'll have any trouble when you come back to Yugoslavia. Uh, good. In fact, I'm rather glad you're with us. If Major Scher tries to chase us up from the pass, he could run into a lot of difficulty without a guide. By the time I left Colonel Horton, the camp was in a state of great activity. Ramsden and a French officer went to look at the cleft in the rock wall that we'd so recently descended. The prospect of taking 250 people and supplies up it was daunting, to say the least. But the Frenchman immediately began working out how it could be done with ropes and muscle power. First to go up would be Lieutenant Brzezinski and his 20 Poles, who would form a protective screen. Then the women and children would follow. Finally, the main body of men. And last of all, Sergeant Ryan's rear guard. Sadly, the mules which had brought the fugitives so far would have to be abandoned in the pass. Violetta, Kozatz, and myself were ordered to go up after the Poles, and a whisper in my ear from Horden told me that my job was to keep a close watch on the Yugoslav, just in case. The manner in which the French officer organized the climb was magnificent, and the operation began slowly but efficiently. By midday, I was able to look down the cliff face at the milling crowd below as they waited for their turn. I wondered if the ravine crossing would be as efficiently negotiated but that was in the future. Then my mind turned to Sergeant Fritsch. Herr Mayor, Sergeant Fritsch is here. Ah, Fritsch, come inside. My, you look as though you've walked across the Sahara Desert. Oh, Herr Commandant, it was much worse. You blew up the passage? It was not possible. We were ambushed by a patrol of Britishers. A Weber and Lanth were killed. You mean the way is still open for the enemy to get over the pass? Yeah, Herr Commandant. Cosette? What happened to Cosette? I can't be certain, but I think he was killed too. I hope so. If the Britishers have Cosette, they will make him show them the way. Did you see his body? I dropped down when a machine gun opened up on us. Cosette fell and his body rolled over, down into a gully. Hmm. And then what happens? I decided my duty was to get back and report the incident. Oh, this changes everything, Lieutenant Fraser. I must work on the presumption that the Englanders know how to get out of the pass. We are already doing so, I'm sure. By late this afternoon, a mass assault could be mounted to overwhelm their rear guard. Then the column will be at our mercy. Yeah, that must be done. Well, you did what you could, Fritsch. You did the right thing by reporting back as soon as possible. If uh, your permission, Herr Commandant, I have an idea how the enemy could be stopped. Mm -hmm. How? I have traveled the route twice and could guide a large force of men onto the heights above the pass. Which is what should have been done in the first place. But would it not be too late? Well, I think it would take the enemy two or three days to reach the passage over the pass. I think uh, Stormgruppen could reach it before they do. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. 
Uh, what do you think, Vesa? I agree, Herr Mayor. Lieutenant Gorin could command such a group, and then... No, 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 Vesa. I will command the group. Lieutenant Gorin can stay here with the equipment and keep the surrounding hills patrolled for partisans. You will send 2,000 men down the pass to reinforce Lieutenant Lübber and order him to reach the enemy column at all costs. Yeah, Mayor. A thousand men will stay here at the head of the pass, and the rest will go with me. Yeah, Herr Mayor. And uh, what will I do, Herr Mayor? <laughs> Come with me, of course. Sergeant Fritsch, you will get yourself cleaned up, and I can allow you no more than three hours sleep. Yeah, Herr Commandant. That is sufficient. Be off with you, then. Visa, I am afraid we have let matters get somewhat out of hand. Imagine the shame that will fall on us if the enemy escapes. It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? Perhaps we should have captured them instead of making truces. Heaven knows we had so many opportunities, yeah. But had you done so, Hammer, we would be facing the Russians at the Eastern Front by now. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is true, Vesa. Well, now the game is over, and we must pursue them without mercy. Let us hope they did not capture Cosettes and are still trapped inside the pass. Right, now to work. Before half of our complement had reached the top of the cleft, Violetta, Cosette, and I began to lead our people up the steeply sloping ground, which would take us a thousand feet higher. Men helped the women and children up the loose stony scree, a slow and dangerous process where one slip could bring tragedy in its wake. As the sky began to darken, the women and children reached the top. I had watched with amazement as Lady Agnes bustled about on the treacherous slope, Helping here, they're helping there, with the sure-footedness of a mountain goat. For a squarely built woman of late middle age, dressed in a grey tweed suit, to have climbed unassisted so far was a near miracle in itself. But this, this left me speechless with admiration. Lieutenant Brzezinski's men had fanned out on the upper plateau, and they stood guard. Behind them, the group at the top of the slope grew larger until midnight, when everyone except our rear guard was on the plateau and safely camped. satisfied that his flock had reached the plateau. He reported to Colonel Horton. A hundred percent success, sir. Splendid, splendid. Our chaps did a sterling job. There were times I thought we were never going to succeed. That slope was a dash killer. Even worse than climbing up that confounded cliff. Ah, but LaRue certainly knows his onions about mountaineering, sir. If it wasn't for him, most of us would be still waiting to climb up the slope. Has he pulled up his ropes? Can't leave them there for the Germans, you know. Well, I told him to wait for Captain Sanders' lot, sir, and then the ropes will be brought up. Oh, of course, of course. Oh, dear me. What with all the excitement I was forgetting about, Sanders... I hope he's all right. But personally, Colonel, it would have been as well to have left a small rear guard in the past to convince Shear's patrols that we're still there. Oh, does it really matter now? Rather have our chaps on the higher ground to keep them at bay. Uh, yes, sir. You don't seem entirely convinced, Ramston. Well, if Shear's men come after us, we could still find ourselves in a pickle. 
They can move faster than we can, and if we're caught on the open ground, well, that's the end. My dear Ramston, you are an old pessimist. <laughs> I think our Sergeant Ryan will know how to keep these Nazi blighters in their place. We could find ourselves sandwiched, sir, if Shear sends his men on the other way, and I think it's quite likely that he will. Yes, yes, uh, there is that factor to consider. Far better to keep the SS down in the past for as long as possible, thinking that we're still trapped. Oh, dear me, this is frightfully complicated. A fellow wishes he was in a nice, comfortable chair in the operations room. <laughs> you know, it won't be easy asking these chaps to stay down there, Ramsden. One could almost call it a suicide mission. I say, what about those wild Russians? They might like that kind of a show. Well, perhaps Dimitri might be agreeable. The trouble is, we don't know where they are. Oh, they're a weird lot. The last message I received from Sanders merely stated that Dimitri seemed to be fighting a private war, and they wanted to stay in the past. For all we know, they could have been killed or recaptured. Well, if they aren't, Dimitri and his chappies could be performing a jolly fine service. I mean, while they're harassing Shear's patrols, He'll believe we're all still down there. But we can't be sure, sir. Oh, oh all right, Ramsden. Send a man down to tell Sergeant Ryan to stay in the pass for at least the next 24 hours. Then he can pull back and climb that cleft in the rock. By heaven, half a dozen men could hold that position for a week or more. Oh, yes, I know. Leave Dimitri in the pass and send a message for Ryan to climb the cleft and hold it for at least two days if the Germans try to climb it. It would be a damn silly waste of men if they tried. Does that meet with your approval, Major? Good enough for me, sir. I'll send Jenks down to give Sanders the order. Not Sanders. The order is for Sergeant Ryan, since he's been running the show all along. Order Sanders up here, where he can be of more use. A few minutes before midnight, Dimitri stood between the double barricade of rocks which stretched across the pass. He waited for the return of Comrade Alexandre Nevesky who'd gone out under cover of darkness to look at what the SS were doing round the bend in the pass. Dimitri's curiosity had been aroused by the flashing of lights, and even indistinct shouted orders had been carried to his ears along the still night air. At one minute to midnight, Nevesky returned and reported he'd seen massed lines of SS troops within the pass's narrow confines. It was obvious that a mass assault was imminent. In the few seconds he had left, Dimitri ordered his men into position. At precisely midnight, several flares were fired, and the 19 Russians saw massed ranks of trotting, camouflaged SS troopers turning the bend and coming for them. was written by Ron Evans, produced by Yolan Dotman, and directed by Henry Dippenfall. Springbok 930 Dossier, dramatized for broadcasting, and brought to you on Springbok Radio.